block. At least two people have been killed and 27 injured in Chad as demonstrators demand a return to civilian rule. It comes after the military took power and they could lead to disorder while the country was still in mourning. Tensions have been on the rise since Debbie's death, with the military struggling to win over a population exhausted by 30 years of autocratic rule. And turning to India, where the country continues to see staggering numbers of COVID-19 cases and deaths as it fights a severe second wave. Its tally of new infections has remained above 300,000 for six straight days. The Indian Army has joined medical relief efforts as hospitals struggle with the influx of patients and shortage of supplies. Meanwhile, crematoriums are being pushed to their limits. Gao Yiming tells us more, and a warning here, viewers may find some of these images distressing. India is facing an out-of-control public health crisis. Hundreds of thousands of patients are pouring into hospitals to seek treatment for COVID-19. But due to shortages of oxygen in beds, many are being turned away. His condition is a bit serious. We're standing here without oxygen and a patient in the middle of the road without any hope. It's been two hours. I've been waiting here since 8 in the morning. As far as I can see, I won't be able to get in for another hour or maybe more. I have a car and I'm sitting in it. But where will a poor person sit if he is sick? Crematoriums are working day and night to cope with the soaring deaths. The World Health Organization says this unprecedented crisis in India is beyond heartbreaking. WHO is doing everything we can, providing critical equipment and supplies, including thousands of oxygen concentrators, prefabricated mobile field hospitals and laboratory supplies. A number of nations are sending aid to help India battle this new wave of infections. China says 800 oxygen concentrators have been sent from Hong Kong to Delhi and 10,000 more are scheduled to arrive in a week. A foreign ministry spokesperson says Beijing is willing to support Delhi with all the help it needs. We are making it clear that we stand ready to help India fight its recent outbreak. Both sides have been communicating on the matter. If India puts forward specific needs, China is willing to provide support and assistance to the best of its ability. The U.S. has promised to provide medical equipment and protective gear to India, as well as raw materials for vaccines to India's manufacturers. The State Department says it's working nonstop to deliver these supplies, and President Joe Biden has vowed to help India overcome the difficulties in its time of need. Both France and Germany have also promised to provide medical aid, including oxygen, as soon as possible. And Russia says India will receive the first batch of its Sputnik V vaccines on May the 1st. Gao Yiming, CGTN. Meanwhile, Turkey has imposed its strictest pandemic restrictions, closing businesses and schools, limiting travel, and instructing people to stay at home for nearly three weeks. The health ministry has also announced it's moving on to the next stage of the vaccination plan, saying China's Sinovac vaccine has proven to be effective. CGTN's Mahal Bardavid has this report. Turkey was among the first countries to purchase Sinovac Biotech's COVID-19 vaccine, Coronavac. The government rolled out a vaccination program in January and has since administered over 20 million doses. Over 75 percent of the vaccines administered so far are from China's Sinovac Biotech. The health ministry has declared this vaccine as significantly effective. The rate of admissions to hospital for people above the age of 65 and especially those who have been vaccinated has decreased. And this corresponds with the official figures of the health ministry. In mid-April, Turkey's health minister Fahrettin Koca stated that COVID-19 infections among those over the age of 65 and health workers had drastically decreased. Both were included in the first group to receive China's Coronavac vaccine in Turkey. Jeanette Bardavid is a Hebrew teacher at the Jewish high school in Istanbul. She was vaccinated when people over the age of 65 received their shots. 
I got the Chinese vaccine, Sinovac, three weeks after I took my second dose in March. My antibody level was measured, and it was very high. Now I feel so much more confident. Turkey's education ministry has extended the school year until July 2nd, and curriculums have been adjusted due to the pandemic. We are currently teaching classes online. However, schools can reopen any day, and we might have to start face-to-face -face education again. As a teacher, of course, I was worried that we could be at risk, both myself and my students. Meanwhile, the health minister announced that most of the new cases were due to COVID-19 variants, which have also infected children. Doctors stress that China's vaccine also provides some protection against variants. We can say that people with an elevated antibody level have less risk of developing a recurrent disease with other variants of the coronavirus, especially mutants. The Turkish government recently began vaccinating those over the age of 55, but has called on citizens to support the process by adhering to social distancing measures. Mikhail Vardavid, CGTN, Istanbul. Body camera footage has been shown to the family of Andrew Brown Jr., a black man who was shot and killed by police last week in the U.S. state of North Carolina. It happened the day after the verdict in the Derek Chauvin trial and sparked more outrage. Nadia Romaro reports. It ain't right. It ain't right at all. The family of Andrew Brown Jr. finally able to see some of the officer's body camera footage from the shooting that killed him last Wednesday. Let's be clear. This was an execution. The video's release was delayed by law enforcement, leading to protest Show the tape. and passionate pleas from the attorneys for Brown's family. What do you want? Video. A redacted version of the video was then released Monday afternoon. The family's attorneys say the redacted clip was not enough. We only saw a snippet wow. of the video. Uh -huh. When we know that the video started before uh -huh. and after. Right. What they showed the family. The Pasquotank County Sheriff's Office said deputies shot Brown as he fled as they attempted to serve him an arrest warrant. CNN has learned Brown's death certificate says he died from a gunshot wound to the head and ruled his death a homicide. The family says Brown was shot from behind. Andrew had his hands on his steering wheel. Mm -hmm. He was not reaching for anything. He wasn't touching anything. He wasn't throwing anything around. He had his hands firmly on the steering wheel. They run up to his vehicle shooting. City and state leaders and the sheriff's office asking everyone to wait for the investigation to be completed before making any conclusions, encouraging protesters during the day and at night to remain peaceful. I'm Nadia Romero reporting. Violence has escalated between Israeli troops and Palestinian militant groups since last week. Stephanie Freed reports from Jerusalem. From Gaza, dozens of rockets were fired because that led to clashes in Jerusalem throughout the West Bank um, and Palestinian-occupied uh, territories. So in response as well, Gaza fired dozens of rockets. Overnight Monday, Israel's uh, security cabinet came to a decision that if rockets would continue, they would, there would be what they said would be a significant escalation vis-a-vis -vis Israel and Gaza. So overnight Monday, no rockets were fired from Gaza onto Israel. And the situation here, I, I was here on Monday night, the situation here calmed down as well in terms of clashes between Palestinian youth um, and police. However, there could be another escalation from Gaza. Why is that? Because there is the expectation that Palestinian elections that were supposed to take place in May there will be an announcement in the coming days that they're going to be postponed. Uh, and specifically in Hamas-controlled Gaza, there's anger over that because the understanding is it was Israel that pressured the factions in the West Bank to postpone or cancel the election. Uh, it, it, it's complicated, but there is a concern that there will be an escalation. There may be an escalation in the coming days. That's Stephanie Fried in Jerusalem. And with that, we come to the end of this hour's The World Today. I'm Wang Mama in Beijing. Thanks for watching and stay with me for China 24.
China Global Television Network. Coming to you live from Beijing, this is China 24. Our look at China and its impact around the world in this edition. Protecting cultural heritage, promoting innovation in the private sector. We bring you the highlights from President Xi Jinping's tour of the Guangxi Zhuang Autonomous Region. The WHO is set to decide on emergency use approval for two Chinese vaccines. What will this mean for the country's vaccine efforts? Technology drives China's massive courier industry forward with autonomous vehicles, but its workers. Are being left behind, and we take you on a visit to a souvenir shop in Xinjiang that's become a must visit for tourists. Welcome to China 24. I'm Wang Mengmang in Beijing. We begin our show in the south of China, where President Xi Jinping began a tour of the Guangxi Zhuang Autonomous Region on Sunday. He learned about the region's efforts to protect ethnic culture and the environment and promote innovation in its homegrown enterprises. Jiang Xiaoyi has our top story. President Xi visited Nanning City, the capital of Guangxi, on Tuesday. He took in cultural performances by the Zhuang ethnic group and learned more about efforts to protect their heritage and to promote ethnic solidarity. On Monday, President Xi visited a food processing zone in the city of Liuzhou, which is the base for local specialty luo si fen rice noodles. He said private enterprises should continue to strive, knowing they will have government support in challenging times. The party and state will support and provide guidance when private enterprises come across difficulties. Therefore, private enterprises should strive to thrive bravely. The special delicacy dates back to the 1980s, when night fairs started to emerge in Liuzhou, featuring river snails and sour bamboo shoots. The dish became a sensation in China and created jobs for over 300,000 people. It is exported to more than 20 countries and regions in the world. President Xi also stressed the importance of innovation, especially as it begins its 14th five-year plan for economic development. He made the remarks to the Liu Gong Group, a leading Chinese machinery manufacturer in Liuzhou. The equipment manufacturing industry is of paramount importance to high-quality development, where innovation plays a key role. Only through innovation can we become stronger and better. The Chinese president also called for efforts in ecological protection, as he toured a park in Guilin, which is famous for its karst hills and caves. Jiang Shaoyi, CGTN. While President Xi Jinping wraps up his inspection of South China's Guangxi Zhuang Autonomous Region, the president called for national unity at a museum on ethnic minorities in the regional capital Nanning. CGTN's Zhao Yunfei followed President Xi's path, visiting the same museum. China has five autonomous regions, and the regions have relatively higher population of ethnic minorities, and Guangxi is one of them. In the past six decades since its establishment, Guangxi's social and economic development shows the country's successful practice of regional ethnic autonomy system. Now, in his last day's inspection to Guangxi Zhuang Autonomous Region, President Xi Jinping paid a visit to its capital, Nanning, and he took a tour in the Anthropology Museum behind me and checked out Guangxi's unique ethnic culture. 
In this museum, we can see some layouts of intangible cultural heritage. Asian bronze drum, weaved embroidery, or folk handicrafts. These are the wisdom that pass through generations. Although Guangxi is called the Zhuang Autonomous Region, it has 12 long-dwelling ethnic minorities. The Yao, Miao, and Dong ethnic groups also make up the population. Over the past decades, Guangxi has taken pride in harmonious coexistence of its ethnic communities with very rare ethnic conflicts. President Xi has called for national unity in many occasions. He once said that the national rejuvenation requires all ethnic minorities to strive together. For Guangxi, the region's sustainable development is backed by the central government's campaign of rural revitalization. President Xi's three-day trip to Guangxi covered a wide range of topics, rural revitalization, ecological protection, and innovation in manufacturing. His first day in Guilin prioritized a new goal after the country won the battle of poverty eradication. He emphasized the importance of grassroots governance and ecological protection. To achieve that goal, President Xi said CPC members should hold loyalty and faith while serving the people. He cited a heroic battle of the Long March and emphasized the Red Army spirit. He said the secret to the success of the Chinese Revolution lies in ideals. On day two, President Xi underscored reform as he visited two distinct local businesses. Liu Zhou is a major industrial hub, and President Xi called for industrial modernization. He urged companies to develop their own core technologies. China's 14th five-year plan aims for high-quality development. President Xi said the central government will provide all efforts in support private enterprises. Due to its geographical advantage, Guangxi plays a bigger role in the Belt and Road Initiative. President Xi's inspection to Guangxi has also provided a framework for international cooperation. This year marks the 30th anniversary of China-ASEAN dialogue relations. President Xi promised that China should work with ASEAN to advance all-round cooperation. And Guangxi is a gate of China to the ASEAN for the prosperity in the region. Zhao Yunfei, CGTN, Nanning, Guangxi Zhuang Autonomous Region. And now let's get some more discussion, and I'm pleased to be joined here by Mr. Li Yong, our current affairs commentator. Always great to have you with us on our program, okay. Mr. Li. Uh, so President Xi, as we heard, uh, was encouraging private enterprises to grow. What is the significance for this call to the private sector, especially during the pandemic when so many private businesses have died off because of the economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic? I think the role of the uh, private sector is still there because, you know, in the past, I think it will continue to be after the pandemic, after they recovered from the pandemic, they contributed, for example, 50 percent of the um, uh, tax revenue, 60 percent of the GDP, 70 percent of the technological innovations, uh, very important, 80 percent of the China's employment, and lastly, the account for 90 percent of the total business uh, entities in China. So they play a very important role. So their role need to be reassured, which I think President Xi Jinping has done that. And they need to be encouraged in terms of their you know, uh, development in real economy. The, their economic presence need to be strengthened. And above all, I think they, are, can, they will continue to be trusted as part of us as part of the economy. I think those are the things, you know, uh, I think the, the President Xi Jinping's visit to this area, uh, the, you know, the message actually from you know, Xi Jinping's speeches, conversations, you know, with people and companies, you know, uh, uh, on this visit. Yeah. Uh, to what extent do you see uh, the private sector having the potential to help uh, drive China's economic recovery? Yeah, uh, I think, you know, given their role, I think they are, they are very important in terms of, uh, you know, achieving um, technological innovations. As I said, 70% you know, of the technology innovations are made by private sectors. And remember, we are facing a changing landscape. Uh, you know, in the past, we had an assumption that technological cooperation, you know, can, can be made uh, through global exchanges and so on. But today, the assumption does not seem to be as viable because there are certain restrictions and limitations and even sanctions. 
uh, you, you know, by some countries, you know. The, so technological breakthrough is very important in terms of achieving high quality uh, growth, yeah. as well as uh, you know China's effort to really achieve modernization. So that will require whole society effort to develop basic science, applied science, and, uh, uh, and, and, and of course, the proper technologies, advanced technologies. You know, and we are actually forced to develop a self-reliant type of a technological development. That's mm -hmm. actually the situation we are facing. Yeah, and achieving a technology sufficiency is one of the very important goals exactly. for China's 14th five-year plan. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mr. Li Yong, for your analysis. You're Appreciate welcome. it. While well, China and Germany are scheduled to hold their sixth government consultation panel on Wednesday, Chinese Pre Pre Premier Li Keqiang and German Chancellor Angela Merkel will host a virtual meeting. The panel was initiated on 2011 to enhance ties and expand cooperation. While well, Beijing denies allegations it withheld an invitation to India to attend a regional video conference on the COVID-19 pandemic. China has always maintained the idea of open and inclusive cooperation and is willing to invite all other South Asian countries, including India, to participate. We're also willing to continue our aid to countries in combating COVID-19 through bilateral channels. Now, this meeting was held among the foreign ministers of China, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Pakistan and Sri Lanka on Tuesday afternoon. The officials discussed cooperation in fighting COVID-19 and promoting economic recovery. The foreign ministry says China is coordinating with Chinese companies in obtaining oxygen supplies to meet India's demand. India is plagued with staggering numbers of COVID-19 cases and deaths. It has reported new infections of over 300,000 for six straight days. The World Health Organization is reviewing China's two biggest COVID vaccines for possible emergency use. Sinopharm is being considered first, followed by Sinovac next month. A decision could come within days, and as Tony Waterman explains from Brussels, getting the green light could make Sinopharm a major player in the fight to stamp out the virus. During this process, the WHO's technical advisory group will review all of the data available on the Sinopharm vaccine. They want to make sure that it's safe, that it's at least 50 percent effective, and that the manufacturing process is up to standard. Now, the WHO told me earlier that the vaccine will only be approved when it meets all the necessary criteria, and a decision is expected by the end of the week. Now, if Sinopharm gets the green light, the jab could very quickly be rolled out worldwide in what would be a massive victory for China's biotech industry. The WHO has backed only three other vaccines so far, Pfizer, BioNTech, AstraZeneca, and Johnson & Johnson. Getting the sign-off from the WHO would also give the Sinopharm vaccine global credibility after it faced criticism for not releasing enough data and after Beijing's top disease control official raised questions about the effectiveness of Chinese vaccines in general. Adding another vaccine to the global arsenal could also help revive the floundering COVAX facility. That's that program to provide vaccines to low-income countries. It has been struggling to get ample supplies amid export bans and hoarding. Uh, some countries in that program have yet to receive a single dose. Now, both Sinopharm and Sinovac, another Chinese vaccine that's up for review starting next week, have applied to be part of the COVAX facility. WHO approval may also open the door to wider distribution of Sinopharm in Europe, which right now is mostly limited to the Eastern Bloc. Tony Waterman, CGTN, Brussels. And now to some updates on China's COVID-19 inoculation campaign and its vaccine assistance to other nations. China has administered over 229 million vaccine doses in the country as of Monday. The Chinese Foreign Ministry has also expressed China's readiness to help India fight its COVID-19 outbreak as soon as possible. In the area of vaccine assistance, Egypt's drug authority said it had granted approval to China's Sinovac coronavirus vaccine for emergency use. Serbia has received a shipment of half a million doses of Sinopharm vaccine, bringing to 3 million the total amount received by the country so far. 
Pakistan took delivery of a third batch of donated COVID-19 doses. Chinese ambassador to Pakistan Nong Rong said the South Asian country has received the largest number of China-donated vaccines. And now let's get some more discussion. I'm pleased to be joined by Chen Xi, an assistant professor of health policy and economics at the Yale School of Public Health. And he joins us from Connecticut. Thank you so much, Professor, for joining us on China 24. Um, the WHO you, said it will decide on emergency approval use for Sinovac and Sinopharm vaccines in two weeks, although individual countries have given their own approval. Uh, so why this delay in WHO emergency use approval? Yeah, the review meeting is uh, proceeding as a schedule. The WHO's formal review meeting of the two Chinese vaccines for emergency listing is a pre prerequisite for their inclusion in the COVAX uh, global uh, vaccine distribution. Uh, the WHO has been actually in contact, in constant contact with the two complaints to prepare for the final review meeting. And the schedule of the meeting means that the reviewers will have the required information and, and they could finish their report before the, the dates. And we, we all know that China has um, uh, administered around uh, 230 million vaccines uh, domestically and also shipping uh, more than 100 million overseas. But this uh, formal review meeting will be a formal recognition of uh, Chinese vaccine because it will be uh, put in the global distribution. So that's why it's uh, important for this meeting to boost the confidence in the Chinese vaccine and accelerate the global distribution of the vaccines. Uh, so far, as you mentioned, that only three vaccines are on the basket of uh, a global distribution in COVAX, but uh, most of them are um, fitting uh, the context of more rich resources countries uh, with the cold chain distribution. But we know that the Chinese vaccine has uh, being able to address uh, more global uneven distributions because it's more on, uh, more affordable and accessible. It does not require the the, the very strict cold train uh, uh, logistics, and especially it will be very helpful for low resource countries and the tropical countries, and also the uh, countries in the uh, southern and hemisphere which are will be entering into the winter, where the winter usually means a surge in the virus outbreak. So time is life and death, it's very important. So the so it will also have uh, 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 a dom a domestic, uh, uh, the reopening of the, of the travel. So the reason for a little bit delay is that because uh, the, the vaccine uh, phase three trials has been, uh, do, uh, been done in multiple contexts, and every country has its own uh, trial context and uh, the researchers and the review committee has to uh, synthesize all the data from those uh, countries, especially pay special attention to older adults and people with medical conditions because they have to watch those more, more vulnerable population uh, when it's uh, being distributed uh, in the global uh, context. Yeah, and Professor, uh, we know that nations around the world are facing a severe shortage of vaccines. Uh, for example, India is the world's largest producer of vaccines, but because the country is now plagued with staggering numbers of COVID uh, cases and deaths, it will have to prioritize its own vaccine use first. So what will this WHO approval of China's Sinopharm and Sinovac vaccines mean for the country? And can we expect the approval to you know, resume global travel anytime soon? Yeah, this is a, a, a very important, especially given that the Western countries uh, has not been uh, having enough vaccine for its domestic market. So it will take time for them to distribute vaccine in the global scale. But uh, the, the time is very urgent because I was mentioning the Southern Hemisphere has, will be entering to winter very soon. And also, uh, part of the a large part of the uh, Western vaccine will not be uh, suitable for the uh, for the distributions in low resource countries and the countries with high temperature and also countries with a, a, a lower affordability of vaccines. So, cheap, so the cheaper Chinese vaccine and the vaccine without the cold chain uh, shipment will be helping those uh, low resource 
countries. So imagine that the, the vaccine has to be distributed to every corner of the world uh, with those uh, low resources, uh, like uh, villages in Tanzania. So yeah. every individual has to be uh, accessing those vaccines. So, uh, so a basket of vaccines that fit different environment, different uh, distribution uh, contexts will be very important. And given that China already been uh, administering uh, vaccines to the domestic market, as well as the international market, this will be a really important practice before its formal recognition and formal shipment distribution in the global context. Sure. Thank you so much for insights, uh, Professor Chen Xi. We really appreciate your time. The World Health Organization has designated the last week of April each year as World Immunization Week. Currently, over 190 countries are participants in a framework called the Global Vaccine Action Plan, or GVAP, which aims to prevent millions of deaths through, through more equitable access to vaccines. On Tuesday, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation held an online panel to discuss what can be done to promote the use of vaccines, during which Feng Zijian, Deputy Director of China CDC, had this to say about China's immunization efforts. For China, the task going forward is to fully eliminate measles and further reduce the infection rate of hepatitis B. We should also include more vaccines in the national immunization program, including those for HPV, HIV, and rotavirus. Our immunization targets should include people of different ages. However, there are a few challenges ahead of us. For example, new vaccines are becoming more and more expensive. So how can we ensure health equality? We need a better decision-making mechanism when it comes to immunization. You are watching China 24, coming up next. China's goal towards carbon neutrality by 2060 takes shape with practical plans to achieve peak emissions before 2030 in major industrial sectors. And the dilemma of the country's cutthroat logistics industry. CGTN. Facing the unknown is always difficult. In a world in turmoil, it's easy to lose orientation. But when the storms come, we have to see the possibilities. Reinvent. Find new opportunities. Discover a path forward. CGTN. See the difference. China's Environment Ministry says it's taking further steps and encouraging relevant industries to do the same to curb carbon emissions. CGTN's Huang Yue has the details. China's Ministry of Ecology and Environment says in order to realize the nation's goal of achieving peak carbon emissions before 2030, it has been working with relevant industries, electricity, steel and petrochemistry, to name a few, to map out a practical path. We are promoting the establishment of a national carbon emissions trading system. We've started with the electricity generation industry and plan to include other high-emission industries next. Building this system is an important way to curb carbon emissions. Li says before carbon emissions do finally peak, controlling carbon intensity, the amount of carbon dioxide emissions the country produces per unit of GDP, is a key starting point. Starting from carbon intensity is in line with China's real situation. Many countries around the world have also put intensity targets first and foremost. In fact, China's greenhouse gas emissions are still growing. 
controlling carbon intensity can better balance emissions reduction with economic development. China's carbon intensity had decreased by 48.4 percent by the end of 2020 compared with 2005. The country is now working on formulating an action plan for peaking carbon dioxide emissions before 2030. Li says, in addition to upgrading traditional industries and tapping into renewable energies, China is also pushing forward legislation on climate change. China has committed to moving from carbon peak to carbon neutrality from 2030 to 2060, 30 years in much shorter time span than many developed countries might take. The official said cooperation across a broad range of areas is significant for China to fulfill this commitment. Huang Yue, CCTN, Beijing. Chinese lifestyle service and food delivery giant Meituan has launched its new generation self-designed driverless delivery vehicles in Beijing. The company says the vehicles are big improvements over earlier models in terms of automation, carrying capacity, and cruising range. The move comes as the Chinese capital rolls out policies to promote business applications of self-driving technology. Meituan started piloting its autonomous logistics service in February to reduce human contact and possible virus transmission during the COVID-19 pandemic. So far, the company said that it has sent orders to customers from over 20 residential communities in Beijing using autonomous delivery vehicles. And now let's get to know more about Meituan's new generation delivery vehicle. It's around 156 meters centimeters tall and weighs 500 kilograms, and also it can run a bit faster than bicycle. Meituan says one vehicle can drive about 80 kilometers without recharging, and it can carry up to 150 kilograms of goods, enabling it to make several deliveries per trip. Now the vehicle is also sensitive to obstacles in its surroundings within the radius of more than 150 meters. And Meituan is not the only pioneer in autonomous logistics services. In September 2020, Alibaba unveiled its autonomous logistics robot, which plans delivery routes, identifies obstacles, and predicts pedestrians' intended movements. And in 2018, JD.com launched its first-generation logistics drone, codenamed the JDY 800, which can carry over 800 kilograms of cargo. While autonomous delivery methods are seeing growth, most deliveries still rely on manpower. Last year's pandemic boosted online shopping in China, but tens of thousands of delivery workers have not benefited from the boom. CGTN's Wang Tianhui has the story. 昨天我要了快递，八十一号。It's the hardworking carriers that serve as the solid foundation for smooth logistics in China, supporting its massive scale of online shopping and deliveries in as short a time as possible. But many say that even as their workload increases, their salaries have not, and they're even seeing a decline in their paycheck. 快递太不容易了。三个月这么大袋子，这么大的一个袋子，到六楼，挣了三块九毛钱。It's difficult when the hard work doesn't pay off. Data shows the delivery company's charge dropped from about four dollars per package in 2007 to a dollar and a half in 2020. Experts say that's mainly because of the surging demand, which is driving vicious competition. 由于市场上。It's hard to raise the fee due to the intense competition, but the costs have been rising fast. So when companies try to internally cut costs, many decided to pay less to workers. Deliveries in China have surged to an annual average of 10 billion items a year, 80 percent of which are from online shopping. China Post Bureau anticipates the annual delivery items will surpass 95 billion this year. But the boom in deliveries does not pose any advantage to the couriers. In 2020, nearly half of the delivery workers made less than 5,000 yuan. That's about $770 a month, much lower than the national average income. And more than half of them have to deliver over 100 packages a day. Experts warn that squeezing the income of delivery workers will ultimately impact the entire business environment negatively.
and they must find ways towards a more sustainable model. The delivery industry must transform towards integrated logistics and extend their service chains. They also need to further associate their market with high-value added products such as medicine, cold chain products. In that way, they can be more sustainable. Some delivery companies that promoted themselves with extremely low fees have now been punished. But at the end of a long, tiring working day for the delivery man, how to put more money into their pockets and keep the business environment running optimally are the key challenges to be faced. Wang Tianhui, CGTN. And now let's get some more discussions here. I'm joined by Mr. Yang Hangjun, a professor in transport and logistics at the University of International Business and Economics. Welcome, Professor, to China 24. So first of all, let's circle back to the autonomous delivery first. Machines replacing humans. What is your assessment of its future? So uh, currently, uh, driverless delivery is still at the starting stage. Compared with the traditional menu delivery, autonomous driverless delivery is still very limited. Uh, in my opinion, the situation will not change in the short run, see, at least for the next two or three years. Now, uh, first, compared with the current menu delivery, the cost of autonomous delivery vehicles is actually much higher from research and development, production, operation, and maintenance. And second, now, the high precision map data required by autonomous delivery vehicles and the complex road conditions are big challenges for the current driverless technology. However, in the long run, driverless delivery is necessary and will be the future. Now, first, with the decline of the labor force in the future, the automation equipment to replace the human beings to do the delivery is an inevitable trend. Second, the development of technology, the Internet, the Internet of Things, big data, AI, continue to develop, leading to more efficient and intelligent driverless delivery vehicles. The third, there's a huge potential market, the explosive growth and the larger scale of the e-commerce market and also the takeout market has provided enough market scope you now for the development of logistics technology innovations such as driverless delivery vehicles. Yeah, and also, Professor, uh, to the second issue that we brought up in the segment, how can the country address the problems brought by vicious competition? Now, companies were lowering their prices for courier services and hurting the delivery workers as a result. Uh, how do we ensure that the delivery workers are paid properly? Yeah, uh, as you pointed out, you know, in recent years, the price was in the you know, delivery industries have intensified. Uh, the data show that you know, the aggregate delivery fees declined dramatically right, uh, from like $4 per piece to like about $1.5 per piece. Um, so you now the excessive price competition will not only disrupt you know, the normal order of the market, but also the development of the industry. Uh, so I think like, you know, the following measures might uh, be taken to protect the rights and interests of the you know, delivery workers. The first, I think we, we can introduce legislation to prohibit career companies from engaging in malicious price wars and to impose heavy penalties on violators. The second, we also can increase the minimum wage standards for the employees. The third, legislation also can be introduced to guarantee uh, career companies to provide the labor contracts for many workers. Nowadays, about only 10% of these employees have a formal labor contract. And uh, finally, we also can provide some trainings for these employees to help them to improve their professional skills. So then they can make more income. All right, thank you so much for your analysis, Professor Yang Hangjun. Always great to talk to you. And now here's a quick look at what else is happening across China. China has published a landform survey report on the Diaoyu Islands and islands adjacent to it in the East China Sea. The survey obtained new terrain data, including data on waters up to 30 meters or less in depth. 
the report also made large-scale topographical thematic maps of the Diaoyu Islands. Beijing says the data shows that the Diaoyu Islands belong to China. Authorities have issued a warning to residents in northern China over strong dust storms on Tuesday. These come as the northwestern regions of Xinjiang and Inner Mongolia experience sandstorms. On the digital front, one of China's tech and e-commerce giants, JD.com, is now paying some of its staff in digital yuan. The company is partnering with the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China to deposit the digital income. This is part of China's plans over the past few months to shift to digital currency. And when we return here on China 24. We take you on a visit to a souvenir shop in Xinjiang that's become a must visit for tourists. Each day, there are millions of stories. Each one can open new perspectives, new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there. To see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you. All around the world. All around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN. See the difference. I see a country on the move. There is my opportunity. Is it good to change so fast? Yes, but it's a challenge. We have one foot in the future. But we never forget our past. We need to talk to one another. And listen. More than a billion voices telling their stories. Rediscovering China, only on CGTN. In this episode, we'll follow the lives of three ethnic Yao women, a dance instructor, a traditional brocade embroiderer, and the guardian of a written script exclusively for women as they go about fulfilling their dreams. Let's turn to Xinjiang's Turpin City. A collection shop has become a must-visit spot for tourists. The crowded store, which is packed with antiques, is not only a piece of reminiscence, but it also presents the evolution of economic and cultural exchanges between various ethnic groups in the region. Yiming Gajiti has been collecting antiques and historical objects since the 1980s. Outside his shop in Turban, in northwest China's Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, stand two 3.5-meter-tall copper kettles purchased eight years ago. Inside are beautiful containers, wooden flower sifters, and farm tools. Gajiti says every old item is a record of the life of its time. We have things from many ethnic groups, including the Han, Hui and the Kazakh, so that everyone can understand the history and the culture of each ethnic group. Gajiti's house has over 100,000 items. In the shop, clocks, radio receivers, and other historical collections are neatly displayed. It's become a popular destination. I really admire Uncle Yi Ming and his family. Because of their persistence in collecting these items, we can see these distinctive objects and closely feel the changes of time. 
Gajiti is now over 70 years old. He says he will pass on the legacy to his son to keep history alive for the younger generation. Zhang Meiyuan, CGTN. And before we go, let's take a look at what's trending across China's social media. Out of love for traditional Chinese culture and ancient architecture, a young woman in Zhejiang Province has built a pavilion in the style of the Forbidden City in the backyard of her house. She has no professional background, but from carpentry to painting, she learned all the techniques and did all the work on her own. In Shandong Province, the delivery man passed out. While working in the rain, fortunately, a policewoman found him during patrol. She shielded him with an umbrella until the ambulance came. Body camera from the policewoman. Last but not least, a lamb that has inspired many people online died on Sunday. It was born in Inner Mongolia 40 days ago with two deformed hind legs. Much to the breeder's surprise, it learned to walk on its two front legs and inspired netizens. The breeder said it had a very strong will. And that'll do it for today's show. You're always welcome to drop us a line at China24 at cgtn.com. We want to leave you with images of migratory birds settling in a wetland in northeast China's Jilin Province. I'm Wang Mama in Beijing. Thanks for watching and stay with us for Global Business with Lily Liu coming up next. Hi there, and welcome to your weather forecast. Here in China, under the influence of a new blast of cold air, we've seen some sandy and dusty weather across many places up in the north at the start of this week. And the car behind is still a Mongolian cyclone. And as we get into Wednesday, conditions are likely to gradually ease up with better visibility. And at the same time, your rainfall will continue to favor places south of the Yangtze River, with localized soaking downpours in part of Yunnan, Guangdong, as well as Fujian province. Which, out of question, will help to ease the current drought. But on the other hand, soaking downpours may also cause some new problems like flooding. And then, as we get into Thursday, this round of rain will push further toward the south before gradually moving out of the picture. And a closer look at some of the major cities: you're partly sunny for cities like Guangzhou and Fuzhou, with daily highs in the upper 20s. Things are likely to trend higher as we get into Friday, with probably daily highs around 30 degrees. Then, about the maximum temperature. Actually, during the period from Friday to Sunday, many places across China may have a chance to see the warmest conditions so far this year with a significant round of warm-up. For example, here is 30 for the day high in Rumqi and Zhengzhou on this Friday, 27 in Ninchuan. Certainly quite warm, even a little bit hot. Be sure to dress accordingly.
Chinese President Xi Jinping begins a tour of southern China's Guangxi Zhuang Autonomous Region. China's industrial profit surges nearly 140 percent in the first three months of 2021. We break down the numbers for you. And plus, the European Parliament prepares to vote on a post-Brexit EU-UK trade deal. Well, it is good evening from Beijing and welcome to this edition of Global Business here on CGTN. I'm Lily Lu. We begin in south of China where President Xi Jinping began a tour of the Guangxi Zhuang Autonomous Region on Sunday. He learned about the region's efforts to protect ethnic culture and the environment and also promote innovation in its homegrown enterprises. Jiang Shaoyi has the story. President Xi visited Nanning City, the capital of Guangxi, on Tuesday. He took in cultural performances by the Zhuang ethnic group and learned more about efforts to protect their heritage and to promote ethnic solidarity. On Monday, President Xi visited a food processing zone in the city of Liuzhou, which is the base for local specialty luosif and rice noodles. He said private enterprises should continue to strive, knowing they will have government support in challenging times. The party and state will support and provide guidance when private enterprises come across difficulties. Therefore, private enterprises should strive to thrive bravely. The special delicacy dates back to the 1980s, when night fears started to emerge in Liuzhou. Featuring river snails and sour bamboo shoots, the dish became a sensation in China and created jobs for over 300,000 people. It is exported to more than 20 countries and regions in the world. President Xi also stressed the importance of innovation, especially as it begins its 14th five-year plan for economic development. He made the remarks to the Liu Gong Group, a leading Chinese machinery manufacturer in Liuzhou. The equipment manufacturing industry is of paramount importance to high-quality development where innovation plays a key role. Only through innovation can we become stronger and better. The Chinese president also called for efforts in ecological protection as he toured a park in Guilin, which is famous for its karst hills and caves. Jiang Shaoyi, CGTN. Chinese Premier Li Keqiang and German Chancellor Angela Merkel will co-chair the sixth round of intergovernmental consultations via video link on Wednesday. Earlier today, Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbing said the meeting will focus on climate change, the COVID-19 pandemic and economic cooperation. And Chinese State Councillor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi shared proposals on how to advance the post-pandemic economic recovery and regional cooperations in the future with six counterparts in South Asia via a video call. We should oppose attempts to label the virus and politicize the pandemic or to prevent international cooperation in fighting COVID-19. Also, we should continue to support the positive role of the World Health Organization in the fight against the pandemic. All countries should work together to build a community of human health. China is implementing President Xi Jinping's pledge to make vaccines a global public good, carrying out vaccine cooperation on a global scale. We are willing to promote vaccine cooperation with other countries via flexible means, such as free aid, commercial procurement and production under the framework of the Six-Nation Cooperation Mechanism. In order to improve the Belt and Road Initiative and help major regional countries towards recovery, China proposes the establishment of a China-South Asian Poverty Reduction and Development Cooperation Center. China is committed to safeguarding the international system with the United Nations at its core, an international order based on international law resisting illegal acts such as willful interference in other countries' internal affairs and coercing others to pick sides. In the first quarter of this year, China's investment and cooperation with countries along the Belt and Road Initiative maintained steady growth. Now the contracted value of newly signed projects with countries along the route increased nearly 20 percent on the year. And some 3,400 trains also traveled between China and Europe during this period. That's a jump of 75 percent on the year. Well, the boost comes as the first direct freight trains from southwest China to the Dutch capital Amsterdam and British port city Flextel departed, marking the formal opening of two more stops on the transportation hub. Marco reports. 
two freight trains carrying electronic devices and medical supplies have left for Amsterdam and Felixstowe on the eighth anniversary of the Chengdu Europe Railway Express. They are the latest additions to the now 61 lines of the Chengdu International Railway Port, which plays a vital part in building southwest China into a westbound gateway for foreign trade. Eastbound cargo is also growing uh, very rapidly, so we found a lot of new clients for that connection. We started first with uh, once a week, and currently we are already running the train with uh, four times a week. And that's not uh, only uh, milk powder, but it's also beer and uh, cars. The advantages of rail transport have been further recognized by businesses in foreign trade. For example, the cost is only one eighth that of air freight, and the time needed is only one third that of maritime shipping. Rail is much more reliable, especially in the post-epidemic era. This railway port not only connects businesses in the Chongqing Chengdu area with customers in Europe, but also other Chinese cities. So far, the port has cooperated with 20 other transportation hubs to facilitate internal economic circulation. On Monday, the Chengdu Railway Port signed cooperation terms with one of the largest shipping ports in East China, the Zhoushan Port. It's part of plans to optimize logistic services for businesses in East Asia. Mark Ke, CGTN, Chengdu. Now some fresh economic data. Latest data from China's National Bureau of Statistics shows that industrial profits surged almost 140 percent in the first three months of this year. Officials say that、uh, among all 41 industrial categories, 16 witnessed triple-digit growth, and strong profits in raw materials manufacturing and processing industries helped to drive overall industrial profit growth as demand picked up. Profits of equipment and high-tech manufacturers also maintained strong growth thanks to sustained economic recovery both in China and the global market. Chinese lifestyle service and food delivery giant Meituan has launched its new generation self-designed driverless delivery vehicles in Beijing. Hi. Well, the company said that the vehicles were a big improvement over earlier models in terms of automation, carrying capacity, and cruising range. But the move came as the Chinese capital rolled out policies to promote business applications of self-driving technologies. And Meituan started piloting its autonomous logistics service in February to reduce human contact and possible COVID-19 transmission during the pandemic. And so far, the company said it has sent orders to customers from over 20 residential communities in Beijing using autonomous delivery vehicles. And while autonomous delivery methods are seeing growth, most deliveries still rely on manpower. Last year, the pandemic has boosted online shopping in China, but tens of thousands of delivery workers have not really benefited from the boom. CGTN's Wang Qianhui has more. Good morning. I've ordered. Quickly, eight twenty-one. Ah, ah, I'm on the line. Okay. It's the hardworking carriers that serve as the solid foundation for smooth logistics in China. Supporting its massive scale of online shopping and deliveries in as short a time as possible, but many say that even as their workload increases, their salaries have not, and they're even seeing a decline in their paycheck. Quite not easy. Three months, such a big bag, such a big bag, six months, it's three hundred and nine dollars. It's difficult when the hard work doesn't pay off. Data shows the delivery company's charge dropped from about four dollars per package in 2007 to a dollar and a half in 2020. Experts say that's mainly because of the surging demand, which is driving vicious competition. It's hard to raise the fee due to the intense competition, but the costs have been rising fast. So when companies try to internally cut costs, many decided to pay less to workers. Deliveries in China have surged to an annual average of 10 billion items a year, 80 percent of which are from online shopping. China Post Bureau anticipates the annual delivery items will surpass 95 billion this year, but the boom in deliveries does not pose any advantage to the couriers. In 2020, nearly half of the delivery workers made less than 5,000 yuan. That's about $770 a month, much lower than the national average income.
and more than half of them have to deliver over a hundred packages a day. Experts warn that squeezing the income of delivery workers will ultimately impact the entire business environment negatively, and they must find ways towards a more sustainable model. The delivery industry must transform towards integrated logistics and expand their service chains. They also need to further associate their market with high-value added products such as medicine, cold chain products. In that way, they can be more sustainable. Some delivery companies that promoted themselves with extremely low fees have now been punished. But at the end of a long, tiring working day for the delivery man, how to put more money into their pockets and keep the business environment running optimally are the key challenges to be faced. Wang Tianhui, CGTN. Well, the global auto industry is going electric, and one of China's largest brands have entered the race. Tech company Huawei said they are looking to work with automakers that support smart driving. Ao Xiaochen explains. The global auto industry is going electric. It is an inevitable trend as major economies in the world are likely to ban the sales of petrol and diesel cars within the next two decades. But it doesn't mean life is getting any easier for those who started as e-car makers. I'm talking about the likes of Neo, Xpeng, and Li Auto. Huawei's recent entry into the e-car race has shaken up the market, pressuring the stock prices of Neo, Xpeng, and Li Auto. That reflected investors' expectations on heating competition in the e-car space, and Huawei is likely to take home a large chunk of the market. Huawei is not yet an automaker. The company says it wants to be an auto supplier to work with auto brands on smart and electric cars. The company has been studying electric mobility and auto technology since 2012. This year, it has started to commercialize the auto parts and solutions it has developed and install them on cars. Its solutions and products range from intelligent driving, battery to vehicle cloud and connectivity. It has co-created a car with Bayek under the Arc Fox brand, and will collaborate with Chang'an and GAC Group next. The company said at the Shanghai Auto Show earlier this month that it hoped to integrate China's supply chain resources into its business. Here, I want to talk about this company's resilience. Huawei used to be the world's second largest smartphone maker and supplier, but due to Washington's protectionist measures, coupled with many unfavorable factors such as the pandemic. Its sales fell year on year. However, Huawei shifted their attention to investing R&D that could hedge against external risks in the future, like its own Hongmeng operating system. The system still has much room for improvement, but it is expected to become a strong competitor of the Android system. Huawei is also working on how to maximize the value of 5G network-related products and solutions. It is also looking at 5.5G networks for future growth opportunities. Huawei has signed more than 140 commercial contracts for the deployment of 5G networks and has 330 million users, including individual users and organizations such as ports, coal mines, factories, and medical centers. Self-sufficiency is Huawei's priority, as the company reiterates over and over again in different media interviews. Analysts say Huawei will play a big role in China's carbon-neutral goals. Huawei will provide customers with more eco-friendly and energy-efficient services and systems. Huawei will also launch two satellites jointly with China Aerospace and China Mobile in July this year. So the market will continue to pay close attention to Huawei's future moves. If the company can prove it will continue to be a sustainable, responsible, and innovative company, the market will reward the firm with reasonable stock prices and good sales and profits. You're watching Global Business on CGTN. Still to come on the program, we have the latest as the European Parliament votes on a post-Brexit EU-UK trade deal. Prevention is the best kind of medicine, and health checkup services are rapidly gaining popularity in China as a result. More and more people, you'll see the adoption rate is accelerating. Listed on Nasdaq in 2014, but why did Icon bid to privatize just one year later? For this, like check up, like a business, mostly actually it's like Asia business model. This kind of concept to any comprehensive check up mostly happen in Asia. A dropout from Harvard University in the 1990s. Why such a bold move? The reason I decided to leave Harvard because at that time. 
internet start to boom in China. So I came back with Charles Zhang. He's the founder of Sohu.com. Meet Zhang Ligang, founder and CEO of Icon Healthcare Group. Only on BizTalk. Only on CGTN. Now, time for a quick check on the European stock markets, where we see things fail to make headways today. Uh, that follows earnings from blue chip companies like HSBC and BP. In the meantime, UBS became the latest bank to disclose a hit from dealings with a failed U.S. investment firm Archigos. Now, let's get more details as we cross over to Matt Goodrick in London. Happy Tuesday, Matt. Please go uh, walk us through some of those earnings numbers、uh, that came out today, and what do they tell us about the state of business and the economy in Europe? Well, it does seem that traders are doing two things today, Lily.、Uh, firstly, trying to digest a slew of earnings,、uh, which have, if anything, actually muddied the waters rather than given a clear sense of direction. And secondly,、uh, feeling a bit jittery ahead of the U.S. Federal Reserve policy meeting later in the day. Now, as far as those earnings are concerned, there are a couple of real standouts I have to tell you about. UBS, as you mentioned, there being one. Now, the Swiss bank has taken a tumble after a reporting an unexpected $774 million hit from the collapse. Of the U.S. hedge fund Archie Goss,、uh, HSB. Uh, BC, I should say, is higher thanks to an upbeat quarterly profit as successful vaccine rollouts in its key markets promised a, a brighter economic outlook. While oil major BP also rose after、uh, first quarter profits soared thanks to stronger oil prices. Meanwhile, on the broader markets, there's a definite feeling of apprehension about today's Fed meeting. I have to say, on the one hand, there's a little doubt the stimulus taps will keep flowing for now, but the worry is the Fed could signal the largesse will come to an end thanks to a slew of good economic numbers. It's a judgment call for sure. Traders are just hoping the Fed makes the right call and, crucially, at the right time. Now, Matt, let's get the latest on the vote, which has been going on for hours on the EU-UK trade deal. We know the European Commission said that a trade agreement between the two will give each side some tools to ensure compliance with their trade and also cooperation agreements. As far as the EU is concerned, that they will not hesitate to use them. It sounds like a war of words is breaking out between the EU and the UK. What's that all about? And what are those tools that Ursula von der Leyen referred to? Yeah, you're right. It, it does、uh, sound like a bit of a threat from、uh, Brussels. The two sides haven't exactly been the best of friends, have they?、Uh, since the UK's full departure back in January,、uh, there's the problem of trade and a big fall in exports from the UK to continental Europe, and the issue with Northern Ireland. Basically, because the region is still a member of the single market, it has to be treated differently from the rest of the UK. And well, that's caused some. Unforeseen problems, such as a shortage of some food items, so、uh, the UK is ignoring some of the rules, and that's well, really enraged Brussels, which is、uh, taking legal action. Now, as for the tools available to each side, well, most of them are held by the 27. There's very、uh, little the UK can do to redress any disputes. A case in point today: the European Parliament votes on the trade agreement. While it's expected to go through on the nod, lawmakers could impose some barriers or indeed some sanctions. And the French government is threatening to limit the UK's financial services over road bumps on fishing rights. As far as the UK government is concerned, it's increasingly clear where the power lies. Lily, back to you. Well, great stuff. Thank you so much. Keep an eye on the updates for that. Thank you very much. That's Matt Goodrick for us in London. And let's、uh, get to some other business he- business headlines we're tracking at this hour. Major automakers and suppliers will press the、uh, U.S. Congress again today to address a global chip shortage that has impacted auto production around the world. Automakers have warned that the shortage could result in 1.3 million fewer vehicles built this year in the United States and disrupt production for another six months. Toyota said it will acquire Lyft's self-driving technology unit, that's a level five, for 550 million dollars. The acquisition will strengthen Toyota's research ability in autonomous driving and allow Lyft to focus more on its core ride-hailing business. And Blue Origin, which is a space rocket company backed by Amazon's Jeff Bezos, is formally challenging a 2.9 billion dollar moon lander contract awarded by NASA to rival Elon Musk's SpaceX. Blue Origin said it has filed a protest with the Federal Government Accountability Office, accusing NASA of moving the goalposts for contract bidders at the last minute. 
Japanese corporate culture is known for its after-work drinking parties and other social events, but the pandemic has put them on hold for more than a year now. This has dealt a heavy blow to the hospitality industry. One company, however, has adapted to the era of remote work by taking its catering business straight to people's homes. Finop Amoroso reports from Tokyo. Since the coronavirus pandemic arrived in Japan last year, office parties have moved online and party food comes in these boxes. Many of our customers use our service for welcome parties, end of year or general get-togethers. Some also order custom food boxes, adding their company logo or even requesting an original bowl to be included in the box. The hospitality industry in Japan has taken a heavy blow. Restaurant sales fell a record 15.1% year-on-year in 2020, according to the Japan Food Service Association. Many businesses have focused on takeout and delivery. Others have closed down. Before the pandemic, this company was running a corporate catering service that provided companies with meals to facilitate employee communication. But most large events were cancelled and their sales were almost completely wiped out. Looking for inspiration, they saw how work was moving online and so they came up with a solution. This food box is delivered directly to their customers' homes. It contains a selection of snacks and dishes, and it even comes with a choice of alcoholic or non-alcoholic drinks. The company says it can prepare and deliver meals for up to 20,000 people across the country to enjoy exactly the same thing at the same time. With other services like Uber Eats, there is a difference between regions. With people working remotely and moving back to their hometowns, eating the same food and sharing the same experiences increases their sense of unity and belonging. Demand for niche catering has taken off in the past year. Nompi says it counts several major corporations among its clients, with many IT companies in particular using its services. These businesses are ordering food boxes to bring together their different teams spread out across nationwide branches. Working from home might be here to stay. A recent Kyodo News survey of 110 large Japanese corporations found that over two-thirds are planning to maintain or expand levels of remote work. However, online meetings pose a challenge for team building and innovation. How much online participants talk will vary, and for those who don't speak much, it will impact their motivation. This could also impact productivity, However, Japan's work culture is known for its low levels of productivity, so I hope businesses will continue to make use of the advantages of hosting things online even after this pandemic. With Japan facing a fourth wave of coronavirus infections, more catering businesses are trying to reach people, and more corporations are hoping they can make online teamwork taste better. Phoebe Amoroso, CGTN, Tokyo. Counting down the days, California is eyeing mid-June for what is calling a full reopening after one year of coronavirus closures. And more than ever, the entertainment industry is keen to get back to business. Our Los Angeles correspondent Edith Tianzen checks out places that define the word fun theme parks. A popular local attraction in the city of Palmdale, Dry Town Water Park has literally been dry for over a year. With its entire 2020 season cancelled, its budget deficit has climbed to over $1 million. Being shut down, we're not running cabanas, we're not running birthday parties that the community has come to enjoy. Obviously, we're not open to enjoy the water park on the hot days. So, yeah, there was not any real revenue opportunities for us um, because of the closure in 2020. In the last 15 seasons, you know, there's not have been a season such as 2020 where we've been you know, asked to close and, you know, as of today, there's still no green light for 2021. While water parks continue planning for possible reopening this spring, California theme parks are already humming, welcoming visitors back on April 1st, though at significantly reduced capacity. For now, safety regulations make it quite a different experience. Ticket sales are now mostly online and limited, so while many people may enjoy shorter lines for a change, not all the rides are open. And long gone are the days of greeting costume characters or crowded parades, and no more snacking while standing in queues. And this new reality comes with new business models. 
Disneyland Resort in California has canceled annual passes that normally aim to attract visitors during off-season, a term that doesn't exist anymore. The company laid off over 32,000 employees in recent months during a time when its California park served as a vaccination site. It's estimated that um, the theme park and attractions industry lost five times more employees uh, last year on average than any other industry. The impact to the entire industry has been devastating. Um, it's estimated that in 2019, the industry generated uh, $25 billion. Last year, that dropped to $15 billion, a $10 billion uh, drop uh, loss. The world's largest theme park operator, though, is seeing explosive growth in its streaming services, fortuitously launched just before the pandemic. Those profits have helped offset the billions of losses in theme park revenues, but for the mid-range companies, it's a different story. SeaWorld, Six Flags, uh, they got big lines of credit to help them get through this, and, and a lot of the money that they've borrowed is going to need to be paid off. So that's going to potentially depress any capital improvements that they're going to be able to do for the next few years. Data that we've seen has shown that up to a third of the market will not consider a visit to a theme park in 2021, no matter what happens. Once a popular attraction for people of all ages, the theme park industry is now facing its toughest time, with its expansion in recent years now being replaced with what looks like years of recovery. It is Tian Shan, CGTN, Los Angeles. Now it's time to check in with our team in London and City in Europe's Lord Robin Dwyer is here for a preview of Global Business Europe at 1600 GMT. Robin, take it away. Thank you. Yes, coming up on Global Business Europe, earnings season is in full swing. Shares in the banking giant HSBC and the oil firm BP are rallying. We'll tell you why some investors are excited about a pandemic recovery. Also on the show, the European Parliament is set to approve its Brexit trade deal with the UK. But Brussels is warning London the deal has real teeth and it will bite if any rules are broken. All that and more on Global Business Europe. A lot to expect. Thank you so much. That's Robin Dwyer for us in London. And that will do for this edition of Global Business here in Beijing. I'm Lily Lu. Bye for now. China Global Television Network.
Russia lists the United States as a country committing unfriendly actions towards Russia shortly after the U.S. expelled Russian diplomats. Where does China fit in this latest U.S.-Russia spat? And Chinese President Xi Jinping emphasized China's carbon neutrality target at a recent virtual climate summit. How does China intend to reach this ambitious target? Welcome to The Point, an opinion show coming to you from Beijing. I'm Li Xin. The U.S. is certainly on the list. The Russian foreign ministry was referring to a newly signed decree as the latest countermeasure to U.S. sanctions imposed in April. However, against the backdrop of the tit-for-tat confrontations, both officials of the U.S. and Russia agree to stay in touch and are expecting a presidential summit in the summer. Were the U.S.'s sanctions a symbolic move? What are the odds of face-to-face -face talks between the leaders of the two countries. I'm pleased to be joined today by Victor Kao, Chair P Professor at Suzhou University, and from Moscow by Dmitry Babbage, Political Analyst at Sputnik International. Gentlemen, welcome to The Point. Now, Thank the you. U.S., as I said, issued an executive order with sanctions on April the 15th in regard to the so-called harmful foreign activities of the government of Russia, including Russia's alleged election interferences and cyber activities. And as pointed out by some media outlets, the cause of the action of the sanctions also includes Russia's military buildup in Ukraine. Mr. Babich, on exactly on what basis were these sanctions issued? Are they justified? Well, they are certainly not justified. Uh, first, uh, you know, even your phrase, uh, Russian military buildup in Ukraine. The Russian troops uh, in the last few weeks were amazing not in Ukraine, but on the border, because uh, because of the military exercise that Russians had, and second, uh, because of the threat of a new spiral of a civil war inside Ukraine. So, uh, you know, when the United States moves its troops and has military exercises right next to Russia's border, you know, uh, thousands of miles away from the United States, uh, we don't say that this is uh, something criminal, that this is uh, uh, unacceptable, and we don't uh, expel American diplomats uh, or impose sanctions because of that. As for the elections, it's just laughable because there was absolutely no evidence given of any Russian interference. The, the Americans didn't even say in what way Russians could uh, uh, damage elections. I mean, uh, Russians didn't steal the ballots. They didn't fill the ballot boxes. Uh, as for activity in the social networks, I mean, you or me, we can talk to our friends in the United States via social networks. We can express our opinions. Maybe in this way, we will persuade our American friends to vote for some candidate or another candidate. But it doesn't mean that we interfere. <laughs> it's just uh, the reality of the new world that people can communicate uh, between various uh, continents, and the American government has been pushing for it officially for many years, you know, open world where people can exchange opinions. Yes, foreigners can uh, tilt uh, public opinion in various countries now because uh, people mm -hmm. have access to internet, people have access to television, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that something criminal happened and that uh, the elections are not free or they are not, uh, uh, you know, independent anymore. Mm. So uh, I just don't see how how the, uh, Russia could do something so wrong that the United States uh, describes in its accusation. Mm. The executive order, the U.S. presidential executive order, brought the expulsion of 10 Russian diplomats and economic sanctions against uh, uh, certain Russian individuals and entities. However, U.S. President Joe Biden later explained that I cho chose to be proportionate. He said that the U.S. is not looking to kick off a cycle of escalation and conflict with Russia. We want a stable, predictable relationship. Um, Victor, how do you understand such seemingly um, contradicting moves? Is the U.S. merely bluffing to Russia or hoping that a symbolic move will bring Russia to the negotiating table? No, I think uh, what's appalling is that at the very core, the United States doesn't seem to have the minimum respect for Russia as a great country, as the, one of the strongest military powers, 
as a country which has made a tremendous amount of uh, contribution to the establishment of the current international order after sustaining the heaviest losses and sacrifices in the Second World War. And the United States has forces which seem to be very eager to continue to dismember uh, Russia as it is. This is, I think, the root cause of all the frictions or confrontation between the United States and Russia. Uh, purely from the Chinese perspective, we fully respect Russia as a great country. We fully respect the Russian people as a great nation. And we think we need to deal with Russia with equality and mutual respect. And we oppose any appalling pressures exercised by the United States on Russia. As for the sanctions, I don't think any sanctions against a great country, a strong country like Russia will work. It will be counterproductive. It will really poison the relations between Russia and the United States, and eventually it will turn the American people as a loser. And uh, uh, it will also poison the atmosphere for international cooperation, especially involving major powers like the United States, China, mm. and Russia at the very top in the very difficult international situation mm. as mankind is faced with. Mr. Babbage, um, on a specific term, however, uh, how are these U.S. moves impacting Russia? Is there any impact at all? I mean, the chief executive of a Russian financial service group said that the impact of the economic sanctions are limited. How do you see it? Well, there was a certain slowdown in the economic growth of Russia, which was phenomenal in the early 2000s. Uh, experts argue how much that uh, sanctions uh, uh, produced this effect or how much it was produced by the fall uh, on the commodity prices, I mean, on the oil prices and the prices for natural gas. But certainly it's not a disaster for Russia. I mean, if you come to Moscow or to St. Petersburg or even if you come to small towns, uh, you won't see problems in, uh, in uh, uh, you know, food uh, or uh, 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 any kind of commodities that the population needs. So maybe some big companies have lost some of their revenues. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, rich people are now feeling unsafe about their assets abroad, but it's very unwise on the side of the United States to demonize uh, Russia's leader, President Vladimir Putin, and to alienate uh, the, the Russian elite. Uh, because, yes, like in any country, elite is important in Russia. And when they feel threatened by the United States, when uh, the United States and the European Union include them in various sorts of blacklists, uh, I think it damages the United States and the EU much more than it damages Russia, because these people just move their capitals back to Russia and they concentrate on the country's development. They could be much more useful for the West if okay. the West just left them in peace. Mm. Well, well, Russia has, uh, as I said, uh, announced this list of country committing unfriendly acts towards Russia. Victor, how do you look at this measure? The, you know, how severe, how strong is that a measure? And what possible impact will it cast against the United States? Well, I truly believe if any country pushes Russia around, Russia will push back. There is no doubt about it, and Russia probably will reinforce the pushback against any country which unrightfully pushes Russia. And I think uh, this will, again, make the relations between the United States and Russia further deteriorate, and I hope they will not deteriorate to such a point of no return, because if it gets even worse, you are talking about a potential uh, face down or showdown between these two largest uh, military powers in the world and this does not spell well for mankind as a whole. So we would urge the United States and Russia to reconsider their very tough positions against each other and hopefully there will be uh, improvement of relations between these two countries or even a rapprochement because I firmly believe if Russia and the United States can deal with each other with equality and mutual respect, it's more deserving for these two very mm. great countries in the world. Finally, some Chinese experts have pointed out that China should have a clear head about possible situation in the future, meaning potential U.S. Ec economic sanctions against uh, China, the state, not just Chinese companies. Victor, uh, do you agree with such precautions? Do you think China um, should be 
you know, cautious about this? Well, I think precaution is always a good virtue, and China is not an exception. However, I think we need to be uh, very much looking at the substance of the issue between us. China and the United States has the largest uh, trading volume in the world, and the United States and the Chinese economy are very much integrated with each other. There are dangerous or even evil forces in the United States which want to drive for a complete disconnection between China and the United States. But that's against the fundamental interest of the American people and the Chinese people. And I don't think they can achieve their goal, however they mislabel that. Mm. Therefore, I think I personally have great confidence in the continued uh, uh, status of China-U.S. relations because you are talking about uh, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of people across China and the United States working together with a common goal for maximizing benefits for both the Chinese people and the American people. So while we need to guard against these very dangerous politicians in the United States, which miscalculate and mis which misguide mm -hmm. the American people, we also need to have confidence right. that yeah. no one can really disrupt China-U.S. relations at the very core. Yeah. Well, many thanks to my guests from China and Russia, of course. The opinion of uh, the uh, Americans and uh, Europeans are missing here, or Western Europeans, I should say. But uh, at least you get the Chinese and Russian perspective, some Chinese and Russian perspective. Many thanks to Victor and Dmitry. Thank you. We'll take a, a quick break. And when we come back, Chinese President Xi Jinping emphasized China's carbon, carbon neutrality target at a recent virtual climate summit. How does China intend to reach this ambitious target? Uh, earlier, I talked to Dr. Fang Li, director of the World Resources Institute, China. Stay tuned. Each day, there are millions of stories. Each one can open new perspectives, new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there to see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you all around the world, all around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN. See the difference. Making sense of the overwhelming wave of information means cutting through the noise to shine a light on the heart of the story and making room for new perspectives. True understanding means the ability to see events from more than one side. I'm Liu Xin, and this is The Point. Chinese President Xi Jinping gave a speech on China's commitment to fighting climate change at the Virtual Leaders Summit on Climate hosted by U.S. President Joe Biden on April the 22nd and 23rd. President Xi emphasized China's commitment to green development using a people-centered approach. He also reiterated the commitment made last year that China will strive to peak its carbon dioxide emissions before 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality before 2060. How significant are China's efforts and pledges, and how does it intend to fulfill its future commitments? I'm pleased to be joined in Beijing by Dr. Fang Li, director of the World Resources Institute, China. Dr. Fang, welcome to The Point. Now, President Xi emphasized that China will strive to peak carbon dioxide emissions before 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality before 2060. But at the same time, China's reliance and use of coal keeps going up. So how exactly does China intend to achieve those goals, given its population and its reliance on coal energy for its economic, uh, for its economic growth? I think very nice to meet you. And to be the chief representative of the China Office of World Resources Institute in China, the most frequent question I've been asked is how China can achieve that target, the new pledge 
that is an ambition pledge, mm -hmm. since it's used the shortest time or shorter than most of the developed countries mm -hmm. from picking to neutrality. Uh, if we reveal that the development of the China economy in the past four decades, we can find that China is really unique to achieve the target. China is really good at making the master plan and break out the master plan into stages and also reallocate the task to the local level and set up the uh, local level competition. We can see the successful story in terms of economic development. So can this harness in uh, picking carbon picking and carbon neutrality? That is a, a very good story we can learn from the past. And the local competition, as our perspective, can, in, can encourage the local innovations and also through systematic or the designed uh, pilot can find the new ways or measures mm. and successful experiences can scale up in the national level. So that is a really impressive. Now, and yeah. beside of that, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Well, go ahead. You wanted to add something. Yeah, beside of that, China is a really unique, have a one organization called NDRC, National Development Reform Committee. The daily work or the main task of that organization is think about the reform. So reform is always on the road of the whole process of the uh, development of the China. So that is a really unique of the world. And China uh, can China is in the position that can play more important role in carbon neutrality since so far till now there's no any country achieve the target of carbon neutrality. Mm. So it's a systematic change. China can have a chance in this process. Yeah, we'll talk about that in just a moment. But first, let's let's talk about what President Xi said that China will strictly limit the increase in coal consumption uh -huh. and mm -hmm. start phasing it down from 2026. Um, so basically, over the next couple of years, the use of coal will be strictly limited, but it will still be increasing, and China only start phasing it down from 2026, basically from the next five-year plan, five-year plan number 15. However, according to the International Energy Agency, coal demand is on rise, on course to rise in 2021 by 4.5%, with China uh, leading the 80% the of growth worldwide. Basically, China is projected to account about 50% of global demand in, uh, in coal demand. So why does China not start facing it down earlier? Uh, you know, at the shifting the economy or shifting the whole system from high carbon intensity economy to green and lower carbon intensity economy, it's a need time. Uh, WRI, as one of the think tank and do tank, we take over not only the pure environment issue, we also look after the just transition, think about the social issues. When the steps go so fast, how about the, the staff or employment in the coal sector, the whole supply chain? And the number of the employment in coal uh, sectors is around uh, 2.7 million. So that is a huge number. And the other, uh, if we look at the other part, the grid, transition of the grid can, can accept the more renewable energy. It's a need time to uh, readjust the grid and also the renewable energy can feed in the grid. It's also needed time. Uh, we look at the, the whole plan. So Xi Jinping, President Xi Jinping mentioned about in the 14th five years plan, limited the consumption of the coal. That is a very positive signal that is a burn the curve of the consumption and emission to the, to the stage 
of the very plaque and mm. then turn this down. That is so, uh, if, as our understanding, that is a, in 14 five years plan, just uh, uh, control or limit the consumption of coal. And also in the 14 five year, uh, 15 five years plan, that is phase down the coal consumption. Mm. So that is a step by step achieve the target. Yeah, uh, help people understand the five-year plans because we talk about the five-year plans, the 14th and the 15th. But for people who are not familiar with uh, uh, what these five years, five-year plans mean for for China's future, um, help us understand that and what it means in global climate change terms. Yeah, in terms of the global uh, climate change, there's a two-phase target. One is till 2030 that half reduce, reduce 50% of the emission, total emission of global. And till the middle of this century, that is a 2050, it should be reduced down to the net zero. And in China, uh, just, like, just like the beginning I mentioned, that China is really good at break down the long-term target into stages. So. As our understanding that the every five years plan uh, will match into the long term strategy, and China will also have the long term strategy in 2035 and 2050. Mm. Some have also doubted if China can really kick its coal addiction to achieve its 2060 carbon neutral goal. What's your take on this? So, you mean China or? The there are some, yeah, there are some critics who say China can't really get rid of its, uh, you know, reliance on coal consumption. Uh, in terms of the resource resources, eighty percent of the emission from the coal consumption, and China's uh, rely on the coal as an energy as a key energy. Uh, but consider of the climate change and also the development of the technology in renewable energies such as the solar panel and wind power, China has a chance to uh, have the energy revolution. In Chinese, we call it a full revolution in energy consumption, energy supply, energy uh, generation, and also energy uh, tra transfer transformation. Mm -hmm. So that is a full energy revolution. Uh, if we translate it into Western narrative, it's kind of a systematic change. Mm. In China, we use the revolution, <laughs> but uh, in Western part, we uh, usually use the systematic change. In your speech on April the 23rd, you mentioned uh, to achieve carbon neutrality is not an incremental process, but a systematic change in society. Um, taking system, systemic changes into consideration, we believe that institutional cooperation should be the main focus of cooperation among major emitters or economies such as China, the US, and Europe. What do you mean by institutional cooperation and uh, how, to conduct, how to conduct this kind of cooperation? Uh, among countries such as China and the United States? That's a really good question. In the previous decades, China, U.S., and EU has a lot of cooperation in economy, technology, human resources uh, exchange. However, during recent years, uh, there's more noise among those big uh, entities or big uh, countries. And how about the future uh, system? Hmm. Uh, it, if I look at the world, we, we think that the uh, global internet or international economy has some uh, conflict with the kind of the supply chain. If we look at the things with the supply chain's angle, that's the part of the maybe the kind of a key for the uh, solving the problem. And from the cooperation to the constructive competition, that means to set up the common goals and also uh, uh, under that common goals to have the game, just like the football game, you need to have the 
rules, then the games can start. So yes. that is a systematic change in new carbon neutrality. That is a not only think about the production side, but also consumption side. So from the supply chain, it's a link the word from producer and consumer. And we need a new mechanism, a new systematic thinking about how to achieve the carbon neutrality. You, you said before also that uh, nobody achieved carbon neutrality. Basically, we don't know how life is, you know, if we're really carbon neutral. So uh, China's exploration, you said, that could be an opportunity for the world. What do you mean by that? Um, first, China is a big emitter of the carbon. And that is a very important. If China can achieve the target, that means that China, 28% uh, of emission can, can be released. Mm. And second, uh, especially after Xi Jinping's speech recently, that the new impressive information is given by the world that is on non-CO2 emission reduction. Mm. Uh, according to WRS research, non-CO2 it takes almost 16% uh, of the total greenhouse gas emission of the China. Mm. And if you look at the whole emission of non-CO2 in China, it's as big as the whole greenhouse gas emission of Japan or Brazil. So the amount is great, and China is getting to take actions on that. That is a very strong signal to the world. Well, wow, mm. it's been fascinating. I mean, um, some of the things I also learned for the first time, and uh, it definitely will take a lot of determination, a lot of will, and a lot of action, not just on the country, the governments, but also on every consumer as well. Many thanks to Dr. Fang Li, Director of World Resources Institute, China. <laughs>
watching the world today. I'm Kestiri Manikin. We begin in the south of China, where President Xi Jinping continues a tour of the Guangxi Chuang Autonomous Region. He learned about the region's efforts to protect ethnic culture and the environment, as well as promote innovation in its homegrown enterprises. Jiang Xiaoyi has more. President Xi visited Nanning City, the capital of Guangxi, on Tuesday. He took in cultural performances by the Zhuang ethnic group and learned more about efforts to protect their heritage and to promote ethnic solidarity. On Monday, President Xi visited a food processing zone in the city of Liuzhou, which is the base for local specialty luo and rice noodles. He said private enterprises should continue to strive, knowing they will have government support in challenging times. The party and state will support and provide guidance when private enterprises come across difficulties. Therefore, private enterprises should strive to thrive bravely. The special delicacy dates back to the 1980s, when night fairs started to emerge in Liuzhou. Featuring river snails and sour bamboo shoots, the dish became a sensation in China and created jobs for over 300,000 people. It is exported to more than 20 countries and regions in the world. President Xi also stressed the importance of innovation, especially as it begins its 14th five-year plan for economic development. He made the remarks to the Liu Gong Group, a leading Chinese machinery manufacturer in Liuzhou. The equipment manufacturing industry is of paramount importance to high-quality development where innovation plays a key role. Only through innovation can we become stronger and better. The Chinese president also called for efforts in ecological protection as he toured the park in Guilin, which is famous for its karst hills and caves. Jiang Shaoyi, CGTN. In India, the number of new COVID cases has remained above 300,000 for six straight days. A number of countries are sending aid to help India battle this new wave of infections. Ravinder Bawa has more from Delhi. Well, experts are saying that, of course, it will not be enough, knowing that the way the infectivity rate is rising or is high in many places. In some places, it has dipped, but overall, it's quite high. And because of that, the number of infections are rising. So the rate at which the infections are rising and the rate at which the help is being pour, pouring in or the new infrastructure is being ramped up, it will take time for the two to balance out. And for that, it is very important that we break the chain of the spread of this virus we do keep those lockdowns in place, which, of course, it is not a national lockdown, but we know that cities like Delhi, Delhi, Mumbai and other places have announced these lockdowns to break the chain, to actually slow down the infection so that people who are pouring into these hospitals get the uh, correct treatment or treatment at the right time. Because right now it is a race against time. A lot of people are losing their lives because of the lack of oxygen and we are seeing the, those visuals on a daily basis we are hearing that news from all corners on a daily basis and is it is really unfortunate what is happening uh, on the ground in india turkey is set to go into full lockdown on thursday president recep tayyip erdogan announced the decision after a cabinet meeting on monday the decision follows record levels of COVID cases in last week although numbers have decreased over the weekend Mihal Badavid reports. The Turkish government's decision to impose a full national lockdown had been anticipated by many. On April 16th, daily new cases had reached record levels of 63,000. On Monday, daily new cases had decreased to about 37,000, but the Turkish president has stressed this figure needs to be much lower. We have to bring down the number of our cases below 5,000 at a time when Europe entered a period of easing the restrictions. Otherwise, it will be inevitable for us to face with heavy consequences in every field from tourism to trade and education. The new measures will take effect on April 29th, Thursday evening, and end on the morning of May 17th. That means the restrictions will be imposed during the entire month of Ramadan, as well as the aid holiday. Many in Turkey were looking forward to a vacation during aid, but intercity travel has been banned, except for those with official approval. Grades of all levels will be switching to online education as schools have been shut down completely. Public transportation will be operating at half capacity. All offices are ordered to close shop 
there is an exception for essential workers, such as emergency service workers, health workers, and those in the food and manufacturing industries. This is the strictest lockdown imposed in Turkey so far. The government had been avoiding lockdowns to prevent a financial meltdown. However, bringing case levels down now is crucial to save the tourism industry as the summer season is about to begin. I'm Mikhail Bardavid for CGTN in Istanbul. Hong Kong will reopen bars and restaurants for vaccinated residents starting on Thursday. The venues will be allowed to stay open until 2 in the morning, but they will operate at half capacity. All staff and customers must have received at least one dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. The announcement comes as authorities try to encourage residents to get vaccinated. Only around 11% of the city's population have so far received their first vaccine dose. Japan's decision to release tons of radioactive wastewater from its wrecked Fukushima power plant has been strongly opposed by some governments and members of the public. One professor we spoke to says Japan has other options to handle the polluted water rather than releasing it into the ocean. I think that there is no need to release the water into the ocean, so I am against the government's decision. And the Japanese government has stated that the decommissioning of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant requires the release of treated water, and the government says that it is the only option. But I think this is not true, and there are other feasible um, alternatives. Treated water is currently being stored in temporary tanks. I am uh, the chairperson of the Citizens Commission of, on Nuclear Energy, the members of the commission include nuclear engineers and scientists. So we are proposing two alternatives. The first alternative is to store uh, water in large tanks for more than 100 years. The half lifetime of tritium is 12 years. So um, after 120 years, the radioactivity level will drop by a factor of 1,000. And the second alternative is to dispose of water permanently by solidifying it with mortar, uh, in other words, concrete. This has been done in the U.S. nuclear facilities. So I think uh, both are technically easy and feasible. Water uh, containing tritium is being discharged into the sea from a healthy nuclear facility in the world. I think this is true. But the water at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant came through the core of reactors that were damaged in the accident. In other words, it came into direct contact with the fuel debris. Therefore, it contains nuclides other than tritium. Uh, TEPCO is also trying to reduce them to below the detection limit. However, the water that is going to be released from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant will contain uh, nuclides other than tritium, even if they are below the detection limit. So I think it is not the same as what is being released by uh, reactors that have not had accidents. This was clearly stated by the uh, chairman of the Nuclear Regulation Authority in Japan in questioning uh, session at the National Diet uh, on April uh, 14. So I think the Japanese government is saying that the upstream water is the same as the uh, water released from a healthy nuclear power plants, but this is not the truth, I think. 70% of local governments in Fukushima prefecture have adopted resolutions opposing to the discharge uh, water into the sea. And according to a public opinion poll conducted by a newspaper company, Asai Shinbun, more than 50% of Japanese, uh, ordinary Japanese people, are st strongly against it. And in addition to that, according to the agreement between Fisherman Society and TEPCO, TEPCO will not release treated water into the sea without the agreement of all parties concerned. So the, I think the government's decision to release treated water into the sea is a violation of the promise. The existing ARPS facility, ARPS facility has not yet completed 
its pre-use pre inspection by the Nuclear Regulation Commission. So, um, the existing AUPS has been in use since 2013, but officially, it is still in test operation. It, I think, I expect uh, they will complete its pre-use inspection soon, but at this point, I believe that the Japanese government's decision to release water into the sea lacks the uh, premise. Chinese State Councillor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi has hosted an online meeting with six of his South Asian counterparts. He shared proposals on the post-pandemic economic recovery as well as regional cooperation. China is implementing President Xi Jinping's pledge to make vaccines a global public good, carrying out vaccine cooperation on a global scale. We are willing to promote vaccine cooperation with other countries via flexible means, such as free aid, commercial procurement and production under the framework of the six-nation cooperation mechanism. Wang Yi made the comments at a video conference with his counterparts from Afghanistan, Pakistan, Nepal, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh. The six nations reached a consensus to join hands in fighting the pandemic. They agreed to respect each other's efforts in coping with the crisis and support the WHO's leadership. They also agreed to enhance cooperation to help each other improve the ability to handle major public health emergencies. The cooperation includes vaccine distribution and production. Regarding the post-pandemic economic recovery, the Six Nations agreed to continue their Belt and Road cooperation and improve the livelihood of the poor. They also agreed to oppose bullying, interference and double standards in diplomacy and to expand cooperation in various fields. And that's all the time we have from the show. Thanks for watching. I'll see you on the link at the top of the hour. China Global Television Network. On 
today's World Insight. The industrial internet in an age of digital transformation of brick and mortar businesses. How does it work? How is it transforming enterprises? Insights from a panel at the Boao Forum for Asia. Important infrastructure for everything you want to do. Our local teams are、um, upskilled in the use of the internet technologies. Digitalization is a very disruptive、um, approach that we are going to tackle now. Here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Inside. I'm Tian Wei. Today, I bring you a discussion on industrial internet and digital transformation at this year's Boa Forum for Asia. The industrial internet is a network of advanced tools and instruments in a web of smart communication technologies. It powers smarter, faster business decision making for industrial companies. It's said to be the key for businesses going through digital transformation. But many businesses still face constraints, such as technological lag, weak data infrastructure, cybersecurity issues, and many others. So, what should be the priority when a business decides to go through digital transformation? For companies that have successfully applied the industrial internet, how did they do it? Key lessons learned. On that, I hosted a session at this year's World Forum. The industrial internet has developed rapidly since it was proposed in the 1980s. Before the meeting, I had a discussion with Miss Dong. Indeed, the industrial internet helps businesses improve their efficiency. Lower the cost, better service the customers, more competitive. In the development process, it is mainly supported by science and technology. Back in the 1980s, the internet did not have a good foundation in many regions and countries. With the improvement of internet technology, the development of information technology, and digital technology, the industrial internet has achieved great results. The Chinese government attaches great importance to the industrial internet. And issued several policies. The Ministry of Science and Technology began research on industrial internet-related technologies 20 years ago. We have an example. Southwest Jiao Tong University organized and developed a manufacturing industry value synergy platform. On this platform, more than 10,000 companies provide collaborative services. This project won the second prize of the National Science and Technology Progress Award. In the future, we will conduct industrial internet demonstration projects in more fields. Such as aviation, electrical, automobiles, smart home appliances, rail transit, etc. With the development of information technology, big data, cloud computing, and artificial intelligence, the role of the industrial internet will become greater and greater. In the next step, we will also cooperate with international companies and relevant countries. Director General Spiegelman. What a pleasure to have you also with us today. Would you like to share with us 
What about the latest uh, from Israel in terms of encouraging industrial internet and uh, in order to uh, go through this uh, wonderful uh, digital transformation? Director General Spiegelman, please. I said, hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. Well, good morning from Israel, and thank you for having me for this important session. Um, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the industrial internet, or the internet is the uh, important infrastructure for everything you want to do. And I think, especially in the last year with the COVID pan pandemic, uh, we saw that uh, in Israel, an increase in digital transformation, things that usually would have taken years, both in public sector and private sector, in science and technology, accelerated tremendously uh, because everyone were at home. Um, so the internet enabled us to do a lot of things that in other ways would have taken a lot of time or were just impossible. Now, this is, as we see, the next growth engine, or one of them, especially if you look at uh, AI, data, uh, uh, and things like that, um, quantum computing, things that will need uh, digital transformation and will need uh, internet, industrial internet will need the data. Uh, this will be, as we see, see it, one of the major growth engines for the country and actually globally uh, in the next few years. So I think uh, we believe that this well, uh, will help us, uh, uh, our economy tremendously, our businesses. Uh, there has been a lot of digital transformation around the country, uh, a lot of businesses from small businesses that never used the internet or use it for very basic um, things, but had to do it and then now are working online uh, and going to bigger business and, and the startups and the technology company that actually leverage this situation to uh, a lot of very good use cases. Also from the government perspective, uh, we saw it as an important uh, opportunity for digital transformation of government services from education and not just government services uh, like, you know, signing up online or having your ID, but also education and remote education and distant learning, online courses, healthcare services, um, and almost everything else.呃，既是挑战，与此同时确实带来了一些相关产业的发展机会，特别是从工业互联网这个角度，我们台上坐的四位嘉宾都是来自于企业界的代表，他们来自于不同的背景、不同的产业。我觉得现在最好的还是让他
Today is truly an era of the Internet of Things, and GRI is now building a fully unmanned lights-out factory in China. And it depends on 5G technology. We should not shrink from the changes in this era, but rather face it bravely. GRI has about 70 production bases across the country. In the past, without these new technologies, it was inevitable to encounter loopholes and mistakes here and there. Now we have platforms like Industrial Cloud. It can be said that our factories abroad and our 70 production bases in China can be connected all together. The ability to respond is stronger, and the ability to control quality is stronger. At the same time, we apply these new technologies to our research and development. I think every one of us, especially from our manufacturing industry, must remember that manufacturing is fundamental, and the Internet is like adding wings to a tiger. You will be much more powerful. Oh, uh, you've been taking notes while Miss Dong has been uh, explaining her story. Uh, what's your takeaway? What about your take on the issue? I would say that uh, the, the Internet has changed our business model dramatically over, over even the recent past. Uh, you know, our company's been in business 350 years, so we've had to change our business model. But in the recent past, especially the last year and a half, you know, we've had to bring new technologies into China in different ways. So in terms of technology transfer, it has, uh, it has worked. It has worked very effectively. But to uh, Madam Dong's opinion, I would say that the human side of this cannot be underestimated. So we need to make sure that our, our local teams are um, upskilled in the use of the Internet te technologies and that we've adapted to these, uh, these fully. Uh, I would say... The COVID-19 uh, experience for healthcare was dramatically inf influenced by the internet uh, technologies. Thank goodness for 5G. Uh, thank goodness for the emergency hospitals that were connected with 5G uh, at the time. I think we all benefited from these and it's simply to home delivery. So, you know, it works in very high tech ways. It works in very simple ways that affect us in, in our daily lives. And as I look forward, uh, I think this is a way to give us transparency throughout the entire product development life cycle, uh, back from the customer needs all the way through our upstream processes, whether we're uh, designing new pharmaceutical uh, medicines or new electronic uh, materials. So for us, it's transformational, and in many ways, uh, we're the company behind the companies who are, are doing this with our electronic materials that are being supplied to the uh, to the internet-based industries. I understand during the pandemic, uh, your company has been very busy. Yes. To say the least. So what about that period of time, uh, especially during the very height of it? Uh, now we're still in it, but you know. Yeah, so, so Chen Wei, at that, at that time, I mean, we had to have very clear visibility on our supply chains so that we didn't have any uninterrupted uh, supply of our medicines. Uh, throughout China. We make a number of medicines here, but we also bring in medicines from other parts of the world. The same thing in our electronics business. Our, our customers operate 24-7. They do not, they never shut down. And they didn't shut down during COVID. So it was absolutely critical that we knew exactly where everything was up until the last mile. And the internet uh, gives us that kind of visibility and some of the technology that we're using to manage our supply chain gives us the kind of visibility to, to respond quickly to unforeseen events. In this episode, we'll follow the lives of three ethnic Yao women, a dance instructor, a traditional brocade embroiderer, and the guardian of a written script exclusively for women as they go about fulfilling their dreams. The world is changing fast, taking all our lives with it. But we can change it too, by seeking answers, 
for problems through discussions and debates. A world insider, I ask direct questions to real people in the know, seek genuine answers, but respect diverse perspectives. Our live global debates tackle the most critical issues head on. World Insight with Tian Wei go beyond the headlines. Mr. Madino, uh, from your perspective, how do you see uh, the other two? They are exploring this possibility. The, the steel industry in which I'm, I'm working is uh, an industry which is um, a high technology industry. Products look uh, very similar, but I can tell you steel is very different from one to another. And the technology behind, the content behind the properties of the steel are extremely diverse. And in this uh, complexity uh, and uh, this volatile world in which the steel industry is, digitalization is a very disruptive um, approach that we are going to tackle now. Why is digitalization uh, accelerating right now? I think it's also mainly due to the fact that uh, processing data, uh, advanced analytics are more powerful today uh, than before. Also, the storage cost of data has been dramatically divided by 50 in few years. And these allow people to really take full advantage of all the data they have in hand, uh, being able to invest in these technologies. Now, um, China is uh, uh, the main producer of steel in the world with 60% of the world production. So therefore, for China, uh, it is a huge challenge and a huge opportunity to digitalize this industry. Uh, in this aspect, uh, the China uh, ministry has uh, uh, put in place a lot of solutions which uh, we believe will help the development of digitalization through platform. We need standardized platform to digitalize companies and we need as well to uh, develop champions, steel champions who are able to succeed in creating their digital factory, and then that this model can be replicated to as many as possible. Uh,工业的这个走向数字化、智能化。那么这个历程其实在我们看来，它是一个应该说呃根本的是一个技术革命。We uh, talk about the entire industry moving towards digital intelligence. To us, this course is a technological revolution. I very much agree with what Ms. Dong said about linking technology with manufacturing. The industrial internet is a term that is often misleading. People tend to think it is industry plus the internet. In fact, the traditional consumer internet cannot meet the requirements of the industry. The industry's requirements for the internet are very high. The technologies of traditional industries are complicated. Each one is on its own island and different standards and procedures do not fit with one another. The whole process of digitalization is to integrate data into the entire industry as a factor of production, from R&D to design, to intelligent manufacturing to service and maintenance. This process actually has a lot of technologies that need to be broken through, and it is very difficult. It is not like what everyone thinks that adding internet to industry will complete this process. 
We Chinese understand that to be rich, we need to build roads first. This is a concept practiced during China's 40-year development. From the very top decision makers to grassroots workers, we are all very clear about that. Here in the process of industrial digitalization, the Internet is the road. We need to broaden Internet access so that everybody is connected to a road. Then the roads should be linked with one another. We are an innovative company. We try to be an innovative company across uh, life science, healthcare, and electronics. And the massive amount of data that we need to process, whether it's for discovering new medicines or developing new materials, requires the machine learning and the AI that will allow us to sort through the noise and get to the real understanding of what the data is telling us. Uh, we've even seen this now in the development of vaccines. The speed of which vaccines have been developed, I believe, have been accelerated by the use of machine learning and, uh, and AI. Uh, so we need the support. It's not possible to do it the old way and, and to keep up with what our customers are expecting, what patients need in terms of new developments. And it really pushes us to the breakthrough options that we may not have seen in the past. What are some of the things that you are having in mind when you said that? So when it comes to innovative uh, new drug therapies, you know, we, we absolutely need to accelerate uh, the uh, execution of clinical trials. They need to be done in a very globalized fashion. Uh, they need to be done in a very accurate uh, fashion. And, and uh, here, the use of AI has absolutely shorten the time and the efficiency, uh, the effectiveness of these clinical trials that leads to all kinds of new drug discoveries, not just for our company Merck, but uh, I'm, I'm sure many others. But what about the data, the data aspect? Yeah, this? so you know, the, the, we're in a data explosion. Data is growing at about 30% uh, a year. It's an astronomical amount and it was boosted by the recent uh, uh, pandemic uh, situation. So we need to be able to process data and here, uh, our company, our company's companies uh, that we work with, the semiconductor companies, they are challenged by the fact that the semiconductors that they're producing today are probably not going to be adequate for the data demands of the future. To make new semiconductors, you have to be doing this uh, work at the atomic level. And this is where companies like Merck get involved, is that our business is around atomic level chemistry. And we use the data that's, that we uh, have benefited from uh, to help develop new materials, to develop new semiconductors, which helps the better connectivity of us and our customers. Take our air conditioners as an example. There are thousands of component parts, and the data in this process is very complicated, from producing the parts to manufacturing the complete machine. What kind of changes can be brought about after our unmanned plant is in place? In the past, we need to have tens of thousands of people to complete such a product. But in an unmanned plant, we need about only 1,000 people. But the most challenging part is quality control that I mentioned. We all know big data is very good, internet technology is very good. Yet, we are thinking about what kind of methods can we use to ensure that there are no problems using internet technology in the manufacturing process, because it will be fatal should there be problems. What do you need to really success uh, tackle the, the benefit of the, the digitization. The, the problematic is very often the customers 
we meet every day doesn't really know what they want. Uh, and because they are not clear with their own strategy. And in the steel industry, there are basically three main strategies you can uh, adopt. The first one is to be an innovative company and you want to be close to your customer and design the products they need. And for that, you need to segment your customers properly. You need to collaborate with them on the design phase and you need to be fast to go to the, to the market. The other one is to be very uh, good with uh, the supply chain. So you want to be the one who can deliver in different size lots very fast your customer and being very flexible for them. The third one is you want to be the cost leader. So that means you want to be the cheapest one. So that means you need to have 100% utilization of your line, of your plant. You want to be able to standardize your product so that you buy in volume and produce in volume. The industrial internet can reach every company in every sector. Different industries and companies have their own characteristics, but there are also commonalities. The first one is that there must be very good information infrastructure construction, which is very important for every enterprise from R&D, design, manufacturing, sales, service to user experience. The whole chain shall make use of data technology and the data of one procedure shall be of use to another. Then there's also the problem of data linking and coordination among enterprises. The second commonality is technological advance. When we look back, the industrial internet is constantly upgrading along with technological advances. Our communication technology from 2G to 3G to 4G to 5G has completely subverted the original production model and information utilization model. Now we have big data, we have cloud technology and artificial intelligence. We can do many things that we couldn't do in the past. Thirdly, the industrial internet will bring us lower costs, higher efficiency, stronger competitiveness, and better user experience and services. Thus, it would also require from enterprises and from our society continuous high-intensity investment and support in the future. If I were to predict, I would say the most disruptive thing that the industrial internet is likely to bring about in the future is quantum science and quantum computing in 10 to 30 years. It will completely change our information transmission and computing capability. This is a question that our enterprises must think about before the arrival of technology. Just now, Minister Huang from China talked about the disruptive uh, innovation that's likely to take place and transform the whole picture. Uh, from your perspective, how do you see the speed of that? And what does that mean in terms of preparations? Is there a way to prepare at all? I think if I'm looking at this revolution from a government perspective or a country perspective, I think we need to prepare and be ready. Um, what we see is just the tip of the iceberg or just the starting point of what will be the next huge revolution. So we started with the digital transformation, now with the data revolution. Uh, People say that data is the new gold uh, or new oil. I'm not sure, but um, we are definitely just seeing the, the, the beginning of what will be a major revolution. And in any revolution, we need to prepare and we need to be make sure we have the right infrastructure. Now, when I'm talking about infrastructure, there are many things we need to think from a policy or government perspective um, to enable this industry or the R&D or the startup. So we are just the enablers, but we have to make sure that we have the right things in place. Uh, we need to think maybe on three or four different uh, inf infrastructures. First, the physical infrastructure. People talked about 5G, about cloud. Make sure that we have the right uh, uh, a broadband or cloud for processing and co computing power for processing all this data and information and technology uh, for com companies. So this is one thing, thing when you have to think about it and we in the Israeli government really think about how we make sure that we, on a government perspective, enables all this amazing innovation and industry from 
uh, all the economies, the new economy, to have what they need to leverage this innovation and, and transformative technology. The other thing, and it was mentioned before, is about uh, the human capital and the talent. Do we have enough people who knows how to use the internet and what to do? So uh, we see in the future, in the near future, and 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 then the next five to ten years, a lot of the current positions and jobs will disappear probably. And there will be a lot new roles. Do we have the right training for the people to to support all of that? So from um, computer science and data analysts and data scientists, that's on the high end of the R&D innovation, but also more basic from um, data analysts. And almost everyone will be able to, will need to know how to use data or how to use technology, almost any job. Do we have, or how do, not do we, we don't have right now, we have a lot of uh, missing uh, talent that is needed, but how do we make sure that we supply them? right enough of talent. And the third is about policy. You talk about security and cybersecurity and privacy. There will be a lot of changes in policy and regulations with all this innovation coming up from autonomous cars. What does it mean to have an autonomous cars in terms of privacy and, and, and what will it mean in terms of healthcare and all that? So how do we support, have the right policies in place for one hand to not to help the industry goes forward and not hold it back. On the other hand, make sure that we protect our citizens and our people uh, in terms of security and privacy and a lot of other impacts that we even not sure that we right now know what will happen in five or 10 years. So we now just need to imagine and make sure they have the right uh, support and regulation and policy in place. So there's a lot of work in a country wide level to prepare for this, um, which will be an amazing revolution, like every revolution, like the industry revolution 100 years ago. This is will change a lot of things. It will change most of the industries. It will change most of the things we do. Yeah. The world will not look the same in five, 10, 20 years. And we make sure we, and, and governments usually do not react very fast. So we have to start prepare right now. The world is changing fast, taking all our lives with it. But we can change it too, by seeking answers to problems through discussions and debates. On World Insight, I ask direct questions to real people in the know, seek genuine answers, but respect diverse perspectives. Our live global debates tackle the most critical issues head on. World Insight with Tian Wei. Go beyond the headlines. Images may appear to be identical, but looks can be deceiving. The difference is not always obvious. It has to be discovered. There are always different sides to a story. We put the focus on the details. To see more, to understand better, see GTN. See the difference. Chesterna 可以讲互联网时代已经完全颠覆了我们过去的不仅是思维。The internet age has completely changed our thinking and our behavior. We eagerly hope that both on a national level and also for the world to establish a better governance of the internet age. The reason I'm doing live streaming is because I'm trying. This new era has already come. In the past, we do tens of thousands of our own specialty stores, especially during the time of the pandemic. The past model can no longer work. So last year, I did more than a dozen live streaming. Some say that must be very tiresome. I don't feel I'm tired. It's a kind of happiness. 
and I gained a lot. At one time, our turnover reached 10 billion RMB in one live streaming. That's so very interesting. It is the technology of the Internet that makes all these possible. Basically, if you place an order on us today, it will be delivered to your door by tomorrow. The response is quick and precise. We often talk about innovation. In fact, I think innovation is everywhere. If you don't innovate, you will be outpaced. Innovation is not a thought, it's an action, especially for us manufacturers. Al, you want to take with that question? So I really like this comment that innovation is from everywhere. We try to connect all of our uh, operations around the world uh, together. I think in many ways digitalization is the universal language, it's the universal process by which we can bring the customer closer to what we do in our, in our businesses. Uh, you know, one of the examples there is that we actually connect our manufacturing process to our end use customer. And in this, this particular connection, it allows us to fine tune what we do in our upstream operation to their exact specifications. And I think that works for most any, every industry, from air conditioners to pharmaceuticals to, to phones and, and, and uh, other things. Because the closer you are to your customer in the real-time response that you can get from your customer, the better you can design your products, your services to, uh, to, to meet their, their needs. And it builds in resiliency into your operation. There's no time that I can remember when we were tested with resiliency then, like the recent past. But I think it showed the potential of having smart systems that can be transferred to other parts of the world. Uh, so in fact, what we're looking at is building modular factories. These are digital twins of what we have in certain parts of the world. And these kinds of modular factories will give us the flexibility to build what we need close to the customers who need them when they need them. And, and uh, this is very different. You call it, uh, maybe it's disruptive, maybe it's rethinking our original business models, but I think it's the way we need to be in the future. We can't be building just one factory, one place in the world to do everything that we think we're gonna need. You have to be close to your customer. What about the moving factors, shall we say? Geopolitics, the politics, the economic situation, pandemic. You also have uh, international trade rules uh, that are now under huge discussions. All of this will have an impact on how industrial internet will be used and who will really benefit from it, to what degree. Yes, so uh, basically we, we are in, indeed in a, in a very changing world, uh, as we say, on the geopolitical uh, in terms of pandemics. And basically, uh, there is a, a, a clear need of integrating that in the, in the strategies of the company through the digitalization. And this is uh, a movement uh, we see more and more. Uh, we see that uh, governments are taking actions. Uh, they are coming with uh, proposals, like we have seen in China, with this proposal in the 14th, uh, five years plan to integrate digitalization really as a point of bringing the human community together. Mm. We have seen that there have been a, a lot of antagonizing and digitalization is a topic which has been brought by the China government as a topic which is including everybody and that it should bound again all the di di diverse countries and diverse ideas we are yeah. uh, having right now. Mm. L? I would say that uh... Nobody has a lock on innovation, right? And if you believe that, and you really want to innovate for your customers, uh, the best thing uh, for, for companies, uh, for governments to do is to facilitate innovation. Because the one thing we don't have more of is time. And digitalization can save time and speed innovation for all kinds of uh, industries. Our um, business, uh entrepreneurs and pioneers are also great diplomats. 
in their way of expressing. Uh, Mr. Zhang, it triggers a huge impact on the cooperative relationship of the entire supply chain of the industry, especially for small and medium-sized enterprises. It will bring about a closer cooperation. Because of the pandemic, people have developed cross-regional online methods that allow data to travel instead of people to travel. There is a huge change of the way of cooperation for upstream and downstream industries. Director General Spiegelman, a few words before we wrap up. Yes, just uh, uh, try to finish with an optimi optimistic view. This <laughs> is a global uh, change. This is a global uh, opportunity for all of us. I think uh, the internet will lower all boundaries and all companies are, a lot of companies are global companies today. The markets are global. It's really hard to separate. So we have to look together uh, mm -hmm. in Asia and other countries, how we can together make sure that we leverage this opportunity. I agree about the time. We have to be quick and smart and leverage and make sure that we put everything we need to help the world uh, take this opportunity to the be to, to a good place and mm -hmm. to help the citizens and the people and the businesses and the economy. Um, we have a lot of work to do, but I'm quite optimistic what we are on the right way and we will overcome all the challenges from infrastructure to talent to policy and we will be able to enjoy. Um, so I think we have this opportunity and we know that we can together join forces and, uh, uh, and, and, and leverage this okay. great opportunity. Let's yeah. do it. Thank you. Thank you for your confidence and uh, optimism. Uh, Huang Bozhang, what I want to say is that in the future, not just enterprises, but users of the whole society will feel the benefits that the industrial internet brings to us, and we will all contribute our strength to work together. Thank you so much for your contribution, both here on the site and also online with us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Industrial Internet and Digital Transformation. That's a panel I hosted at this year's Boal Forum for Asia. If you'd like to see more, search World Inside our program or check out our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Ken Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for watching and bye for now.
Hello there, you're watching The Link, coming to you live from three continents. I'm Kasturi Manikam in Beijing, where it's 11 p.m. The coronavirus situation is critical in India as the country breaks global records for the sixth day in a row. It's 4 p.m. here in London. I'm Jamie Owen. The world rushes to India's rescue. Supplies and equipment start to arrive from the international community. And I'm Anna Vivier in Nairobi, where at 6 p.m. a protest turned deadly in Chad as protesters demand civilian rule. The men are rocked by violent protests with two people killed on Tuesday as demonstrators call for the military to seize power. The number of new COVID cases in India has remained above 300,000 for six straight days. A number of countries are sending aid to help India battle this new wave of infections. Ravinder Bawa has more from Delhi. Well, experts are saying that, of course, it will not be enough, knowing that the way the infectivity rate is rising or is high in many places. In some places, it has dipped, but overall, it's quite high. And because of that, the number of infections are rising. So the rate at which the infections are rising and the rate at which the help is being pour, pouring in or the new infrastructure is being ramped up, it will take time for the two to balance out. And for that, it is very important that we break the chain of the spread of this virus we do keep those lockdowns in place, which, of course, it is not a national lockdown, but we know that cities like Delhi, Delhi, Mumbai and other places have announced these lockdowns to break the chain, to actually slow down the infection so that people who are pouring into these hospitals get the uh, correct treatment or treatment at the right time. Because right now it is a race against time. A lot of people are losing their lives because of the lack of oxygen and we are seeing the, those visuals on a daily basis we are hearing that news from all corners on a daily basis and it is it is really unfortunate what is happening uh, on the ground in india china says it stands ready to help india fight the coronavirus chinese state councillor and foreign minister wang yi made the remark at a virtual meeting with five of his south asian counterparts afghanistan pakistan nepal sri lanka and bangladesh he also shared proposals on economic recovery and regional cooperation. China is implementing President Xi Jinping's pledge to make vaccines a global public good, carrying out vaccine cooperation on a global scale. We are willing to promote vaccine cooperation with other countries via flexible means, such as free aid, commercial procurement and production under the framework of the Six Nation Cooperation Mechanism. The six nations reached a consensus to join hands in fighting the pandemic. They agreed to respect each other's efforts in coping with the crisis and support the WHO's leadership. They also agreed to enhance cooperation to help each other improve the ability to handle major public health emergencies. The cooperation includes vaccine distribution and production. Regarding the post-pandemic economic recovery, the Six Nations agreed to continue their Belt and Road cooperation and improve the livelihood of the poor. They also agreed to oppose bullying, interference and double standards in diplomacy, as well as to expand cooperation in various fields. Now, the global community has pledged to help India battle COVID-19. Let's find out how Europe is contributing to their efforts. Jamie? Gaz, help is on the way. That's the message from European countries as international aid starts to arrive in coronavirus-ravaged India. The first shipment came from Britain and Germany and France say they'll be sending supplies in the coming days. Well, let's talk to our correspondent, Nawid Jabakul, who's been following the story for us. How vital are these supplies? Yeah, absolutely incredibly important at this stage, Jamie. What you've got with these figures, as we've been hearing in the show, another 320,000 infections on Tuesday, and it's been several days of this. Within the space of about three days, a million new cases are being reported in India. There are suggestions that the figures could be even higher, but it's not just uh, infections. Deaths are also rising, almost 200,000 people dying. And with the scenes we've seen coming out, it's moved uh, India to try and tackle the issue domestically, but across the world, one of the largest uh, expatriate populations, one of the largest diasporas is the Indian one. And here in London, as we've been finding out, people taking matters into their own hands. We visited a temple today where communities are getting together to try and raise funds to help 
loved ones and uh, relatives back home. One that we've been speaking to in London just in the space of two days has uh, raised more than $150,000, which suggests that the, the help isn't just coming from ordinary people, but from governments as well. The UK is sending aid to the country, the first international aid arriving there, 200 pieces of equipment, including 100 ventilators, but really it's just a tiny drop in the ocean compared to what's needed in the country with such vast numbers. And what is the vaccine situation like? Yeah, that's been an interesting point. Lots of doctors in India saying that it's, uh, vaccinations could also help uh, stop the spread of the, the virus in the country. In terms of other countries trying to offer, offer things at the moment, the vast uh, emphasis is on oxygen concentrators and on ventilators to try and immediately help people breathe, essentially. That's the situation we're talking about. France, Germany saying they'll send more uh, aid in the coming days, as well as the United States. And China, its uh, foreign ministry in its embassy in Sri Lanka saying 800 oxygen concentrators have been airlifted from Hong Kong to Delhi more help on the way 10,000 on the way uh, in the next week or so but th with the wider question of vaccines that's where you're seeing a lot more nationalism here in the UK the Prime Minister spokesman has already ruled it out he said quote we're moving through the UK prioritization list for our domestic rollout and we don't have surplus doses so while we're seeing a global response we're also seeing that same guarded nationalism that we've seen previously with this pandemic. Luigi Barkel thank you very much well, there's been an outpouring of support for India across Europe as the country buckles under COVID-19. In many cases, Indian expatriates are leading the way with social media groups, a hive of activity. Trent Murray reports now from Berlin. As the COVID-19 crisis deepens in India, countries across Europe are gearing up to send support. Germany has pledged to contribute oxygen and ventilators, both of which are in short supply. Watching the health emergency unfold from abroad is particularly hard for Germany's Indian expats, many of whom are now banding together to push for further aid. Every Indian or every German, they are very sad. I, I have seen many Germans are calling me, sending me news and asking for help, whatever they can do. They are showing, showing sympathy for us and praying to the God uh, that situation come under control. Bajana Sodi's Berlin restaurant has become a rallying point for those wanting to help, with volunteers working around the clock to help muster support from politicians and private companies. Almost 40 companies we contacted to 40 companies, please help us, although wherever the concentration, ventilations, BPAP uh, machines and uh, oxygen concentration machines are available. Although we are getting the, uh, a quotation like this, although 150 machines, and we are asking for quotation and we are dispatching all these quotations to Indian government or India everywhere on all the NGOs. The German Air Force is preparing to fly in more life-saving cargo, with Chancellor Merkel expressing sympathy for what she describes as terrible suffering. The government's pledge to help India comes as concerns remain about the high number of new infections being recorded here in Germany. Tough new lockdown measures were introduced over the weekend, as well as beefed up border controls designed to keep out infectious new variants. Berlin has now banned travellers from India entering the country, except German citizens. The health minister says the strict measures are necessary to ensure the new mutation discovered in India doesn't endanger Germany's vaccination program. Trent Murray, CGTN, Berlin. The European Parliament is finally debating and voting on the post-Brexit trade deal four months after the agreement went into effect. The results are expected early on Wednesday, but there's little doubt over the outcome. MEPs are expected to wave through the deal, but made it clear that the UK will be held responsible for any breaches. Well, let's talk to our correspondent, Tony Waterman, in Brussels for us. Tony, what difference precisely will today's vote actually make? Well, Jamie, in terms of the deal itself, not much. As you mentioned, uh, this came into effect in January. And outside of some grace periods and cert for certain parts of this agreement, it's pretty much uh, in full effect. Today's debate and vote is really about giving MEPs uh, their say in this matter. Normally, uh, they would have this debate long before the deal comes into place. They would go about ratifying it. But that wasn't the case because you might remember that it really came down to the line uh, at Christmas on this 
deal, and they just did not have uh, much time to do do this. But a lot of MEPs today were lamenting Brexit still, but also quite hopeful that this is going to be the turning of a page. This has been a very painful chapter in Europe's uh, history, and many of them just looking to move on uh, at this point. But of course, this deal is rather bare bones. It uh, covers trade, of course, but it largely ignores stuff like financial services. So the debate is going to continue for many, many months to come. The UK has been warned to uh, stick to the deal. Um, what action can the EU take if the UK doesn't? Well, there are provisions in this agreement for dispute settlement. So that can be things like taking legal action or potentially imposing tariffs uh, to re-level the playing field if there is a breach uh, to that. In fact, the EU is already looking to go down this avenue after uh, the United Kingdom allegedly, uh, unilaterally, I should say, made a move to extend these grace periods on goods moving uh, into uh, Northern Ireland from uh, from Britain. So this is something that's already underway. And a lot of the MEPs saying today to the commission president who was sitting in parliament during this debate saying, let's uh, make sure that we pursue these legal actions with vigor. So while this is perhaps the turning of a page, there's not much hope here that this is going to, at least in the short term, uh, do a lot to sort of mend this very frayed relationship at this point. Tony Waterman in Brussels. Thank you very much. And that's all from me here in London. I'll be back at the top of the hour for Global Business Europe. Gaz is back to you in Beijing. Thank you, Jamie. Now, as China's economy shows a steady recovery from COVID-19, President Xi Jinping has been visiting some provinces and autonomous regions of the country. On his trip to southern China's Guangxi Chuang Autonomous Region, he learned about efforts to boost local growth and protect ethnic culture and the environment. Jiang Xiaoyi has more. President Xi visited Nanning City, the capital of Guangxi, on Tuesday. He took in cultural performances by the Zhuang ethnic group and learned more about efforts to protect their heritage and to promote ethnic solidarity. On Monday, President Xi visited a food processing zone in the city of Liuzhou, which is the base for local specialty luosif and rice noodles. He said private enterprises should continue to strive, knowing they will have government support in challenging times. The party and state will support and provide guidance when private enterprises come across difficulties. Therefore, private enterprises should strive to thrive bravely. The special delicacy dates back to the 1980s, when night fears started to emerge in Liuzhou. Featuring river snails and sour bamboo shoots, the dish became a sensation in China and created jobs for over 300,000 people. It is exported to more than 20 countries and regions in the world. President Xi also stressed the importance of innovation, especially as it begins its 14th five-year plan for economic development. He made the remarks to the Liu Gong Group, a leading Chinese machinery manufacturer in Liuzhou. The equipment manufacturing industry is of paramount importance to high-quality development where innovation plays a key role. Only through innovation can we become stronger and better. The Chinese president also called for efforts in ecological protection as he toured a park in Guilin, which is famous for its karst hills and caves. Jiang Shaoyi, CGTN. U.S. President Joe Biden is expected to announce new COVID-19 related guidelines later today. For more, let's bring in our correspondent John Terrett, joining me now live from New York. John, what's Biden expected to say? Hello, Gas. Well, in about two hours from now, it now being 11.15 local time here in New York, and about 1.15 local time down in D.C., we are going to hear from President Biden, and he is expected to update the American people on how he thinks his administration has dealt with the COVID-19 crisis in its first 100 days. 100 days for him is up on Friday. Now, the interesting thing about this is that he's doing it on the same day that the CDC, which is the Centers for Disease Control, a sort of public health watchdog, if you like, based at Atlanta in Georgia in the south of the country, is going to update its policies on Americans wearing masks. Now, you can't tell Americans what to do. It's only a recommendation, but it's a very strong recommendation. And Anthony Fauci, who is the Biden administration COVID-19 guru, has refused to get out in front of the CDC to say what he thinks that they're actually going to say. But I think you've got to believe that there's probably going to be some kind of easing of restrictions of mask wearing 
if not inside, then certainly outside. And that is because so many Americans now have been fully vaccinated. And I think whatever the CDC does say today, whatever Biden says to back them up, it will refer to fully vaccinated Americans only. Now, this comes as President Biden is under intense pressure here in the United States at home to do something about countries around the world who are suffering in the face of COVID-19 rather more than even America is. And in particular, of course, India, the tragic horror story that we've seen unfolding on CGTN since the weekend. I think Biden's already promised money. I think they're going to change some import and export controls so that they can get equipment that makes oxygen into India, because I think India's problem is not so much that it has no oxygen at all, but rather that the oxygen is in the wrong place and they can't get it around the country easily. So if you can get machines from America into India that make oxygen locally where it's needed, that will be a big help. And then on top of that, of course, there's the whole vaccine issue. It's rather embarrassing to admit, really, that we are a bit awash in America with vaccines now. We have the Moderna one, the Pfizer one, the Johnson Johnson one is flowing once again here. And I think President Biden will talk, or at least hint at sending some of the vaccine supplies overseas, in particular to India, and in particular the AstraZeneca vaccine, which there's a big stockpile of in America, but which is not approved for emergency use here like the others. So I think that will be the first of the supplies to go over. Gas? Now, John, Biden's announcement comes a day before his first anticipated address to Congress, but this time it's going to be yes. different, isn't it? It's going to be different for two reasons. First of all, it's going to be smaller and there'll be fewer people there. But second of all, we in America think of this as being what they call the State of the Union. But when you are a first term president, when you're new to the job, the theory goes that you don't have a union over which you can pronounce any state. So it's called a joint session of Congress. And it's the same thing, really. What happens is the 100 senators will wander down the corridor into the House and they'll sit there with members of Congress and their guests and listen to the president and he will speak about what he sees the state of the country is and what he hopes it will be in the future. Normally it's held in February, but the American Recovery Act, that huge stimulus bill and the COVID-19 restrictions rather deferred it until now, the middle of April. And what is interesting, you know, is that Biden actually does have something to say. He has turned out to be a much more progressive president than anybody, certainly here in New York on Wall Street, was anticipating. We thought he would be a more conservative Democrat, because that's how he was in the Senate. And also his majorities are way for thin in the Senate and the House. But he hasn't really turned out to be like that. He's actually been quite progressive in pushing stuff forward. So the progressives on the left are very happy. The Republicans are very, very unhappy. I cite as an example the capital gains tax being doubled. That announcement's coming later today or later this week. That's a very progressive move, which Wall Street was certainly not expecting. Now, as I say, fewer guests will be present because of COVID restrictions. And the other thing I do like to mention at this time, it's well worth hearing. I love this story. Somebody has to be the designated survivor. Okay, so you've got the president and the great and the good of Washington politics in the House in just over 24 hours from now. In the unlikely event that an asteroid came down and killed them all, somebody has to take over as the next president. It's normally the transport secretary or the energy secretary, but they get full Secret Service protection. And after two hours, when the president's back in the White House, the Secret Service just melts away and they go back to being the transport secretary again. It's rather sad in a way. Gas. All right, John, thank you. Always a pleasure speaking with you. John Terrett in New York for us. And coming up next, Chad's transition turns violent as protesters demand a civilian rule. Stay with us. Each day, there are millions of stories. Each one can open new perspectives, new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there to see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you all around the world, all around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN. See 
the difference. Welcome back. You're watching The Link. We begin in chat here in Africa, where at least two people were killed and 27 others injured on Tuesday after demonstrators took to the streets of the capital in Jemena to demand a return to civilian rule. Chad's military took power following President Idris Deby's death last week. The ruling military council has banned demonstrations in the central African country that is still in mourning. The council, headed by the late president's son, Mohamed Idris Deby, had promised to hold civilian elections within 18 months. Anti-French sentiment was running high among the protesters who blamed France for having backed the Deby regime against what they say is the will of the people. They are demanding some freedoms because here in Chad there is no democracy. They talk about democracy in theory, but on the ground there is no democracy. That's why people came out here today to protest and to demand their rights because we are fed up. What kind of regime do we have now with the president dead and his child at the helm? We don't want that. This foolishness needs to stop. It is Macron's fault, the French president. We don't need the French in Chad. We are tired of suffering. We want to express our worry over the development of the situation in Chad. First of all, by strongly condemning the repression of protests and the violence that took place this morning in Jemena. We are calling for the respect of the commitments that were taken by the Transitional Military Council, that of a peaceful and politically inclusive transition. The United States Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, is expected to emphasize America's commitment to Nigeria's democracy and security in virtual talks, President Muhammadu Buhari. The meeting comes at a time when there's been an increase in violence and kidnappings in Nigeria. Philly Haza reports from Abuja. The U.S. State Department confirmed that the talks between the Secretary of State and Nigeria's president will be held virtually on Tuesday. The meeting is part of Antony Blinken's first virtual trip to Africa. He is scheduled to hold talks with the governments of Kenya and Nigeria, as well as engage with young people from across the continent. His meeting with President Buhari is aimed at strengthening democratic governance, building lasting security, and promoting economic ties and diversification in the country. The meeting is coming at a time when Nigeria is plagued with a range of insecurity problems including insurgency kidnapping and ethnic clashes secretary blinken will also participate in a health partnership event to assess collaborations in combating the pandemic as well as long-term u.s investment in tackling infectious diseases he's also scheduled to speak with nigeria's foreign minister Geoffrey Onyema to re-evaluate the bilateral relationship phil ihaza cgtn abuja well, let's now move over to Uganda, where the police force there has dismissed 153 officers over corruption and other disciplinary issues. A spokesperson says that the police standards body found proof that the officers discredited the force. Isabel Nakira tells us more. Ugandan police say some of the dismissed officers continuously involved themselves in fraudulent activities, even after several warnings. Others were relieved from work over neglect of duty and drunkenness. The incidents of misconduct were committed between 2015 and 2019. The police spokesperson says the move to punish the officers is meant to clean the image of the force. As a force, we expect the highest uh, professional standards from all our officers. Any allegations of uh, behavior that do not meet the set standards are rigorously investigated in accordance with the police act and standing orders we believe this is going to help the public to have confidence in police officers uh, who have a duty to be honest act with integrity and not compromise or abuse their position in 2020 the uganda police force was named as the most corrupt public institution in the country by the inspectorate of government and the Uganda Bureau of Standards. This public survey suggests that most Ugandans do not trust the police. The police say the actions taken to remove the officers will help reduce the many complaints reported against the force. Isabel Nakiria, CGTN Kampala, Uganda.
Well, that's it from us for now from news from the continent, but we will be back at 1700 GMT for more news making headlines across Africa. From now, it's back to gas in Beijing. Thank you, Hannah. Now, the Gaza Strip is facing a growing electricity crisis. Frequent power cuts are disrupting many public services in the Palestinian enclave, especially the healthcare system. A solar power plant project funded by China has brought hope to patients in a children's hospital. No Harazin reports. Adura Children's Hospital in Gaza City is now powered by solar panels. The project has been funded by China and implemented by the Give Palestine Association charity organization. At an online ceremony held in early April, Chinese ambassador to Palestine said his country has been committed to implement projects that will help Palestinians improve their livelihood. The hospital has 90 beds and can provide health services for nearly 100,000 children. It includes residential units, intensive care, emergency, and laboratories. And with the new solar panels, most of these departments can operate without having to rely on external generators. These children are on ventilators and the electricity should not stop because that means they will lose their lives. Now through this project, the continuous electricity supply has been secured, which enhances the quality of health services with high efficiency, as they no longer rely on external generators. The Nur al Hayat project harnesses sustainable energy to serve the hospital by installing solar panels. It will provide 30 megawatts of electricity and help 80% of the hospital's departments operate. Palestinian citizens are very happy about the project. CGTN met with Iman al-Harazin, the mother of two-month-old child suffering from respiratory problems. When the power is out, we can't operate the electrical devices in our homes. But here in the hospital, the situation has become much better after the installation of the solar panels. And they can help our children immediately without waiting for the electricity to come back. The Palestine Give Association, which supervised the project, says China's support for clean energy projects has helped provide better health services to children in Palestine. The project provides Al Dura Hospital with 30 megawatts energy. We are very thankful because this will target the main departments, like the intensive care units and the children's overnight department. The Light of Life project was funded through generous funding from the People's Republic of China, represented by the Chinese Embassy in Palestine. Gaza's Ministry of Health has repeatedly warned of the collapse of the health care system in the besieged enclave due to frequent power cuts and a serious shortage of medical equipment, mainly caused by an Israeli blockade. Nuharazin CGTN, Gaza. And before we go, let's take you to China's Jilin province, where the first supermoon of the year brightens the sky. This is the link. Thanks for watching. Good night.
This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Today on Culture Express, top-notch performers. Honoring heroic efforts in battling the coronavirus impressed audiences at the National Opera House. Switzerland's Montreux Jazz Festival goes on show for the first time in China's eastern province of Zhejiang. Surrealism comes to the Russian city of Perm in an exhibit of works by Spanish painter Salvador Dali. And urban planners in Shijiazhuang, capital of North China's Hebei Province, promote a series of measures to benefit locals and enrich their nightlife. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Culture Express here on CGTN. I'm Louis Li, live here in Beijing. Thank you for tuning in. At the National Opera House, a special performance has been held on April 22nd and 23rd. While in local theater goers, goers the top-notch show includes a tribute to medical personnel's heroic efforts in battling the coronavirus. Let's take a listen. The opera titled "The Splendor of Sunshine" was staged at Macau Cultural Center for two days. The performance offered 13 well-known arias and songs. Followed by a mini opera portraying doctors and nurses pulling together in fighting COVID-19 last year. We've especially tailored the show for this particular performance. The first half of the show revolves around the theme of love. The second half celebrates our heroic medical workers. In the field of music, opera is often regarded as the crowning jewel. We're trying to make opera more accessible to a wider audience. It's part of our effort to serve the public better. We're all impressed by how the Macau audience has appreciated the operatic arts. They were clapping so hard at the end of the show. It's a wonderful experience. The China National Opera House also sent its artists to the campuses and communities of Macau to interact with local residents and the younger generations. The troops' visit to Macau is the latest in its campaign to implement a call to the country's artists by Chinese President Xi Jinping, urging them to bring their performances within the reach of the grassroots. Ding Xue, CGTN. How long does it take for a newbie to learn Monkey King's signature move, and how much effort from the cast and crew is put into one single act? Let's follow CGTN's Wang Yuqing for a special acrobatic fighting lesson at the China National Peking Opera Company. Today we're doing one of the classics. It's Monkey King's Up Where in Heaven. This is mesmerizing, but I'm not sure how am I gonna learn.首先，我们在演员中呈现的就是我们所有这出戏的道具，也就是那个时候称之为冷兵器。那么这面大黄旗，我们称之为大都旗，也就是孙悟空刚一出场所用的这面旗子，上面写着“齐天大圣”四个字
While I was getting hit over and over by my own weapon, the actor told me that this is only one of the most basic moves and he can practically do it in his sleep. Now you see my right hand is shaking and out of control completely and the right side is experiencing some soreness as well and this experience just reminds me of this film I like very much it's called Farewell My Combubine it's about Peking Opera and this runaway apprentice when he saw the big stars performing on stage he cried and said how many beatings did it take to become the stars they are today now i truly understand it's a very hard and difficult art form to master and it takes people's years and years of practice even their entire life to become people performing on stage and my respect for peking opera and its performers is now higher than ever And now turning to one of the world's biggest and longest running jazz festival, Switzerland's Montreux Jazz Festival. The music-centric event will be staged for the first time here in China in the eastern province of Zhejiang. Swiss and Chinese representatives of the festival made the announcement at a news conference over the weekend. Our reporter Yang Ran has the details. Montreux Jazz Festival China will be held in the Fuyang district in the scenic city of Hangzhou from October the 5th to 8th this year. Yangbei Lake Wetland, a newly renovated historical and ecological area, will be the setting for this renowned jazz event. Festival CEO Joyce Pengpeng says Hangzhou is a perfect location for this international brand. Hangzhou, they have a beautiful landscape. They are traditional city, they have a, uh, the culture, and also their digital hub, and they have a high technology, so it's good for the development of a Montreal Jazz Festival China. Founded in 1967 by Claude Nobs, the Montreal Jazz Festival, originally staged in the Swiss city of Montreal by late Geneva, is one of the most influential music festivals in the world. International editions of this event have been held in Rio de Janeiro and Tokyo. The festival's music archives have been included in UNESCO's Memory of the World program. Hi, I'm so happy to announce... Jazz queen Laura Figi, Hong Kong jazz guitarist extraordinaire Eugene Pao, and Inner Mongolian band Hongai among the headliners of the four-day event. It is great that we can finally bring this legendary festival from Switzerland to China. I performed at the Montreux Jazz Festival in Switzerland in 1982. I'm happy and honored to be the music director of the Montreux Jazz Festival of China. We will bring some of the very best performers to Hangzhou, and my aim is to provide you a unique musical program and experience in the spirit of Montreux. It is so much fun working with these great musicians. And I'm looking forward to share this with you and to see you all in Hangzhou in October. The festival's China edition will also be a platform for music education and exchanges between Switzerland and China. A series of art, technology and digital music collaborations will take place at the Zhejiang Conservatory of Music. Yang Ran, CGTN. Still to come on Culture Express. The Russian city of Perm hosts an exhibit of works by the late celebrated Spanish surrealist painter Salvador Dali. And pieces of the past. In a Xinjiang city, a collection of antiques present the evolution of economic and cultural exchanges between the region's various ethnic groups. Images may appear to be identical, but looks can be deceiving. The difference is not always obvious. 
it has to be discovered. There are always different sides to a story. We put the focus on the details. To see more, to understand better. See GTN. See the difference. Watching Culture Express here on CGTN. In the Russian city of Perm, an exhibition showcasing scores of artworks is now on display by the late celebrated Spanish surrealist painter Salvador Dali. From glass sculptures to canvas, let's take a look at the revered masterpieces. At the central exhibition hall in Perm, art lovers are enjoying a Dali exhibit titled Surrealism Is Me. Among the more than 150 items on display are glass sculptures, graphic art and original photographs by the late surrealist painter. The works also display his versatility with different techniques including woodcutting and lithography. Some of the pieces were created by shooting collar bullets onto a blank canvas. This series is more traditional. It is a traditional etching, but the artist has made it in color. He was the first who made it in color. He used multiple layers, and we can see that there are several colors. The charm of this series, I think, is in its subtlety, in its airiness, in the tenderness. All these works are made only in single copy, and the artist finished them by hand. At some places, he was applying glue and putting golden foil on it. The main section of the exhibit contains works Dali produced after the Second World War. At the time, his departure from surrealism was followed by his bold experimentation with other forms of art, such as glass sculptures. It was very important that we offered an all-round view of the artist. Apart from objects he made for abstract surrealist art, he also produced works that could become part of the interior. His art, his surrealism, has become a part of our life. It was a very important step for him. In total, he made around 28 glass objects. We have presented three of them at the exhibition. The exhibition Surrealism is Me runs in Perm until the end of May. Mike Fox, CGTN. To Shanghai, artist He Duoling's solo exhibition titled Grass and Color has opened over the weekend at the Long Museum. Inspired by his experiences living in Russia, art lovers will get to experience his collection on public display for the very first time. One of the highlights is the Russian Forest series created between 2014 and 2020, after He spent six months in Russia. The trip inspired him to depict what he had observed while in Russia. The series depicts poet Alexander Pushkin and novelist Fyodor Dostoevsky in a forest. He said he plans more pieces in the series. It was so overwhelming to see the forests in Russia it was a shock to me as I'd never seen forests like that before. As for the Russian poet, writer, musicians and artists, I feel their works have a close relationship to nature compared to Europeans and Americans. So that's why I named the series Russian Forest. Uh, More than 70 groups of paintings, some dating back to the 1970s, are on display at Long Museum. The largest is Flying Bird. Measuring 4.5 meters high, the piece delivers a sense of grief and sorrow, as it was painted during the coronavirus pandemic in Wuhan. The exhibition, which runs until June 20th, also shows some of Hu's sketches. 
that have never been displayed publicly until now. The sketches from the 1970s, before he studied at a professional art institute, are really precious. He was afraid they'd get lost in the shipping process, so he brought them to the museum himself. He is considered a prominent figure in contemporary art, and rose to fame in the 1980s. With art insiders saying his works have brought a fresh visual experience to viewers, He still lives in his hometown of Chengdu, Sichuan Province. Zhang Yue, ICS for CGTN, Shanghai. Now to Xinjiang's Turban City, a collection shop has become a must-visit spot for tourists. The crowded store, which is packed with antiques, is not only a place of reminiscence, but it also presents the evolution of economic and cultural exchanges between various ethnic groups in the region. Yiming Gajiti has been collecting antiques and historical objects since the 1980s. Outside his shop in Turban, in northwest China's Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, stand two 3.5-meter-tall copper kettles purchased eight years ago. Inside are beautiful containers, wooden flower sifters, and farm tools. Gajiti says every old item is a record of the life of its time. We have things from many ethnic groups, including the Han, Hui, and the Kazakh, so that everyone can understand the history and the culture of each ethnic group. Gajiti's house has over 100,000 items. In the shop, clocks, radio receivers, and other historical collections are neatly displayed. It's become a popular destination for tourists. Admission is free. They can learn the stories behind the items from Gajiti. I really admire Uncle Yi Ming and his family. Because of their persistence in collecting these items, we can see these distinctive objects and closely feel the changes of time. Gajiti is now over 70 years old. He says he will pass on the legacy to his son to keep history alive for the younger generation. Zhang Meiyuan, CGTN. on Culture Express. Urban planners in Shijiazhuang, capital of North China's Hebei province, promote a series of measures to bring excitement to the lives of the locals. Facing the unknown is always difficult. In a world in turmoil, it's easy to lose orientation. But when the storms come, we have to see the possibilities, reinvent, find new opportunities, discover a path forward. CGTN. See the difference. Each day, there are millions of stories. Each one can open new perspectives, new possibilities, wherever you look. We are there to see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you all around the world, all around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN. See the difference. Welcome back to Culture Express here on CGTN. 
A vibrant nightlife is an important symbol of a city's openness and vitality. After successfully battling a coronavirus outbreak in January, the capital city of North China's Hebei province, Sijiazhuang, has definitely turned the corner. Local authorities are promoting measures to benefit locals and enrich their lives. Take a look. In the center of Shijiazhuang, the night begins when the lights switch on in Xintianxia Plaza. Try your hand on the screens or do some reading with your kids. Locals have a great variety of experiences to enjoy. Since April the 15th, our plaza has launched activities to promote nightlife here. We've organized restaurants, cinemas and bookshops to be part of our discount package to ensure more customers and better sales. Since April the 15th, when the local government launched nightlife incentives in Shijiazhuang, foot traffic on locomotive pedestrian street has increased to more than 50,000 people on weekdays and over 80,000 on weekends. It's as bright as daytime. It's great to be part of the crowd. Shop owners are working double time to meet nightlife lovers' demands. On regular days, the turnover is about three to four thousand yuan per day. It can reach about eight to nine thousand yuan per day on weekend. Our income at night is 85 percent of that of the whole day. If we are allowed to close our door later, we will earn over a thousand more per day. Neon lights are not exclusive to skyscrapers in the city center. In Zhengding, an ancient town of about 15 kilometers north of downtown Shijiazhuang, government initiatives and rock and roll are revitalizing this 1,600-euro town. We'd like to tell more people that there's a beautiful ancient town in Shijiazhuang. In fact, we're very happy about it and proud of it, too. We will run several public votings to select unique street blocks, model projects, as well as classic events to further improve the city's night's economy. Authorities have also issued a total of 1 million yuan, or about 155,000 U.S. dollars of coupons to local residents to help boost spending in the night economy. CGTN. And counting down the days, California is eyeing mid-June for what is calling a full reopening after a year of coronavirus closures. More than ever, the entertainment industry is keen to get back to business. Our Los Angeles correspondent Edis Tiazan checks out places that define the word fun, theme parks. A popular local attraction in the city of Palmdale, Dry Town Water Park has literally been dry for over a year. With its entire 2020 season canceled, its budget deficit has climbed to over $1 million. Being shut down, we're not running cabanas, we're not running birthday parties that the community has come to enjoy. Obviously, we're not open to enjoy the water park on the hot days. So, yeah, there was not any real revenue opportunities for us um, because of the closure in 2020. In the last 15 seasons, you know, there's not have been a season such as 2020 where we've been you know, asked to close and, you know, as of today, there's still no green light for 2021. While water parks continue planning for possible reopening this spring, California theme parks are already humming, welcoming visitors back on April 1st, though at significantly reduced capacity. For now, safety regulations make it quite a different experience. Ticket sales are now mostly online and limited, so while many people may enjoy shorter lines for a change, not all the rides are open. And long gone are the days of greeting costume characters or crowded parades, and no more snacking while standing in queues. And this new reality comes with new business models. Disneyland Resort in California has canceled annual passes that normally aim to attract visitors during off-season, a term that doesn't exist anymore. 
The company laid off over 32,000 employees in recent months during a time when its California park served as a vaccination site. It's estimated that um, the theme park and attractions industry lost five times more employees uh, last year on average than any other industry. The impact to the entire industry has been devastating. Um, it's estimated that in 2019, the industry generated uh, $25 billion. Last year, that dropped to $15 billion, a $10 billion uh, drop uh, loss. The world's largest theme park operator, though, is seeing explosive growth in its streaming services, fortuitously launched just before the pandemic. Those profits have helped offset the billions of losses in theme park revenues. But for the mid-range companies, it's a different story. SeaWorld, Six Flags, uh, they got big lines of credit to help them get through this. And, and a lot of the money that they've borrowed is going to need to be paid off. So that's going to potentially depress any capital improvements that they're going to be able to do for the next few years. Data that we've seen has shown that up to a third of the market will not consider a visit to a theme park in 2021, no matter what happens. Once a popular attraction for people of all ages, the theme park industry is now facing its toughest time, with its expansion in recent years now being replaced with what looks like years of recovery. It is Tian Shan, CGTN, Los Angeles. After 40 days in voluntary isolation, 15 people in a scientific experiment emerged from a vast dark cave in southwestern France. For most of the eight men and seven women, time passed more slowly in the darkened Dan Lombri cave in the French Pyrenees. The experiment was done to help researchers understand how people adapt to drastic changes in living conditions and environments. Ever wonder what it would feel like to unplug from a hyper-connected world and hide away in a dark cave for 40 days? Fifteen people in France did just that, emerging on Saturday from a scientific experiment. The participants said time seemed to pass more slowly in their cavernous underground abode in southwestern France, where they were deprived of clocks and light. In regard to the science, we took part in several experiments. Each time we ate or slept, we had a sort of telephone that we needed to fill in. Why are you going to bed? Why are you eating? There was a series of questions like that to answer. When we went to bed or when we woke up, we had to estimate what one minute was. You press a button to start your minute, and when you thought the minute was over, you pressed it again. They will analyze how we perceive time thanks to things like that. For 40 days and nights, the group lived in and explored the cave as part of the Deep Time project. There was no sunlight inside, the temperature was 10 degrees Celsius, and the relative humidity stood at 100 percent. The cave dwellers had no contact with the outside world, no updates on the pandemic, nor any communication with friends or family. Scientists say the experiment will help them better understand how people adapt to drastic changes in living conditions and environment. More than physiology and the need to eat and sleep, these are the most classic synchronizers, the cognition, the human will, and the brain took over to manage to function together in the group. In partnership with labs in France and Switzerland, scientists monitored the 15 members' sleep patterns, social interactions, and behavioral reactions via sensors. Cloud says it's too early to share any results, as they must now start analyzing the mammoth amount of data gathered during the experiment. Zhang Meiyuan, CGTN. And that's it for this edition of Culture Express here on CGTN. I'm Louisa Lee, live here in Beijing, and thank you for watching. We're going to leave you with a runway show by Marcus Amida, and it's happening on top of a 500-meter high suspension bridge. And stay tuned for more news coming up here on CGTN.
is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Welcome to Global Business Europe, live from CGTN in London. I'm Jamie Owen. And I'm Robin Dwyer. Our top stories. India struggles to cremate its dead as the country grapples with a second wave of coronavirus. The international community rallies to India's aid with supplies and equipment arriving from around the world. The European Parliament finally debates and votes on the post-Brexit trade deal four months after it came into effect. And the supermoon lighting up the night sky to the delight of astronomers everywhere. Well, let's start in India where hospitals are having to turn away patients due to a lack of oxygen supplies and beds. The country is also struggling to cremate the dead with makeshift funeral pyres being built in the capital. The World Health Organization says mobile field hospitals are being set up as the country records a sixth consecutive day of more than 300,000 positive cases. Ravinda Bawa reports from Delhi. Well, on the one hand, where uh, international countries are sending medical supplies in aid, that will not be enough to meet the ground uh, demand because the number of, at the rate at which the infection is rising, the number of people who are requiring medical treatment at this point, it will be difficult to fulfill uh, that demand with just this kind of aid which is coming in. The government really needs to ramp up the infrastructure which they are trying to do. But more than that, what is important at the moment is to break the chain of the spread because the spread is quite high and the infectiousness of this particular variant is very high and to break that there has to be a total lockdown now that means there will be a big hit to the economy but something that the government will probably have to think about because right now the local lockdowns which have been announced are making some difference but not to such a huge extent and that's why it is important that a, a national lockdown be announced but that would mean loss of livelihoods because you know that a lot of people in India are daily wage earners for them it will be a time where they will need relief packages from the government, which means the government will have to spend more. So we really have to see how this is taken forward. But for now, this international aid is, of course, a great help, but much more is required, seeing the numbers that are surging and the predictions of more numbers rising probably by mid-May. So we really are in for a long battle here in India. Meanwhile, help is on the way. That's the message from European leaders as international aid starts to arrive in India. The first shipment came from Britain, and Germany and France say they'll send supplies in the next few days. Let's talk now to our correspondent, Nawid Jabakal. So, Nawid, how vital are these supplies? They're incredibly important, Robin. I think with this uh, coronavirus pandemic, people uh, may have become a bit desensitized to the amount of figures being thrown around. But just to, to recap some of those that we heard from Ravinda's piece there, 320,000 cases, infections recorded on Tuesday. It's six days in a row now. So every two or three days, every three days, almost one million people are recorded to have the virus in India. The figures could be even higher, 2,771 deaths. Again, that rising to almost 200,000. And what's uh, the pictures we've seen come out of the country in the past week or so, those pictures of devastation and despair, what that's done is spurred the international community to act, governments, but also ordinary people, as we've been finding out here in London. Thousands of miles away, but compelled to help. The Indian diaspora is the largest ethnic minority in the UK, almost 1.8 million people. Here it's one of Europe's biggest Hindu temples. The desperate scenes out of India feel a lot closer to home. The donations are flooding in, really. Um, just in a couple of days, we've passed um, the £100,000 mark. Um, and, um, you know, people are really um, taken by what's actually happening in India when people can't breathe because there's no oxygen. Um, you know, you know there's problems. Press for all those affected by the COVID-19 crisis. They're also seeking help from the gods here, because on the ground the virus is ravaging parts of India. 
On Tuesday, the first international aid arrived in the country, sent from the UK. 200 pieces of equipment, including ventilators, just a drop in the ocean compared to the roughly 300,000 cases a day being reported. The help from the UK government is largely symbolic at a time when India is desperate for international supplies. Other countries, including the US, France and Germany, as well as the World Health Organization, say they'll also send aid in the coming days. For many worshippers here, some of whom have lost loved ones, can't reach India quickly enough. We try to help them much as we can. It's really bad to see here everything. And we see everything. We talk to our people in India. It's very sad. Everybody, they don't get enough, you know, help. I kind of liken it to the scenes that we were having. Well, not even as much, but when we were having our first and second waves. Um, and it's, it's just horrible to, to think that that's what they're going through with less resources and more stretched uh, manpower. It's a very difficult situation in India, so I'm very, very worried. So I came here today for prayer. The WHO has warned what's happening in India can easily hit other countries. This is a global virus, we're constantly told. A small sign that it's also a global response. And we'd beyond Europe, which other countries are offering aid? Yeah, the UK uh, claims to have become the first country to have offered international aid. It's uh, sent 200 uh, pieces of equipment, including 100 ventilators and 95 oxygen concentrators. France says it's going to send oxygen supplies as well as Germany here in Europe. That is, uh, elsewhere, the US president said it's going to share 60 million uh, vaccines for the coronavirus, but hasn't specified which countries that will go to. But closer to home in India, there have also been responses from the likes of Thailand and China as well. Its embassy in Sri Lanka tweeting to say it's provided uh, 800 oxygen concentrators to Delhi from Hong Kong and 10,000 more will be on the way. And speaking earlier in Beijing, the Chinese foreign ministry spokesman said that if there was a call for assistance, then Beijing is willing to, to help more. Have a listen. We are making it clear that we stand ready to help India fight its recent outbreak. Both sides have been communicating on the matter. If India puts forward specific needs, China is willing to provide support and assistance to the best of its ability. We're seeing this emphasis from countries all around the world and a demand from the Indian government for oxygen supplies, for oxygen ventilators and uh, concentrators as well. Because the focus right now, as we heard in that piece, is on actually getting people to breathe. But uh, some doctors in the country have also called for vaccines to be shared, something that's been quite controversial in the past year and something that the World Health Organization has called for more help on with its COVAX scheme as well. Uh, the US, the president, as I mentioned, said it's going to share 60 million vaccines that hasn't specified. India is saying some of them should go. To, to that country. And here in the UK, its government has ruled out sharing vaccines at the moment. A, prime, a spokesman for the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, said, uh, quote, we're moving through the UK prioritisation list for our domestic rollout and we don't have surplus doses, end quote. So while we're seeing this global response to try and help India, we're also seeing the sorts of vaccine nationalism that we've seen uh, throughout this pandemic over the past year and a half or so. Robin. Luigi Barkel, thank you. Well, as Naweed was saying, there's been an outpouring of support for India across Europe as it grapples with its surge in coronavirus. Indian expatriates are leading the way with social media groups becoming a hive of activity. Trent Murray reports now from Berlin. As the COVID-19 crisis deepens in India, countries across Europe are gearing up to send support. Germany has pledged to contribute oxygen and ventilators, both of which are in short supply. Watching the health emergency unfold from abroad is particularly hard for Germany's Indian expats, many of whom are now banding together to push for further aid. Every Indian or every German, they are very sad. I, I have seen many Germans are calling me, sending me news and asking for help, whatever they can do. Or they are showing, showing sympathy for us and praying to the God uh, that situation come under control. Bajana Sodi's Berlin restaurant has become a rallying point for those wanting to help, with volunteers working around the clock to help muster support from politicians and private companies. Almost 40 companies we contacted to 40 companies, please help us, although wherever the concentration, ventilation, BPAP, 
machines and uh, oxygen concentration machines are available. Although we are getting the uh, a quotation like this, although 150 machines, and we are asking for quotation and we are dispatching all these quotations to Indian government or India everywhere on all the NGOs. The German Air Force is preparing to fly in more life-saving cargo, with Chancellor Merkel expressing sympathy for what she describes as terrible suffering. The government's pledge to help India comes as concerns remain about the high number of new infections being recorded here in Germany. Tough new lockdown measures were introduced over the weekend, as well as beefed up border controls designed to keep out infectious new variants. Berlin has now banned travellers from India entering the country, except German citizens. The health minister says the strict measures are necessary to ensure the new mutation discovered in India doesn't endanger Germany's vaccination program. Trent Murray, CGTN, Berlin. The German government has raised its growth forecast. Europe's largest economy now sees gross domestic product increasing to 3.5%, up from the previous estimate of 3%. That's based on lockdown measures easing and the vaccination program gathering pace. It also expects GDP to grow by 3.6% next year and the economy to reach its pre-pandemic level by 2022. China's industrial profits surged last month, almost doubling from a year ago. Supported by a booming economy and demand for raw materials, profits rose to $110 billion in March, up 92%. Growth was slower than the first two months of the year, which saw a dramatic 179% increase, but it still outpaced the 20.1% gain in December. French oil giant Total has taken legal action that could see it abandoning its gas project in Mozambique after an attack by so-called Islamic State fighters last month, which saw dozens of civilians killed. Total had hopes to begin exporting liquefied natural gas from Palma within three years, but has withdrawn its staff from the $20 billion development. Apple will begin rolling out an update of its operating system with new privacy controls designed to limit digital advertisers from tracking iPhone users. Currently, data is used to create highly targeted advertisements based on online behavior. Facebook has lobbied against the change, arguing that the opt-out system will make advertising less effective. Toyota, the world's biggest car company, is to buy the self-driving unit of the ride-sharing platform Lyft. The deal, valued at $550 million, will give the Japanese firm greater exposure to the booming driverless car market in the United States. The European Parliament is finally debating and voting on the post-Brexit trade deal four months after the agreement went into effect. The results are expected early on Wednesday, but there's little doubt over the outcome. MEPs are expected to wade through the deal, but the EU has said that the UK will be held responsible for any breaches. Well, let's talk to our correspondent, Tony Waterman, in Brussels. Tony, what difference will today's vote actually make? Well, Jamie, in terms of the deal itself, not the, that much. As you mentioned, this came into effect uh, in January, and outside of some lingering grace periods, it's pretty much in place. Today's vote and debate was really procedural. This is about uh, MEPs getting their opportunity to uh, talk about this deal, debate this deal, something that normally happens long before a deal actually comes into effect. And many of them use this uh, as a way to lament Brexit, but also express hope that this is going to be the turning uh, of a chapter. This has been a very difficult period in European history. This is something that they do not want to see repeated, and they simply want to move on from this. Unfortunately, uh, what they seem to be moving on to at this point in time does not look to be all that great. We see that trade between the two has uh, plummeted. And the relationship, which had begun to sour during the negotiation process, really looks to be curdling uh, a bit here. The EU has accused the UK not once, but twice, of breaching this agreement uh, already. It's launched legal proceedings over this. And Ursula von der Leyen, the commission president in parliament today, uh, said that while she hopes this is the turning of a page, she made it very clear that the next chapter is one in which the European Union will defend itself. Take a listen. This agreement comes with real teeth, with a binding dispute settlement mechanism and the possibility for unilateral remedial measures where necessary. 
And let me be very clear. We do not want to have to use these tools, but we will not hesitate to use them if necessary. Tony, the UK has been warned to stick to the deal. What action can the EU take if they don't? Well, there is a dispute mechanism that is part of this deal to protect both sides if there are uh, any alleged breaches to it uh, that follows legal proceedings like we're seeing the EU take against the UK after it unilaterally decided to extend grace periods on uh, customs checks for goods moving from Britain into uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, things like uh, extending tariffs to sort of relevel the playing field. This is an option in these types of dispute uh, settlements. But... Um, the MEPs actually told the commissioner today to make sure that they pursue any sort of breaches with a lot of vigor. And Ursula von der Leyen did say that some progress has been made when it comes to resolving some of these outstanding issues, most notably on the proper implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol, which was one of the most sensitive uh, parts, if not the most sensitive part of this agreement. So there's hope that that is going to be settled in the very near future. And But I'm going to say it now. I've said it before many times. Times, Jamie, this is not the end of Brexit. This is something that is going to be here for, for many, many years to come. And this deal was pretty bare bones. It focused on trade. They, it lar largely ignored the financial services sector. So these negotiations are going to be going on for a long time to come. Tony, we look forward to many more years of discussing Brexit uh, for the moment. Thank you very much indeed. Tony Waterman there for us in Brussels. It's three weeks since the President of the European Commission was left without a chair to sit on at a summit with Council Presidents Charles Michel and Turkey's President Erdogan. Ursula von der Leyen has spoken for the first time about the incident, saying she felt hurt by the snub and saying the blunder could only be explained because she is a woman. Turkey says the seating arrangements were requested by EU officials. More at europe.cgtn.com. You're watching CGTN still ahead, keeping young people out of trouble as tensions run high in Northern Ireland. Search CGTN Europe wherever you get your podcasts to subscribe to The Agenda Podcast. The Agenda with me, Stephen Cole, always gets to the heart of the story. Just subscribe today and listen now. Covering the world from four continents, a new horizon. Teams in Beijing, Washington, D.C., Nairobi, and London who connect, interact, and inquire to bring you the stories that matter to all. The Link, only on CGTN. Facing the unknown is always difficult. In a world in turmoil, it's easy to lose orientation. But when the storms come, we have to see the possibilities. Reinvent Find new opportunities. Discover a path forward. CGTN. See the difference. Global Business Europe. Remember that CGTN is available to watch for free on all the major digital platforms on Smart TV or online on Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire and Android TV on YouTube and Dailymotion as well as CGTN.com and the CGTN app. Now it's earnings season and a deluge of corporate results out this week. Here's Juliet Mann. Thanks, Jamie. Well, here's a, a funny thing. I mean, we've heard from some heavy hitters today, but investors 
don't seem very bothered. We're, we're not seeing much in the way of markets direction because with all of the seemingly good news, there's a but. Now we're seeing gains in banking giant HSBC after profits surged way beyond analyst expectation to $5.8 billion in the first quarter. But the fallout from US Fadar Chigos is still rippling across the banking industry with losses now over $10 billion. Swiss bank UBS says it lost $774 million because of its links to the collapsed company, but still recorded a $1.8 billion profit. Nomura um, at um, Japan, that, well, they, they posted their biggest quarterly loss in over a decade. Um, no bright spots there. Now, maybe that's why analysts aren't excited about those HSBC numbers. Now, BP's results had a warmer reception. In fact, um, shares in BP um, are up 15% since they posted their full year results in February. And they jumped again today on stronger oil sales and bumper revenue from natural gas trading. Profits beat expectations, almost tripling to $2.6 billion. And now the energy company says it can start buying back its shares and that it will continue to generate surplus cash this year if oil prices stay above $45. At the moment, they're around pre-pandemic levels, more or less $65 a barrel. Whitbread, now they own chains like Premier Inn and Beefy, so they say they're targeting cost savings, but posted a $1.39 billion um, annual loss. You know, hospitality has been particularly hard hit during the pandemic, but the firm says it does expect a significant bounce in staycation demand this summer. Well, Fiona Sincotta is an analyst at City Index. She's here now. Um, thanks for joining us. Let's start with HSBC um, results. Um, markets seem quite excited about them, or look, they're, they're positive. Do you think that they've been overcautious? Do you think the banks in their pandemic strategies after all? It seems to be that way right now, but that's with the beauty of hindsight, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, at the time, they sort of took the action that they deemed was necessary. Obviously, we've had support from fiscal support from governments, and also we've had uh, monetary support from central banks. So that's something that the HSBC and other banks couldn't necessarily price in at the time because they didn't know what was going to happen. So there definitely was a very cautious slant to the way they behaved, but now we're seeing sort of reaping the rewards from that caution. Um, so, you know, that those bad loan provisions that they set aside, HSBC set aside around $3 billion, um, last year in bad loan provisions. And so they released around $400 million of that, which is what's really helped to boost their numbers today. That's the banks. Let's talk about BP. I mean, you could say they're performing while transforming. What's your outlook um, on the company and the impact that this relatively new CEO is making? I mean, do you think investors could have expected any more? I think these were really solid numbers. This was a really good showing from BP. As we said, we've got the support from... been that exceptional performance from the gas trading unit in the first quarter as well which has really helped so we have seen some strong okay. numbers now this well, we oh, lost you sorry. for a moment well, we've got we've lost you for a moment we, we, we got you back um, you were you were talking about how you thought it was a solid strong set of results that's right and so what's really important with these numbers as well is to do with the transition that we want to see from BP towards that sort of cleaner, greener machine that it wants to become, it needs to use the money and the, and the assets from the traditional um, sort of profit-making machine, so as in the oil assets, um, in order to be able to tra transform into the new company. So that's something that's been very useful to see, that it is still making that money. As you said, with the oil prices expected to stay relatively high, that does bode well for BP going forward. Now, I'm not sure if you've been out to a restaurant sitting outside for, for now, but things are opening up in, in the UK. That said, the hospitality sector has got a long road to recovery, hasn't it? It has. I mean, it was the hardest hit as far as the coronavirus pandemic is concerned. You know, they really did suffer as far as travel restrictions, people not being able to, 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 to visit other parts of the country, not having international tourism. There has been a very hard hit. Now, things are starting to turn a corner. I mean, we have seen sort of this control on costs. Um, from sort of companies such as Whitbread. As you said, I mean, there was an eye-watering loss around that £1 billion mark. 
but this should be able sort of the, the line being drawn under this we think with the vaccines rolling out now and the economy reopening and even looking towards this summer i think there's probably quite a lot of people that are actually going to look to staycation rather than go abroad and that could really help uh, companies like whitbread to to see a bounce back over the summer Fiona Sincotta, thank you very much. It does, though, seem that it's down to us consumers to get the economy back going, Jamie. We're going to have to keep spending, spending, spending. Spend, 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 absolutely. Thanks, Julia. Electric car giant Tesla has reported a bumper start to 2021, with sales up more than 70% on the same time last year. But there's more bad news for the aviation sector. Let's get more now on what's moving the markets, and we can talk to our correspondent, yes. John Terrett, who's at the New York Stock Exchange. Yes. So, John, hello to you. Tell us more about hello. Tesla. Hello, hello, Robin. Hey, Robin. Hey, Jamie. I'd like to be associated with Juliet's remarks, which is to say that the numbers seem pretty good, but the markets are not really reacting very positively because there's a big but. Let me try and explain how that fits in with the Tesla story. First thing to say, as you know, Tesla is simply the most exciting company of our era, it really is. First, we had the energy companies and we had the car companies, the dot coms, the computer companies, and now it's the AI companies, of which Tesla is a leader. And of course, Elon Musk is their secret source. He's such an exciting, innovative young man. He's taking part hosting Saturday Night Live in a couple of weeks' time, which is a major comedy program on NBC on Saturday evening that everybody watches. And so you can see that he just keeps on generating publicity for himself and his company. And, of course, it's a car company, a space company. It's a clean energy company with solar panels. It's all sorts of things. And the latest news, they've had a record start to 2021, $438 million in profit, revenue up 74% to $6.3 billion. But here comes the but. Tesla stock is down. And the problem is that many on Wall Street wonder whether all this is actually sustainable or not. They've noticed a slowdown in the revenue already, and they wonder how much worse this will get. And they also look to the very stiff competition in the EV market, not least of all from China. Although, as I always say, those companies do not have the secret source that is Elon Musk, so we'll have to wait and see. The other line of interest here in Wall Street today is that they bought $1.5 billion worth of Bitcoin in the quarter, and they sold $272 million worth of it. Musk is accused of buying it, talking it up, and then profiting from it. He issued a tweet saying, look, I sold it to prove its liquidity as a cash alternative, which is, in other words, Robin really is just saying, I'm Elon Musk, so on your bike, mate, I'll do what I like. Tesla shares are down 4% at the moment, but still about $700 a share. Robin? So plenty going on with Tesla then. What else has caught your eye? Well, uh, I like talking about General Electric. General Electric was one of the original Dow Jones components when they formed it back in 1896. And it's only just come off the Dow Jones in the last couple of years. You don't buy GE stock if you want to make a quick profit. It's a, you know, in the sort of, it's a, it's a tortoise in the race against the hare is GE. But it's had a lot of troubles lately. And the stock is down again today. And here's why. It has several divisions. Three of them, power, Renewable energy and aviation did not do well in this quarter, although healthcare and financials did relatively well. The CEO, Larry Kalb, says he thinks that the renewable energy division will pick up in 2022. But he also says he was asked why the aviation division, they make big jet engines, why the aviation division hasn't done better. And he said, look, you know, European departures from European airports are down by 75 percent on the pre-COVID era. That is why. So we'll have to see whether it comes back or not. General Electric shares down 3% this minute. And then Hasbro. I like talking about the toy companies as well. Hasbro is based in Rhode Island, a little tiny state, the tiniest of all the states, to the north of New York City. And their profits and their earnings easily beat Wall Street expectations. Their revenue was a miss. Sales up 14% on things like Nerf Blasters. I don't know what that is. Play-Doh. I do know what that is. Transformers. Twister. A good game if you like smelly feet. My Little Pony and, of course, Monopoly, which is that great Sunday afternoon game that you play when you're a family. They've done well, as did Mattel, based out in California. They were doing well based on Barbie and Fisher Price toys last week. Now, Hasbro shares are up 1.3% at the moment, and the reason for that is they're selling their E1 music division, which includes Death Row Records here in New York. Now, 
Robin, they bought this two years ago for four billion dollars. They're selling it to a private equity company called Blackstone for 385 million. So that's a huge loss. But I think it is that they just want to be a better toy maker and a better toy seller. And you don't really want to have a record label called Death Row Records around your neck when you are a toy maker. Happy toys and that sort of thing. However, the reason they bought it was because there are synergies with their movie division in toys like Peppa Pig and PJ Masks. That's why they they bought it, and their movie division has not done so well in this quarter for fairly obvious reasons. You saw the Oscars. You know why. <laughs> well, John, I probably had a hand in those Hasbro revenues. Thank you very much for now, John Terrett at the Stock Exchange in New York. What's a Nerf Blaster? We can't let John Terrett go without uh, working out what a Nerf Blaster is. In what? my experience, it's a kind of gun that fires uh, toy bullets. Okay. John, I hope you're still listening, <laughs> and uh, now you know what it is. It's important to inform. Um, thank you very much. Uh, let's stay in the States because America is back. That's been uh, the mantra of uh, President Joe Biden since his inauguration. His focus has been on a reset for foreign diplomacy, which had been damaged, arguably, under the Trump administration. But as Biden's first 100 days are completed, repairing relationships doesn't happen overnight. Giles Gibson reports. In his first few weeks in office, President Biden made a symbolic visit to the State Department, the arm of government his predecessor was accused of sidelining. American alliances are our greatest asset. And leading with diplomacy means standing shoulder to shoulder with our allies and key partners once again. By leading with diplomacy, we must also mean engaging our adversaries and our competitors diplomatically. A fresh style and tone, certainly, but the dynamic of Washington's relationship with the world's other superpower hasn't changed much. The US and China have kept billions of dollars of tit-for-tat tariffs from the Trump era in place. So after four years of trade barriers and tweets, former President Donald Trump isn't easily forgotten. I think Trump's imprint on the bilateral relationship will go down, frankly, in history. But it's for the two sides going forward to see which of the pieces they can pick up in terms of being able to manage their differences while finding constructive areas to cooperate. One area of potential collaboration is the global response to climate change. At President Biden's virtual climate summit, the U.S. pledged to halve greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. But trust is a delicate thing. The U.S. was in the Paris Climate Agreement at the start, then it was out, and now it's back in again. Republicans have also accused Biden of abdicating American leadership in the country's longest-running war. After two decades of fighting, all U.S. troops will be out of Afghanistan by the 11th of September this year, the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. The coronavirus pandemic, though, has limited Biden's ability to visit troops abroad and conduct diplomacy face to face. Unusually for a new president, he's only hosted one foreign leader at the White House so far, the Japanese Prime Minister. His first foreign trip won't be until June, attending the G7 summit in a small British village before crossing the English Channel for NATO talks in Brussels. Giles Gibson for CGTN in Washington. You're watching CGTN still ahead. It's a roller coaster ride for theme parks. We're in California as the tourism industry hopes the only way is up. More than 100,000 people in Italy have now died from COVID-19. The vaccination program offers some hope for the future, but intensive care units are near capacity. The Spanish government is hoping to vaccinate over one million people by next month. Living in Germany are struggling with their mental health. Hungary is supplementing the EU's vaccine rollout, buying doses from Russia and China to speed up the process. Four million people have tested positive in France. After a grim winter, the promise of a spring bloom that could mean freedom for millions. On the agenda with me, Stephen Cole, we look up into space. We look down into data. 
We look at death. We look at politics. We look at opioids, climate change. We look at all the issues that really matter around the world. But you matter too. We want to tell the stories you want to see and hear about. Make it your agenda. We can try out the wild and crazy ideas. Nothing can stop an idea whose time is coming. This idea is coming. I actually feel quite comfortable in isolation. We should all be very basic when we try to save the world. Oh, no. We hope it will happen. We have to live in hope. The agreement is signed. But what is the real deal now the UK has left the EU? For trade, for business, for the city, for ordinary people. Make sense of Brexit with CGTN. Welcome back to Global Business Europe with Jamie Owen and Robin Dwyer. Our top stories. India struggles to cremate its dead as the country grapples with the second wave of coronavirus. The international community rallies to India's aid with supplies and equipment arriving from around the world. And the European Parliament debates and votes on the post-Brexit trade deal four months after it came into effect. As we heard earlier, the EU is warning it will sanction Britain if it breaches the Brexit trade deal. This just days after disturbances broke out in Northern Ireland amid unease over the new trading arrangements. Well, many young people were involved in some of the worst street violence in years, with tensions between Protestants and Catholic communities running high. CGTN's Andrew Wilson reports now on the efforts to try to bring divided communities together. Ten down. Move this back leg up, then kick up the head here. Lockdowns lifting and MMA champion Danny Kaur's gym is open again. Kids from all backgrounds brought together to practice mixed martial arts. Classes are free. The priority to Danny is to keep these youngsters off the streets, burn off energy together. Much better than throwing petrol bombs at the police. A lot of it was kids going out there for excitement, you know. Of course, there's all those reasons behind it. They've been in newspapers and radio shows and television shows, you know, but the, the young kids that are out there are out there to get an adrenaline bus. And it's as simple as that. They haven't got a political agenda. They don't actually hate the, the person that they've went to school with or they've met before. Um, they're just getting some kind of buzz out of it. Um, once this is back up and running, these things are, are fully fledged, and there's more of these, and people put funding into these things, um, then, you know... Northern Ireland's next generation will be crucial. Integrated schools are relatively new and growing slowly. About 7% of the kids here now study at mixed schools, races and religions together. A quiet space we have for our students. Uh, so if I can show you. Lagan College was the first. Because we have people from all backgrounds, we have Protestant Catholics coming here together they're able to challenge each other and to discuss each other so we are as much as possible a bias free zone one would think that integrated education would be the product purely of government and policy well far from it all of northern ireland's 65 integrated schools are the result of parental demand not one student has been put in place by a politician paul yes. collins fundraises for the umbrella program the other thing to remember as well is when the school becomes in, it's not just the children, it's the parents who are brought into this equation as well. They're at the school gates waiting and talking to people and their common interest now is the children. And also, interestingly, the grandparents as well are, are being brought into that process as well. So it, it is, it's not the only factor, but it's one of many factors that can, can help to move things forward. 
with all the black. And his daughters, Lily and Freya, are loyal students at Lagan. It's nice just to like have a different variety of friends, not everyone just being the same, you know, talking to different people and learning new things. Is, I think that's really important. I think it's the key. I genuinely think if the future, if the future of Northern Ireland is to progress and become anything, like become better, like it needs to become better, integrated schools are the way, like 100%. For every teenager at the barricades, there's another being helped to build a better future. And whether it's parental pressure on an education system or a local gym giving youngsters a place to go, there are plenty of adults in Northern Ireland playing their part to help write a different story for the next generation. Andrew Wilson, CGTN, Belfast. Well, let's talk now to Louise Ferguson, uh, who writes for the Irish Times, Reuters and the Washington Post. Good to have you on the programme, and sorry to bounce you into some breaking news. Um, but we're hearing that one of Northern Ireland's most uh, important politicians, Arlene Foster, is facing a no-confidence motion. For an international audience unfamiliar with the uh, granular and sometimes baffling detail of Northern Ireland politics, how significant is that? It's actually Amanda Ferguson, but we will not bother about that. It's a very significant move. Uh, at the moment, following our peace agreement in 1998, a mandatory coalition government was formed, which is headed up at, the pre at present by a British uh, Protestant unionist politician and by an Irish Republican politician. So it's two uh, different heads of government with very uh, different ideas about what the future of Northern Ireland should be. Now, Arlene Foster is the First Minister. She's the leader of the Democratic Unionist Party. And there seems to be moves uh, within the last hour. It's become apparent that there's a move to perhaps try and oust her from her leadership position with various uh, documents circulating amongst her uh, political reps, um, suggesting that they have no confidence in her leadership anymore. The European Parliament, as we were reporting earlier on this programme, finally gets to vote on uh, the post-Brexit trade deal. At the sharp end, in Northern Ireland, do you think the communities there can now turn a new chapter? Well, I think that the majority of people in Northern Ireland have been peace supporting for their entire lives. Certainly the Brexit uh, protocol, which affects trade between uh, Britain and Northern Ireland, has caused a great deal of distress amongst those who would identify as British unionists with, uh, within Northern Ireland. They feel uh, betrayed by the UK government. They feel betrayed by the Prime Minister. And they're uneasy uh, about the future because the political uh, landscape and the demographics of Northern Ireland are changing. There's no one particular reason why we saw street violence earlier in this year. There's a combination of factors that led to that. Let's talk about the young people um, involved in those disturbances uh, on the streets of Northern Ireland. Um, I, I wonder how important are integrated schools in trying to heal those divided communities and perhaps why there are so many children still educated in separate Catholic and Protestant schools. Yes, integrated education is extremely important and, and under 10% of our schools uh, are integrated. Certainly it's viewed that if children were educated together that um, it may make social cohesion better. Certainly there's, there's some people who live in what will be referred to as single identity communities where perhaps they may, may never meet or interact with people from a different background, perhaps until they go to university or they enter the workplace. So certainly it's going to be one of the tools uh, that will help uh, our society, but it's not the only one that needs work on. Well, another one that might need work on is perhaps the economy there. Growth prospects for the Northern Ireland economy uh, look pretty promising uh, over the next uh, quarter or so. I wonder, does, does peace on the streets depend in some part uh, on, uh, on a wealthy and employed community? Yes, it certainly does. It's not a very good image when uh, sort of street violence and buses on fire and uh, petrol bombs being thrown at police are beamed all over the world. Uh, but it has to be put into context that that is something that is happening uh, fr from a minority of people within a minority of communities. Certainly it's very worrying and we don't want to see repeats of that. Uh, but there were a range of factors that played into that. One of them was anger around the Brexit protocol. And, um, you know, we also have criminal and paramilitary elements involved. And also there perhaps would be what would be referred to as recreational rioting, perhaps a little bit of lockdown fatigue amongst young people who view it as uh, something exciting uh, to be part of. Uh, but certainly, you know, the, it's a, a minority of children and our Children's Commissioner in Northern Ireland has indicated that she feels um, adults encouraging uh, young people to take part in street violence, that it's a form of child abuse. Amanda Ferguson, thank you very much indeed for talking to us. Thank you.
Turkey is to go into lockdown on Thursday as the country battles a third wave of COVID-19. In the strictest measures so far, all schools and non-essential businesses will close and public transport will operate at half capacity. Alcohol sales are also banned. President Erdogan says the aim is to reduce daily infections to under 5,000 cases. Informal talks between Turkey and Greece on the future of Cyprus have begun following a four-year pause. The Geneva-based talks will be attended by leaders from the two sides of Cyprus, as well as Turkish, Greek and British foreign ministers. Cyprus was divided between Turkey and Greece in 1974. Previous reunification talks have failed. California's Democratic Governor Gavin Newsom, who's up for re-election in 2022, could be facing a vote of confidence before the end of the year. Enough signatures have been gathered to trigger a statewide vote on whether to remove him from office over his handling of the pandemic. The Democrat has called the move a far-right power grab. In Myanmar, around 200 protesters have marched in Yangon. It's the largest rally in weeks since a brutal crackdown on demonstrators. Humanitarian groups say security forces have killed more than 750 people since February's military takeover. Massive sandstorms have swept across Mongolia, causing air pollution and traffic accidents. The sand wall stretched for hundreds of meters and enveloped buildings in many cities, turning the sky yellow. People have been warned to stay indoors with more storms expected. After a year of coronavirus closures, California is setting its sights on a full reopening of some of its tourist attractions by June. As with most sectors, theme parks are keen to get back to business, having suffered huge losses in the pandemic. CGTN's Adiz Tianshan reports. A popular local attraction in the city of Palmdale, Dry Town Water Park has literally been dry for over a year. With its entire 2020 season cancelled, its budget deficit has climbed to over $1 million. Being shut down, we're not running cabanas, we're not running birthday parties that the community has come to enjoy. Obviously, we're not open to enjoy the water park on the hot days. So, yeah, there was not any real revenue opportunities for us um, because of the closure in 2020. In the last 15 seasons, you know, there's not have been a season such as 2020 where we've been you know, asked to close and, you know, as of today, there's still no green light for 2021. While water parks continue planning for possible reopening this spring, California theme parks are already humming, welcoming visitors back on April 1st, though at significantly reduced capacity. For now, safety regulations make it quite a different experience. Ticket sales are now mostly online and limited, so while many people may enjoy shorter lines for a change, not all the rides are open. And long gone are the days of greeting costume characters or crowded parades, and no more snacking while standing in queues. And this new reality comes with new business models. Disneyland Resort in California has canceled annual passes that normally aim to attract visitors during off-season, a term that doesn't exist anymore. The company laid off over 32,000 employees in recent months during a time when its California park served as a vaccination site. It's estimated that um, the theme park and attractions industry lost five times more employees uh, last year on average than any other industry. The impact to the entire industry has been devastating. Um, it's estimated that in 2019, the industry generated uh, $25 billion. Last year, that dropped to $15 billion, a $10 billion uh, drop uh, loss. The world's largest theme park operator, though, is seeing explosive growth in its streaming services, fortuitously launched just before the pandemic. Those profits have helped offset the billions of losses in theme park revenues. But for the mid-range companies, it's a different story. SeaWorld, Six Flags, uh, they got big lines of credit to help them get through this. And, and a lot of the money that they've borrowed is going to need to be paid off. So that's going to potentially depress any capital improvements that they're going to be able to do for the next few years. Data that we've seen has shown that up to a third of the market will not consider a visit to a theme park in 2021, no matter what happens. Once a popular attraction for people of all ages, 
The theme park industry is now facing its toughest time, with its expansion in recent years now being replaced with what looks like years of recovery. It is Tian Shan, CGTN, Los Angeles. A concert in Spain attended by 5,000 people as part of a COVID-19 trial led to no significant increase in infections. Six people tested positive within two weeks of the show where there was no social distancing. That's lower than the average transmission rate in the general Spanish population. Similar studies are planned at football matches and rock concerts in the UK. You're watching CGTN. Still ahead, lighting up the night sky. This year's first pink supermoon is seen across the world. How did it get its name? Each day, there are millions of stories. Each one can open new perspectives, new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there to see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you all around the world, all around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing, and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN. See the difference. What would you say is a good question? Stephen, I'd say it's one where there's always more than one answer. The Answers Project is a new podcast series from CGTN Europe. With me, Stephen Cole. And me, Mari Beveridge. In each episode, we'll take a complex question. And with the help of some of the world's foremost experts, shine light on some of the answers. So join us for The Answers Project. Available wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to Global Business Europe. China has been laying out the roadmap to meet its targets for cutting carbon emissions. The country's environment authorities say the starting point could be improving energy efficiency. CGTN's Huang Yu reports. China's Ministry of Ecology and Environment says in order to realize the nation's goal of achieving peak carbon emissions before 2030, it has been working with relevant industries, electricity, steel and petrochemistry, to name a few, to map out a practical path. We are promoting the establishment of a national carbon emissions trading system. We've started with the electricity generation industry and plan to include other high emission industries next. Building this system is an important way to curb carbon emissions. Li says before carbon emissions do finally peak, controlling carbon intensity, the amount of carbon dioxide emissions the country produces per unit of GDP, is a key starting point. Many countries around the world have also put intensity targets first and foremost. In fact, China's greenhouse gas emissions are still growing. Controlling carbon intensity can better balance emissions reduction with economic development. China's carbon intensity had decreased by 48.4 percent by the end of 2020 compared with 2005. The country is now working on formulating an action plan for peaking carbon dioxide emissions before 2030. Li says in addition to upgrading traditional industries and tapping into renewable energies, China is also pushing forward legislation on climate change. China has committed to moving from carbon peak to carbon neutrality from 2030 to 2060, 30 years in much shorter time span than many developed countries might take. Huang Yue, CGTN, Beijing. A new malaria treatment shown to be 77% effective in trials in Africa has been announced by the UK institution behind the COVID-AstraZeneca vaccine.
The Jenner Institute at Oxford University says the development could be a game changer in the fight against the disease that killed over 400,000 people worldwide in 2019. CTTN's Robert Najila reports. With much of Africa still fighting to control the spread of COVID-19, news that a vaccine against malaria has been developed with a 77% efficacy could not have come at a better time. For the first time, a vaccine has reached the efficacy level that WHO have been looking for. They want a malaria vaccine with 75% or more efficacy by 2030. We think we can do that. So 77% is the highest yet and could really add to the existing tools that we use to control malaria. WHO says Africa continues to carry a disproportionately high share of the global malaria burden. In 2019, 94% of all malaria cases and deaths were on the continent. According to the World Malaria Report released in November last year, 409,000 people died from malaria in 2019. Most of them were young children in sub-Saharan Africa. Six countries among them, Nigeria, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Tanzania, Burkina Faso, Mozambique and Niger, accounted for half of all malaria deaths worldwide. In recent years, efforts to control malaria have been scaled up, reducing mortality by an estimated 44% in the past decade. But the disease continues to have a huge impact on economies and their populations in Africa. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention says direct costs associated with malaria, including illness, treatment, and premature deaths, have been estimated to be at least $12 billion per year. CDC says the cost in lost economic growth is much higher. Robert Magilla, CGTN, Nairobi, Kenya. And finally, the first pink supermoon of 2021 has been seen across the world. From Sydney's Bondi Beach to New Delhi's India Gate, the supermoon lit up the night sky. The supermoon happens when the moon is at its closest point to Earth and appears bigger, despite being 222,000 miles away. And while it's known as a pink supermoon, it's not very pink. April's full moon is named after the wild ground phlox flower, which is pink and blooms in the northern hemisphere at spring. Don't worry if you missed it, though. The supermoon will appear full for a few more nights to come. The headlines again. India is struggling to cremate its dead as the country grapples with the second wave of coronavirus. Hospitals are having to turn patients away due to a lack of oxygen supplies and beds, and makeshift funeral pyres are being built in the capital. The international community is rallying to India's aid, with supplies and equipment arriving from around the world. The first shipment came from Britain, and Germany and France say they will send supplies in the next few days. And the European Parliament is finally getting its chance to debate and vote on the post-Brexit trade deal, four months after it came into effect. MEPs are expected to wade through the deal, but the EU has said that the UK will be held responsible for any breaches. Well, that's it for Global Business Europe. Thanks for watching. More on all of our stories at europe.cgtn.com and do follow CGTN Europe on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. We're on smart TV apps such as Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire and Android TV on YouTube and Dailymotion as well as cgtn.com and the CGTN app. Coming up next on CGTN, it's Africa Live. We will see you again tomorrow, same time, same place. From all of the team in London, it's goodbye. Goodbye.
This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. India reports over 320,000 new COVID-19 cases amid severe second wave. Chad protests turn deadly as demonstrators demand a civilian rule. And U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken to meet Nigeria's President Buhari virtually on Tuesday. Hello and welcome. You're watching Africa Live. We're coming to you live from Nairobi. I'm Hannah Vivier and here with the latest in business is Rama. That's right, Hannah. Here's what's coming up in the course of the hour. South Africa unveils a $100 million fund to support women-owned firms in the energy sector. And Tunisia announces relief measures designed to cushion firms affected by pandemic restrictions. We'll have the details on those stories and plenty more coming your way in the course of the hour. For now, let's start with the latest in current affairs with Hannah. We're looking forward to that, Roma. We'll see you in a bit. Well, the number of new COVID-19 cases in India has remained above 300,000 for six straight days. A number of countries are sending aids to help India battle the new wave of infections. Ravinda Bawa has more from Delhi. Well, experts are saying that, of course, it will not be enough, knowing that the way the infectivity rate is rising or is high in many places. In some places, it has dipped, but overall, it's quite high. And because of that, the number of infections are rising. So the rate at which the infections are rising and the rate at which the help is being pour, pouring in or the new infrastructure is being ramped up, it will take time for the two to balance out. And for that, it is very important that we break the chain of the spread of this virus we do keep those lockdowns in place, which, of course, it is not a national lockdown, but we know that cities like Delhi, Delhi, Mumbai and other places have announced these lockdowns to break the chain, to actually slow down the infection so that people who are pouring into these hospitals get the uh, correct treatment or treatment at the right time. Because right now it is a race against time. A lot of people are losing their lives because of the lack of oxygen and we are seeing those visuals on a daily basis we are hearing that news from all corners on a daily basis and is it is really unfortunate what is happening uh, on the ground in india china says it stands ready to help india fight the coronavirus chinese state councillor and foreign minister wang yi made the remark at a virtual meeting with five of its south asian counterparts afghanistan pakistan nepal sri lanka and bangladesh he also shared proposals on economic recovery and regional cooperation. China is implementing President Xi Jinping's pledge to make vaccines a global public good, carrying out vaccine cooperation on a global scale. We are willing to promote vaccine cooperation with other countries via flexible means, such as free aid, commercial procurement and production under the framework of the Six Nation Cooperation Mechanism. The six nations reached a consensus to join hands in fighting the pandemic. They agreed to respect each other's efforts in coping with the crisis and support the WHO's leadership. They also agreed to enhance cooperation to help each other improve the ability to handle major public health emergencies. The cooperation includes vaccine distribution and production. Regarding the post-pandemic economic recovery, the six nations agreed to continue their belt and road cooperation and improve the livelihoods of the poor. They also agreed to oppose bullying, interference and double standards in diplomacy and to expand cooperation in various fields. Turkey is set to go into full lockdown on Thursday. President Recep Tayyip Erdogan made the announcement following a record levels of COVID cases reported there last week. Michelle Bardavid reports. The Turkish government's decision to impose a full national lockdown had been anticipated by many. On April 16th, daily new cases had reached record levels of 63,000. On Monday, daily new cases had decreased to about 37,000, but the Turkish president has stressed this figure needs to be much lower. We have to bring down the number of our cases below 5,000 at a time when Europe entered a period of easing the restrictions. Otherwise, it will be inevitable for us to face with heavy consequences in every field from tourism to trade and education. 
The new measures will take effect on April 29th, Thursday evening, and end on the morning of May 17th. That means the restrictions will be imposed during the entire month of Ramadan, as well as the Eid holiday. Many in Turkey were looking forward to a vacation during Eid, but intercity travel has been banned, except for those with official approval. Grades of all levels will be switching to online education as schools have been shut down completely. Public transportation will be operating at half capacity. All offices are ordered to close shop. There is an exception for essential workers, such as emergency service workers, health workers, and those in the food and manufacturing industries. This is the strictest lockdown imposed in Turkey so far. The government had been avoiding lockdowns to prevent a financial meltdown. However, bringing case levels down now is crucial to save the tourism industry as the summer season is about to begin. I'm Mikhail Bardavid for CGTN in Istanbul. Here on the African continent, the Nigerian government says it is expecting nearly 30 million doses of the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine. Nigeria aims to vaccinate at least 40% of its population before the end of the year. Reporting from JOS, here is Tisem Akende. Some 29.8 million doses of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine have been promised to Nigeria, according to the head of the country's health body, Dr. Faisal Shwaib. No exact date has been given for the arrival of the vaccines, but Dr. Shwaib says the government signed up to receive the vaccines through the African Union. The primary health care boss also stated that more AstraZeneca vaccine deliveries through the COVAX facility are expected by the end of May or early June. He says that will allow Nigeria to administer the second dose of the vaccines it received in March to those who got their first jobs. Dr. Shaib noted that nearly 1.2 million Nigerians have received their first dose of their AstraZeneca vaccine shots. That is almost 60% of the eligible groups targeted in the first phase. The government says it's making efforts to hit its target of vaccinating at least 40% of its citizens in 2021 and another 30% by the end of 2022. Tessim Akendi, CGTN Joss, Nigeria. In Chad, at least two people have been killed and 27 others injured in anti-military demonstrations. French President Emmanuel Macron and the President of the Democratic Republic of Congo, Felix Tshisekedi, have condemned the violent action against protesters. Both leaders are calling for a civilian military solution. Noktula Shabalala brings us that story. It's been a week after the military took control of the country, following the death of President Idris Deby. Demonstrators in Chad have taken to the streets, demanding a return to civilian rule. Tires have been burning in several neighborhoods in the capital, Jamena. In a statement on Monday, the Military Transitional Council banned demonstrations while the country is still in mourning. Police have been patrolling the streets under pressure to stop protests. The African Union has expressed grave concern about the military takeover. French President Emmanuel Macron has condemned the violence against demonstrators. We want to express our worry over the development of the situation in Chad, first of all by strongly condemning the repression of protests and the violence that took place this morning in Jamena. We are calling for the respect of the commitments that were taken by the Transitional Military Council, that of peace and political inclusion. During a meeting in Paris, French President Macron and the President of the Democratic Republic of Congo, Felix Tshisekedi, say they remain in favor of a peaceful transition in Chad. Let me be very clear. I gave my support to the integrity and the stability of Chad very clearly in Jamena. I support peaceful, democratic, inclusive transition. I do not support a plan of succession, and France will never be on the side of those who form this plan. The time has come to start a national political dialogue that is open to all Chadians. That is what is expected of the Transitional Military Council, and that is the same condition of our support. On Chad, we are on the same wavelength. We need to quickly restore democratic order. I'm sticking to the same line of thought that I said in Jamena. We, of course, support the current stability. But under the condition that they go quickly towards the consolidation of democracy, 
of democratic institutions. Meanwhile, in his first address to the nation, military council leader Mahamad Idris Debi has called on international support to improve the situation in the country. Chad needs the national and international community to succeed in this transition, as the challenges are huge. Chad needs massive support from its partners to stabilize an economic and financial situation heavily impacted by the security, health, humanitarian and social situation. I also want to reassure our partners that Chad will continue to hold its own and take on its responsibilities in the fight against terrorism and will respect all its international commitments. Noctula Shabalala, CGTN. The United States Secretary of State Antony Blinken is expected to emphasize America's commitments to Nigeria's democracy and security in virtual talks with President Muhammadu Buhari. The meeting comes at a time when there has been an increase in violence and kidnappings in Nigeria. Philly Hazard reports from Abuja. The U.S. State Department confirmed that the talks between the Secretary of State and Nigeria's president will be held virtually on Tuesday. The meeting is part of Antony Blinken's first virtual trip to Africa. He is scheduled to hold talks with the governments of Kenya and Nigeria, as well as engage with young people from across the continent. His meeting with President Buhari is aimed at strengthening democratic governance, building lasting security, and promoting economic ties and diversification in the country. The meeting is coming at a time when Nigeria is plagued with a range of insecurity problems including insurgency kidnapping and ethnic clashes secretary blinken will also participate in a health partnership event to assess collaborations in combating the pandemic as well as long-term u.s investment in tackling infectious diseases he's also scheduled to speak with nigeria's foreign minister Geoffrey onyema to re-evaluate the bilateral relationship phil ihaza cgtn abuja well, during that virtual meeting with U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, Nigerian President Muhammadu Bukhari stated that the United States should consider moving the military headquarters for AFRICOM to Africa itself. According to a statement issued by the Nigerian presidency, Bukhari viewed the move better to tackle the growing armed violence in West Africa and Central Africa, as well as the Gulf of Guinea, the Lake Chad region, and the Sahel. Africa Command is currently overseeing all its Africa operations from Stuttgart in Germany. Let's continue in Nigeria where it's now being reported that the latest round of kid student kidnappings in northern Nigeria can be traced to as far back as December of last year. Hundreds of students have been abducted from their schools by what authorities say are criminal gangs and armed bandits. CDT's Robert Nagila takes a closer look at the scale of that problem that Nigerian authorities are battling with. On December 11th, more than 300 boys are kidnapped from their school in Kankara, Katsina State, by armed bandits. They are released six days later. On February 17th, 42 people, among them 27 students, are abducted from the Government Science Secondary School in Kagara, Niger State. One person is killed during the raid. They are released on February 27th after negotiations with the bandits. On the 26th February, 279 girls are abducted from a boarding school in Zambara State. They are freed on March 2nd after a ransom was reportedly paid. On March 11th, 39 college students are taken hostage by bandits from their hostel outside the northwest city of Kaduna. Only 10 have been released. On April 20th, gunmen abducted about 20 students from the Greenfields University in Kaduna State. A rescue operation is still underway. Three students have reportedly been killed by the abductors, bringing the death toll from the attack to six. Now, UNICEF, the UN's children's agency, says more than 700 students have been kidnapped from schools in northern Nigeria since December. And Nigeria's president, Muhammad Buhari, has called the kidnappings barbaric terror attacks and pledged to fight them with every available resource. Back to you. Well, it's time now for us to take a short break and return. We'll be bringing more news, making headlines from across the continent. Africa is a continent of diversity with varied climates and enchanting geography, and a people so distinct but with a shared, enduring spirit. We are at the heart of the continent. 
to bring you the untold stories. Let's have a look. We celebrate Africa as it shapes its own destiny. I've been sure she turned in Syria, Ethiopia, Tanzania. Africa Live. Find your voice. Welcome back. You're watching Africa Live. Well, as China's economy shows a steady recovery from COVID-19, President Xi Jinping has been visiting some provinces in autonomous regions of the country. On his trip to southern China's Guangxi Zhuang Autonomous Region, he learned about efforts to boost local growth and protect ethnic culture as well as the environment. Jiang Xiaoyi has more. President Xi visited Nanning City, the capital of Guangxi, on Tuesday. He took in cultural performances by the Zhuang ethnic group and learned more about efforts to protect their heritage and to promote ethnic solidarity. On Monday, President Xi visited a food processing zone in the city of Liuzhou, which is the base for local specialty luosif and rice noodles. He said private enterprises should continue to strive, knowing they will have government support in challenging times. The party and state will support and provide guidance when private enterprises come across difficulties. Therefore, private enterprises should strive to thrive bravely. The special delicacy dates back to the 1980s, when night fairs started to emerge in Liuzhou. Featuring river snails and sour bamboo shoots, the dish became a sensation in China and created jobs for over 300,000 people. It is exported to more than 20 countries and regions in the world. President Xi also stressed the importance of innovation, especially as it begins its 14th five-year plan for economic development. He made the remarks to the Liu Gong Group, a leading Chinese machinery manufacturer in Liuzhou. The equipment manufacturing industry is of paramount importance to high-quality development where innovation plays a key role. Only through innovation can we become stronger and better. The Chinese president also called for efforts in ecological protection as he toured a park in Guilin, which is famous for its karst hills and caves. Jiang Shaoyi, CGTN. The head of the UN's peacekeeping operations has asked the Security Council to consider a six-month rollover for the mandate of its mission in South Sudan's Abyei region. Jean-Pierre Lacroix says this would give parties in Sudan and South Sudan more time to resolve security issues in the oil-rich contested area. Citizens Nogutula Shabalala reports. RBA is South Sudan's hotly contested region. The area sits on the Sudan and South Sudanese border. Both countries have claimed ownership of the oil-rich region. The 2005 peace deal that led to South Sudan's independence from Sudan required both Khartoum and Juba to work out the final status of the region. But it is still unresolved. In the meantime, the area is a theater for armed groups and ethnic clashes. Mr. President, the general security situation in the Abia area during the reporting period has been relatively calm, albeit volatile and unpredictable. The most prevalent threats to security were shooting incidents and the increased presence of unidentified armed groups. Out of 47 incidents recorded, 23 were attacks on civilians that resulted in five fatalities and serious injuries. Speaking at a virtual meeting of the UN Security Council, the UN peacekeeping chief says continued dialogue between Sudan and South Sudan has yielded many agreements. The main political highlight of this reporting period was the Joint Political and Security Mechanism JPSM meeting hosted by the government of, of the Sudan on the 28th and the 29th of October 2020. During the meeting, several important issues were agreed upon, including the establishment of checkpoints in Abia, the introduction of search and seize operations, the deployment of joint military observer teams throughout Abia area, the need for regular JPSM and AJOC meetings, and the need for progress on joint border verification and monitoring mechanism and border-related benchmarks. However, the talks did not translate into significant improvements on the ground in Abyei. 
As the security situation remains tense, the head of peace operations in the United Nations wants the UN mission for RBA to be extended. Since 2011, there are nearly 3,700 UN peacekeeping troops in the area. I would like to highlight that all parties continue to recognize the usefulness and relevance of UNISFA and recognize that the mission has also been instrumental in addressing tensions between the Ngog Dinka and the Miseria communities through community dialogue and reconciliation initiatives, despite operational constraints due to administrative bottlenecks. In view of the above, I would request that the Security Council considers a rollover mandate for UNISFA for six months until the 15th of October 2021, in order to give the party the space to discuss future arrangements and the way forward. The UN says improvement of bilateral relations between Sudan and South Sudan can stabilize RBA and, in turn, help strengthen regional stability in the Horn of Africa. Noktula Shabalala, CGTN. Let's head over to South Africa now, where President Cyril Ramaphosa has urged people in the country to appreciate and celebrate its diversity. He was speaking during the official Freedom Day celebrations. South Africa is celebrating 27 years since the birth of its democracy. CDTN's Yuri Sanjamela has more. The 27th of April 2021 marks 27 years since the end of apartheid regime. It's also the day when all South Africans were given a right to vote in the first democratic elections. This year's Freedom Day celebrations are held under the theme, The Year of Charlotte Matleke, the meaning of freedom under COVID-19. Matleke is celebrated for being the first black woman to graduate with a university degree, as well as being one of the founders of the Bantu Women's League, which later became the ANC Women's League. Many have paid the ultimate price so that we are able to breathe the clean air of freedom today. Over the years, we have encountered and overcome many challenges, but there are still many challenges that we are yet to overcome. These are problems common to all of us and they impact on all of us. But like those who came before us, we understand that no challenge is too great that it cannot be overcome. The president has also asked South Africans to unite in fighting social ills, particularly gender-based violence. South Africa has a femicide rate that's five times higher than the global average. Let us be guided by our loyalty alone. And our loyalty should be to our country. The struggles waged by our forebears were not for themselves alone, they were for the generations yet to come. We must take a firm stand against the social ills that prevent the men and the women and children of South Africa from living lives of freedom. We must take a firm stand against violence that is perpetrated against women and children. We must speak out and report any instances of gender-based violence, any if, even if the perpetrators are close to us. President Ramaphosa reminded South Africans to celebrate their diversity and nationhood, despite all the challenges they faced. Let us acknowledge and let us appreciate, and more importantly, let us celebrate the diversity of this country, for it is what makes us who we are. We may come from different backgrounds and different regions in our country, but we call ourselves South Africans with pride. Ramaphosa also emphasized that there's an urgent need to transform the ownership, control, and management of the economy so that black South Africans are fully represented and equally benefit. Yuri Sanjamila for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. You know, South Africans have designed interesting innovations since the COVID-19 pandemic hit over a year ago. 
Among their list of creations were rapid testing kits, self-isolation pods, and ultra-cold storage freezers. Well now, one entrepreneur is developing facial recognition technology that can identify people even when they're wearing face masks. CGTN's Julie Shia brings us this fascinating story. The wearing of masks to guard against COVID-19 is compulsory in South Africa and many other countries. It's posed a challenge when identifying people at banks, airports, or when you're simply trying to unlock your phone. One South African entrepreneur is working on finding a solution to identify people without having to remove their masks. When we got hit by this COVID-19 virus, we were told that we are not supposed to uh, move around touching surfaces. So we had to look for a contactless modality and at the same time look at the question of accuracy. Fingerprint is at the top. And then facial recognition is the second most accurate modality. The technology uses a limited amount of facial features left exposed by the mask, but it requires prior registration on a database. The accuracy is yet to be fully tested and approved by the country's Department of Trade and Industry. We actually had to come up with a solution that uses a, a blend or a mixture of um, conventional image processing techniques and what we call artificial intelligence techniques. You can actually recognize a person as they walk through the, the terminal without you having to ask them to take their mask off. Another innovation awaiting validation is a mobile ultra-cold freezer which could be a game-changer in vaccine delivery to poor and remote areas globally. It's not just COVID vaccines. Think about measles, mumps, um, even just the flu jab. All of these vaccines, if you're going to store them for a long period of time, you have to store them at minus 20 or lower. Ebola, for example, is minus 70. And so you don't have that many remote locations where you've got access to that kind of cooling power. The cryovac is battery powered and can last for close to a month without being charged. It can also be used to transport large amounts of vaccine to urban areas or far-flung places. You can get something like 600,000 vaccines in one aircraft. It simplifies your entire logistics chain, but more importantly, it means that you can dump it in the field and you can forget about it in the sun and for 25 days, you know that you will have GPS control, you will have temperature monitoring. COVID-19 is one of the most serious challenges faced by the globe. The World Health Organization estimates the continent has stepped up, accounting for 12.8 percent of all technological innovations piloted or adopted in 2020. Judy Sharas, Cape Town, South Africa. Let's cross over to East Africa now, where in Uganda, the police force has dismissed 153 officers over corruption and other disciplinary issues. According to a spokesperson, the police standards body found proof that the officers had discredited the force. For more details, here is Isabel in Akira. Ugandan police say some of the dismissed officers continuously involved themselves in fraudulent activities, even after several warnings. Others were relieved from work over neglect of duty and drunkenness. The incidents of misconduct were committed between 2015 and 2019. The police spokesperson says the move to punish the officers is meant to clean the image of the force. As a force, we expect the highest uh, professional standards from all our officers. Any allegations of uh, behavior that do not meet the set standards are rigorously investigated in accordance with the Police Act and standing orders. We believe this is going to help the public to have confidence in police officers uh, who have a duty to be honest, act with integrity, and not compromise or abuse their position. In 2020, the Uganda police force was named as the most corrupt public institution in the country by the Inspectorate of Government and the Uganda Bureau of Standards. Its public surveys suggest that most Ugandans do not trust the police. The police say the actions taken to remove the officers will help reduce the many complaints reported against the force. Isabel Nakiria, 
Sujitian, Kampala, Uganda. Meanwhile, Tanzania's President Samia Suluhu Hassan has freed more than 5,000 prisoners as the country celebrates Union Day. The celebrations mark 57 years since the coming together of Tanganyika and Zanzibar to form the Republic of Tanzania in 1964. TDTN's Daniel Kijo reports. Pardoning prisoners on Union Day is an annual tradition. The head of state is given powers by law to free prisoners during select national public holidays. Tanzania's President Samia Suluhu Hassan honored this practice by releasing and reducing sentences of 5,001 prisoners held in various prisons across the country. Of these prisoners, 1,516 were released after serving more than a quarter of their sentence. This is the minimum requirement as per Tanzania's Prisons Act. The president also announced that another 3,485 inmates will have their sentences reduced. A statement from the president's office further explained that these 3,485 prisoners that have had their sentences reduced will continue to serve the remaining part of their sentences in prison. Criteria for being released include suffering from serious illnesses, already having served the majority of one's uh, sentence, being pregnant while in prison, and committing uh, more minor crimes. Uh, President Samia called on all released prisoners to make good use of, their training, of the training they received while in prison and to join their fellow citizens in leading responsible lives. She also reminded the released prisoner to respect and comply with the national laws. Last year, the late uh, President John Wagufuli pardoned 3,973 prisoners in order to ease congestion in prisons. About 35,000 inmates are reported to be in the country's jails. Daniel Kijo, CGTN, Dar es Salaam. Well, I'll be standing by to bring you more news, including what's happening in the world of sport. But for now, let's take a look at what's happening in business with Rama. Thank you very much, Hannah. Here's what's coming up in Business News. South Africa unveils a $100 million fund to support women-owned companies in the energy sector. And Tunisia announces relief measures to cushion companies affected by pandemic restrictions. It's just taken me completely out of my depth, but... At the same time, it's exciting. It's new, it's different, it's a challenge. It's really exciting. back to the program. Now, as South Africa continues to experience an energy crisis, load shedding has become part of the normal routine and it's continuously crippling the economy. Load shedding is essentially a measure of last resort being used by the national power supplier, ESCOM, to prevent a collapse of the power system countrywide. Now, to help mitigate this issue, a $104 million fund has been set up to help women-owned enterprises produce electricity but also create jobs in renewable energy at the same time. Yes, GTN's Yolisa Njamela with that story. The fund seeks to invest in businesses and energy projects. Its other aim is to change the energy landscape by supporting players in the renewable energy independent power producer procurement program. The fund was made available by Machago Financial Services, a 100% black women owned and managed entity. This is a major deal, considering that the energy sector in South Africa still remains in white hands. Masako is an alternative investment company. We focus on socio-economic developmental assets because our passion is growing and driving the economy. And as a fund, we're going to be looking at investing in energy 
uh, projects, but then we're not only going to end at energy projects. We are also going to invest in uh, energy assets as well and companies. We're going to focus on the entire uh, energy or, uh, value chain. I mean, South Africa has been at, I mean, we've been exposed to load shedding. Uh, the energy gap, it's like so huge. So our fund actually uh, seeks to bridge that gap. The company is co-owned by sisters Makule Mupita and Meta Mkhari. The team has already managed over 4 billion rand in funds and now wants to see black participants, especially women, as key players in the sector. Participation of we women especially is still under 30%. But then even that 30%, actually, if you took out the funding that has been put up by all these different structures, you actually come down to less than 6% of black people and women representation. So what we seek to do as also the Black Energy Professionals Association, we seek to deliver on influence on policy changes so that uh, the imbalances of the past can really be um, removed. The fund is the first of its kind here in South Africa. At this point in time, there is no fund that is 100% owned by black women. And it's not only owned by black women, the team is also black women. And not only just a team because they are women, the team have been at the forefront of infrastructure development. Together they have over 40 years experience in infrastructure, in energy advisory, in project development, in the full value chain. Mkhari emphasized that sustainable investments are at the core of their focus. The group also intends to support South Africa's energy sector's recovery. Yuli Sanja Mela for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. On to North Africa now, where authorities in Tunisia have announced a range of relief measures designed to cushion companies affected by the pandemic and those that have not been able to settle their tax dues, not just for 2020, but for the year before that too. As CGTN's Alan Charchi now explains, companies have been given a grace period of up to seven years to settle their tax dues to the state. The Tunisian government explained that this payment advantage will include companies which have not yet concluded payment schedules for their tax debts for 2019 and 2020. Prime Minister Hisham Meshishi said the new tax facilities are part of the economic rescue plan. The measure is part of the economic rescue plan which was developed with our social partners. The government's willing to support companies to overcome this difficult period. We will save the affected SMEs, protect jobs and save the country's economy. Tunisian entrepreneurs have welcomed the state initiative. However, many business owners believe the government was too slow to react to the economic crisis. The COVID-19 pandemic has devastated many sectors and affected nearly all private companies. The role of the state is decisive. The government was absent for more than a year since the start of the health and the economic crisis. The recent measures will help companies improve liquidity. According to the National Institute of Statistics and the National Organization of Entrepreneurs, more Tunisian firms face specter of bankruptcy due to the COVID-19-induced economic crisis. More than 60% of enterprises or 450,000 companies in Tunisia are threatened with bankruptcy. More than 70,000 SMEs have definitely closed. The numbers are shocking. Hundreds of thousands of workers have lost their jobs. The new government measures in favor of companies are important but we need more support and incentives. In addition to the tax payment advantages, the Ministry of Finance has also launched a new support mechanism. More than 500 SMEs will benefit from the endowment line of support for the financial restructuring this year. As businesses are forced to stop operations, the Tunisian government has issued several tax incentives to mitigate the economic and social impact of the crisis. Authorities assert that the relief program for SMEs affected by the pandemic will protect up to 200,000 jobs. Admin Shawishi, CGTN, Tunis. Away from the continent now, the first quarter of 2021, China's investment uh, and countries along the Belt and Road Initiative maintained steady growth. Some 3,400 trains traveled between China 
and Europe during the period. That's 75% more than the same period a year earlier. As the GTN's Mark Hena reports, the boost comes as a first direct freight train from southwestern China to the Dutch capital of Amsterdam and the British port city of Felixstowe departed, marking the formal opening of two more stops along this transportation hub. Two freight trains carrying electronic devices and medical supplies have left for Amsterdam and Felixstowe on the eighth anniversary of the Chengdu Europe Railway Express. They are the latest additions to the now 61 lines of the Chengdu International Railway Port, which plays a vital part in building southwest China into a westbound gateway for foreign trade. The eastbound cargo is also growing uh, very rapidly, so we found a lot of new clients for that connection. We started first with uh, once a week, and currently we are already running the train with uh, four times a week. And that's not uh, only uh, milk powder, but it's also beer and uh, cars. The advantages of rail transport have been further recognized by businesses in foreign trade. For example, the cost is only one-eighth that of air freight, and the time needed is only one-third that of maritime shipping. Rail is much more reliable, especially in the post-epidemic era. This railway port not only connects businesses in the Chongqing Chengdu area with customers in Europe, but also other Chinese cities. So far, the port has cooperated with 20 other transportation hubs to facilitate internal economic circulation. On Monday, the Chengdu railway port signed cooperation terms with one of the largest shipping ports in East China, the Zhoushan port. It's part of plans to optimize logistics services for businesses in East Asia. CGTN, Chengdu. We're still in the world's second largest economy. With China having brought the coronavirus pandemic under control within its borders, life over there is getting back to normal. But as our reporter Liu Jiaxin now explores, day-to-day -day work for many people may never be the same again. Work, the power source of urban vitality. Even if you are not a workaholic, let's just admit that most of your life gives way to office hours. But when the epidemic struck, some companies had to make a choice. We actually started with a staggered work arrangement, where only half of our team members came to work in the office. Since COVID-19 hit, I've been carrying mobile phones and computers with me all the time. My work is somewhat flexible. My workplace can be wherever I want. For many people working for a digital economy, a mobile device and a smooth network will do the job. But the only issue is, is offline office really optional? I'm really looking forward to the combination of working from home and working in the office. Remote work is actually relatively advanced, but at present, it has its own challenges, like communication between colleagues. People find it better to work with their peers rather than working on their own. And some of the benefits of working at the company's office are really attractive. With the epidemic largely under control in China, most companies have returned to their pre-epidemic mode of work. In other countries and regions, remote work, more flexible office hours and four-day work weeks are becoming more popular. 20% of Canadian tech workers are able to work from home on a regular basis. And elsewhere, leaders in New Zealand and Finland are already advocating shorter working hours to boost domestic spending. Final story in the segment comes to you from Tanzania. One of the country's stated goals is to elevate the East African nation from its current middle income status. To do that, the government plans to produce a lot more industrial output, and that in turn requires enormous demand for electricity. We'll bring you the story now of one inventor who's attempting to meet Tanzania's growing energy needs by creating generators at home. Here's Isaac Lucando with that story. This workshop might be mistaken for a junkyard, but what comes out of it is enlightening. The strange-looking gadgets strewn across the room conceal an electricity generator that may revolutionize electricity generation in Tanzania. 
Rogers Msuya, its 52-year-old inventor, says what's unique about the generator is that it uses magnets to generate electricity. I am an expert in water pumps and electricity generating machines, but the difference is that the generators I make don't use fuel, they use free energy. So I've been researching on getting energy without using energy. The idea of a free energy generator or generating power from a never-ending source like a magnet is not a new one. What got the government interested in Msuya's invention is his ability to make easy-to-use units that generate up to 155 kilovolts of electricity that can even power a street. An expert from the government confirmed that the magnets can indeed generate electricity. Other experts went on to satisfactorily measure the amount of electricity generated and saw that by using this technology, it is possible to generate large amounts of electricity that could be entered into the national grid. Earlier this year, the Ministry of Energy formally recognized Msuya and his invention and is now looking at ways to partner with him. With a total of 1,600 megawatts of electricity currently being generated in the country, the government wants to add on other sources of electricity, in addition to hydropower, solar, geothermal, and wind power that are already in use. According to the government, Tanzania's long-term plans are to increase the country's electricity capacity to 10,000 megawatts from various sources by 2025. The government sees the inventions of people like Rogers Msuya as key to reaching this goal. With only a primary school education, Msuya's success has been fueled by an intense love of electrical engineering. Having once made a helicopter that actually worked, he says his main challenge is accessing capital to realize all the ideas he has. Any money I get, however little, I invest in these projects. I might have some money in my mobile money wallet, but I direct everything here because if you don't create, what will you have to show? If you don't research, what will you have to say? Nsuya makes a living by selling the generators he makes to whoever is interested. However, he's not yet done inventing. He says he aims to pass on his skills to the younger generation and keep providing energy solutions to light up his country and the African continent. Isaac Lukando, CGTN, Dar es Salaam. And I'll leave it there for the time being. I'll be back at the top of the hour, though. We'll be heading over to Uganda at the top of the hour. It's become the second African country after Zambia to say, yeah, we'd like to reschedule some of our debts. But how did the country end up in this situation? And how big of a problem do they have as far as public debt is concerned? We'll have some answers for you live from Kampala at 1800 GMT. See you then. For now, back to Hannah. We'll see you then, Rama. Well, let's now take a short break and return your sport news, including... Cameroonian UFC heavyweight champion Francis Ngannou returns home to Heroes. Welcome. Its effects are surreal, but its existence is undeniable. Mother Nature is fighting back against a species that is destroyed. We're here to raise our voices. Uh, we know that climate change has already started and it's killing us. It hurts. Amid the tears and the grief, however, there is hope for resolution. We need to live in harmony with nature. We focus on the deeds, the deals and the people working to make a difference. This is surviving climate change, only on CGTN. How would you create your legend? On the fields, on the tracks, in the arenas of Africa. Were you born to be a player? Could this moment be yours? Sports scene. Find your game.
Time now for the sport news. We begin in Douala where Cameroon's Francis Ngannou, the first ultimate fighting champion African heavyweight champion, received a hero's welcome when he returned home on Monday. Ngannou won the American Mixed Martial Arts League heavyweight title last month. He toured Cameroon's largest city, Douala, showing off his championship belt to cheers from fans along the street. Ngannou came from humble beginnings, starting out as a sand miner in his hometown of Bati in western Cameroon. His win in the United States made UFC history and inspired many back home. Meeting with local officials, Ngannou, who is expected to tour other cities in Cameroon, including the capital Yaoundé, spoke about what the support from home meant to him. It's been a month since I have been waiting for this day, and finally, it has come. It warms my heart to see all the people here today. Everyone who has come for this event has come to welcome me back home. I want to thank you all from the bottom of my heart for all the support, because your support has helped me get to this level. It's been three years since I started this journey, and I promise that I will keep this belt at home. I am inspired by your encouragement. I am very happy to see my champion, Nganu, Francis Nganu. He is our brother. He has turned into a father figure. We are with him. We fight with him. Even when he went for the UFC, we were with him. Nganu, Francis Nganu is like a father to many. The whole of Cameroon is behind him. I am so proud to the point where even if I die today, I am glad that I saw Nganu, our champion, the champion of champions. In netball, South Africa's team has made a winning start in the 2023 World Cup qualification campaign. The Proteus came back from a long lockdown break to take top honors in the Tri-Nations tournament at home where they convincingly registered six straight wins against Zambia and Uganda. CDTN's Julie Shire reports. South Africa's netball team extended their unbeaten run to clinch their first title after emerging from a strict lockdown. The year long put the brakes on sporting events and team training, causing some anxiety among the players. Having to train alone and then coming into here, doing the court sessions, doing everything together as a group is quite different. And sometimes it doesn't matter how much you train individually, uh, doing these type of sessions is really exhausting. I think the important part was to ensure that everyone is at good state, um, mentally, obviously, and physically. The Proteas also suffered a major setback, losing many international players in the last year. But getting their first tournament win has boosted the team's confidence. Yeah, the spirit in the team is really great. Um, the experienced players uh, really step up and take the youngsters and the um, new players into the team really well. They're helping them at, um, on and off court to adapt, and we um, really am grateful for this opportunity. The focus remains on preparing for the World Cup, which will be hosted by South Africa in two years. One wants to stay at the top and represent uh, their country. So I think uh, that part of it, in terms of development and having the depth in our country, is brilliant. So maybe this going on and going forward is probably literally going to be what we need, with a whole lot of other things obviously on the side. But we need depth, and I think this set up here, um, obviously before this bar challenge, is creating that for us, not just for us as players only, but for coaches as well. Wow, we're very excited. I think at this stage we're just taking it like one tournament um, to the next just to get the combinations going and um, to start building on the, the basics, working towards 2023. The Proteas are ecstatic to have their first win under their belt. They can now put a long and stressful lockdown behind them and focus on polishing up their game as they head towards the World Cup. Judy Shara, CGTN, Cape Town, South Africa. To the Bundesliga now, where Bayern Munich have signed RB Leipzig coach Julian Nagelsmann to take over from Hansi Flick next season on a five-year contract. The Bavarian giants say this on Tuesday. The 33-year-old Nagelsmann took the reins at second place RB Leipzig in 2019 and led them to the Champions League semifinals last year. Flick is leaving Bayern at the end of the season of his own free will, despite having a contract until 2023. Nagelsmann, the youngest ever Bundesliga coach when he took over at Hoffenheim five years ago, was long seen as a Bayern target. Nagelsmann led Leipzig to third place in his first season as well as the Champions League last four. While this season, his team still have an outside shot at the title, seven points behind Bayern with three games remaining. 
Flick is the strongest candidate to succeed German coach Joachim Lowe after the Euro Championships in June. I would not have terminated this contract to go to other clubs. Our talks were good, they were fair, they were open on my side, on Oliver's side. We were very direct with each other, talked about things and I said from the very beginning that if there wasn't any agreement, I wouldn't accept it. And as I said in the press conference, there were no treats on my side or from my advisor's side, and so it was accepted. So I don't think this has anything to do with breaching a contract or anything else like morality to fulfill contracts. In Italy, UEFA are planning an investigation into AC Milan star striker Zlatan Ibrahimovic for having alleged ties to a betting company. A Swedish newspaper reported early this month that Ibrahimovic has been part, a part owner of Bethard since 2018. FIFA's Code of Ethics states a player cannot have interest in entities or companies that promote, broker, arrange, or conduct betting, gambling, lotteries, or similar events or transactions connected with football matches and competitions. If found guilty, the 39-year-old would have to pay a fine of just over 100,000 U.S. dollars and face a ban from any football-related activity for a maximum of three years, effectively ending his career. Nigerian forward Kelechi Iheanacho can simply not stop scoring in the English Premier League after notching his 14th goal in as many games when his team, Leicester City, came from behind to beat Crystal Palace 2-1 at the King Power Stadium on Monday night. Leicester manager Brendan Rodgers has hailed Iheanacho for the superb late winner that kept their Champions League push on course. We've obviously had to design the team around the injuries we had. A bit of common sense, putting in attacking players, and uh, he's come in and uh, been absolutely incredible. Really, you know, 14 goals, I think it is, in, in 14 games, and all different types of finishes. So, uh, and tonight the goal was, wow, what a what a strike! So, uh, absolutely delighted from the team R, um, and uh, a real collective uh, win for the for the guys this evening. Well, that's it for this edition of Africa Live. Remember that you can send your feedback to contacts on the screen and follow us on digital media platforms. For me, Hannah Vivier, and the rest of the Africa Live team, thank you so much for watching. Rama is up next with Global Business.
This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Hello there. Welcome to this edition of Global Business Africa. In the course of the hour, we'll run through the business news stories you need to know about from the continent and beyond. But first, a very quick run through the markets here for you. So relatively flat numbers coming through in some of the markets we track here. In fact, Kenya's basically given up all the gains that it had uh, made a little earlier in the year. It's basically back to where it started 2021 from. Um, elsewhere in the world, Tesla shares are down by almost 4% in the market today, at least in pre-market trading. Uh, on a year-to-date basis, it's also relatively flat, just about 0.5% uh, higher. Now, for a stock that essentially had gone up by over 300% in the last 12 months, this performance so far this year has been pretty subdued. Here's what's coming up tonight. Uganda becomes the second African country after Zambia to seek a rescheduling of its debts. The central bank in Nigeria puts sugar and wheat on a forex restriction list in order to boost local production. And a freight train from southwestern China to the Dutch capital makes its maiden voyage. We start the program tonight in Uganda, where the government over there says it may approach its major creditors, seeking suspension of debt repayment as it grapples with a growing default risk. Uganda's total public debt load surged to over $18 billion as of the end of 2020. That's 35% more compared to the previous year. This was occasioned by fresh borrowing to cover revenue shortfalls as a range of measures taken to combat COVID-19 hit the economy fairly hard and stifled tax collections. External creditors include China and the World Bank. They hold roughly two-thirds of Uganda's debt. Over the last decade, the East African nation has drastically expanded its borrowing, especially from China, in order to fund infrastructure development. That includes money that went into airports, power plants, and roads. Negotiations are currently underway as well with China for a $2.2 billion loan to finance the construction of a standard gauge rail line. Over in West Africa, the National Statistics Office in Ghana says that the country is on the path to recovery after it suffered a downturn due to the pandemic. According to the government's agency, Ghana's economy grew by 3.3% in the last quarter of the year. That's from a contraction of 3.2% seen in Q3 2020. Here's GTN's Nabil Ahmed Rufai with the details from Accra. Ghana's statistical service says the real estate industry contributed significantly to economic growth at the end of last year, when COVID-19 lockdown restrictions were eased, while other sectors of the economy, like tourism and hospitality industry, were the hardest hit, the housing sector recorded a growth of 43.5%. The lockdown influenced many Ghanaians, especially those living abroad, to buy homes. Analysts are concerned that the hospitality industry in Ghana is still reeling from the pandemic. Services sector has been the one that has been leading in terms of you know uh, contributing to the economy. So uh, the hotel chains and all of that hugely affected. I'm sure some of the hotels we I'm mean, involved in a lot of activities in the hotels in terms of events and what have you. You go and see that most of them have closed their conferences and what have you because of the, the danger that revolves around this COVID-19. The government reviewed its projection of the economic growth last year from 6.5 percent to 0.9 percent when the pandemic struck. But the year ended with a 0.4% growth, according to data from the statistical service. The government has to be strategically positioned to support these uh, major players in these chains, in this value chain of the tourism. It's very key so that when we rebound back, we will be at a place where we can build from where we left off pre-COVID. The IMF has estimated Ghana's economy to grow by 4.6% this year, higher than the 3.3% growth it's projected for the whole of sub-Saharan Africa. Ghana is among few African countries that recorded a positive economic growth rate last year, despite the fallout from COVID-19 pandemic. The government is targeting a 5% growth in the economy this year as it rules out its vaccination. Nabil Ahmed Rufai, CGTN, Accra, Ghana. On to North Africa, the Central Bank of Egypt has allowed banks to issue electronic currencies that will be subject to its direct supervision. Now, each coin in the mobile payment service will essentially be equal on a one-to-one -one basis with one Egyptian pound. 
At CGTN's Yasser Hakim now reports, Apex Bank has already warned financial institutions against the use of cryptocurrencies, which it sees as being very high-risk assets. The issuance of the electronic currencies is the first of its kind in Egypt. One unit of the new electronic currency is to have the value of one Egyptian pound and is to be used via the mobile wallet and service providers. The state and central bank policies are aimed at achieving financial inclusion and digital transformation, as well as to transform the society into a cashless economy. It protects the different sides of any transaction, whether consumers or traders. This system will help merge the informal economy with the formal economy, as all transactions will be monitored by banks and so will naturally increase the tax revenue for the state. The central bank has stepped up its drive for digital transformation in the last few years, encouraging Egyptians to part way with cash and log online. Electronic currencies are going to be the trend and an alternative to the paper notes and coins. It's a good idea, especially that the central bank can control the transactions, making it easier and safer to use. The Bitcoin or virtual and electronic currencies are the future. The Bitcoin or cryptos are volatile. To have a currency monitored by the central bank will create stability, which is important for us. But is the introduction of the electronic currency a step towards issuing cryptocurrencies, which the central bank has strongly rejected? There's a difference between the electronic currency and cryptocurrency. The electronic currency is issued against an actual amount of money in the person's bank account, unlike the cryptocurrency that doesn't have any financial control, no base or form to protect the currency owner nor to monitor illegal transactions. There will be a limit on issuing electronic units for each person. However, the e-currency can be exchanged into Egyptian pound. Achieving financial inclusion and digital transformation will elevate Egypt in the world rankings and ratings of the international markets and will help improve the climate for business in Egypt. Yes, Hakim for CGTN, Cairo. All right, then a quick run through some company news. Egypt says it hopes it will soon end a dispute over compensation regarding the huge container vessel that blocked the Suez Canal last month. The Suez Canal Authority is claiming $916 million in damages from the ever given owners. The 400 meter long vessel is owned by Japan's Shoei Kaisen Kaisha, but it's operated by a firm based in Taiwan. It blocked the vital waterway for six days, disrupting shipping markets and ports around the world. In East Africa, digital mobile lenders in Kenya will have six months to be licensed by the central bank if lawmakers adopt a proposed law. The Central Bank of Kenya Amendment Bill of 2021 aims to curb the steep digital lending rates that have plunged many borrowers into a debt trap as well as predatory lending. It will also seek to push out rogue players amid concerns about unethical business practices, including money laundering, illegal mining of customer private data, and the shaming of borrowers who default on repayment. The UK consumer book market had an interesting year. Retail sales were up 7% to about $3 billion last year as readers facing several lockdowns at home made their escape into books. Fiction sales were up 16%. Non-fiction were up by 4%. Print accounted for $2.3 billion of those sales. Digital sales, however, were up by 24%. Clearly, you still prefer the physical book. Bestsellers included The Thursday Murder Club by Richard Osman, Girl, Woman, Other by Bernadina Veristo, and Seven Ways by Jamie Oliver. And HSBC has reported stronger than expected earnings, and it says economic outlook is a lot brighter. Europe's largest bank by assets reported income of $5.8 billion for the first quarter of the year. HSBC's results were strong in its heartland of Asia, particularly in the wealth and asset management division that recorded a collective $24 billion in net client money under management in the quarter. The investment bank also reported a surge in trading and advisory revenues, matching trends seen earlier this month on Wall Street. That's a run through your company headlines.
All right, then let's get back to our lead story. Uganda, uh, especially the finance minister in that particular country, expressing interest in asking the country's creditors for a bit of forbearance for a break in debt service. What does that mean for the Pearl of Africa? Let's explore that in some more detail. John Walugembe is executive director of the Federation of Small and Medium-Sized Enterprises in Uganda. He joins us now live from Kampala. Um, John, welcome to the program. Does Uganda, in your view, does a country need to raise fresh debt to pay off the expensive part of its $18 billion debt portfolio? Or is a break on debt service sufficient to give the country the breathing room it needs? Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I need to say that Uganda's debt levels are reaching unsustainable levels. They estimated to reach close to 47.2% of GDP. And during this year's budget, government is projecting to borrow more, so we would not recommend this method. I think they are, they can, government can look at different ways of uh, financing its debt. One, government can uh, cut expenditure. Two, government can raise taxes. The challenge with raising taxes now is that because of the pandemic, uh, a lot of businesses are struggling. So uh, I don't think that they can sustainably raise money this way. So I think debt is inevitable, but they shouldn't simply borrow debt to repay debt. They should look at other ways of managing this, principally through Right, and unfortunately, we've lost that connection to John Malagemba there in Kampala. Time for a short break here on Global Business Africa. Here's what's coming up. Nigeria's central bank restricts FX access to sugar and wheat imports in order to boost local production. And we'll take a look at the extent to which supply chains have been disrupted in our series on the impact of the pandemic on Africa's economy. The world economy as we know it is about to change. Global business reports highlight emerging markets, developing countries, and dynamic sectors worldwide. We feature top analysts and newsmakers to provide perspectives on every facet of business. From an on-the-ground perspective, we provide you with balanced and objective assessments. Fast, sharp, and insightful. Global business. Only on CGTN. Africa is the nexus of enterprise, and global business will tell you why it matters. From the mega investment projects to multi-billion dollar mergers and acquisitions. Africa today collects, just in terms of revenues from taxes alone, $545 billion a year. If you take 10% of that and you devote it to the energy sector, problem solved. All this on global business, weekdays at this time on CGTN. There is more to this place than just glorious landscapes. There's more to it than just, say, Table Mountain or glorious, endless salt flats. There's more to it than countries that are home to some of the deepest minds in the world. There is so much more to this place, even if it is home to some of the finest diamonds on the planet. It is the sheer diversity of the people who call South Africa home and the relentless drive to make it a better place that make it so special. And we know that because this too is home. No one knows South Africa like we do. CGTN, see the difference. Welcome back to the program. Let's head over to Nigeria. The central bank over there has announced plans to place sugar and wheat on its foreign exchange restriction list. This is part of a broader plan, according to the CBN, that's aimed at boosting local production of these commodities. Now, despite spending over $150 million importing sugar in 2019, Nigeria still has enormous demand, and demand in the country is simply way beyond what local supply can currently meet. Here's CGTN's Kelechi Mikalam with the details. Officials of Nigeria's central bank taking a tour of a 60,000 hectares sugar factory in north central Nigeria. The factory, estimated at $500 million, is run by Africa's richest man, Aliko Dangote. 
The government is a major financier of the project and it wants to cut imports on the products. Right now, the Central Bank of Nigeria spends close to between 600 to 1 billion dollars, 600 million to 1 billion dollars importing sugar into the country. And that is a humongous sum of money. And so and we're saying that if Nigeria can produce sugar and be self-sufficient in food production, that this should be something that we should support. We would also leverage by providing some funding for this project in Naira. And of course, he needs dollar to import the equipment that will keep this project running. Hopefully, in the next two years, we will provide that support. So that is our interest here because it will reduce, um, it will reduce uh, in reliance on importation uh, on foreign on forex. Sugar is a staple in Nigerian homes. The nation's sugar demand currently stands at 1.6 million metric tons, but local production capacity is 130,000. Economic watchers say the decision to ban importation of the said products is wrongly timed. Why you are investing on local production? You don't stop, uh, uh, what is it called, uh, 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 export, I mean, importation. And moreover, what is the quantity of uh, 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 um, sugar and wheat importation compared to other things we imported, including PMS, that form the bulk of our foreign exchange spending and earnings. So it, 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 it's just like you have an elephant as a problem, but you are chasing a, a hand. Even if you kill the hand, we need to reduce the size of the elephant. Nigeria is an import dependent economy. But the central bank has been working to change that narrative. It has placed an importation ban on more than 40 items to encourage local production. Items like rice, maize, cement and margarine are among those on the FX restriction list, with sugar and wheat to be included soon. But experts warn that if issues of weak infrastructure and farmers' insecurity are left untackled, Nigeria may still be a long way from achieving food independence. Kelechi Emekalam, CGT and Abuja, Nigeria. On to South Africa. The state-owned low-cost carrier, Mango, is unlikely to be able to pay the salaries of its 500 or so employees from May as it struggles to stay afloat. The Department of Public Enterprises said over the weekend that it's in talks with Mango's board and the interim board of the parent company, South African Airlines, about repositioning the national carrier subsidiaries in light of delayed funding from the government. Here's Angela Kobler with the details. There's an unexplained delay in receiving government funding, which means that in all likelihood the low-cost carrier will cease operating from 1 May. Government funding options appear to have dried up. The only possibility would be to borrow more, and I'm not sure whether the uh, Treasury has the ability to issue more guarantees for lenders and whether that would be acceptable to lenders. So as a result, unfortunately, Manco has also run out of money, uh, similar to ISA A, which stopped paying uh, its employees uh, in March last year. Analysts are wondering why the Mango board and management didn't see the writing on the wall sooner, especially during COVID and the impact on global air travel. Traffic volumes remain subdued and pegged at between 40 and 50 percent levels compared to pre-COVID data. It hasn't uh, restructured the company for a lower level of activity and it was necessary to actually uh, get rid of say, at least half of the aircraft or maybe more and uh, also adjust the uh, personnel complement to about that type of level uh, to make provision for a lower scale of activity post-COVID. That didn't happen and as a result the, um, the costs or the leasing cost of the aircraft and associated costs insurers and air crew and so on kept on running. Questions are now being leveled at the board and management. And where was the board of Mango? You know, that is something for the board to consider. At uh, the moment that you run into a, a financial distress position, you're very close to the edge. And uh, the board of directors must have taken a decision to either put it in business rescue or restructure the company itself. It's just really unpalatable that no no change was actually adopted as far as the company's operations is concerned. And what are the prospects of finding and securing a private sector buyer for the low-cost airline? Maybe a year or two ago, Mango 
<coughs> was a very attractive investment. At that time, there were many people interested in buying the company. Uh, but if you run it into the ground, obviously the, the cash value for the company uh, has dep- depreciated significantly. Analysts are now wondering why the management team and board of directors didn't act sooner to save the airline. I'm Angelo Coppola for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. At least a year has now passed since the first COVID-19 cases are reported across the continent. To date, the available data shows that roughly 3% of the population has contracted the virus, but the enormous long-term impact will be on the economy. The International Monetary Fund says that Sub-Saharan Africa is the one part of the world that will grow by the slowest this year. Tonight, we'll take a look at how the pandemic has disrupted supply chains, not just in Africa, but on the globe. Let's start in a mining sector, specifically in South Africa. Here's Angelo Coppola with a deep dive into the mining sector, which is a mainstay of the continent's most industrialized economy. The South African mining sector took a massive 30% hit in production levels in the second quarter of 2020. This was followed by a 40% recovery in the third quarter. But the fourth quarter was not that, uh, was disappointing, let me put it that way. We, we thought, look, you won't get another 40% increase, but um, it was actually very flat. Uh, in short, we, we ended up about 12% below in terms of production. Fortunately, there was strong support from commodity prices and another surprise. It continued to improve uh, over the period uh, by 24% in total. Uh, the, the second surprise was everybody thought, including uh, institutions like the World Bank, that Uh, supply chains would be disrupted. Now, us supplying to the rest of the world was a bit disrupted uh, because of logistics, but not, definitely not in the first phase. We didn't find any disruption in our supplies coming to us. In-country logistical challenges didn't help matters when it came to the country's rail and harbours network. Then there were the border posts, and there were two impacts there. One, people moving. Out and in, in out of South Africa, the the, the uh, SADC workers moving out and then coming back, and and the second part is actually getting product to mainly the Maputo corridor to the Maputo harbour. The sector employs over four hundred thousand people from South Africa and its neighbouring countries, thirteen percent of whom aren't back at work yet. There are still about sixty thousand people not back at work because of the risk. Uh, either age and then linked to that uh, comorbidities like diabetes and silicosis and TB and whatever. And we know that because we screen all workers every day. The South African mining sector were lucky. The surging commodity prices cushioned it from some of the blows felt by other industry sectors. I'm Angelo Coppola for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. Now the continent as a whole is a key source of raw materials for key industries across the globe. The DRC and Zambia, for instance, they produce a fair bit of copper. Some of the largest platinum reserves in the world are found between South Africa and Zimbabwe. CGTN's Wang Maje spoke to experts on how the economic impact from this virus, particularly on supply chain disruptions, have affected companies operating in China who are doing business in the continent. Africa has been hit hard by COVID-19. Available statistics to date show around 3% of the continent's population has contracted the virus, and a regional economy could take a beating. With a UN report from March showing Africa could face its first recession in 25 years, with output losses due to the virus estimated to reach 99 billion US dollars. Additionally, the IMF says Africa registered the slowest growth in the world in 2020, with its GDP falling by 2.6% last year. Africa could learn from China, which has formed a whole industrial supply chain. Companies involved in such a chain help it grow by fostering its self-circulation. 
Africa has been a source of raw materials for global industries, but the onset of COVID-19 has disrupted the supply chains, including for said materials. So how have supply disruptions from Africa impacted Chinese industrial companies? Raw materials can be produced like they usually are. Freight charges have gone up sharply. Plus, there's the cost of nucleic acid testing and also human resources management needed to help workers whose mental health has been affected by the pandemic. Experts say Chinese companies are switching things up on the continent due to the pressure. Some companies have switched from importing iron ore from Africa, for example, to importing recycled iron stew from other countries instead. One firm, the Hongqiao Group, has strengthened its development of iron ore mines on the continent to break through supply disruptions by eliminating the middleman. But Professor He says China-Africa cooperation will be in good shape moving forward. China will launch its vaccination program for both Chinese and African employees on the continent, which will build a more secure bamboo fence for health security. This will offer more promising economic cooperation between China and African countries amid the threat of COVID-19. Professor He believes bilateral coordination in 2021 will be better than last year, especially with this year being the final year for the implementation of outcomes of the Beijing summit of the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation. Wang Mengjie, CGTN, Beijing. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic has not only impacted businesses quite negatively, it's also forced people to cut down on their spending too. In Nigeria, the country's statistics bureau says that total household expenditure dropped from over $283 billion in 2019 to $279 billion the year after. Now, that decline essentially means that Nigerians spent a lot less cash due to the pandemic and all the cascading effects it had on household spending last year. So, Yitian Dejibadmus takes up the story. Before the COVID-19 pandemic hit Nigeria, Simisola Adigun shops here at her favorite supermarket every weekend. But now, she manages to do so just once a month, only picking up the most essential items she needs. Shopping, as she used to know it, has changed. I used to have to spend for fa my family upkeep. I, I could spend as much as 80000 you know, to at least, to an extent, take care of um, uh, family items for the month. But now it's either I make do with what I have initially or I add, I have to add more. Either way, it's, you know, taking a lot of getting used to. The items I used to buy for, say, 500 naira, 1,000 naira has skyrocketed by 100%, even more. So now you have to manage what you have, the, the income that you have. The purchasing power has reduced. Adigo is not the only one who has been forced to cut down on her consumption level. The National Bureau of Statistics' latest report on Nigerian gross domestic product shows household consumption declined by over $4 billion between 2019 and 2020. And what that means is that the effect of uh, COVID-19, as it were, in 2020, had its deep on the consumption power of many Nigerians. This is following the disruption that came with COVID, which led to so many economic activity being halted and led to so many companies sacking a number of their staff or resizing their employee size. To the extent that it led to wage court and all of that, that actually translated to reduction in income for most of Nigerians, which eventually translated to reduction in the general consumption. With skyrocketing prices, a monthly inflation surge and depreciation of the Naira, Consumers like Adigo are having to implement major lifestyle changes in order to cope. It's my needs over my wants now. I have to consider the things I really need over the things I, I want, you know. And of course, even your needs, some take more priority than others. So you have, I have to be watchful about the things that I need. Nigeria is battling a galloping inflation, which is currently at 18.17%. Food inflation is even worse at 22.95% and mainly blamed on insecurity in parts of the country. The government says it is doing everything to revive the economy. It's come up with various schemes aimed at boosting consumption. 
One of them is the central bank's COVID-19 stimulus package for households and small businesses. We should look at possibility of even doing more, creating more loans through our targeted credit facilities for our households and small and medium small businesses particularly that were adversely impacted by COVID. Knowing fully well that when we support these households and medium and small enterprises, what that will result is that it will stimulate consumption spending that will ultimately lead to aggregate demand and then bolster our gross domestic product. Adigo says she hasn't applied for the CBN stimulus just yet, preferring to manage with what she earns for now. Dejibadmo, CGTN, Lagos, Nigeria. Now the series will continue tomorrow. We'll be examining the impact of the pandemic, not just on the job market, but also on education systems across the continent. Time now for another break. Here's what's coming up next. A freight train from southwestern China all the way to the Dutch capital makes its maiden voyage. And we'll explore how this pandemic has radically changed working patterns in China when we return. Business in Africa is at a crossroads. We celebrate those who are adopting and thriving despite the challenges from grassroots to big businesses. Global business takes you along for the ride as we track the making of a giant. Only on CGTN. How will your world change today? What happens here? What happens there? Or what you make happen for yourself? If it matters to you, it matters to us too. Your stories are these stories that need to be told. Africa Live. Find your voice. Accra is my kind of city. That's because when I'm here, I feel like I'm back home in Lagos or Abidjan, which are two of the major cities I grew up in. After about a decade covering business news on the continent, I've learned it's all about the high risk, but also the high returns and the high energy. You simply have to adjust in order to keep pace. When I started out as a journalist, my dream was to open people's minds to the different perspectives. From the CEO in the boardroom to the trader out in the street, we all have different stories. From Accra to Addis Ababa, from Cairo to Cape Town, and I wouldn't have it any other way. Here at CGTN, we realize that Africa is on the move, and it's moving fast, but we're moving right along with it. I'm Uchiyo Poronkwa, and I'm a business anchor and reporter at CGTN. Welcome back to the program. These are some of the stories making your headlines at this hour. At least two people have been killed. 27 others have been injured in anti-military demonstrations in Chad. The French President Emmanuel Macron and the President of the Democratic Republic of Congo, Felix Shisekedi, have both condemned the violent action taken against the protesters. Both leaders are calling for solution that involves both civilian representatives and elements of the military. The Nigerian President Muhammadu Buhari has urged the United States to consider moving its military headquarters for AFRICOM, Africa Command essentially, to the continent of Africa. He said this during a virtual meeting with the U.S. Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken. Mr. Buhari views the move as one that will better tackle the growing armed violence in Western and Central Africa, as well as the Gulf of Guinea, the Lake Chad region, and the Sahel. Africa Command is currently overseeing all of its operations on the continent from Stuttgart. The head of the United Nations Peacekeeping Operations has asked the Security Council to consider a six-month rollover for the mandate of its mission in South Sudan's region 
of Abyei. Jean-Pierre Lacroix says that this would give parties in Sudan and South Sudan more time to resolve security issues in the oil-rich but still contested area. And finally, the number of new COVID cases in India has remained above 300,000 for six consecutive days. A number of countries are sending aid to help India battle this new wave of infections. Crematoria in the Indian capital of Delhi being forced to make makeshift funeral pyres as the city runs out of space to cremate the dead. Deaths have been surging in India as a second wave of infections continues to devastate the country. That's a run through your headlines. On to the business of logistics now. In Q1, China's investment in cooperation with countries along the Belt and Road Initiative did see steady growth. Some 3,400 cargo trains traveled between China and Europe during that period. That's 75% more year on year. Now, this increase in traffic comes as the first direct freight trains from southwestern China to the Dutch capital of Amsterdam and the British port city of Felixstowe departed, making, marking rather, the formal opening of two more stops on that transportation line. Two freight trains carrying electronic devices and medical supplies have left for Amsterdam and Felixstowe on the eighth anniversary of the Chengdu Europe Railway Express. They are the latest additions to the now 61 lines of the Chengdu International Railway Port, which plays a vital part in building southwest China into a westbound gateway for foreign trade. The eastbound cargo is also growing uh, very rapidly, so we found a lot of new clients for that connection. We started first with uh, once a week, and currently we are already running the train with uh, four times a week. And that's not uh, only uh, milk powder, but it's also beer and uh, cars. The advantages of rail transport have been further recognized by businesses in foreign trade. For example, the cost is only one-eighth that of air freight, and the time needed is only one-third that of maritime shipping. Rail is much more reliable, especially in the post-epidemic era. This railway port not only connects businesses in the Chongqing Chengdu area with customers in Europe, but also other Chinese cities. So far, the port has cooperated with 20 other transportation hubs to facilitate internal economic circulation. On Monday, the Chengdu railway port signed cooperation terms with one of the largest shipping ports in East China, the Zhoushan port. It's part of plans to optimize logistic services for businesses in East Asia. CGTN, Chengdu. Now, with China having largely brought the coronavirus under control within its borders, life in the world's second largest economy is getting back to normal. But as our reporter Liu Jixin now explores, day-to-day -day work for many there will never be the same again. Work, the power source of urban vitality. Even if you are not a workaholic, let's just admit that most of your life gives way to office hours. But when the epidemic struck, some companies had to make a choice. We actually started with a staggered work arrangement, where only half of our team members came to work in the office. Since COVID-19 hit, I've been carrying mobile phones and computers with me all the time. My work is somewhat flexible. My workplace can be wherever I want. For many people working for a digital economy, a mobile device and a smooth network will do the job. But the only issue is, is offline office really optional? I'm really looking forward to the combination of working from home and working in the office. Remote work is actually relatively advanced, but at present, it has its own challenges, like communication between colleagues. People find it better to work with their peers rather than working on their own. And some of the benefits of working at the company's office are really attractive. With the epidemic largely under control in China, most companies have returned to their pre-epidemic mode of work. In other countries and regions, remote work, more flexible office hours and four-day work weeks are becoming more popular. 20% of Canadian tech workers are able to work from home on a regular basis. And elsewhere, leaders in New Zealand and Finland are already advocating shorter working hours.
to boost domestic spending. Liu Jiaxin, CGTN, Beijing. Now, autonomous delivery methods, that's a fairly indirect way of talking about getting things delivered to you by drones. That sector is seeing some growth, but most deliveries, even in e-commerce, still rely traditionally on manpower. Last year's pandemic did boost online shopping in China, but still tens of thousands of delivery workers really haven't benefited from that boom. CGTN's Wang Chenhui explains why. <laughs> It's the hard-working carriers that serve as the solid foundation for smooth logistics in China, supporting its massive scale of online shopping and deliveries in as short a time as possible. But many say that even as their workload increases, their salaries have not, and they're even seeing a decline in their paycheck. It's difficult when the hard work doesn't pay off. Data shows the delivery company's charge dropped from about four dollars per package in 2007 to a dollar and a half in 2020. Experts say that's mainly because of the surge in demand, which is driving vicious competition. It's hard to raise the fee due to the intense competition, but the costs have been rising fast. So when companies try to internally cut costs, many decided to pay less to workers. Deliveries in China have surged to an annual average of 10 billion items a year, 80 percent of which are from online shopping. China Post Bureau anticipates the annual delivery items will surpass 95 billion this year, but the boom in deliveries does not pose any advantage to the couriers. In 2020, nearly half of the delivery workers made less than 5,000 yuan. That's about $770 a month, much lower than the national average income. And more than half of them have to deliver over 100 packages a day. Experts warn that squeezing the income of delivery workers will ultimately impact the entire business environment negatively, and they must find ways towards a more sustainable model. The quality must be. The delivery industry must transform towards integrated logistics and extend their service chains. They also need to further associate their market with high-value-added products such as medicine, cold chain products. In that way, they can be more sustainable. Some delivery companies that promoted themselves with extremely low fees have now been punished. But at the end of a long, tiring working day for the delivery man, how to put more money into their pockets and keep the business environment running optimally are the key challenges to be faced. Wang Tianhui, CGTN. Counting down the days, California is eyeing mid-June for what it's describing as a full reopening after a year of pandemic restrictions. More than ever, the entertainment industry is very, very keen to get back to business. Our Los Angeles correspondent Edith Tianxian takes out, checks out rather, the places that define fun, especially theme parks. A popular local attraction in the city of Palmdale, Dry Town Water Park has literally been dry for over a year. With its entire 2020 season cancelled, its budget deficit has climbed to over one million dollars. Being shut down, we're not running cabanas, we're not running birthday parties that the community has come to enjoy. Obviously, we're not open to enjoy the water park on the hot days. So, yeah, there was not any real revenue opportunities for us、um, because of the closure in 2020. In the last 15 seasons, you know, there's not have been a season such as 2020 where we've been. You know, asked to close, and you know, as of today, there's still no green light for 2021. While water parks continue planning for possible reopening this spring, California theme parks are already humming, welcoming visitors back on April 1st, though at significantly reduced capacity. For now, safety regulations make it quite a different experience. Ticket sales are now mostly online and limited, so while many people may enjoy shorter lines for a change, not all the rides are open. And long gone are the days of greeting costume characters or crowded parades, and no more snacking while standing in queues. And this new reality comes with new business models. 
Disneyland Resort in California has canceled annual passes that normally aim to attract visitors during off-season, a term that doesn't exist anymore. The company laid off over 32,000 employees in recent months during a time when its California park served as a vaccination site. It's estimated that um, the theme park and attractions industry lost five times more employees uh, last year on average than any other industry. The impact to the entire industry has been devastating. Um, it's estimated that in 2019, the industry generated uh, $25 billion. Last year, that dropped to $15 billion, a $10 billion uh, drop uh, loss. The world's largest theme park operator, though, is seeing explosive growth in its streaming services, fortuitously launched just before the pandemic. Those profits have helped offset the billions of losses in theme park revenues, but for the mid-range companies, it's a different story. SeaWorld, Six Flags, uh, they got big lines of credit to help them get through this, and, and a lot of the money that they've borrowed is going to need to be paid off. So that's going to potentially depress any capital improvements that they're going to be able to do for the next few years. Data that we've seen has shown that up to a third of the market will not consider a visit to a theme park in 2021, no matter what happens. Once a popular attraction for people of all ages, the theme park industry is now facing its toughest time, with its expansion in recent years now being replaced with what looks like years of recovery. It is Tian Shan, CGTN, Los Angeles. Back to the continent, South Africa has rolled out its first green hospital, Sintocare. The hospital brings together special expertise and clever engineering and new tech that's earned it a, a, fi a, green, a five green star rating. It's the first hospital of its kind in Africa and one of five in the world. So Mitra Naidu has that story on What's Hot. Everything in this hospital has been carefully thought through to ensure it's delivering the best health care, which is also environmentally safe, right down to the paintwork. There is no lead or harmful toxins in the paint used throughout the building. So on the green initiative side, it's, it's a lot more comprehensive than people think. I think normally when you're talking green, you're expecting to see solar, you're expecting to see wind turbines. But in terms of energy saving, um, our, how we make hot water, for example, we use heat pumps. Um, to heat and cool the building, we use a four-pipe four, four pipe chiller. That means we are extracting heat. Normally, heat is a byproduct of cooling down of your chiller. So we're extracting that heat to also heat up the building. So there's one of the avenues where we're very efficient. Carefully designed systems also makes this hospital energy efficient. We also harvest rainwater, and that grey water is then used to um, flush your urinals and toilets. Um, and that, that reduces um, your water consumption as a hospital a lot. In terms of energy and lighting, we have a major component of natural light coming in and the artificial lighting used throughout the building is, is LED. Sintoke is a specialized hospital focusing exclusively on head, neck, spinal and vascular surgery. The hospital has been open for just a few months and is already having an impact. Our patient stay is much shorter than in other hospitals, even if you take it on the same um, surgery that's been done. So I think most of the time our patients benefit more because of the fact that they can go home earlier, their pain is more reduced, and if your pain is reduced, then it means that your recovery is speedy. So that all alone makes us different. The hospital generates its own oxygen and uses robots to deliver medication. We manufacture our own oxygen, so that happens through a PSA process. It stands for pressure swing adsorption. And what we do is you are taking um, atmospheric air, um, you are compressing it and filtering it and drying it, and then it's passed through uh, um, the PSA itself, which is a, a molecular sieve, and inside the molecular sieve you have a zeolite crystal. So what happens, your nitrogen is adsorbed, and um, your oxygen passes on through to the pipeline of the hospital. Sintoke is situated in South Africa's capital, Pretoria, and was built at a cost of $33 million dollars a worthy investment in the advancement of healthcare in the green space. Sumitra Nadu, CGTN, Pretoria, South Africa. Quick run through commodity prices. Now, for most of the year, oil has been posting the strongest year-to-date gains amongst the basket of commodities. 
we do track on the program. But copper is now a very close second, with Fords in London up at least 25% since the start of the year. Today's high was $9,780 a tonne, and we haven't seen prices that strong since 2011. Copper prices, in fact, are more than double since the low hit last year of $4,371 a tonne. On paper, this should be a fantastic story. Net positive for Zambia, the continent's second largest copper producer. But it may also complicate credit restructuring talks, particularly with general elections over there, now just three months away. Here's what's coming up next. We'll be heading over to Tunisia next to take a look at an international organic farming fair. Africa is a continent of diversity, with varied climates and enchanting geography, and a people so distinct, but with a shared enduring spirit. We are at the heart of the continent, to bring you the untold stories. Let's have a look. We celebrate Africa as it shapes its own destiny. Africa Live. Find your voice. Welcome back. Let's head back up north to Tunisia. The country is hosting an international organic agriculture and food fair, which aims to boost organic food exports from the North African state. More than 100 exhibitors from all parts of the country are taking part in the event, which was cancelled last year because of the pandemic. So GTN's Adin Chuachi attended the event. He filed this report. The International Fair Bioexpo is open to all professionals operating in the organic sector in Tunisia, Local farmers, processors, industrialists, artisans and distributors can gain exposure for their organic food businesses. We're making organic and homemade jam which is very tasty and healthy. The production of organic fruits is both a long process and a very expensive one. Yet the quality of fruits is much better than conventional farming. Taking part in this fair is a boost to our business and to organic agriculture. Saida Fahri is a 60-year-old organic farmer. She has lost more than 50% of her revenue during the general lockdown caused by the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic. But at the moment, the business of organic food production and distribution is booming. I am happy because I was able to sell all my produce to the domestic market in two days. This is exceptional during the pandemic, which caused sales to plunge. I've signed a contract with an exporting company to export my organic products abroad. The Minister of Agriculture noted that the state is offering incentives to organic farmers. In addition, the regional agriculture departments are providing counseling to rural women and supporting organic agriculture, which is creating jobs in inner regions of the country. The organic food industry is one of the most promising sectors in Tunisia. Its added value is important to creating an economic dynamic in the agricultural regions. It continues to create jobs. Organic farming employs tens of thousands of rural women. It guarantees their financial autonomy. This fair shows the great potential of Tunisia's organic food production. Several online conferences are broadcast during the Bio Expo. Tunisian foreign experts are explaining the various modes of organic production, certification, organic cosmetics, fair trade, recycling and many other topics related to sustainable development. The Organic Agriculture and Food Fair is the first exhibition to be organized in Tunisia since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic last year. Experts explain the growing consumer demand for organic food by the concern regarding health and the environment. 
Adnan Shawishi, CGTN, Tunis. And finally, Japanese corporate culture is known for its after-work drinking parties and other social events. But this pandemic has put those events on hold for the better part of a year. And that, in turn, has dealt a heavy blow to the hospitality industry. One company, however, has adapted to this era of remote working by taking its catering business straight into people's homes. Phoebe Amoroso has that story from Tokyo. Since the coronavirus pandemic arrived in Japan last year, office parties have moved online and party food comes in these boxes. Many of our customers use our service for welcome parties, end of year or general get-togethers. Some also order custom food boxes, adding their company logo or even requesting an original bowl to be included in the box. The hospitality industry in Japan has taken a heavy blow. Restaurant sales fell a record 15.1% year-on-year in 2020, according to the Japan Food Service Association. Many businesses have focused on takeout and delivery. Others have closed down. Before the pandemic, this company was running a corporate catering service that provided companies with meals to facilitate employee communication. But most large events were cancelled and their sales were almost completely wiped out. Looking for inspiration, they saw how work was moving online and so they came up with a solution. This food box is delivered directly to their customers' homes. It contains a selection of snacks and dishes, and it even comes with a choice of alcoholic or non-alcoholic drinks. The company says it can prepare and deliver meals for up to 20,000 people across the country to enjoy exactly the same thing at the same time. With other services like Uber Eats, there is a difference between regions. With people working remotely and moving back to their hometowns, eating the same food and sharing the same experiences increases their sense of unity and belonging. Demand for niche catering has taken off in the past year. Nompi says it counts several major corporations among its clients, with many IT companies in particular using its services. These businesses are ordering food boxes to bring together their different teams spread out across nationwide branches. Working from home might be here to stay. A recent Kyodo news survey of 110 large Japanese corporations found that over two-thirds are planning to maintain or expand levels of remote work. However, online meetings pose a challenge for team building and innovation. How much online participants talk will vary, and for those who don't speak much, it will impact their motivation. This could also impact productivity. However, Japan's work culture is known for its low levels of productivity, so I hope businesses will continue to make use of the advantages of hosting things online even after this pandemic. With Japan facing a fourth wave of coronavirus infections, more catering businesses are trying to reach people, and more corporations are hoping they can make online teamwork taste better. Phoebe Amoroso, CGTN, Tokyo. A quick run through the currencies as we wrap up the program. We did speak about Uganda, exploring the possibility of a debt service break a little earlier in the hour. The currency has not changed much as far as its trend is concerned for most of the year. In fact, it's up roughly 1.5% against the American dollar, but that doesn't do much to offset the near 8% decline against the greenback in the last five years. 48% of Uganda's uh, foreign public debt is dollar-denominated, and roughly 8%, percent about $910 million, is denominated in the yuan. Uh, Bitcoin has had a rather torrid time in the third week of April. It fell as low as 47 to 20 to the dollar, but it's clawed back some of those losses uh, since then. It's risen to over $55,250 in today's session. Ethereum, another large cryptocurrency, also continues to rack up gains. On a year-to-date basis, it's up nearly 260%. That's it for this edition of Global Business Africa. As always, we'd like to hear your thoughts on the content you've seen on the program in the last hour. There are many ways to get your thoughts back to us. All of them are on your screens right now. I'm Raman Yang in the Kenyan capital, Nairobi. Thank you for your company in the last hour. The World Today is up next from Washington, D.C.
We've made stunning progress. As long as you are vaccinated and outdoors, you can do it without a mask. New rules for vaccinated Americans, dropping the mask mandate for certain activities. An international lifeline for India desperately needed medical supplies are starting to arrive from abroad. The country is struggling with the world's worst coronavirus outbreak. And a new civil rights investigation into police violence in the U.S. Troubling new details in the death of Andrew Brown, shot while being served a warrant. Live from Washington, this is The World Today. Hello and thanks for joining us. I'm Elaine Reyes in Washington, D.C. Countries across the globe are sending emergency oxygen, aid and medical supplies to help India deal with a deadly surge of COVID-19. More than 300,000 new cases a day for the sixth straight day. Hospitals are struggling with an influx of patients and a shortage of supplies. Gally Ming reports, but first a warning that viewers may find some of the following images disturbing. India is facing an out of control public health crisis. Hundreds of thousands of patients are pouring into hospitals to seek treatment for COVID-19. But due to shortages of oxygen in beds, many are being turned away. His condition is a bit serious. We're standing here without oxygen and a patient in the middle of the road without any hope. It's been two hours. I've been waiting here since 8 in the morning. As far as I can see, I won't be able to get in for another hour or maybe more. I have a car and I'm sitting in it. But where will a poor person sit if he is sick? Crematoriums are working day and night to cope with the soaring deaths. The World Health Organization says this unprecedented crisis in India is beyond heartbreaking. WHO is doing everything we can providing critical equipment and supplies, including thousands of oxygen concentrators, prefabricated mobile field hospitals, and laboratory supplies. A number of nations are sending aid to help India battle this new wave of infections. China says 800 oxygen concentrators have been sent from Hong Kong to Delhi, and 10,000 more are scheduled to arrive in a week. A foreign ministry spokesperson says Beijing is willing to support Delhi with all the help it needs. We are making it clear that we stand ready to help India fight its recent outbreak. Both sides have been communicating on the matter. If India puts forward specific needs, China is willing to provide support and assistance to the best of its ability. The U.S. has promised to provide medical equipment and protective gear to India, as well as raw materials for vaccines to India's manufacturers. The State Department says it's working nonstop to deliver these supplies, and President Joe Biden has vowed to help India overcome the difficulties in its time of need. Both France and Germany have also promised to provide medical aid, including oxygen, as soon as possible. And Russia says India will receive the first batch of its Sputnik V vaccines on May the 1st. Gao Yiming, CGTN. U.S. President Joe Biden has promised to send coronavirus vaccines to India. He also responded to new U.S. health guidelines. CGTN's Roy Ruttenberg joins us now with the details. Roy. That's right. Joe Biden came out on the White House lawn uh, wearing a mask and then taking that mask off, indicating that because he's fully vaccinated, he now no longer needs to wear one in public. That is in line with the new recommendations from the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. The CDC echoed by President Biden that Americans who are fully vaccinated no longer need to wear masks outdoors. This announcement, of course, coming on the heels of Biden's 100th day in office. And amid, as Biden says, record high numbers of vaccinations, some 215 million Americans now receiving at least one shot. But it does come amid some hesitation amongst Americans over vaccines. A growing number of people uh, who signed up for two dose uh, of vaccines not showing up for the second dose, as well as some hesitancy, a slowdown in inoculation. Still, this may be a reward for those who are vaccinated and a carrot for those who aren't. For those who haven't gotten their vaccination yet, especially if you're younger or think you don't need it, this is another great reason to go get vaccinated now, now. Yes, 
the vaccines are about saving your life, but also the lives of the people around you. Biden says the science is behind him. Indeed, the numbers are going down, the daily infections, the number of hospitalizations, and indeed the deaths. Elaine? So, Rui, why is there still a push then for indoor mask wearing in the United States? Well, no doubt the administration has been pace, pay, uh, uh, facing a lot of pressure from people wanting some sort of easing of restrictions uh, as the summer holidays are coming up, children going to uh, summer camps, uh, children returning back to schools. But the CDC says that the restrictions that can happen outdoors because there's very little chance of infection there don't exist or are not relevant for indoors. Let's have a listen. Masked, fully vaccinated people can safely attend worship services inside, go to an indoor restaurant or bar, and even participate in an indoor exercise class. Although these vaccines are extremely effective, we know that the virus spreads very well indoors. And that is some of the concern that uh, scientists and doctors here have. Uh, they say, as Joe Biden echoed, that uh, this still isn't over, that there's a lot more work that needs to be done in May and June. And as Biden himself said before uh, he left his uh, short announcement, he's urging Americans not to let up. Elaine? All right, Rory Ruttenberg, live for us here in Washington. The U.S. will ease travel restrictions on college students from some of the hardest hit countries, and that includes China, Brazil, South Africa, Iran, and most of Europe. The State Department says as of August 1st, academics and journalists can qualify for a national interest exception visa. About a third of all international students in the U.S. are from China, by far the largest percentage from any country. Brazil's health regulator has voted to reject Russia's COVID-19 vaccine. The agency said there are inherent risks and effects, and it doesn't have enough information to guarantee the safety, quality, and effectiveness of Sputnik V. Russian officials defended the vaccine, saying that it's more than 97 percent effective and already approved for use in 61 other countries. Brazil's vaccine campaign has been sluggish despite having the third highest caseload in the world. Paulo Sotaro joins me now. He's director of the Brazil Institute at the Woodrow Wilson Center, a think tank here in Washington. Good to see you, Paulo. So what is behind the decision, really, of rejecting the Sputnik V vaccine? Adding to Brazilian reports that the government has rejected offers in the past from Pfizer and COVAX, is it a political one? It certainly is, Elaine. Uh, politics has dominated the Brazilian government approach to this from the start. Uh, basically denying uh, the pandemic initially. President Bolsonaro has done that. He has played politi politics all the way. Brazil has uh, 14 million uh, people that have been infected. It's about 10% of the world's uh, population infected. Uh, the number of deaths is approaching 400,000. Is at 392,000. Uh, the situation is uh, normalizing or is getting a little bit better, but we still have more than 1,200 people dying every day in Brazil. And uh, vaccination is starting to pick up, but slowly uh, Brazil did not make the necessary precautions to have vaccines, which is an absolute tragedy because Brazil is a country that in the past has faced different epidemics, has confronted them efficiently. We have good public health medicine in Brazil, but when you have uh, politicians, especially the most powerful politician in Brazil, the president of the country, working against medicine, working against science, it's very difficult and Brazilians, especially poor Brazilians, are paying the price. I want to ask you about this uh, late breaking news that the U.S. says that it will allow Brazilian students, college students to uh, come into the country this fall. What does that signal? Well, that signals uh, it's, uh, the United States is applying the same criteria for students from all over, but the countries that has showed the largest uh, level of infections obviously are treated differently. Uh, there are 
uh, tens of thousands of Brazilian university students, especially here in the United States, they go home on vacation uh, to Brazil, and there are restrictions on how they, how and when, and under what conditions they come back. There is nothing uh, discriminatory about this. This involves also uh, citizens, young citizens of other countries, students. Uh, it's just precaution. Uh, and it's an added uh, side to this tragedy. It did not ha need to be that way had the Brazilian government taken its responsibility, confronted this pandemic as we did other epidemics in Brazil successfully. So how does this all turn around? Because as we mentioned, April is Brazil's deadliest month so far. The, pres uh, the president uh, is against lockdowns. He has said recently that he's willing to let the military step in. How does the country recover? Well, the military involvement would solve nothing. Uh, Brazil uh, is continuing uh, in this self-inflicted crisis, frankly. Uh, it, it, yes, it didn't start in Brazil, started somewhere else. But the government is not dealing with this uh, guided by science, guided by experts on epidemiology, which Brazil has a great number. They are very competent. They are very respected. Uh, it is uh, unfortunate. Obviously, it uh, sends a very uh, bad message about Brazil ab ab abroad, around the world. It's damaging to the country's reputation. All right. Always great to see you, Paulo Sobtero. Thank you so much for joining us. As Brazil approaches 400,000 COVID-19 fatalities, another crisis is hitting Latin America's biggest country, and that is hunger. Emergency aid has been scaled back, and tens of millions of Brazilians are going hungry or face food insecurity. Lucretia Franco reports from Rio de Janeiro. Since March of last year, volunteers from Brazil's Central Union of Favelas, CUFA, have been receiving and delivering tons of food donations to some of the hardest hit areas of the country. But with a pandemic-induced recession continuing, businesses and individuals are increasingly unable to contribute to the charity. Food donations have decreased by around 80 percent compared to last year, and we are fighting to help a growing number of people, especially in the slums, where the majority of people are not able to have even two meals per day. Cufa volunteers here in Rio de Janeiro and across Brazil are distributing these reduced food donations in neighborhoods where drug gang violence is on the rise. It is a slow, dangerous process over an ever-expanding geographical area. Here in Moquiso Favela, 38-year-old Ana Angelica Ferreira, a single mother, takes care of her four children, three nephews and a granddaughter. She lost her job as a maid when the pandemic started, and she's now penniless. As crianças e eu... We are nine, the children and I, but we don't have any income at all. This is our reality. When I worked, the money wasn't much, but at least I could put some food on the table. Today, we are only surviving because of donations. That's the truth. Scenes like this are becoming more and more common in Brazil's urban centers. This man asks for a little rice to passers-by. The government's $100 per person per month emergency aid to the poor, which benefited millions of Brazilians last year, has been reduced by more than half or cut completely. According to a newly released study, 19 million Brazilians are experiencing hunger as a result of the pandemic, while 117 million, more than half the population, are living with some degree of food insecurity. We're not surprised. Conducted by PENSAN, a Brazilian research network on food and nutritional security, the study shows the gravity of the situation. The number of people suffering hunger, yes, that's, that was somehow a, a surprise uh, for, for being so high. The, the important aspect of this is that it took only two years for doubling number of starving people. With more than 390,000 COVID-19 fatalities, the second highest number in the world, and the pandemic showing few signs of improving, experts say 
They are worried that charity is now the only thing holding off an even worse humanitarian crisis in Brazil. Lucrecia Franco, CGTN, Rio de Janeiro. People in Hong Kong can resume their nightlife as long as they're vaccinated. Starting Thursday, restaurants and bars can reopen at half capacity and stay open until 2 a.m. Staff and customers must have received at least one dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. Right now, about 11 percent of city residents have been vaccinated. China is hoping to boost those numbers. Still to come, a stark assessment of Israeli-Palestinian relations and another U.S. neighborhood on edge after another deadly police shooting. The family calling for an investigation. CGTN. A new report by Human Rights Watch accuses Israel of apartheid, a system of institutionalized segregation. The report says Palestinians are subject to oppression and inhumane acts. It points to expanding Jewish settlements in internationally recognized occupied territories, demolition of Palestinian homes, checkpoints, and other military crackdowns. Israel strongly denies the accusations. The Gaza Strip is facing a growing electricity crisis. Frequent power cuts are disrupting many public services, especially the health care system. But a solar power plant project funded by China has brought hope to patients in a children's hospital. Noor Harzin reports. At the Red Children's Hospital in Gaza City is now powered by solar panels. The project has been funded by China and implemented by the Give Palestine Association charity organization. At an online ceremony held in early April, Chinese ambassador to Palestine said his country has been committed to implement projects that will help Palestinians improve their livelihood. The hospital has 90 beds and can provide health services for nearly 100,000 children. It includes residential units, intensive care, emergency, and laboratories. And with the new solar panels, most of these departments can operate without having to rely on external generators. These children are on ventilators and the electricity should not stop, because that means they will lose their lives. Now, through this project, the continuous electricity supply has been secured, which enhances the quality of health services with high efficiency, as they no longer rely on external generators. The Nur al Hayat project harnesses sustainable energy to serve the hospital by installing solar panels. It will provide 30 megawatts of electricity and help 80% of the hospital's departments operate. Palestinian citizens are very happy about the project. CGTN met with Iman al-Harazin, the mother of two-month-old child suffering from respiratory problems. When the power is out, we can't operate the electrical devices in our homes. But here in the hospital, the situation has become much better after the installation of the solar panels. And they can help our children immediately without waiting for the electricity to come back. The Palestine Give Association, which supervised the project, says China's support for clean energy projects has helped provide better health services to children in Palestine. The project provides Al Dura Hospital with 30 megawatts energy. We are very thankful because this will target the main departments, like the intensive care units and the children's overnight department. The Light of Life project was funded through generous funding from the People's Republic of China, represented by the Chinese embassy in Palestine. Gaza's Ministry of Health has repeatedly warned of the collapse of the health care system in the besieged enclave due to frequent power cuts and a serious shortage of medical equipment, mainly caused by an Israeli blockade. Nuharazin CGTN, 
Gaza. U.S. President Joe Biden is approaching 100 days in office. Up next, a look at his foreign policy, especially when it comes to China. Each day, there are millions of stories. Each one can open new perspectives, new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there to see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you all around the world, all around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN. See the difference. A state of emergency has been declared for a city in the U.S. state of North Carolina. The community bracing for the possible release of police video. It shows the fatal shooting of a black man last week as deputies attempted to arrest him. Now, his family members viewed 20 seconds of the footage on Monday. Nadia Romero has their reaction. It ain't right. It ain't right at all. The family of Andrew Brown Jr. finally able to see some of the officer's body camera footage from the shooting that killed him last Wednesday. Let's be clear. This was the execution. The video's release was delayed by law enforcement, leading to protest. Show the tape. And passionate pleas from the attorneys for Brown's family. What do you want? Video. A redacted version of the video was then released Monday afternoon. The family's attorneys say the redacted clip was not enough. We only saw a snippet wow. of the video. Uh -huh. When we know that the video started before uh -huh. and after. Right. What they showed the family. The Pasquotank County Sheriff's Office said deputies shot Brown as he fled as they attempted to serve him an arrest warrant. CNN has learned Brown's death certificate says he died from a gunshot wound to the head and ruled his death a homicide. The family says Brown was shot from behind. Andrew had his hands on his steering wheel. He was not reaching for anything. He wasn't touching anything. He wasn't throwing anything around. He had his hands firmly on the steering wheel. They run up to his vehicle shooting. City and state leaders and the sheriff's office asking everyone to wait for the investigation to be completed before making any conclusions, encouraging protesters during the day and at night to remain peaceful. I'm Nadia Romero reporting. The U.S. Justice Department is opening an investigation into the Louisville Police Department. It comes one year after officers shot and killed 26-year-old Breonna Taylor in her own home. U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland says the investigation will assess whether Louisville police engage in a pattern or practice of using unreasonable force, and it will investigate alleged arbitrary practices such as stops, searches, and seizures. U.S. President Joe Biden has been rolling out and modifying his approach to China in his first 100 days. In many ways, it follows the pattern of his predecessor, and in other ways, it's a departure. CGTN White House correspondent Nathan King takes a look. It's been 100 days of confrontation. Fiery talks between Washington and Beijing in Anchorage, Alaska, after the Biden administration imposed yet more sanctions on China over Xinjiang and Hong Kong. Washington also held, virtually, the first leaders' summit of the so-called Quad, the ad hoc grouping of the U.S., Japan, India and Australia, widely seen as a grouping aimed at containing China. But there's also been cooperation on the biggest threat to the planet, climate change. First, a successful visit to Shanghai by the U.S. Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, John Kerry. Then, Chinese President Xi Jinping, the first foreign leader to address last week's climate summit organized by the White House. We will continue to prioritize ecological conservation and pursue a green and low-carbon path to development. China will strive to peak carbon dioxide emissions before 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality before 2060. But much of the second day of the climate summit was dedicated to how the U.S. could catch up with China on the climate-centric industries of tomorrow. Beijing is leading the way from electric vehicles to lithium batteries to the use of wind and solar power. 
In fact, competition with China on all fronts is now an urgent priority for Washington. While the climate summit was underway, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee backed by an overwhelming majority the Strategic Competition Act of 2021. It's a 280-page call to counter China, militarily, economically, ideologically, and beyond. China today is challenging the United States, destabilizing the international community across every dimension of power, political, diplomatic, economic, innovation, military, even cultural, and with an alternative and deeply disturbing model for global governance. So this is a challenge of unprecedented scope, scale, and urgency, and one that demands a policy and strategy that is genuinely competitive. The act will now go to a full vote in the Senate. There are many more pieces of legislation targeting China in the works from breaking up supply chains when it comes to semiconductors and smartphones to requiring universities to reveal funding from China and restrictions on Chinese students in strategic industries. The first 100 days of the Biden administration has been targeting China in a more organized and strategic way than under Trump. The Biden administration is also keeping in place Trump's tariffs, at least for now. Nathan King, CGTN. Washington. Works of art that give a glimpse into China's past are on display in Beijing. The National Museum of China unveiled an exhibition that includes ceramics that date back more than a thousand years. TJ reports. More than 200 pieces of exquisite ceramics are on display, including 150 pieces crafted around the 12th century in today's Hejin city, and 80 from local art collections across the country. These ceramics have bridged the gap in the region's porcelain-making history, providing rich information on the techniques, craft level, and industrial chain of porcelain during the Xiong and Jin dynasties as far back as 1,000 years ago. With these ceramics best representing the Chinese civilization, we want to show the long and dazzling history of our traditional culture. White porcelain is famous for its elegance and simplicity, while ceramics produced during the Jin dynasty from 1115 to 1234 are known for their rich colors and unique designs. Animals or flowers, each pattern has a special meaning. Blossoms means wealth and honor, which is very typical. While the pattern of children playing indicates the wish for many offspring and many blessings. Multimedia technology offers viewers a panoramic and immersive experience through simulations of ancient workshops, kilns, and wells. Hejin City was a porcelain hub during the Chang Dynasty to the Jin Dynasty. Excavated in 2016, the Hejin Kiln was selected as one of the top 10 new archaeological discoveries of that year. CGTN. And that is the world today. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Elaine Reyes. Dialogue is coming up next, and we're back with more news at the top of the hour.
This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Racing against time and production capacity, will China be able to meet its vaccination targets? With rare blood clotting reported in Europe and the U.S., how can public confidence in various COVID-19 vaccines be regained? Facing skepticism on clinical trial data, will Chinese vaccines be recognized and used throughout the world? With new COVID-19 variants emerging in several countries, are current vaccines good enough to cope? Seeking answers from Chinese CDC Director Gao Fu on CGTN Dialogue. Director Gao, very glad to have you on the show. Let's talk about vaccination rate. At present, many Chinese are still having a wait-and-see attitude towards vaccination, although uh, 200 million doses have been rolled out. What do you make of the rollout rate so far? Um, as you know, you know, the vaccine hesitancy, that's a professional term, uh, vaccination hesitancy. So like you said, wait and see. I think that's n not only for China, but also everywhere in, in the world, not just because of the COVID-19 vaccine. Mm -hmm. So it's for any vaccine. You know, very notorious uh, story about the measles virus in the UK, you know, Andrew Wakefield. It's a very famous story there. So I think it is quite normal. But in China at the moment, we are talking about you know, everywhere in the world, not just the percentage of the vaccinees we have. We are talking about the doses we vaccinated. You know, for some people, they only have uh, the first dose. In general, for the vaccine we are using, uh, you need two doses. So when you are talking about the, you know, the percentage of the vaccination in China or everywhere in the world, we don't have enough for the protection yet. I think we are approaching for that target. But do you know why people are still reluctant to get vaccination? Because we've heard news of blood clotting after AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson. That makes people worry whether vaccines are safe. What do you say? Um, you know, in general, if you want to have a very good vaccine, you have to have the vaccine uh, safe and effective or infectious and also it's quality controllable and more importantly it's reachable you know you, it's uh, it can reach to everybody so that's very important i mean for the hesitancy so there's a lot of, there are a lot of risks there at least because this is the first time for the people for the human beings to use the covid 19 or corona, general coronavirus vaccine mm. so there are people still worried about the uh, uh, safety behind. Um, of course, as you mentioned, Johnson & Johnson and uh, AstraZeneca. Uh, AstraZeneca, they have, they found something for the, you know, blood clot, that, that, that's a, uh, we still know the reason. So I, I'm keep asking the, the audience, uh, ask the public to give the size some time. However, so whether or not you should take the vaccines, it all depends on the balance. So the, the risk taking and, the and also the benefit. So from that point, so I think we are ready to take any kind of vaccines. But yeah, do you think there's also a trade-off between individual interests and public good? Is it vaccination working for the greater good of the public? I mean, when you think about uh, this, you use the word trade. <laughs> You know, especially here in China, because there's very few infection cases, people don't feel the need to get vaccinated. Yeah, because, you know, look at the whole outbreak in the whole world. And I should say China, at the moment, we, we, are, we have done the best uh, because of the so-called NPI, non-pharmaceutical interventions. So because you don't see any patients or any cases, even asymptomatic infections, you think you are safe. However, once the border opens, so if in case you, you are, you, maybe only your local region, you might have some imported cases. That imported virus or imported case, you know, from time to time there's a chance. But there is no 
foreseeable scenario that China will open the border all of a sudden, because the world is still ravaged by this COVID virus. Yeah, you're right. I mean, first, when you open the border, and second, even though you might have some imported case of virus into China, so that particular, even a single case, they might expand, might you know, get into a local transmission. We already have several cases, like in Shijiazhou, you remember, in northeastern uh, provinces of Jilin and Heilongjiang, and recently you really, you know that, yeah? So there's always a chance there. So this is why we still, we shouldn't take this risk. Of course, uh, for the side effect, everybody can, we call it your, uh, in the professional term AEFI, adverse event, uh, follow your immunization. So there are always something there, but you know, you have to, you know, this is why from time to time there's some uh, transient stop and then people will stop and uh, vaccination and to so figure out, you know, what was going on there. The same thing for, for the moment for the Johnson & Johnson AstraZeneca vaccines. Um, but in general, we know the benefit much better, higher than we risk taking. So this is why we still encourage people to get vaccinated. But the problem is you have to reach 80% of the population mm -hmm. being vaccinated. Yeah. That's kind of a quota. You have to re reach the target. If somebody is not willing to take, what do you got to do? So this is why I'm seeing, you know, the public health education. So, you know, for any kind of this public health emergency, I said, well, when you interviewed me before, I want to readdress again, science-based. From the science tells us vaccine is good. And then the second line is public understanding, public involvement, public compartment. Mm. So, and the third is uh, authority decision making. So you have these three lines. So we tried very hard to put public understanding first. This is needed. Someone like me, the professionals, to try to explain. Like your job is to interview me. So we are here, we are talking something, why you need these vaccinations. Okay. Risk and benefit, you know, oh, you always do this um, balance. So in general, let's put the public understanding first. So uh, let's talk about the target a little bit. Why do we need to vaccinate 80% of the population? What will it be like when we get 80% vaccination rate? Does it mean the virus is gone? Theoretically, when we desire this 80% based on so-called R0, or basic reproduction number. So i.e., if you have one infected person, how many this person would transmit to another, uh, to uh, other peoples? Usually, if one infected person would transmit into 3.5, that's basic reproduction number, mm. that's R0. So this particular virus, R0 equals 2.5 to 3.5. Maximum, one person would affect 3.5. Roughly three to four, three, three to four percent. Mm -hmm. So these are basic, basic numbers. So with this are not in your mind. So we calculated you need eighty percent of the population to be vaccinated to protect yourself from the transmission of the virus. So with this eighty percent of the herd immunity, the virus would stop transmission. Transmission. No more transmission. There's no more transmission and no more outbreak. So theoretically, so the virus will go, the virus will disappear. However, this is a special virus. It's multiple hosts. Mm. They infect human beings. As you heard something, there are also some Animal. rare cases, uh, and so many animals, rare cases from dogs and cats, and also lions and uh, you know, mink. So there, it's so different. Not like the smallpox. Smallpox and hepatitis B has only, only, only yeah, human beings. So those kind of virus, also polio, those kind of virus, it's very easy. Once you get this herd immunity, the virus no more host, the virus will disappear. You basically, you eradicate the virus. So it's different for different virus, herd immunity means, has different meanings. All right, 80% we will have herd immunity but not necessarily the virus is gone. That's correct. Okay. Another issue is the efficacy rate of the current vaccines we have, inactivated and adenovirus vaccines. 
Some say that the Chinese are inactivated vaccines efficacy rate range from 50% to 80%, uh, while the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines efficacy rate is more than 90%. First of all, what is the efficacy rate's uh, value, and, and does it matter? Of course, you know, the efficacy value is very, very important to uh, assess the efficacy of your vaccines or, you know, um, uh, foresee the possibility to be reinfected. Um, I mean, but um, uh, at the moment, all the data indicates either inactivated or um, mRNA vaccine, they would protect very well for the serious conditions and also for the death. Mm -hmm. So, of course, you know, even for the mRNA vaccine, also inactive vaccine from the clinical trials and real world data, you see some uh, re infection after vaccination. I think that's, um, that's another issue. That tells you maybe it's not uh, infectious, but when you are still seeing about that, that's about the infection. So that infection could be just a symptom infection. That's i.e., only when you do the test, mm -hmm. you are positive. But you wouldn't. Uh, uh, get a serious condition or you would get the, you know, anyone to get into the death. So in your opinion, uh, the effectiveness to keep people from going to hospitals or get killed by this virus is more important? Yes, that's correct. And also, you know, from what we have experienced of the flu vaccine, you know, you never get a very high protection of the flu vaccine, but you get some proportions. Mm. No, that you are always the rich. More importantly, you know, the benefit you got from the flu vaccination is the serious condition and death. Um, because flu and COVID, they are both respiratory infectious diseases. So at the moment, there are a lot of scientific questions remained. You might have very good antibodies in your blood, mm. but the antibody might not be good enough to reach to your lung, to your respiratory trick here, respiratory system here. So this is why you still you see the number. Uh, I think um, maybe a few weeks ago, the American real world data shows they still have a few 5,000 or something, you know, um, uh, infected cases after vaccination. So this, is a t this tells you uh, somehow COVID-19, so some, something you know, really like what we saw for the flu. So again, I'm seeing this is a scientific question, but definitely all those numbers tell us protection of the serious condition or death, the rate much lower. So there is another thing that probably is related to uh, flu vaccines is that will we be able to have a third shot? Will that change uh, the efficacy rate and Will that also add another kind of a strain on our supply chain? Um, you know, that's a very good question. At the moment, the protocol we are using is, you know, two shots. You know, inactive vaccine vaccines or the subunit, subunit uh, protein vaccines or the adenovirus vector vaccines. We don't have enough data or evidence to change this protocol yet, but we are thinking the whether or not if you have a boost shot, uh, i.e. You know, more than two, would help? I think this is a scientific question. I, I think this is uh, under investigation. Uh, hopefully, we will have an answer soon. Do you suggest the third shot will be different than the previous two shots? Is another kind of vaccine that you in general, take? In general, sequential vaccination or se sequential injection, i.e. You use, use different kind of vaccine. Of course, the same, same or similar antigens, mm -hmm. immunogens, and it would be better. So that's already, you know, scientifically, we know that by, you know, in the textbook. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's all depends on the availability of the vaccine we have. Uh, talking about availability, that means we will not only have to have 2 billion, but 3 billion doses within a year. Uh, can we produce that many doses? Yeah, the capacity in China at the moment, I think we have such a capacity. I don't think there's any problem here. Mm -hmm. So the problem is like, you know, you know the Chinese, they are working very hard. We need all those people working in the uh, companies, you know, day and night. And, you know, I can't, we, we should have enough. 
And the most uh, recent headline making news is that WHO is approving uh, the use of Chinese vaccines for emergency use. Uh, first of all, what do you think of their decision and what does it mean for the Chinese uh, vaccine makers and the people who are suffering this COVID in other parts of the world? You know, because China, we are in the first line of the vaccine development, even from the very beginning of the COVID-19 uh, outbreak. So if the WHO can approve any kind of Chinese vaccines, I think that will help to save the world um, because we still need uh, uh, options of the vaccines. To be honest, we still don't know which vaccines or which single vaccine is the best. But we know the vaccine at the moment under clinical trials, under use, so far they are all good. Of course, from time to time you find some side effect or AEFI from some vaccines and then they will stop to do some vaccine, to do some investigation. Historically, we already have the, we already break the record for the human beings, you know, China, US, UK, and uh, you know, uh, also some other countries, we are, Russia, our, all the vaccines, we are in the you know, first lines there, but we still don't know which one is, should be the best. So this is why we still use so many different kinds of vaccines. The reason why there is doubt in the West about the Chinese vaccine is that they say the phase three trial data is not complete and transparent. What do you want to say to those critics? Um, you know, the phase three clinical trials in China, first, it's impossible to do a phase three clinical trial inside China because you know, we don't have any more cases there, here. And the second, all our clinical trials, we did all this outside of China, from different countries. Yeah. You know, it's very hard to collect all those data. As you know, recently, uh, Sinovac, I, I think you know, it will be very soon, um, Sinopharm, they will release, and also CanSino. CanSino released some data of their phase three clinical trials. Uh, because we are in an urgent use, you know, that, that we can use the word pressured. We are pressured to have really good vaccine to be used. So everything is in the emergency. So this is why, though we don't have the um, really you know, complete data, we, we have some interim data. Once you have all those interim data, so we you know, push that interim data, based on those interim data, to put our, push our vaccines into the clinical use. Again, none of the vaccine is formally approved. Either they are you know, under uh, EUA or they are conditional use. Mm. So conditional use, none of them is uh, formally approved. This is why, though I think you know, we are really- Are you saying there is no perfect data collection for any vaccine makers? Yeah, at the moment, you know, because you know, for example, even for some vaccine, I don't want to say which one. So they are targeted to have 150 patient in your placebo and your vaccinees in total. But while they approve the vaccine, they only have 98 of the patients. Okay. Yeah, because you know, we are in urgent use. Uh, another thing is about the age group. Uh, the vaccination began here in China for people between 18 years old and 65. Well, in other countries, the senior citizens were among the first to be vaccinated. Why China choose to vaccinate the young people? In general, from the very beginning of the clinical trials design, I think uh, we are very cautious. Um, you know, from our uh, phase one to even three clinical trials, uh, we didn't have very good numbers of the aged uh, people there. The seniors. So you do, yeah, the seniors. You don't have the data here. And for some other vaccines, because they have more patients, they recruited some seniors there. So we don't have very good data to support for the seniors. However, as I said, we already have some interim data here. Mm -hmm. So this is why, as you know now, and um, in practice, we also have some seniors, you know, they have the vaccine already vaccinated. Mm -hmm. uh, and also the latest development of the COVID spread around the world. Um, in Europe, uh, they are facing an uphill battle, but most importantly, probably in India, they mm -hmm. see a double mutant variant. Um, how dangerous is that? Can 
the current vaccine still do the job? For the variants, I think it's very hard to predict or to see uh, you know, how serious it would be because it's just a new emerging variant. We have to wait and see. So I keep, keep seeing you need to give size a little bit of time. So we don't know. However, you have to be really uh, careful to assess this because whatever they have are mutations, the virus is still the virus. COVID-19 is still COVID-19. And still evolving. I.e., they still use the same mechanism to get you to your cells. So at the moment, most of the vaccines, they are focusing on their immunogens or antigens by stop the virus entry. So that particular region is still the same. So you're saying the spike proteins exactly. that enter the cells have not changed dramatically. No. The, and but also the, recep- the so- so-called RBD, receptor by the domain. There is some change, but not completely change. If this virus completely changed into a new virus, I call new, that means... Could that would, happen? Most likely not. So from our understanding of any kind of virus, you know, that particular virus will still be its own characters. And uh, there's no chance to, to be changed into a new one. If changed into a new one, of course, you, know, you have to um, change your vaccines. Mm. And also, because we have a COVID-19, this COVID-19 tells us we might have a COVID XY. Think about after 1918 influenza pandemic, you know, you have HXAY, so many viruses there. So the coronaviruses are adapted to the human being very well. We might have something new, but unlikely we have something completely different from the, the one we have at the moment. Now the world has so many different uh, approaches, vaccines, versions of it. China have inactivated Aetna, and uh, Europe and America have uh, mRNA. Will it possible that the vaccinations will be accepted by different countries? Will that be an international agreement on vaccination protocol? I think that's the target for the WHO COVAX. You know, COVAX means you know, data sharing. Of course, also vaccine sharing. Um, I hope under the WHO leadership, so we can get you to that stage. The whole world will share the data and share the vaccines. So is it the case that people getting vaccinated will get a passport and travel freely across border? That's the question, you know, everybody's discussing. I'm a member of the, uh, it's organized by the Thai Public Health Ministry. They also organize a panel discussing an expert group to assess whether or not you Asia, we should introduce this. You know, you saw the news, WHO at the moment, they are not encouraged. They are not encouraging you to have But Europe is going to allow Americans vaccinated enter Europe in summer. And Australia and New Zealand also have an agreement. Yeah, this is the, you know, the, as you see, it's a, some are not have a group. Some are still under discussion. I think uh, China also in that stage. Uh, we should work together, you know. Um, I keep seeing we should share the vaccine, not just the vaccine itself, um, but also the data mm-hmm. and the information, and also share the so-called passport or green card. Um, not just a bilateral, hopefully multilateral, you know, by WHO. So why do we get you to that stage? As you mentioned from the very beginning, two kinds of vaccine from China side at the moment is um, uh, assessed by WHO. I think we will soon have that answer. Once the WHO approved our vaccine, I think we are in a very good business to discuss with the um, WHO or any other countries, at least we might have some bilateral... I, I want to follow up on that because uh, WHO uh, recognition is one thing, but already China had bilateral agreement with a lot of countries to provide our own vaccines. What is the difference between WHO acceptance and the bilateral agreement between China and the countries? Here, I want to address again. So this is really the public health emergency public emergency. You know, mutual trust is very, very important. You know, for, for example, we have some bilateral um, agreement with some countries because, you know, say, for example, one of the vaccine from, for the protein subunit vaccine developed by my group, and we did some work in the Uzbekistan, 
because there, you know, there are officials, there are authorities, and there are people or public, you know, trust this kind of vaccine. This is why we can have this uh, kind of agreement. But in general, so we really would like um, WHO to play a very important leadership here. But at the moment, you don't have the complete data. Everything is in emergency use. So WHO, you know, not in a very good position to approve anything with the interim data. I think this is quite understandable. So mutual trust here for the emergency use is very, very important. Of course, COVID is a big game changer for this world. And even with the best technology of vaccines, do you think we will be able to go back to normal, pre-COVID normal? It's very difficult. and It all depends how you define the normal. You know, I give you an example. If someone, some baby who was born um, in 2019 and 2020, no. you know, they, their memory, they, and uh, they might they might think the human beings always wear the mask. masks. You know, in that sense, only when they grew, you know, big enough, and maybe the adults, the parents will tell us, hold on, baby. So that's only some special okay. period. You know, this is why, you know, it all depends how you define normal. And for us, you and me, I don't think, you know, we will move back, you know, we always think move back to so-called normal physiologically. Have you ever thought about the psychological effect for the human being? You, for you, you know, after one or two years, would you think there's no psychological effect for you? Mm. I, I, at least for me, it's huge. So, you know, there's a lot of here, a lot of uh, philosophy um, questions here. Okay, but we're gonna live with the new reality, whatsoever, right? You already saw that, you know, think about when we have the first wave in Wuhan, you know, people are so worried, you know, this is why we have the so-called epidemic there. And, you know, there's a lot of rumors and misinformations uh, there, uh, but now look at what happened here. People are already a little bit relaxed in the whole world, not just in China. So um, I think gradually we will get used to live, you know, friendly with this virus, and maybe by the end of the day, the COVID-19 virus will be like the flu. Like, have you, ever, have you ever thought about the influence of the seasonal flu to you? No. Exactly. Because so we accepted it in yeah, a way. Eventually, you know, if in that sense, we already changed. We, we haven't returned to the normal. Mm. We already accept to have the or COVID-19 together with us. All right. On that note, thank you very much, Director Gao. Okay, my pleasure. Thank you. Nice to meet you again. Each day, there are millions of stories. Each one can open new perspectives, new possibilities, Wherever you look, we are there to see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you all around the world, all around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN. See the difference.
We've made stunning progress. As long as you are vaccinated and outdoors, you can do it without a mask. He rules for vaccinated Americans, dropping the mask mandate for certain activities. An international lifeline for India, desperately needed medical supplies are starting to arrive from abroad. The country is struggling with the world's worst coronavirus outbreak. Live from Washington, this is The World Today. Hello and thanks for joining us. I'm Elaine Reyes in Washington, D.C. Countries across the globe are sending emergency oxygen, aid and medical supplies to help India deal with a deadly surge of COVID-19. More than 300,000 new cases a day for the sixth straight day. Hospitals are struggling with an influx of patients and a shortage of supplies. Gao Ming reports, but first a warning, viewers may find some images disturbing. India is facing an out of control public health crisis. Hundreds of thousands of patients are pouring into hospitals to seek treatment for COVID-19. But due to shortages of oxygen in beds, many are being turned away. This condition is a bit serious. We're standing here without oxygen and a patient in the middle of the road without any hope. It's been two hours. I've been waiting here since 8 in the morning. As far as I can see, I won't be able to get in for another hour or maybe more. I have a car and I'm sitting in it. But where will a poor person sit if he is sick? Crematoriums are working day and night to cope with the soaring deaths. The World Health Organization says this unprecedented crisis in India is beyond heartbreaking. WHO is doing everything we can, providing critical equipment and supplies, including thousands of oxygen concentrators, prefabricated mobile field hospitals and laboratory supplies. A number of nations are sending aid to help India battle this new wave of infections. China says 800 oxygen concentrators have been sent from Hong Kong to Delhi, and 10,000 more are scheduled to arrive in a week. A foreign ministry spokesperson says Beijing is willing to support Delhi with all the help it needs. We are making it clear that we stand ready to help India fight its recent outbreak. Both sides have been communicating on the matter. If India puts forward specific needs, China is willing to provide support and assistance to the best of its ability. The U.S. has promised to provide medical equipment and protective gear to India, as well as raw materials for vaccines to India's manufacturers. The State Department says it's working nonstop to deliver these supplies, and President Joe Biden has vowed to help India overcome the difficulties in its time of need. Both France and Germany have also promised to provide medical aid, including oxygen, as soon as possible. And Russia says India will receive the first batch of its Sputnik V vaccines on May the 1st. Gao Yiming, CGTN. U.S. President Joe Biden has promised to send coronavirus vaccines to India. He also responded to new U.S. health guidelines that may encourage more people to get vaccinated. CGTN's Roy Ruttenberg has the details. Well, Joe Biden walked out to the White House lawn on Tuesday wearing a mask and then removing it, indicating that as a fully vaccinated adult, he no longer needs to wear a mask outdoors, echoing the change in guidance from the Center for Disease Control on Tuesday that fully vaccinated Americans can now not wear a mask outside in small groups. The restrictions, they say, still apply in large places like concerts and compacted gatherings, but in public spaces, in small groups, the mask is no longer required. Well, this announcement coming on the heels of President Biden's 100th day in office and amid higher numbers in vaccinations, President Biden announcing that at least 215 million Americans have received at least one shot, many of them the most vulnerable of populations. Still, there is growing hesitancy to get a shot among some groups, and more and more people who signed up for two doses are not showing up, it turns out, for the second dose. So there is that concern. The announcement, the easing of restrictions, perhaps a reward for those who are vaccinated, and a carrot for those who aren't. For those who haven't gotten their vaccination yet, especially if you're younger or think you don't need it, this is another great reason to go get vaccinated now, now. Yes, 
The vaccines are about saving your life, but also the lives of the people around you. Well, President Biden says that the restrictions being eased is in line with the science and the numbers, the daily infection numbers, the deaths and the hospitalizations all dropping. And Biden says that the doctors are also behind it, but they are urging that indoor restrictions remain in place. Masked, fully vaccinated people can safely attend worship services inside, go to an indoor restaurant or bar, and even participate in an indoor exercise class. Although these vaccines are extremely effective, we know that the virus spreads very well indoors. So both the CDC and the White House are urging Americans to keep the course. They say there's a lot more work to be done in May and June. Yes, some restrictions have been eased, but they say this is not over. Roby Ruttenberg, CGTN in Washington. The U.S. will ease travel restrictions on college students from some of the hardest hit countries. And that includes China, Brazil, South Africa, Iran, and most of Europe. The State Department says as of August 1st, academics and journalists can qualify for a national interest exception visa. About a third of all international students in the U.S. are from China, by far the largest percentage from any country. China's foreign ministry says agreements have been reached between Southeast South Asian counterparts on COVID-19. Foreign ministers from Afghanistan, Pakistan, Nepal, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh attended a virtual meeting to discuss the crisis. We should oppose attempts to label the virus and politicize the pandemic or to prevent international cooperation in fighting COVID-19. Also, we should continue to support the positive role of the World Health Organization in the fight against the pandemic. All countries should work together to build a community of human health. China is implementing President Xi Jinping's pledge to make vaccines a global public good, carrying out vaccine cooperation on a global scale. We are willing to promote vaccine cooperation with other countries via flexible means, such as free aid, commercial procurement and production under the framework of the Six Nation Cooperation Mechanism. The Six Nations agreed to work together on health crises and jointly promote post-pandemic economic recovery. In the U.S. state of North Carolina, family members and attorneys of Andrew Brown Jr. are accusing police of conducting an execution. The accusation follows a private autopsy and his family viewing police body camera footage. Brown was shot five times last Wednesday, and now the FBI has opened a civil rights investigation into the shooting. Daryl Forges has more. It was an assassination of this unarmed black man, and that is painful. Six days after sheriff's deputies killed Andrew Brown as they attempted to serve a warrant, an independent autopsy is providing some answers to a grieving family. To my pops, man, yesterday I said he was executed. This autopsy report... Show me that was correct. According to lawyers for Brown's family, Pasquotank County Sheriff's deputies shot Brown four times in the arm while his hands were on his steering wheel. These bullet wounds, according to the autopsy, were more or less glancing shots. They say the fatal shot hit Brown as he drove away. It was a kill shot to the back of the head. It's obvious he was trying to get away. It's obvious. That's not right at all, man. For nearly a week... Protesters and Brown's family have demanded the release of police body cam footage, something only a judge can approve. This tragic incident was quick and over in less than 30 seconds, and body cameras are shaky and sometimes hard to decipher. They only tell part of the story. They won't release the video, so painstakingly, we have to keep putting the pieces of the puzzle together. As the state and FBI investigate, the family, who saw a 20-second clip of body camera video Monday, wants more information. You don't have to be white or black to realize that what this family has not gotten is justice. In Elizabeth City, North Carolina, I'm Daryl Forges. Police departments across the United States have stepped up their use of body cameras. They reveal the behavior of officers and interactions with the public. The cameras from bystanders' smartphones can show another side of the story, as CGTN's Jim Spellman reports. If it weren't for this video, Derek Chauvin may not have been convicted in the murder of George Floyd. It was shot on a smartphone by Darnella Frazier. 
a then 17-year-old high school student. She posted the video on her Facebook page. I'm grateful that Ms. Frazier was there. I'm, I'm grateful she had the courage to start filming it because without her, I don't think we would be sitting here today. In the early 1990s, this footage of Rodney King, a black man being beaten by police officers in Los Angeles during a traffic stop, was one of the first such incidents caught on camera. Since then, the technology has grown more prevalent. Security cameras, cell phone video, police body cams, and dashboard cameras. News sources of video like this doorbell camera are capturing even more of our world. And the audio and video quality from smartphones is often quite good. This was shot on an iPhone. It is generally legal to film police in the United States, and the Internet has allowed videos to quickly spread. It's not clear if body cameras have had a widespread impact on police accountability so far, but public pressure now often prompts quicker release of video evidence. In Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, this video of white officer Kim Potter shooting Dante Wright, a 20-year-old black man, was released less than 24 hours after the incident. Video doesn't always reveal clear-cut police misconduct. This video from Columbus, Ohio, shows a 16-year-old black girl wielding a knife as a police officer shoots her. This video from Chicago captures a chaotic foot chase that tragically ends with a 13-year-old Latino boy being shot and killed. Police say the boy had a gun. Some fear such graphic video footage, often shown on a loop on cable news, may be damaging. I think it's also, though, um, concerning in the sense that it is a, it's like a drip feed of trauma. Some civil rights leaders say it's doubtful that cases of police brutalizing African Americans are actually increasing. It's, it's not that racism has gotten worse, cameras have gotten better, and we've had more exposure to it. And criminal justice reform advocates, including George Floyd's family, contend that countless other African Americans have suffered at the hands of police without the truth ever being revealed. That's the only thing that changed, the cameras, the technology. Uh, it helped open up doors because without that, my brother just would have been another person on the side of the road left to die. Video also has the power to show the humanity of a man like George Floyd in the final moments of his life, and perhaps the lack of humanity from others in those same moments. Jim Spellman, CGTN. The U.S. Justice Department is opening an investigation into the Louisville Police Department. It comes one year after officers shot and killed Breonna Taylor in her own home. U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland says the investigation will assess police practices including use of force, searches, and seizures. Scientists think human activity may have contributed to a tilt in the Earth's axis. Glacial melt has changed the way water is distributed around the world. Scientists believe that has led to the North and South Poles shifting about four meters since 1980. They say in the past only natural factors like ocean currents have caused the poles to drift. The shift could alter the way Earth spins, but not enough to affect daily life. And that is the world today. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Elaine Reyes. World Insight is coming up next.
This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Today's World Inside: The Industrial Internet in an Age of Digital Transformation of Brick-and-Mortar Businesses. How does it work? How is it transforming enterprises? Insights from a panel at the Huao Forum for Asia. Important infrastructure for everything you want to do. Our local teams are.、Uh, Upskilled in the use of the internet technologies. Digitalization is a very disruptive、um, approach that we are going to tackle now. Here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Inside. I'm Tian Wei. Today, I bring you a discussion. On industrial internet and digital transformation at this year's Boal Forum for Asia, the industrial internet is a network of advanced tools and instruments in a web of smart communication technologies. It powers smarter, faster business decision making for industrial companies. It's said to be the key for businesses going through digital transformation, but many businesses still face constraints such as technological lag, weak data infrastructure. Cybersecurity issues, and many others. So, what should be the priority when a business decides to go through digital transformation? For companies that have successfully applied the industrial internet, how did they do it? Key lessons learned. On that, I hosted a session at this year's Wall Forum. The industrial internet has developed rapidly since it was proposed in the 1980s. Before the meeting, I had a discussion with Ms. Dong. Indeed, the industrial internet helps businesses improve their efficiency, lower the cost, better service the customers, more competitive. In the development process, it is mainly supported by science and technology. Back in the 1980s, the internet did not have a good foundation in many regions and countries. With the improvement of internet technology, the development of information technology, and digital technology, the industrial internet has achieved great results. The Chinese government attaches great importance to the industrial internet and issued several policies. The Ministry of Science and Technology began research on industrial internet-related technologies 20 years ago. We have an example: Southwest Jiao Tong University organized and developed a manufacturing industry value synergy platform. On this platform, more than 10,000 companies provide collaborative services. This project won the second prize of the National Science and Technology Progress Award. In the future, we will conduct industrial internet demonstration projects in more fields, such as aviation, electrical, automobiles, smart home appliances, rail transit, etc. With the development of information technology, big data, cloud computing, and artificial intelligence, 
the role of the industrial internet will become greater and greater. In the next step, we will also cooperate with international companies and relevant countries. Director General Spiegelman, what a pleasure to have you also with us today. Would you like to share with us what about the latest from Israel in terms of encouraging industrial internet and uh, in order to uh, go through this uh, wonderful uh, digital transformation? Director General Spiegelman, please. I said, hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. Well, good morning from Israel, and thank you for having me for this important session. Um, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the industrial internet, or the internet is the uh, important infrastructure for everything you want to do. And I think, especially in the last year with the COVID pan uh, pandemic, uh, we saw that uh, in Israel, an increase in digital transformation, things that usually would have taken years, both in public sector and private sector, in science and technology, accelerated tremendously uh, because everyone were at home. Um, so the internet enabled us to do a lot of things that in other ways would have taken a lot of time or were just impossible. Now, this is, as we see, the next growth engine or one of them, especially if you look at uh, AI, data, uh, uh, and things like that, um, quantum computing, things that will need uh, digital transformation and will need uh, internet, industrial internet, will need the data. Uh, this will be, as we see, see it, one of the major growth engines for the country and actually globally uh, in the next few years. So I think, uh, we believe that this well, uh, will help us, uh, uh, our economy tremendously, our businesses. Uh, there has been a lot of digital transformation around the country. Uh, a lot of businesses from small businesses that never used the internet or use it for very basic um, things, but had to do it and then now are working online uh, and going to bigger business and and the startups and the technology company that actually leverage this situation to uh, a lot of very good use cases. Also, from the government perspective, uh, we saw it as an important uh, opportunity for digital transformation of government services from education and not just government services uh, like you know signing up online or having your ID, but also education and remote education and distant learning, online courses, healthcare services, um, and almost everything else. Speakerman,你是所说的这样,疫情呢,呃,既是挑战,与此同时,确实带来了一些相关产业的发展机会,特别是从工业互联网这个角度,我们台上做的四位嘉宾都是来自于企业界的代表。他们来自于不同的背景、不同的产业。我觉得现在最好呢，还是让他们讲一讲自己的事情，来，呃，董明珠女士，从您开始。各位大家上午好，今天在这里，刚才我们在讲互联网，但是我是来自制造业，也是大
Today, we have more precise quality control, and the reason we can be prepared, and the reason we can be precise is because of the Internet, especially thanks to the 5G technology. We used to talk about automated machine, such as a five-seat machine tool. This is still a single operation station. Today is truly an era of the Internet of Things, and GRI is now building a fully unmanned lights-out factory in China. And it depends on 5G technology. We should not shrink from the changes in this era, but rather face it bravely. Korea has about 70 production bases across the country. In the past, without these new technologies, it was inevitable to encounter loopholes and mistakes here and there. Now we have platforms like Industrial Cloud. It can be said that our factories abroad and our 70 production bases in China can be connected all together. The ability to respond is stronger and the ability to control quality is stronger. At the same time, we apply these new technologies to our research and development. I think every one of us, especially from our manufacturing industry, must remember that manufacturing is fundamental and the Internet is like adding wings to a tiger. You will be much more powerful. Oh, uh, you be taking notes while Miss Dong has been uh, explaining her story. Uh, what's your takeaway? What about your take on the issue? I would say that uh, the, the Internet has changed our business model dramatically over, over even the recent past. Uh, you know, our company's been in business 350 years, so we've had to change our business model. But in the recent past, especially the last year and a half, you know, we've had to bring new technologies into China in different ways. So in terms of technology transfer, it has, uh, it has worked. It has worked very effectively. But to uh, Madam Dong's opinion, I would say that the human side of this cannot be underestimated. So we need to make sure that our, our local teams are um, upskilled in the use of the Internet te technologies and that we've adapted to these, uh, these fully. Uh, I would say the COVID-19 uh, experience for healthcare was dramatically inf influenced by the Internet uh, uh, technologies. Thank goodness for 5G. Uh, thank goodness for the emergency hospitals that were connected with 5G uh, at the time. I think we all benefited from these and it's simply to home delivery. So, you know, it works in very high tech ways. It works in very simple ways that affect us in, in our daily lives. And as I look forward, uh, I think this is a way to give us transparency throughout the entire product development life cycle, uh, back from the customer needs all the way through our upstream processes whether we're uh, designing new pharmaceutical uh, medicines or new electronic uh, materials. So for us, it's transformational, and in many ways, uh, we're the company behind the companies who are, are doing this with our electronic materials that are being supplied to the, uh, the Internet-based industries. I understand during the pandemic, uh, your company has been very busy. Yes. To say the least. So what about that period of time, uh, especially during the very height of it? Now we're still in it, but, you know. Yeah, so, so Chen Wei, at that, at that time, I mean, we had to have very clear visibility on our supply chains so that we didn't have any under, uninterrupted uh, supply of our medicines uh, throughout China. We make a number of medicines here, but we also bring in medicines from other parts of the world. The same thing in our electronics business. Our, our customers operate 24-7. They do not, they never shut down and they didn't shut down during COVID. So it was absolutely critical that we knew exactly where everything was up until the last mile. And the internet uh, gives us that kind of visibility and some of the technology that we're using to manage our supply chain gives us the kind of visibility to, to respond quickly to unforeseen events. In this episode, we'll follow the lives of three ethnic Yao women, a dance instructor, a traditional brocade embroiderer, and the guardian of a written script exclusively for women as they go about fulfilling their dreams.
The world is changing fast, taking all our lives with it. But we can change it too by seeking answers to problems through discussions and debates. On World Insight, I ask direct questions to real people in the know, seek genuine answers, but respect diverse perspectives. Our live global debates tackle the most critical issues head on. World Insight with Tian Wei. Go beyond the headlines. Mr. Madino, uh, from your perspective, how do you see uh, the other two? They are exploring this possibility. The the steel industry in which I'm I'm working is uh, an industry which is um, a high technology industry. Products looks uh, very similar, but I can tell you, steel is very different from one to another. And the technology behind the content behind the properties of the steel are extremely diverse. And in this uh, complexity uh, and uh, this volatile world in which the steel industry is, digitalization is a very disruptive um, approach that we are going to tackle now. Why is digitalization uh, accelerating right now? I think it's also mainly due to the fact that uh, processing data, uh, advanced analytics are more powerful today uh, than before. Also, the storage cost of data has been dramatically divided by 50 in few years. And these allow people to really take full advantage of all the data they have in hand, uh, being able to invest in these technologies. Now, um, China is uh, uh, the main producer of steel in the world with 60% of the world production. So therefore, for China, uh, it is a huge challenge and a huge opportunity to digitalize this industry. Uh, in this aspect, uh, the China uh, ministry has uh, uh, put in place a lot of solutions which uh, we believe will help the development of digitalization through platform. We need standardized platform to digitalize companies and we need as well to uh, develop champions, steel champions who are able to succeed in creating their digital factory, and then that this model can be replicated to as many as possible. Uh, with what Ms. Dong said about linking technology with manufacturing. The industrial internet is a term that is often misleading. People tend to think it is industry plus the internet. In fact, the traditional consumer internet cannot meet the requirements of the industry. The industry's requirements for the internet are very high. The technologies of traditional industries are complicated. Each one is on its own island, and different standards and procedures do not fit with one another. The whole process of digitalization is to integrate data into the entire industry as a factor of production, from R&D to design, to intelligent manufacturing, to service and maintenance. This process actually has a lot of technologies that need to be broken through, and it is very difficult. It is not like what everyone thinks that adding internet to industry will complete this process. We Chinese understand that to be rich, we need to build roads first. 
This is a concept practiced during China's 40-year development. From the very top decision makers to grassroots workers, we are all very clear about that. Here in the process of industrial digitalization, the Internet is the road. We need to broaden Internet access so that everybody is connected to a road. Then the roads should be linked with one another. We are an innovative company. We try to be an innovative company across uh, life science, healthcare, and electronics. And the massive amount of data that we need to process, whether it's for discovering new medicines or developing new materials, requires the machine learning and the AI that will allow us to sort through the noise and get to the real understanding of what the data is telling us. Uh, we've even seen this now in the development of vaccines. The speed of which vaccines have been developed, I believe, have been accelerated by the use of machine learning and, uh, and AI. Uh, so we need the support. It's not possible to do it the old way and, and to keep up with what our customers are expecting, what patients need in terms of new developments. And it really pushes us to the breakthrough options that we may not have seen in the past. What are some of the things that you are having in mind when you said that? So when it comes to innovative uh, new drug therapies, you know, we, we absolutely need to accelerate uh, the uh, execution of clinical trials. They need to be done in a very globalized fashion. Uh, they need to be done in a very accurate uh, fashion. And, and uh, here, the use of AI has absolutely shorten the time and the efficiency, uh, the effectiveness of these clinical trials that leads to all kinds of new drug discoveries, not just for our company Merck, but uh, I'm, I'm sure many others. But what about the data, the data aspect? Yeah, so you know, the, the, we're in a data explosion. Data is growing at about 30% uh, a year. It's an astronomical amount and it was boosted by the recent uh, uh, pandemic uh, situation. So we need to be able to process data and here, uh, our company, our company's companies uh, that we work with, the semiconductor companies, they are challenged by the fact that the semiconductors that they're producing today are probably not going to be adequate for the data demands of the future. To make new semiconductors, you have to be doing this uh, work at the atomic level. And this is where companies like Merck get involved, is that our business is around atomic level chemistry. And we use the data that's, that we uh, have benefited from uh, to help develop new materials, to develop new semiconductors, which helps the better connectivity of us and our customers. Take our air conditioners as an example. There are thousands of component parts, and the data in this process is very complicated, from producing the parts to manufacturing the complete machine. What kind of changes can be brought about after our unmanned plant is in place? In the past, we need to have tens of thousands of people to complete such a product. But in an unmanned plant, we need about only 1,000 people. But the most challenging part is quality control that I mentioned. We all know big data is very good, internet technology is very good. Yet, we are thinking about what kind of methods can be used to ensure that there are no problems using internet technology in the manufacturing process, because it will be fatal should there be problems. What do you need to really successfully uh, tackle the the benefit of the, the digitization. The, the problematic is very often the customers we meet every day doesn't really know what they want. Uh, 
and because they are not clear with their own strategy. And in the steel industry, there are basically three main strategies you can uh, adopt. The first one is to be an innovative company and you want to be close to your customer and design the products they need. And for that, you need to segment your customers properly. You need to collaborate with them on the design phase and you need to be fast to go to the, to the market. The other one is to be very uh, good with uh, the supply chain. So you want to be the one who can deliver in different size lots very fast your customer and being very flexible for them. The third one is you want to be the cost leader. So that means you want to be the cheapest one. So that means you need to have 100% utilization of your line, of your plant. You want to be able to standardize your product so that you buy in volume and produce in volume. The industrial internet can reach every company in every sector. Different industries and companies have their own characteristics, but there are also commonalities. The first one is that there must be very good information infrastructure construction, which is very important for every enterprise from R&D, design, manufacturing, sales, service to user experience. The whole chain shall make use of data technology and the data of one procedure shall be of use to another. Then there is also the problem of data linking and coordination among enterprises. The second commonality is technological advance. When we look back, the industrial internet is constantly upgrading along with technological advances. Our communication technology from 2G to 3G to 4G to 5G has completely subverted the original production model and information utilization model. Now we have big data, we have cloud technology and artificial intelligence. We can do many things that we couldn't do in the past. Thirdly, the industrial internet will bring us lower costs, higher efficiency, stronger competitiveness and better user experience and services. Thus, it would also require from enterprises and from our society continuous high-intensity investment and support in the future. If I were to predict, I would say the most disruptive thing that the industrial internet is likely to bring about in the future is quantum science and quantum computing in 10 to 30 years. It will completely change our information transmission and computing capability. This is a question that our enterprises must think about before the arrival of technology. Just now, Minister Huang from China talked about the disruptive uh, innovation that's likely to take place and transform the whole picture. Uh, from your perspective, how do you see the speed of that? And what does that mean in terms of preparations? Is there a way to prepare at all? I think if I'm looking at this revolution from a government perspective or a country perspective, I think we need to prepare and be ready. Um, what we see is just the tip of the iceberg or just the starting point of what will be the next huge revolution. So we started with the digital transformation, now with the data revolution. Um, people say that data is the new gold uh, or new oil. I'm not sure, but um, we are definitely just seeing the, the, the beginning of what will be a major revolution and in any revolution we need to prepare and we need to be make sure we have the right infrastructure now when i'm talking about infrastructure infrastructure there are many things we need to think from a policy or government perspective um, to enable this industry or the r d or the startup so we are just the enablers but we have to make sure that we have the right things in place uh, we need to think maybe on three or four different uh inf infrastructures first the physical infrastructure people talked about 5g about cloud make sure that we have the right uh, uh a broadband or cloud for processing and co computing power for processing all this data and information and technology uh for com companies so this is one thing thing when you have to think about it and we in the israeli government really think about how we make sure that we on a government perspective, enables all this amazing innovation and industry from uh, all the economy to new economy to have what they need to 
leverage this innovation and, and transformative technology. The other thing, and it was mentioned before, is about uh, the human capital and the talent. Do we have enough people who knows how to use the internet and what to do? So uh, we see in the future, in the near future, and 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 then the next five to ten years, a lot of the current positions and jobs will disappear probably. And there will be a lot new roles. Do we have the right training for the people to to support all of that? So from um, computer science and data analysts and data scientists, that's on the high end of the R&D innovation, but also more basic from um, data analysts. And almost everyone will be able to, will need to know how to use data or how to use technology, almost any job. Do we have, or how do, not do we, we don't have right now, we have a lot of uh, missing uh, talent that is needed, but how do we make sure that we supply them? right enough of talent. And the third is about policy. You talked about security and cybersecurity and privacy. There will be a lot of changes in policy and regulations with all this innovation coming up from autonomous cars. What does it mean to have an autonomous car in terms of privacy and, and, and what will it mean in terms of healthcare and all that? So how do we support, have the right policies in place for one hand to not to help the industry goes forward and not hold it back. On the other hand, make sure that we protect our citizens and our people uh, in terms of security and privacy and a lot of other impacts that we're even not sure that we right now know what will happen in five or 10 years. So we now just need to imagine and make sure they have the right uh, support and regulation and policy in place. So there's a lot of work in a country wide level to prepare for this, um, which will be an amazing revolution, like every revolution, like the industry revolution 100 years ago. This is will change a lot of things. It will change most of the industries. It will change most of the things we do. Yeah. The world will not look the same in five, 10, 20 years. And we make sure we, and, and governments usually do not react very fast. So we have to start prepare right now. The world is changing fast, taking all our lives with it. But we can change it too, by seeking answers to problems through discussions and debates. On World Insight, I ask direct questions to real people in the know, seek genuine answers, but respect diverse perspectives. Our live global debates tackle the most critical issues head on. World Insight with Tian Wei. Go beyond the headlines. Images may appear to be identical, but looks can be deceiving. The difference is not always obvious. It has to be discovered. There are always different sides to a story. We put the focus on the details. To see more, to understand better, see GTN. See the difference. Certainly,说到这个有适应能力，要有创新能力，同时有非常强的学习能力。呃，董明珠女士呢，在这方面非常的著名啊。但是从一个企业家的角度来看，哈，怎么能够为未来？ 准备好。可以讲，互联网时代已经完全颠覆了我们过去的，不仅是思维。The internet age has completely changed our thinking and our behavior. We eagerly hope that both on a national level and also for the world to establish a better governance of the internet age. 如果我们当下建立一个新的次序，来管好啊这个互联网的时代。the reason I'm doing live streaming is because I'm trying. This new era has already come. In the past, we do tens of thousands of our own specialty stores, especially during the time of the pandemic. The past model can no longer work. So last year, I did more than a dozen live streaming. Some say that must be very tiresome. I don't feel I'm tired. It's a kind of happiness, and I gained a lot, 
At one time, our turnover reached 10 billion RMB in one live streaming. That's so very interesting. It is the technology of the Internet that makes all these possible. Basically, if you place an order on us today, it will be delivered to your door by tomorrow. The response is quick and precise. We often talk about innovation. In fact, I think innovation is everywhere. If you don't innovate, you will be outpaced. Innovation is not a thought, it's an action, especially for us manufacturers. Al, you want to take with that question? So I really like this comment that innovation is from everywhere. We try to connect all of our uh, operations around the world uh, together. I think in many ways digitalization is the universal language, it's the universal process by which we can bring the customer closer to what we do in our, in our businesses. Uh, you know, one of the examples there is that we actually connect our manufacturing process to our end use customer. And in this, this particular connection, it allows us to fine tune what we do in our upstream operation to their exact specifications. And I think that works for most in every industry, from air conditioners to pharmaceuticals to to phones and, and, and uh, other things. Because the closer you are to your customer and the real-time response that you can get from your customer, the better you can design your products, your services to, uh, to, to meet their, their needs. And it builds in resiliency into your operation. There's no time that I can remember when we were tested with resiliency then like the recent past. But I think it showed the potential of having smart systems that can be transferred to other parts of the world. Uh, so, in fact, what we're looking at is building modular factories. These are digital twins of what we have in certain parts of the world. And these kinds of modular factories will give us the flexibility to build what we need close to the customers who need them when they need them. And, and uh, this is very different. You call it, uh, maybe it's disruptive. Maybe it's rethinking our original business models. But I think it's the way we need to be in the future. We can't be building just one factory, one place in the world to do everything that we think we're going to need. You have to be close to your customer. What about the moving factors, shall we say? Geopolitics, the politics, the economic situation, pandemic. You also have uh, international trade rules uh, that are now under huge discussions. All of this will have an impact on how industrial internet will be used and who will really benefit from it, to what degree. Yes. So uh, basically, we, we are in, indeed in a, in a very changing world, uh, as we say, on the geopolitical uh, in terms of pandemics. And basically, uh, there is a, a, a clear need of integrating that in the, in the strategies of the company through the digitalization. And this is uh, a movement uh, we see more and more. Uh, we see that uh, governments are taking actions. Uh, they are coming with uh, uh, proposals, like we have seen in China, with this proposal in the 14th, uh, five years plan to integrate digitalization really as a point of bringing the human community together. Mm. We have seen that there have been a, a lot of antagonizing and digitalization is a topic which has been brought by the China government as a topic which is including everybody and that it should count again all the, di the diverse countries and diverse ideas we are yeah. uh, having right now. Mm. El? I would say that uh, Nobody has a lock on innovation, right? And if you believe that, and you really want to innovate for your customers, uh, the best thing uh, for, for companies, uh, for governments to do is to facilitate innovation. Because the one thing we don't have more of is time. And digitalization can save time and speed innovation for all kinds of uh, industries. Our um, business, uh entrepreneurs and pioneers are also great diplomats. 
in their way of expressing. Uh, Mr. Zhang? It triggers a huge impact on the cooperative relationship of the entire supply chain of the industry, especially for small and medium-sized enterprises. It will bring about a closer cooperation. Because of the pandemic, people have developed cross-regional online methods that allow data to travel instead of people to travel. There is a huge change of the way of cooperation for upstream and downstream industries. Director General Spiegelman, a few words before we wrap up. Yes, just uh, uh, try to finish with an optimi optimistic view. This <laughs> is a global uh, change. This is a global uh, opportunity for all of us. I think uh, the internet will lower all boundaries and all companies are, a lot of companies are global companies today. The markets are global. It's really hard to separate. So we have to look together uh, mm -hmm. in Asia and other countries, how we can together make sure that we leverage this opportunity. I agree about the time. We have to be quick and smart and leverage and make sure that we put everything we need to help the world uh, take this opportunity to the be to, to a good place and mm -hmm. to help the citizens and the people and the businesses and the economy. Um, we have a lot of work to do, but I'm quite optimistic what we are on the right way and we will overcome all the challenges from infrastructure to talent to policy and we will be able to enjoy. Um, so I think we have this opportunity and we know that we can together join forces and, uh, uh, and, and, and leverage this okay. great opportunity. Let's yeah. do it. Thank you, Thank you for your confidence and uh, optimism. Uh, Huang Bozhang, what I want to say is that in the future, not just enterprises, but users of the whole society will feel the benefits that the industrial internet brings to us, and we will all contribute our strength to work together. Thank you so much for your contribution, both here on the site and also online with us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Industrial Internet and Digital Transformation. That's a panel I hosted at this year's Boal Forum for Asia. If you'd like to see more, search World Inside our program or check out our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Ken Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for watching and bye for now. Welcome to Global Business on CGTN. I'm Rochelle Tufo in Washington. The U.S. and others send aid to India as COVID cases there surge. 
And the US CDC issues new outdoor mask guidance for fully vaccinated people. Plus, tensions overshadow an EU vote on the future of trade with the UK. those stories in just a moment. But first, U.S. markets have just closed. Let's check on how global stocks are wrapping up the day. John Terrett is outside the New York Stock Exchange. Yeah. Hi, John. I sure am where I always am, Monday to Friday. It's a chilly evening here on Wall Street, but the sun is shining above the tall buildings around us. And we have so much information to get in in the next three minutes, I just don't know how I'm going to do it. What I will tell you about, though, is that consumer confidence came in very, very high earlier on today, and the market's certainly like that, the best it's been since the pandemic. We are waiting for some comments from the Federal Reserve, the central bank, on Wednesday. That kind of you know, takes the edge off things a bit. The good news is that Americans can now go outside without a mask, according to the president. So that's very good. In fact, 37 percent of Americans have been fully vaccinated. 67 percent of senior citizens here have been. So at the end of the day, we were expecting another record on the S&P 500, and we was robbed right at the last second. It ticked into the red. So here are the numbers. And the Dow up one point, but we're calling that flat, and it's below 37, 34,000. It was down 111 points at one stage today. So I guess to be in the green at all is a victory. NASDAQ down one third of 1%, ending a two-day winning streak. S&P 500, we were looking for a record. It would have been a record had it been up by one point, but it was down by one point. Now on to Europe. London down a quarter of a percent. NASDAQ, uh, sorry, DAX in Germany. DAX and NASDAQ sounds the same. When you've been on duty all day as I have, it is the same almost. DAX in Germany down one third of 1%. The French one down by just one point. Earnings were in focus. Rochelle. John, speaking of earnings, a lot today. Tell us about what happened. Here we go. I could take up the rest of the program. I'm not allowed to, apparently, but here we go. I'm not going to give you the numbers because I've done that before and got very, very confused. But basically, Microsoft, Alphabet, which is Google, and Starbucks and Visa, the credit card company, all beating Wall Street expectations. You can Google it if you want to. Microsoft shares, though, down 3.5%. Alphabet Google up by about 4%, even though there was a slight miss in their very important cloud business. And then get this, Starbucks shares down 3% in the immediate after hours, even though they beat on the top and the bottom line. And in fact, their revenue was up by 11%, but Wall Street had simply been looking for more. But this is the thing, 91% increase in China. We always know that Starbucks says its expansion will come in Asia. And after things cleared up in China, here's the business reporting a 91% spike, which is pretty good. Visa shares up 1.6%. They beat as well. Also today, we had very strong earnings from UPS, the logistics company, shares up 10%. And Crocs, the plastic shoes people, I'm not sure how I feel about plastic shoes, really, but anyway, <laughs> shares up 15%. 3M was a big drag on the Dow, responsible for 32 points coming off it at one stage. Eli Lilly, not good earnings or had problems with the earnings. And Tesla as well. Now, let me try and tell you all about the Tesla earnings. Here we go. I've just got to turn my pages back. Now, uh, in just a few sentences, basically, here's the most exciting company of our era. Elon Musk, you can hardly take your eyes off him. He's always making news. Today, they made a profit, or yesterday, of $438 million. The revenue was up 74%, $6.3 billion. But Wall Street is concerned. They're concerned that it can't be kept up, that there is already weakness in the revenue number. They're worried that some of the profit came from Bitcoin and some of it from credits, which Tesla gets simply for being an electric vehicle maker. Also, they have very stiff competition from around the world, including in China. Tesla shares down 4%. General Electric used to be a member of the Dow until they kicked it off about two years ago, and it was on the original Dow Jones. Shares down six tenths of 1% today. Their power, their renewable energy, and their aviation division didn't do so well. Hasbro, the game company, shares up 1.3% today. They had an easily, handily beat on their profits and earnings, but the revenue was a miss, and they're also selling their, I suppose it's a record label, an online music division called E1, which is based here in New York, along with Death Row Records, would you believe? And they're selling that for 385 million. They bought it two years ago for 4 billion. And they bought it because they wanted tie-ups with movies and things like that. They're selling it now because they want to be a better toy maker and a better toy seller. And who needs a record label called Death Row Records? 
when you are a very successful toy builder, which they are in the tiny state of Rhode Island, the smallest in the country, just to the north of New York City. And finally, just turn the pages here, uh, tomorrow, Wednesday, more earnings. This is a very important 72 hours for earnings in America. Tomorrow, Wednesday, we're going to hear from Apple, which, of course, is the, one of the most interesting companies alongside Tesla. Also, Facebook, Ditto, the Ford Motor Company, and Boeing as well, which has had such an interesting year for all the wrong reasons. Well, now, let's go to Hong Kong and someone who always beats Wall Street expectations, Michelle Hennessy. Asian shares were little changed on Tuesday. Investors have turned cautious ahead of the U.S. Federal Reserve's meeting and corporate earnings this week. The Shanghai Composite shed early losses to close marginally higher. That was helped by a boost from healthcare and consumer staples. Weak performances in industrials weighed, though, after data showed a slowing pace of profit growth in the sector. Hong Kong shares ended flat. Japanese shares slipped, the Nikkei uh, falling less than half half a percent. The market didn't appear to react to the Bank of Japan's widely expected decision of keeping policy unchanged. Uh, but a slew of corporate earnings failed to meet investors' high expectations for strong profit recovery. In South Korea, the Kospi was idling just under flat at the close. Uh, foreign investors are reducing their positions ahead of the Fed's policy meeting. That offset the optimism around upbeat first quarter GDP data, uh, which showed a seasonal adjusted growth of 1.6 percent in the March quarter uh, from three months earlier. Australian shares also falling slightly. The ASX down less than 0.2 percent. Uh, advances in major miners cushioned the impact of losses in tech and healthcare sectors. Michelle Hennessy, CGTN, Hong Kong. Turning to India now, where the world's worst outbreak of COVID-19 has broken daily records of confirmed cases for the most of the last 10 days. Now, the South Asian country reported almost 323,000 new cases on Tuesday. To date, India has reported over 17.5 million confirmed cases. Still, experts say the actual number is likely up to 30 times higher or closer to half a billion. Well, Indian officials are facing increasing criticism for their handling of the pandemic as video footage of overwhelmed hospitals, mass cremations and oxygen tanks under military guard hit the Internet. Well, the international community is scrambling to assist. On Tuesday, U.S. President Joe Biden told reporters he'd spoken with India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi to begin the process. We are sending immediately a whole series of help that he needs including providing for those Rindesivir and other drugs that are able to deal with this and prevent, in some cases, but recover, help recovery. Uh, secondly, we are sending the actual mechanical parts that are needed for the machinery they have to build a vaccine, and that's being done as well. We're also discussing I've discussed with him when we'll be able to send actual vaccines. Meanwhile, a shipment of medical aid from the United Kingdom landed in India earlier Tuesday morning. Luigi Barkil has the details from London. Thousands of miles away, but compelled to help. The Indian diaspora is the largest ethnic minority in the UK, almost 1.8 million people. Here it's one of Europe's biggest Hindu temples. The desperate scenes out of India feel a lot closer to home. The donations are flooding in, really. Um, just in a couple of days, we've passed um, the £100,000 mark. Um, and, um, you know, people are really um, taken by what's actually happening in India. When people can't breathe because there's no oxygen, um, you know, you know there's problems. Press for all those affected by the COVID-19 crisis. They're also seeking help from the gods here, because on the ground, the virus is ravaging parts of India. On Tuesday, the first international aid arrived in the country, sent from the UK. 200 pieces of equipment, including ventilators, just a drop in the ocean compared to the roughly 300,000 cases a day being reported. 
The help from the UK government is largely symbolic at a time when India is desperate for international supplies. Other countries, including the US, France and Germany, as well as the World Health Organization, say they'll also send aid in the coming days. For many worshippers here, some of whom have lost loved ones, can't reach India quickly enough. We try to help them much as we can. It's really bad to see here everything. And we see everything. We talk to our people in India. It's very sad. Everybody, they don't get enough, you know, help. I kind of liken it to the scenes that we were having. Well, not even as much, but when we were having our first and second waves. Um, and it's, it's just horrible to, to think that that's what they're going through with less resources and more stretched uh, manpower. It's a very difficult situation in India, so I'm very, very worried. So I came here today for prayer. The WHO has warned what's happening in India can easily hit other countries. This is a global virus, we're constantly told. A small sign that it's also a global response. Norwegian Barkil, CGTN, London. Well, on Tuesday, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi hosted a virtual meeting with several of his South Asian counterparts to discuss how to fight and contain COVID outbreaks in their countries. Now, it was the fourth such multilateral meeting attended by foreign ministers from Afghanistan, Pakistan, Nepal, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh. India was not present, despite Beijing having extended an invitation to Delhi. China has always been committed to the principles of openness, inclusiveness and win-win cooperation. This includes opening our door for the participation of South Asian countries, including India. We will also make positive efforts to help the relevant regional countries in their fight against the pandemic and protect the public health of the region. At Tuesday's meeting, Wang Yi said that Beijing is willing to provide the five countries with vaccine supplies. This as India has halted vaccine exports in order to inoculate its own population. India is the world's largest vaccine manufacturer. Meanwhile, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control has announced new guidelines for outdoor mask use for fully vaccinated Americans. CGTN's Rory Ruffenberg has the details. Well, Joe Biden walked out to the White House lawn on Tuesday wearing a mask and then removing it, indicating that as a fully vaccinated adult, he no longer needs to wear a mask outdoors, echoing the change in guidance from the Center for Disease Control on Tuesday that fully vaccinated Americans can now not wear a mask outside in small groups. The restrictions, they say, still apply in large places like concerts and compacted gatherings, but in public spaces, in small groups, the mask is no longer required. Well, this announcement coming on the heels of President Biden's 100th day in office and amid higher numbers in vaccinations, President Biden announcing that at least 215 million Americans have received at least one shot, many of them the most vulnerable of populations. Still, there is growing hesitancy to get a shot among some groups, and more and more people who signed up for two doses are not showing up, it turns out, for the second dose. So there is that concern. The announcement, the easing of restrictions, perhaps a reward for those who are vaccinated, and a carrot for those who aren't. For those who haven't gotten their vaccination yet, especially if you're younger or think you don't need it, this is another great reason to go get vaccinated now, now. Yes, the vaccines are about saving your life, but also the lives of the people around you. Well, President Biden says that the restrictions being eased is in line with the science and the numbers the daily infection numbers, the deaths, and the hospitalizations all dropping. And Biden says that the doctors are also behind it, but they are urging that indoor restrictions remain in place. Masked, fully vaccinated people can safely attend worship services inside, go to an indoor restaurant or bar, and even participate in an indoor exercise class. Although these vaccines are extremely effective, we know that the virus spreads very well indoors. So both the CDC and the White House are urging Americans to keep the course. They say there's a lot more work to be done in May and June. Yes, some restrictions have been eased, but they say this is not over. Rui Ruttenberg, CGTN in Washington. Well, Brazil's health regulator has voted to reject Russia's COVID-19 vaccine. 
The agency said there are, quote, inherent risks and defects and that it doesn't have enough information to guarantee the safety, quality and effectiveness of Sputnik V. Well, Russian officials defended the vaccine, saying that it's more than 97 percent effective and already approved for use in 61 other countries. Brazil's vaccine campaign has been sluggish, despite having the third highest caseload in the world. All right, next on Global Business, the latest on the post-Brexit trade agreement between Europe and the United Kingdom. Plus, China steps up efforts to curb its carbon emissions. From a national psyche point of view, there's a bit of panic. Oh, this thing is going to come and kill us all. There's something real comforting about knowing you're going out to help people. Welcome back. The European Parliament has finally had its chance to debate and vote on the post-Brexit trade deal four months after the agreement took effect. Now, members of Parliament are expected to wave through the deal, but made it clear that the UK will be held responsible for any breaches. Tony Waterman has more from Brussels. After five years of first shock... Today is not a good day for Europe. Then anger... Funny, isn't it? Then acceptance. The final stage of the Brexit saga has finally arrived. The European Parliament on Tuesday debated and voted on the post Brexit trade deal, hoping to move past one of the most painful chapters in European history. But while MEPs overwhelmingly supported the deal, there's little hope of it mending strained relations. The UK government, however, should not mistakenly take this for a blank check or a vote uh, of blind confidence in its intention to implement uh, the agreements between us uh, in good faith. The tariff-free, quota-free agreement has been provisionally applied since January, rendering Tuesday's vote mostly procedural. Attention now turns to proper implementation, which has already proven problematic. A blunder by Brussels to limit COVID-19 vaccine exports to Northern Ireland before backtracking and the UK's unilateral move to extend grace periods on customs checks has eroded trust on both sides. It's also stoked tensions in Northern Ireland, unnerving the public and politicians alike. Let me be absolutely clear. The protocol is not the problem. The protocol is the solution of the problem the name of the problem is Brexit. But for Europe's chief Brexit negotiator, the real problem is far more existential. Michel Barnier sees Brexit as a failure of the EU. This is a divorce. It's a warning. Why did 52% of the British population vote against Europe? There are reasons for that. Social anger and tensions which existed in many regions in the UK, but also in many regions of the EU. There's been a lot of soul-searching in Europe over these past five years. EU capitals have tried to understand what underpinned such a profound vote in hopes of ensuring it never happens again. The pandemic has in some ways helped that cause, tying the bloc's fate tighter together than it's ever been before. If history does repeat itself, it won't be from a lack of trying. Tony Waterman, CGTN, Brussels. Meanwhile, new data shows U.S. home prices jumped 12% in February compared to a year earlier. That's the largest gain in 15 years. The Case-Shiller National Home Price Index shows the biggest gains in the western region of the country, with Phoenix and San Diego seeing at least a 17% increase. Prices are also up in Seattle more than 15% year over year. Well, analysts say record low mortgage rates are helping drive demand, which is increasingly outpacing supply. 
Well, China's Environment Ministry says it's taking further steps to curb carbon emissions and encouraging industries to do the same. CGTN's Huang Yue has more. China's Ministry of Ecology and Environment says in order to realize the nation's goal of achieving peak carbon emissions before 2030, it has been working with relevant industries, electricity, steel and petrochemistry, to name a few, to map out a practical path. We are promoting the establishment of a national carbon emissions trading system. We've started with the electricity generation industry and plan to include other high emission industries next. Building this system is an important way to curb carbon emissions. Li says before carbon emissions do finally peak, controlling carbon intensity, the amount of carbon dioxide emissions the country produces per unit of GDP, is a key starting point. Starting from carbon intensity is in line with China's real situation. Many countries around the world have also put intensity targets first and foremost. In fact, China's greenhouse gas emissions are still growing. Controlling carbon intensity can better balance emissions reduction with economic development. China's carbon intensity had decreased by 48.4 percent by the end of 2020 compared with 2005. The country is now working on formulating an action plan for peaking carbon dioxide emissions before 2030. Li says in addition to upgrading traditional industries and tapping into renewable energies, China is also pushing forward legislation on climate change. China has committed to moving from carbon peak to carbon neutrality from 2030 to 2060, 30 years in much shorter time span than many developed countries might take. The official said cooperation across a broad range of areas is significant for China to fulfill this commitment. Huang Yue, CGTN, Beijing. Still ahead on global business, the theme parks will soon be back and ready for summertime fun in the United States. But how have they had to adapt after the pandemic hit their existing business model? Facing the unknown is always difficult. In a world in turmoil, it's easy to lose orientation. But when the storms come, we have to see the possibilities. Reinvent. Find new opportunities. Discover a path forward. CGTN. See the difference. We are CGTN, China Global Television Network. Welcome back. Well, before we go, Disney's two theme parks in California, Disneyland and Disney California Adventure, will reopen at the end of this week after being closed for a year due to the pandemic. Now, they're among the big theme parks reopening in the state as California plans its full reopening in June. Our reporter, Edis Tianshan, looks at how some smaller attractions have coped in this past year. A popular local attraction in the city of Palmdale, Dry Town Water Park has literally been dry for over a year. With its entire 2020 season cancelled, its budget deficit has climbed to over $1 million. Being shut down... We're not running cabanas, we're not running birthday parties that the community has come to enjoy. Obviously, we're not open to enjoy the water park on the hot days, so 
yeah, there was not any real revenue opportunities for us um, because of the closure in 2020. In the last 15 seasons, you know, there's not have been a season such as 2020 where we've been, you know, asked to close. And, you know, as of today, there's still no green light for 2021. While water parks continue planning for possible reopening this spring, California theme parks are already humming, welcoming visitors back on April 1st, though at significantly reduced capacity. For now, safety regulations make it quite a different experience. Ticket sales are now mostly online and limited, so while many people may enjoy shorter lines for a change, not all the rides are open. And long gone are the days of greeting costume characters or crowded parades and no more snacking while standing in queues. And this new reality comes with new business models. Disneyland Resort in California has canceled annual passes that normally aim to attract visitors during off-season, a term that doesn't exist anymore. The company laid off over 32,000 employees in recent months during a time when its California park served as a vaccination site. It's estimated that um, the theme park and attractions industry lost five times more employees uh, last year on average than any other industry. The impact to the entire industry has been devastating. Um, it's estimated that in 2019, the industry generated uh, $25 billion. Last year, that dropped to $15 billion, a $10 billion uh, drop uh, loss. The world's largest theme park operator, though, is seeing explosive growth in its streaming services, fortuitously launched just before the pandemic. Those profits have helped offset the billions of losses in theme park revenues, but for the mid-range companies, it's a different story. SeaWorld, Six Flags, uh, they got big lines of credit to help them get through this, and, and a lot of the money that they've borrowed is going to need to be paid off. So that's going to potentially depress any capital improvements that they're going to be able to do for the next few years. Data that we've seen has shown that up to a third of the market will not consider a visit to a theme park in 2021, no matter what happens. Once a popular attraction for people of all ages, the theme park industry is now facing its toughest time, with its expansion in recent years now being replaced with what looks like years of recovery. It is Tian Shan, CGTN, Los Angeles. And that's our show, but please join us later for another edition of Global Business. That's at 8 p.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. in Beijing. Thanks for watching. I'm Michelle Acuso in Washington. Stay with us on CGTN. The Point with Lu Xin is coming up next.
This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Russia lists the United States as a country committing unfriendly actions towards Russia shortly after the U.S. expelled Russian diplomats. Where does China fit in this latest U.S.-Russia spat? And Chinese President Xi Jinping emphasized China's carbon neutrality target at a recent virtual climate summit. How does China intend to reach this ambitious target? Welcome to The Point, an opinion show coming to you from Beijing. I'm Di Xin. The U.S. is certainly on the list. The Russian Foreign Ministry was referring to a newly signed decree as the latest countermeasure to U.S. sanctions imposed in April. However, against the backdrop of the tit-for-tat confrontations, both officials of the U.S. and Russia agree to stay in touch and are expecting a presidential summit in the summer. Were the U.S.'s sanctions a symbolic move? What are the odds of face-to-face -face talks between the leaders of the two countries. I'm pleased to be joined today by Victor Gao, Chair P Professor at Suzhou University, and from Moscow by Dmitry Babbage, Political Analyst at Sputnik International. Gentlemen, welcome to The Point. Now, Thank the you. U.S., as I said, issued an executive order with sanctions on April the 15th in regard to the so-called harmful foreign activities of the government of Russia, including Russia's alleged election interferences and cyber activities. And as pointed out by some media outlets, the cause of the action of the sanctions also includes Russia's military buildup in Ukraine. Mr. Babich, on exactly on what basis were these sanctions issued? Are they justified? Well, they are certainly not justified. Uh, first, uh, you know, even your phrase, uh, Russian military buildup in Ukraine. The Russian troops uh, in the last few weeks were amassing not in Ukraine, but on the border, because uh, because of the military exercise that Russians had, and second, uh, because of the threat of a new spiral of a civil war inside Ukraine. So, uh, you know, when the United States moves its troops and has military exercises right next to Russia's border, you know, uh, thousands of miles away from the United States, uh, we don't say that this is uh, something criminal, that this is uh, uh, unacceptable, and we don't uh, expel American diplomats uh, or impose sanctions because of that. As for the elections, it's just laughable because there was absolutely no evidence given of any Russian interference. The, the Americans didn't even say in what way Russians could uh, uh, damage elections. I mean, uh, Russians didn't steal the ballots. They didn't fill the ballot boxes. Uh, as for activity in the social networks, I mean, you or me, we can talk to our friends in the United States via social networks. We can express our opinions. Maybe in this way we will persuade our American friends to vote for some candidate or another candidate. But it doesn't mean that we interfere. <laughs> it's just uh, the reality of the new world that people can communicate uh, between various uh, continents, and the, the American government has been pushing for it officially for many years, you know, open world where people can exchange opinions. Yes, foreigners can uh, tilt uh, public opinion in various countries now because uh, people mm -hmm. have access to internet, people have access to television, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that something criminal happened and that uh, the elections are not free or they are not, uh, uh, you know, independent anymore. Mm. So uh, I just don't see how how the, uh, Russia could do something so wrong that the United States uh, describes in its accusation. Mm. The executive order, the U.S. presidential executive order, brought the expulsion of 10 Russian diplomats and economic sanctions against uh, uh, certain Russian individuals and entities. However, U.S. President Joe Biden later explained that I cho chose to be proportionate. He said that the U.S. is not looking to kick off a cycle of escalation and conflict with Russia. We want a stable, predictable relationship. Um, Victor, how do you understand such seemingly um, 
contradicting moves. Is the U.S. merely bluffing to Russia or hoping that a symbolic move will bring Russia to the negotiating table? No, I think uh, what's appalling is that at the very core, the United States doesn't seem to have the minimum respect for Russia as a great country, as the, one of the strongest military powers, as a country which has made a tremendous amount of uh, contribution to the establishment of the current international order after sustaining the heaviest losses and sacrifices in the Second World War. And the United States has forces which seem to be very eager to continue to dismember uh, Russia as it is. This is, I think, the root cause of all the frictions or confrontation between the United States and Russia. Uh, purely from the Chinese perspective, we fully respect Russia as a great country. We fully respect the Russian people as a great nation. And we think we need to deal with Russia with equality and mutual respect. And we oppose any appalling pressures exercised by the United States on Russia. As for the sanctions, I don't think any sanctions against a great country, a strong country like Russia will work. It will be counter productive, it will really poison the relations between Russia and the United States and eventually it will turn the American people as a loser and uh, uh, it will also poison the atmosphere for international cooperation, especially involving major powers like the United States, China mm. and Russia at the very top in the very difficult international situation mm. as mankind is faced with. Mr. Babbage, um, on a specific term, however, uh, how are these U.S. moves impacting Russia? Is there any impact at all? I mean, the chief executive of a Russian financial service group said that the impact of the economic sanctions are limited. How do you see it? Well, there was a certain slowdown in the economic growth of Russia, which was phenomenal in the early 2000s. Uh, experts argue how much that uh, sanctions uh, uh, produced this effect or how much it was produced by the fall uh, on the commodity prices, I mean on the oil prices and the prices for natural gas. But certainly it's not a disaster for Russia. I mean, if you come to Moscow or to St. Petersburg or even if you come to small towns, uh, you won't see problems in, uh, in uh, uh, you know, food uh, or uh, 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 any kind of commodities that the population needs. So maybe some big companies have lost some of their revenues. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, rich people are now feeling unsafe about their assets abroad. But it's very unwise on the side of the United States to demonize uh, Russia's leader, President Vladimir Putin, and to alienate uh, the, the Russian elite. Uh, because, yes, like in any country, elite is important in Russia. And when they feel threatened by the United States, when uh, the United States and the European Union include them in various sorts of blacklists, uh, I think it damages the United States and the EU much more than it damages Russia, because these people just move their capitals back to Russia and they concentrate on the country's development. They could be much more useful for the West if okay. the West just left them. Mm. Well, well, Russia has, uh, as I said, uh, announced this list of country committing unfriendly acts towards Russia. Victor, how do you look at this measure? The, you know, how severe, how strong is that a measure? And what possible impact will it cast against the United States? Well, I truly believe if any country pushes Russia around, Russia will push back. There is no doubt about it, and Russia probably will reinforce the pushback against any country which unrightfully pushes Russia. And I think uh, this will, again, make the relations between the United States and Russia further deteriorate, and I hope they will not deteriorate to such a point of no return, because if it gets even worse, you are talking about a potential uh, face down or showdown between these two largest uh, military powers in the world and this does not spell well for mankind as a whole. So we would urge the United States and Russia to reconsider their very tough positions against each other and hopefully there will be uh, improvement of relations between these two countries or even a rapprochement because I firmly believe if Russia and the United States can deal with each other with equality and mutual respect, 
it's more deserving for these two very mm. great countries in the world. Finally, some Chinese experts have pointed out that China should have a clear head about a possible situation in the future, meaning potential U.S. Ec economic sanctions against uh, China, the state, not just Chinese companies. Victor, uh, do you agree with such precautions? Do you think China um, should be, you know, cautious about this? Well, I think precaution is always a good virtue, and China is not an exception. However, I think we need to be uh, very much looking at the substance of the issue between us. China and the United States has the largest uh, trading volume in the world, and the United States and the Chinese economy are very much integrated with each other. There are dangerous or even evil forces in the United States which want to drive for a complete disconnection between China and the United States. But that's against the fundamental interest of the American people and the Chinese people. And I don't think they can achieve their goal, however they mislabel that. Mm. Therefore, I think I personally have great confidence in the continued uh, uh, status of China-U.S. relations because you are talking about uh, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of people across China and the United States working together with a common goal for maximizing benefits for both the Chinese people and the American people. So while we need to guard against these very dangerous politicians in the United States, which miscalculate and mis which misguide mm -hmm. the American people, we also need to have confidence that okay. no one can really disrupt China-U.S. relations at the very core. Yeah. Well, many thanks to my guests from China and Russia, of course. The opinion of uh, the uh, Americans and uh, Europeans are missing here, or Western Europeans, I should say. But uh, at least you get the Chinese and Russian perspective, some Chinese and Russian perspective. Many thanks to Victor and Dmitry. Thank you. We'll take a, a quick break. And when we come back, Chinese President Xi Jinping emphasized China's carbon, carbon neutrality target at a recent virtual climate summit. How does China intend to reach this ambitious target? Uh, earlier, I talked to Dr. Fang Li, director of the World Resources Institute, China. Stay tuned. Each day, there are millions of stories. Each one can open new perspectives, new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there to see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you all around the world, all around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN. See the difference. Making sense of the overwhelming wave of information means cutting through the noise to shine a light on the heart of the story and making room for new perspectives. True understanding means the ability to see events from more than one side. I'm Liu Xin, and this is The Point. Chinese President Xi Jinping gave a speech on China's commitment to fighting climate change at the Virtual Leaders' Summit on Climate hosted by U.S. President Joe Biden on April the 22nd and 23rd. President Xi emphasized China's commitment to green development using a people-centered approach. He also reiterated the commitment made last year that China will strive to peak its carbon dioxide emissions before 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality before 2060. How significant are China's efforts and pledges, and how does it intend to fulfill its future commitments? I'm pleased to be joined in Beijing by Dr. Fang Li, director of the World Resources Institute, China. Dr. Fang, welcome to The Point. Now, President Xi emphasized that China will strive to peak carbon dioxide emissions before 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality before 2060. But at the same time, China's reliance and use of coal keeps going up. So how exactly does China intend to achieve those goals, given its population and its reliance on coal energy for its economic 
uh, for its economic growth. Hi, Sing. Very nice to meet you. And to be the chief representative of the China Office of World Resources Institute in China, the most frequent question I've been asked is how China can achieve that target, the new pledge. That is an ambitious pledge mm -hmm. since it's used the shortest time or shorter than most of the developed countries mm -hmm. from peaking to neutrality. Uh, if we reveal that the development of the China economy in the past four decades, we can find that China is really unique to achieve the target. China is really good at making the master plan and break out the master plan into stages and also reallocate the task to the local level and set up the uh, local level competition. We can see the successful story in terms of economic development. So can this harness in uh, picking carbon picking and carbon neutrality. That is a, a very good story we can learn from the past. And the local competition, as our perspective, can, in, can encourage the local innovations and also through systematic or the designed uh, pilot can find the new ways or measures mm. and successful experiences can scale up in the national level. So that is a really impressive. Now, and yeah. beside of that, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Well, go ahead. You wanted to add something. Yeah, beside of that, China is a really unique, have a one organization called NDRC, National Development Reform Committee. The daily work or the main task of that organization is think about the reform. So reform is always on the road of the whole process of the uh, development of the China. So that is a really unique of the world. And China, uh, can, China is in the position that can play more important role in carbon neutrality since so far till now, there's no any country achieved the target of carbon neutrality. Mm. So it's a systematic change. China can have a chance in this process. Yeah, we'll talk about that in just a moment. But first, let's, let's talk about what President Xi said, that China will strictly limit the increase in coal consumption uh -huh. and mm -hmm. start phasing it down from 20 26. Um, so basically over the next couple of years the use of coal will be strictly limited but it will still be increasing and China only start facing it down from 2026 basically from the next five-year plan five-year plan number 15 however according to the International Energy Agency coal demand is on rise on course to rise in 2021 by 4.5 percent with China uh, leading the 80% the of growth worldwide. Basically, China is projected to account about 50% of global demand in, uh, in coal demand. So why does China not start facing it down earlier? Uh, you know, at the shifting the economy or shifting the whole system from high carbon intensity economy to green and lower carbon intensity economy, it's a need time. Uh, WRI, as one of the think tank and do tank, we take over not only the pure environment issue, we also look after the just transition, think about the social issues. When the steps go so fast, how about the, the staff or employment in the coal sector, the whole supply chain? And the number of the employment in coal uh, sectors is around uh, 2.7 million. So that is a huge number. And the other, uh, if we look at the other part, the grid, transition of the grid can, can accept the more renewable energy. It's a need time to uh, readjust the grid and also the renewable energy can fit in the grid 
it's also needed time. Uh, we look at the the whole plan. So Xi Jinping, President Xi Jinping mentioned about in the 14th five years plan, limit the consumption of the coal. That is a very positive signal that is a firm the curve of the consumption and emission to the to the stage of the very plat and mm -hmm. then turn it down. That is so uh, if as our understanding that is a in 14th five years plan just a, uh, control or limit the consumption of coal, and also in the 14th five year, uh, 15th five years plan, that is phased down the coal consumption. Mm. So that is a step by step achieve the target. Yeah, uh, help people understand the five year plans because we talk about the five year plans, the 14th and the 15th. But for people who are not familiar with uh, uh, what these five years five year plans mean for for China's future. Um, help us understand that and what it means in global climate change terms. Yeah, in terms of the global uh, climate change, there's a two-phase target. One is till 2030, that half reduce, reduce 50% of the emission, total emission of global. And till the middle of this century, that is a 2050, it should be reduced down to the net zero. And in China, uh, just, like, just like the beginning I mentioned, that China is really good at break down the long-term target into stages. So as our understanding that the every five years plan uh, will match into the long-term strategy. And China will also have the long-term strategy in 2035 and 2050. Mm. Some have also doubted if China can really kick its coal addiction to achieve its 2060 carbon neutral goal. What's your take on this? So you mean China or there the are world? Some, yeah, there are some critics who say China can't really get rid of its uh, you know, reliance on coal consumption. Uh, in terms of the resource resources, 80% of the emission from the coal consumption, and China's uh, rely on the coal as an energy as a key energy. Uh, but consider of the climate change and also the development of the technology in renewable energies such as the solar panel and the wind power. China has a chance to. Uh, have the energy revolution. In Chinese, we call it a full revolution in energy consumption, energy supply, energy uh, generation, and also energy uh, trans transformation. Mm -hmm. So that is a full energy revolution. Uh, if we translate it into Western narrative is kind of the systematic change. Mm. In China, we use the revolution, <laughs> but uh, in Western part, we uh, usually use the systematic change. In your speech on April the 23rd, you mentioned uh, to achieve carbon neutrality is not an incremental process, but a systematic change in society. Um, taking system, systemic changes into consideration, we believe that institutional cooperation should be the main focus of cooperation among major emitters or economies such as China, the US, and Europe. What do you mean by institutional cooperation and uh, how, to conduct, how to conduct this kind of cooperation? Uh, among countries such as China and the United States? That's a really good question. In the previous decades, China, U.S., and EU has a lot of the cooperation in economy, technology, human resources uh, exchange. However, during recent years, uh, there's more noise among those big uh, entities or big uh, countries. And how about the future uh, system? Mm. Uh, it, if I look at the world, we, we think that the uh, global internet or international economy has some uh, conflict with the kind of the supply chain. If we look at the things with the supply chain's angle, that's the part of the 
may be the kind of a key for the uh, solving the problem. And from the cooperation to the constructive competition, that means to set up the common goals and also uh, uh, under that common goals to have the game, just like the football game, you need to have the rules, then the games can start. So yeah. that is a systematic change in new carbon neutrality. That is a not only think about the production side, but also consumption side. So from the supply chain, it's a link the word from producer and consumer. And we need a new mechanism, a new systematic thinking about how to achieve the carbon neutrality. You, you said before also that uh, nobody achieved carbon neutrality. Basically, we don't know how life is, you know, if we're really carbon neutral. So uh, China's exploration, you said, that could be an opportunity for the world. What do you mean by that? Um, first, China is a big emitter of the carbon. And that is a very important. If China can achieve the target, that means that China, 28% uh, of emission can, can be released. Mm. And second, uh, especially after Xi Jinping's speech recently, that the new impressive information is given by the world that is on non-CO2 emission reduction. Mm. Uh, according to WR's research, non-CO2 it takes almost 16% uh, of the total greenhouse gas emission of the China. Mm. And if you look at the whole emission of non-CO2 in China, it's as big as the whole greenhouse gas emission of Japan or Brazil. So the amount is great, and China is getting to take actions on that. That is a very strong signal to the world. Wow, mm. it's been fascinating. I mean, um, some of the things I also learned for the first time, and uh, it definitely will take a lot of determination, a lot of will, and a lot of action, not just on the country, the governments, but also on every consumer as well. Many thanks to Dr. Fang Li, Director of World Resources Institute, China. <laughs>
A desperate situ situation in India getting worse by the day. India struggles with a devastating second wave of COVID cases as aid from abroad slowly trickles in. Almost 100 days in, U.S. President Joe Biden's approach to China becoming clearer. The areas of cooperation and confrontation taking hold under the new administration. And a new civil rights investigation into police violence in the U.S. Troubling new details in the deadly shooting of Andrew Brown. Live from Washington, this is The World Today. Hello and thanks for joining us. I'm Elaine Reyes in Washington, D.C. Countries across the globe are sending emergency oxygen aid and medical supplies to help India deal with a deadly surge of COVID-19. More than 300,000 new cases a day for the sixth straight day. Hospitals are struggling with an influx of patients and a shortage of supplies. Gaoi Ming reports, but first a warning. Viewers may find some images disturbing. India is facing an out-of-control public health crisis. Hundreds of thousands of patients are pouring into hospitals to seek treatment for COVID-19. But due to shortages of oxygen in beds, many are being turned away. This condition is a bit serious. We're standing here without oxygen and a patient in the middle of the road without any hope. It's been two hours. I've been waiting here since 8 in the morning. As far as I can see, I won't be able to get in for another hour or maybe more. I have a car and I'm sitting in it. But where will a poor person sit if he is sick? Crematoriums are working day and night to cope with the soaring deaths. The World Health Organization says this unprecedented crisis in India is beyond heartbreaking. WHO is doing everything we can providing critical equipment and supplies, including thousands of oxygen concentrators, prefabricated mobile field hospitals, and laboratory supplies. A number of nations are sending aid to help India battle this new wave of infections. China says 800 oxygen concentrators have been sent from Hong Kong to Delhi, and 10,000 more are scheduled to arrive in a week. A foreign ministry spokesperson says Beijing is willing to support Delhi with all the help it needs. We are making it clear that we stand ready to help India fight its recent outbreak. Both sides have been communicating on the matter. If India puts forward specific needs, China is willing to provide support and assistance to the best of its ability. The U.S. has promised to provide medical equipment and protective gear to India, as well as raw materials for vaccines to India's manufacturers. The State Department says it's working nonstop to deliver these supplies, and President Joe Biden has vowed to help India overcome the difficulties in its time of need. Both France and Germany have also promised to provide medical aid, including oxygen, as soon as possible. And Russia says India will receive the first batch of its Sputnik V vaccines on May the 1st. Gao Yiming, CGTN. China's foreign minister says agreements have been reached between South Asian counterparts on COVID-19. Foreign ministers from Afghanistan, Pakistan, Nepal, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh attended a virtual meeting to discuss the crisis. We should oppose attempts to label the virus and politicize the pandemic or to prevent international cooperation in fighting COVID-19. Also, we should continue to support the positive role of the World Health Organization in the fight against the pandemic. All countries should work together to build a community of human health. China is implementing President Xi Jinping's pledge to make vaccines a global public good carrying out vaccine cooperation on a global scale. We are willing to promote vaccine cooperation with other countries via flexible means, such as free aid, commercial procurement and production under the framework of the Six Nation Cooperation Mechanism. The Six Nations agreed to work together on health crises and jointly promote post-pandemic economic recovery. Brazil's health regulator has rejected the use of Russia's vaccine Sputnik V. 14 states and two municipalities appealed for the drug, but regulators say they cannot guarantee its safety. The manufacturer says politics are at play, as Paulo Cabral reports. 
The board of Brazil's health regulator Anvisa denied authorization to import Russia's Sputnik V vaccine, citing lack of consistent and reliable data. The unanimous decision taken by a board of five directors was announced on Monday following a five-hour meeting. One crucial issue cited by the agency was the presence of adenovirus in the vaccine and its potential to cause serious health problems among recipients. It also cited insufficient data on quality control, security and efficacy. The conclusion of the General Management for Medication and Bioproducts, based on the information and the data received until now from both our investigations and coming from other regulatory bodies, is not to recommend the import of the Sputnik V vaccine. The directors of Anvisa also said that their teams sent to Russia for inspections were denied access to four of the seven plants used to produce the Sputnik V. The makers of the vaccine, the Gamaleya Institute, reacted with a post on social media alleging the rejection was politically motivated and suggesting that this had to do with pressure from the United States. Governors and health authorities from some of the 14 Brazilian states who wanted to import the vaccine also attacked the health regulator's decision. But some scientists took to social media to say that Anvisa was acting correctly and cautiously and that approval by regulating bodies of other countries shouldn't be enough for Brazil to rubber stamp the use of the medication as well. Vaccination against COVID-19 is underway in Brazil, but efforts are being hindered by a shortage of drugs. So far, about 27 million people have received at least one dose, about 14% of the population. That's far short of the numbers needed to contain the spread of the virus. President Jair Bolsonaro and his government are facing heavy criticism for not taking action in early stages of the pandemic to secure vaccine supplies for the country. This will be one of the key issues discussed in a Senate probe that opened Tuesday. The panel will determine whether the lack of action or corruption on the part of Bolsonaro or any federal or state officials rose to criminal levels. Opposition senators want explanations, for example, for Bolsonaro's decision to turn down an offer of 70 million doses of the Pfizer vaccine in August last year. They also want the federal government to explain its resistance to social distancing measures while promoting treatments with unproven efficacy, such as the hydroxychloroquine. Over the last week, there's been a slight improvement in COVID-19 numbers with a reduction in daily deaths and many states seeing some degree of stability in the spread of the infection. However, figures are still very high, with average daily deaths close to 2,500. Paulo Cabral, CGTN, São Paulo. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has announced new guidelines for outdoor mask use for fully vaccinated Americans. CGTN's Roy Ruttenberg has the details. Well, Joe Biden walked out to the White House lawn on Tuesday wearing a mask and then removing it, indicating that as a fully vaccinated adult, he no longer needs to wear a mask outdoors, echoing the change in guidance from the Center for Disease Control on Tuesday that fully vaccinated Americans can now not wear a mask outside in small groups. The restrictions, they say, still apply in large places like concerts and compacted gatherings, but in public spaces, in small groups, the mask is no longer required. Well, this announcement coming on the heels of President Biden's 100th day in office and amid higher numbers in vaccinations, President Biden announcing that at least 215 million Americans have received at least one shot, many of them the most vulnerable of populations. Still, there is growing hesitancy to get a shot among some groups, and more and more people who signed up for two doses are not showing up, it turns out, for the second dose. So there is that concern. The announcement, the easing of restrictions, perhaps a reward for those who are vaccinated, and a carrot for those who aren't. For those who haven't gotten their vaccination yet, especially if you're younger or think you don't need it, this is another great reason to go get vaccinated now, now. Yes, the vaccines are about saving your life, but also the lives of the people around you. Well, President Biden says that the restrictions being eased is in line with the science and the numbers the daily infection numbers, the deaths and the hospitalizations all dropping. 
Biden says that the doctors are also behind it, but they are urging that indoor restrictions remain in place. Masked, fully vaccinated people can safely attend worship services inside, go to an indoor restaurant or bar, and even participate in an indoor exercise class. Although these vaccines are extremely effective, we know that the virus spreads very well indoors. So both the CDC and the White House are urging Americans to keep the course. They say there's a lot more work to be done in May and June. Yes, some restrictions have been eased, but they say this is not over. Roby Ruttenberg, CGTN in Washington. The U.S. will ease travel restrictions on college students from some of the hardest hit countries. And that includes China, Brazil, South Africa, Iran, and most of Europe. The State Department says as of August 1st, academics and journalists can qualify for a national interest exception visa. CGTN's Sean Calebs has the details. The move by the Biden administration is seen as incredibly good news for hundreds of thousands of Chinese students. China by far sends more students to study at colleges and universities here in the United States than any other nation. And not only is China going to be allowed to send students here, but also students from Iran, South Africa, Brazil, and a host of other nations. This is something many colleges and universities have been pushing for, urging the Biden administration to make this move. The reason so many of these colleges are simply suffering financially right now, there was a significant drop in enrollment last year during the pandemic. And international students are even more attractive to colleges and universities because they typically pay full tuition, amounting to some $40 billion to the U.S. economy. Most recently, the American Council on Education said it wanted the Biden administration to make this move seen as a welcoming gesture to allow students to come back to the United States and study. How did we get here? Well, back in March of 2020, then-President Donald Trump put a ban on international students coming to the United States during the pandemic, wanting to keep COVID from spreading throughout the United States. Now, even though the door is opening and students are going to be allowed back in, it is not going to be completely a smooth ride. Any first-time visa applicants must meet at the U.S. Embassy with embassy officials before coming to the United States. And considering August 1st is the deadline, there is going to be a backlog of students trying to get through the embassy to come here to the United States. The U.S. says it understands that and is working to streamline the effort. Sean Caleb, CGTN in Washington. U.S. President Joe Biden has been rolling out and modifying his approach to China in his first 100 days. In many ways, it follows the pattern of his predecessor, but in others, it's a departure. CGTN White House correspondent Nathan King joins us live. So, Nathan, Biden's opening months in office have seen a range of activity over China. Walk us through it. Yeah, Elaine, it's not like Trump when it comes to rhetoric. Uh, also, not like Mike Pompeo, uh, the Secretary of State, who literally uh, uh, launched a rhetorical crusade against China. When it comes to policy, though, it looks the same and actually perhaps far more dangerous for the U.S.-China relationship. It's been 100 days of confrontation. Fiery talks between Washington and Beijing in Anchorage, Alaska, after the Biden administration imposed yet more sanctions on China over Xinjiang and Hong Kong. Washington also held, virtually, the first leaders' summit of the so-called Quad, the ad hoc grouping of the U.S., Japan, India and Australia, widely seen as a grouping aimed at containing China. But there's also been cooperation on the biggest threat to the planet, climate change. First, a successful visit to Shanghai by the U.S. Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, John Kerry. Then, Chinese President Xi Jinping, the first foreign leader to address last week's climate summit organized by the White House. We will continue to prioritize ecological conservation and pursue a green and low-carbon path to development. China will strive to peak carbon dioxide emissions before 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality before 2060. But much of the second day of the climate summit was dedicated to how the U.S. could catch up with China on the climate-centric industries of tomorrow. Beijing is leading the way from electric vehicles to lithium batteries to the use of wind and solar power. In fact, competition with China on all fronts is now an urgent priority for Washington. While the climate summit was underway, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, backed by an overwhelming majority, the Strategic Competition Act of 2021, 
It's a 280-page call to counter China, militarily, economically, ideologically, and beyond. China today is challenging the United States, destabilizing the international community across every dimension of power, political, diplomatic, economic, innovation, military, even cultural, and with an alternative and deeply disturbing model for global governance. So this is a challenge of unprecedented scope, scale, and urgency, and one that demands a policy and strategy that is genuinely competitive. The act will now go to a full vote in the Senate. There are many more pieces of legislation targeting China in the works from breaking up supply chains when it comes to semiconductors and smartphones to requiring universities to reveal funding from China and restrictions on Chinese students in strategic industries. The first 100 days of the Biden administration has been targeting China in a more organized and strategic way than under Trump. The Biden administration is also keeping in place Trump's tariffs, at least for now. And you know, Elaine, uh, it may be too early and maybe too hyperbolic to call this the beginning of a Cold War. But I can tell you, after covering Washington and international relations for quite a while, it certainly feels like we're heading that way in the first 100 days of the, uh, of the Biden administration, especially when it comes to policy, not rhetoric. It's almost the opposite of the Trump administration. And China, of course, is pushing back on what it sees as red lines with its sovereignty when it comes to Taiwan, uh, Hong Kong, Xinjiang, uh, and elsewhere. And you know what? Even allies of the U.S., uh, I'm thinking of Japan in particular, are uncomfortable, if you just read the Japanese press, about how they're being pulled into some sort of commitment uh, uh, when it comes to Taiwan and others when it comes to, uh, for example, breaking up supply chains and long-held uh, 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 benefits in terms of trade and elsewhere, uh, are uh, worried. So we'll wait and see. But this may be uh, uh, Biden trying to out-Trump Trump, Trump uh, but we'll see. Nathan, I don't know if you can hear me, but we know that Biden will deliver his first presidential address to lawmakers on Wednesday, about 24 hours from now. What should we be listening for when it comes to yeah. China? Well, I mean, I'd really like to know when the tariffs are going to be lifted, don't you? I mean, uh, the uh, Democrats campaigned that the tariffs were harmful to American businesses, which they were, but yet they're still using it as leverage. That would be a very good way of re-engaging with China and benefit uh, both sides. I'd also like to um, hear something about uh, going forward in terms of the U.S.'s presence in Asia when it comes to trade relationships. One of the main complaints, we don't hear from China, but from allies around the region, is that the Trump administration backed out of the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, uh, have not involved themselves in the RCEP deal, uh, the um, ASEAN deal, which uh, China also pushed. And so while they expect a lot from their allies in the region, they expect a hard line on China, they're not always willing to follow through when it comes to commitments as well to the region. So uh, it's going to be a very interesting to watch. Remember, China doesn't get a vote, so they can say what they like. <laughs> All right, Nathan King live outside the White House. Thank you. Still had a stark assessment of Israeli-Palestinian relations and another U.S. neighborhood on edge after another deadly police shooting. The family calling for an investigation. Network. In the U.S. state of North Carolina, family members and attorneys of Andrew Brown Jr. are accusing police of conducting an execution. The accusation follows a private autopsy and his family viewing police body camera footage. Brown was shot five times last Wednesday, and now the FBI has opened a civil rights investigation into the shooting. Nick Harper has more. 
The lawyers for the family of Andrew Brown were speaking just outside of that building behind me just a short time ago, and during that, they detailed what they'd found during their independent autopsy. Now, they say that Mr. Brown was shot five times in total. Four of those shots hit his right arm. The fifth shot hit the back of his head, and they say that that was the fatal shot. Now, officers were carrying out a warrant for his arrest at the time of the shooting. Mr. Brown tried to drive away, and that's when officers opened fire. But the lawyers for his family say that quite simply what they did was a straight-up execution. They called it an assassination. They say that Mr. Brown posed no threat, that he was scared for his life, and that's why he was driving off. Uh, but they say that the officers uh, carried out a kill shot to the back of his head. Well, an FBI investigation has now been opened. Uh, it's a civil rights investigation, specifically looking at uh, whether federal laws got violated uh, during this arrest and the shooting. On top of that. We know that the family are continuing to push for the public release of the police body cam footage. Now, so far, the family have been shown a 20-second clip of the body camera footage, but they say the whole of the footage needs to be released to them and to the public. But the problem here in North Carolina is that there is a specific law that means that that cannot happen until a judge has ruled. Now, a judge is holding a hearing on this matter on Wednesday, but it's unclear, even if he rules in the favour of releasing that body camera footage, how quickly that may happen. Meantime, uh, protests are continuing here in Elizabeth City. We've seen that for several nights running since the killing of Mr Brown last Wednesday, and we are expecting uh, more in the coming hours as we head into this evening. Police departments across the United States have stepped up their use of body cameras. But cameras from bystanders' smartphones can show another side of the story, as CGTN's Jim Spellman reports. If it weren't for this video, Derek Chauvin may not have been convicted in the murder of George Floyd. It was shot on a smartphone by Darnella Frazier, a then 17-year-old high school student. She posted the video on her Facebook page. I'm grateful that Ms. Frazier was there. I'm, I'm grateful she had the courage to start filming it because without her, I don't think we would be sitting here today. In the early 1990s, this footage of Rodney King, a black man being beaten by police officers in Los Angeles during a traffic stop, was one of the first such incidents caught on camera. Since then, the technology has grown more prevalent. Security cameras, cell phone video, police body cams, and dashboard cameras. New sources of video like this doorbell camera are capturing even more of our world. And the audio and video quality from smartphones is often quite good. This was shot on an iPhone. It is generally legal to film police in the United States, and the Internet has allowed videos to quickly spread. It's not clear if body cameras have had a widespread impact on police accountability so far, but public pressure now often prompts quicker release of video evidence. In Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, this video of white officer Kim Potter shooting Dante Wright, a 20-year-old black man, was released less than 24 hours after the incident. Video doesn't always reveal clear-cut police misconduct. This video from Columbus, Ohio, shows a 16-year-old black girl wielding a knife as a police officer shoots her. This video from Chicago captures a chaotic foot chase that tragically ends with a 13-year-old Latino boy being shot and killed. Police say the boy had a gun. Some fear such graphic video footage, often shown on a loop on cable news, may be damaging. I think it's also, though, um, concerning in the sense that it is a, it's like a drip feed of trauma. Some civil rights leaders say it's doubtful that cases of police brutalizing African Americans are actually increasing. It's, it's not that racism has gotten worse, cameras have gotten better, and we've had uh, more exposure to it. And criminal justice reform advocates, including George Floyd's family, contend that countless other African Americans have suffered at the hands of police without the truth ever being revealed. That's the only thing that changed, the cameras, the technology. Uh, it helped open up doors because without that, my brother just would have been another person on the side of the road, left to die. Video also has the power to show the humanity of a man like George Floyd in the final moments of his life, and perhaps the lack of humanity from others in those same moments. Jim Spellman, CGTN. A new report by Human Rights Watch accuses Israel of apartheid, a system of institutionalized segregation. The report says Palestinians are subject to oppression and inhumane acts. 
It points to expanding Jewish settlements in internationally recognized occupied territories, demolition of Palestinian homes, checkpoints, and other military crackdowns. Israel denies the accusations. The Gaza Strip is facing a growing electricity crisis. Frequent power cuts are disrupting many pu uh, public services. But a solar power plant project funded by China has brought hope to patients in a children's hospital. Noor Harazin reports. At the Red Children's Hospital in Gaza City is now powered by solar panels. The project has been funded by China and implemented by the Give Palestine Association charity organization. At an online ceremony held in early April, Chinese ambassador to Palestine said his country has been committed to implement projects that will help Palestinians improve their livelihood. The hospital has 90 beds and can provide health services for nearly 100,000 children. It includes residential units, intensive care, emergency and laboratories. And with the new solar panels, most of these departments can operate without having to rely on external generators. These children are on ventilators and the electricity should not stop because that means they will lose their lives. Now, through this project, the continuous electricity supply has been secured, which enhances the quality of health services with high efficiency, as they no longer rely on external generators. The Nur al Hayat project harnesses sustainable energy to serve the hospital by installing solar panels. It will provide 30 megawatts of electricity and help 80% of the hospital's departments operate. Palestinian citizens are very happy about the project. CGTN met with Iman al-Harazin, the mother of two-month-old child suffering from respiratory problems. When the power is out, we can't operate the electrical devices in our homes. But here in the hospital, the situation has become much better after the installation of the solar panels. And they can help our children immediately without waiting for the electricity to come back. The Palestine Give Association, which supervised the project, says China's support for clean energy projects has helped provide better health services to children in Palestine. The project provides Al Dura Hospital with 30 megawatts energy. We are very thankful because this will target the main departments, like the intensive care units and the children's overnight department. The Light of Life project was funded through generous funding from the People's Republic of China, represented by the Chinese embassy in Palestine. Gaza's Ministry of Health has repeatedly warned of the collapse of the health care system in the besieged enclave due to frequent power cuts and a serious shortage of medical equipment, mainly caused by an Israeli blockade. Nuharazin CGTN, Gaza. And that's The World Today. I'm Elaine Reyes.
This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. More than four billion people live across Asia, and we are telling their stories. In this edition, tens of thousands of bicycles were left behind when bike-sharing companies went bust. But these unwanted bikes found new homes and a new purpose in the outskirts of Yangon. Economic hardship has driven millions of Tajik men abroad in search of jobs. It has led to a cultural shift in conservative Tajikistan. By enjoy Madam, by Shukla Holi Toki, Kasbistan Technik Romuzan, by Rukhudan. You may recognize these bikes or have even used them. When bike sharing companies like O Bike went bankrupt, and Ofo and Mo Bike started withdrawing from major markets like Singapore, they left tens of thousands of these unwanted bikes in their wake. After lying in bicycle graveyards for months, they finally found a home. These brand new unassembled bikes behind me have already clocked up a high carbon footprint, being manufactured in China, first deployed to Singapore, and now ending up in a Yangon warehouse. Hopefully, Myanmar will be their last port of call. These students live within six kilometers of their high school in a village on the outskirts of Yangon. While it's not far, their journey to school can take one or two hours a day because they can't afford any form of transport and would have to walk. But thanks to the less walk movement, today they have their own bicycles. <laughs> The Less Walk Movement is a charitable organization which aims to improve access to education by donating bicycles to students living below the poverty line. Mm. ไอ้ซอบไปนี่เหมียวอ่ะเนาะอ๋อกูตะไม่เลยเลยแล้วซอบไปนี่เนี่ยให้สรอ <laughs> The brains behind Let's Walk is this entrepreneur from Myanmar, Mike Tan Tun Wing. 
currently there's about every one student or five students end up dropping off school in Myanmar. Uh, part of the reason is of course access to education, the distance, and realize that actually many people they need a bicycle. Let's walk is a good example of a third world country solving a first world problem. Although the sharing bicycle economy bubble has burst in big cities around the world, it is here in rural Myanmar these disadvantaged children have come to the rescue. It is true that one man's trash is another man's treasure. When I started giving the bicycle to the children, firstly, it was astonishment. The children never believed that they are getting this bicycle for free because this is something very valuable in their standard. It's almost like one month of their wage. Second is, of course, maybe, uh, maybe tears of joy because they now know that they no longer have to walk two, three hours to school anymore. They can cycle 30 minutes to school. They have at least one hour, two hour more time. In terms of distribution, how do you make sure that no kids are left behind? We want to really benefit the most vulnerable group. Currently, our selection criteria is actually for students that walk actually two hours to school. Second thing is that they cannot have any other vehicles at home. Third, we tend to choose uh, families that are more vulnerable, either for single families or maybe orphans. Um, so these are our main criteria right now. So uh, rather than the students applying directly from us, we actually work the schools. Lastly, when we give the bicycles, we want their guardian or their parents to sign an undertaking letter of acknowledgement that they won't sell this bicycle away. The idea to recycle and reuse discarded bikes first came to Mike in 2018. When an old bike from Singapore, they went bankrupt in 2018, I could see a lot of these bicycles being treated very badly. We tried to approach some of the liquidator of old bike company. But the legal red tapes and everything wasn't very easy for me, and I and I gave up. The idea really started out about uh, 1st of March in 2019. I could see that Mobike and Ofo, they were announcing gradual withdrawal from the global market, right? And when they withdraw from this global market, usually they leave a mess behind. This time, instead of trying to tackle the red tape, Mike took to social media, asking his friends and followers to help him source and donate 10,000 bicycles. He initially planned to import used bicycles. Then he found a better deal. With warehouse companies storing brand new, unused shared bikes left behind in Singapore and Malaysia. So the start of the bicycles, and they were very, very eager to dispose this bicycle. So we bought them at 15 uh, US dollar, ten dollar in shipping, a five dollar in modification, and another five dollar in dispersion locally. That gave us a cost of about thirty five dollars to reach the students. This news became a bit viral globally, so uh, we were contacted by warehousing companies in Japan, China, Australia, and all around the world right now. So Amsterdam have already donated some bicycles for us for free. The USA have donated some bicycles to us for free. China have donated some bicycles for us for free. So my $35, I'm able to lower to $20 per bicycle. Currently, my way of funding this is actually to get corporate sponsors. Mike believes his solution is not limited to Myanmar and hopes to inspire like-minded people in other countries to follow suit. I believe that this problem is not only faced in Myanmar. Uh, many agricultural countries like Cambodia, even Bangladesh, many of these uh, houses, you know, the families, they stay next to their farm because they walk to their farm. But usually schools are a bit far from their farm, from their villages. I've received emails from all around the world. Say, hey Mike, you know, we have the same idea, but we don't know how to do it. So currently we are sharing our experience to helping them, you know, uh, buy these bicycles. Uh, one is Cambodia, one is Nepal. We are also looking to do help uh, Bangladesh and some other African countries to do that. As developed country buy more bicycles, they also have used bicycles, right? It's actually upgrading. So there's always a constant supply of, increasing supply of used bicycles right now, of very good quality. So we want to connect these developed countries to developing countries where they can donate their used bicycles to students that need them in developing country. The supply shouldn't be an issue in the long run, and we believe that this program can sustainably run for many years to come. Mike hopes his movement will push Myanmar towards a better future. 
we have definitely improved the country in multiple aspects, economically, socially, politically. Because I'm a tech entrepreneur, I always thought that knowledge is the key thing. You know, if we are able to just do simple things, reducing the dropout rate, having better access to education, just hoping that some of the students that we benefit will carry on their education. For Simon Asia, I'm Miro Lu in Myanmar. Up next, how Tajik women are filling the economic gaps in their country. خشکی زندگی من از و خش سوز من چهار کدک تولد کردیم خش رو نز میخو و فش رو نز بوده به تمیم دید که اینجا بهم کار نشد که هم به رسیه رفته به ساختمان کردنیم خب پیش آی رفتم سو منم کار میکدم سو اون کس هم کار میکرد زندگی من خب نرمانی بود میسو و گم وای نبشیم بعد خب بعدی که من از اوژه سلامتی ما گم کردم اوژه وای هم میسو سلامتی شان نیست خصوص برای همین وای شدیم میسو خب وضعیت زندگی من از کمتر باید تره کن Both Parvina and Gulmara live in a village some 60 kilometers west of the Tajik capital Dushanbe near the Uzbek border like thousands of others, they are bonded by circumstance. Annually, hard economic times in this small Central Asian country of 9 million drives more than 1 million Tajik men abroad in search of better opportunities. <laughs> For Gulmara, at first, life was good after her husband left. But after five years, Gulmara's husband got sick and was deported from Russia for fake documents. Life has been tough for 32-year-old Parvina, whose husband left shortly after the birth of their youngest child. Since then, he's been sending her around 300 U.S. dollars a month. Practically every household in this village has lost at least one or two male members to migration. This common trend seen in villages all across the country is not only changing families, but also long-standing cultural traditions in this largely patriarchal society. Since the breakup of the former Soviet Union in 1991, migrants have been Tajikistan's prime export and the single largest source of income, says political analyst Rashid Abdullo. But the formation of new market economy in Tajikistan forces everybody to look for money, to seek money. There is no uh, guaranteed workplaces as it was during the uh, Soviet Union, no guaranteed uh, money, and everybody should depend only, mainly on itself. High unemployment and poor salaries have pushed more and more Tajiks to start looking for work abroad. 
Most head to Russia for its proximity, opportunities, and historical connection. Even they are very bright. They are ready to be engaged in some unqualified work somewhere because as uh, unqualified rookie, he gained much more uh, than here in Tajikistan. Remittances to Tajikistan peaked in 2013, amounting to nearly half of the country's GDP. But then the collapse of the Russian ruble a year later meant that less money was available to send back. The only really strong and uh, confident source of uh, cash money for Tajikistan is immigration. Since 2013 and up to date, the amount of money transferred to Tajikistan from Russia, for example, decreased threefold. According to the World Bank, by 2018, remittances only came up to 2.2 billion U.S. dollars, or 30 percent of GDP, compounding the hardships for those left behind. Family abandonment also contributes to the drop in remittances. It is not uncommon for some men to find new wives while abroad, disconnecting altogether from his family back in Tajikistan. Not only are these wives left to bear the loss of income, but also the emotional loss and negative cultural stigma that comes with being a divorcee. Some in Tajikistan's patriarchal society considered abandoned or divorced women as deficient. Even their own families can turn on them, leaving some women struggling to survive. This women's shelter, called the Caravan of Hope, was set up in 2009 to help women who have been abandoned or abused and teach them new skills that will allow them to build economic independence. Many of these women are in hiding for fear of reprisal from their families or society for what some consider defying cultural norms by seeking that independence, so all people involved must remain anonymous. Some 30 women graduate from one of their courses every month with empowering new skills. Ну, я думаю, что мы сейчас, я вижу, что много изменений в обществе идет за счет того, что наши женщины какое-то образование получают, потому что раньше женщины как-то боялись, стеснялись, а сейчас они уже сами стремятся к этому, хотят получить какие-то навыки, какие-то знания, потому что менять кругозор, потому что они не только мамы, они еще и жена, чтобы какое-то было общение с мужем, со с ребенком, у нее были какие-то знания. Потому что я знаю, что через курсы они не только какой-то навык учат, но они также общаются с друг с другом, они общаются с учителями. Там, кроме этого, учителя очень много проводят всяких во время перерыва бесед с этими женщинами. Поэтому я думаю, что если... A shortage of men and money has forced an inevitable cultural shift in this conservative nation where traditional family values view men as the breadwinners and women as caretakers. Yakubova Zarina grew up in Dushanbe and has been driving a taxi in the capital for more than two years. It's a job traditionally done by men, but out of necessity, she finds herself one of many women who have taken up the non-traditional role. taxi. <laughs> Первое время было как-то нет, а, ну, а потом привыкла, а сейчас, знаете, уже свои клиенты. И когда уже люди очень хорошо относятся, я думала, будут 
ой, женщина там, например, возмущаться, но нет. Честно, прибыльная работа, свободная работа, независимо ни от кого. Многие удивляются вам. Не... Все знаете вопрос, как женщина говорит, вам не пристают там или еще что-то там, вам не трудно ли, как вы решились? Сразу первый вопрос, муж вам разрешил? Yakubova's husband divorced her after he left to work abroad, leaving her with their four children. Не умирать ведь, дома сидеть, тебя никто не накормит. Правильно, детей никто, надо детей на ноги ставить. Отец не делает, мать. While she does face some opposition, Yakubova says female taxi drivers are becoming more socially acceptable, in the capital at least. Некоторые мужчины отрицательно относятся, говорят, да я не сяду с женщиной. Я боюсь, как она может водить эту машину, вообще есть ли страховка. Потом садятся, в принципе, я не заставляю, если хотят, садятся, нет, нет. Бывает такое. Но это самое, скажем, и 101 процент. А остальное, нет, вроде всем нравится. И они говорят, больше бы, да, вот женщин. There is an increasing demand for women to take up jobs abandoned by migrating men. More market stalls are run by women. Women outnumber men in the fields. Even vocational training centers are seeing a growing number of female enrollment. Government has managed to substantially reduce poverty over the last decade, but the facts remain that more than 32% of Tajiks still live below the poverty line, and the country remains the poorest of all 15 former Soviet republics. The government uh, tried to launch as much as possible of different kind of economical projects and attract the money from outside in order to create new job places. But I see that it's not so easy job to ensure real job places with really good attractive salary to keep as much as possible people in working age in the Republic itself. Many analysts point to the growing population, stubborn corruption, and security issues in neighboring countries as the main challengers to the creation of well-paying jobs. But unless that improves, the country's migration trend is not likely to change, forcing the women left behind to shape the future of their country. Natalie Carney, CGTN, Tajikistan. Follow us on social media to contribute story ideas and share your thoughts. Over 2,000 years ago, the Romans invented what we now know today as cement-based concrete. One of the world's most crucial building materials is also one of the most prone to environmental risks. With extensive exposure to air, rain, and pollution, concrete structures tend to get dirty, discolored, and fractured. But scientists have found the future cement to help keep buildings safe. Hydrophobic literally means fear of water. Dutch surfaces exist in nature, from lotus leaves to insects' wings. Their special structure and chemical makeup allow them to repel not only water, but also dust 
and pollutant. And scientists have been able to emulate this super hydrophobic surfaces in the lab for application to daily items like clothes and shoes. At the core of these products is a highly water repellent silicon polymer known as PDMS. PDMS 其实它是一个工业产品啦，可以大量生产，可以做一些表面防护啊，一些保护啊，等等等等。But how does PDMS polymer work to make an entire building water repellent? Is not as easy as slathering it on walls as you would with paint, because top layers would get worn away over time. What if PDMS is mixed with cement? 因为你的掺入，它就涉及到一个它的，比如它的分布的均匀性啊。如果你把它完全包裹住了，那其实它也起不到什么作用了，它可能反而成一个断裂源。So how can we effectively get PDMS polymer into concrete? Professor Xu found the perfect carrier for this water-resistant substance is, wait for it, oil. But many of us know that oil and water don't mix. So how can this mixture happen to create self-cleaning concrete? Let me expound with my favorite summer treat. Well, ice cream is the perfect example of a marriage between oil and water, also known as emulsion. Through the use of emulsifier, the process works by stabilizing a mixture of fluids to help them unite and stay together. Therefore, it's not entirely true that oil and water don't mix. They can, with a little bit of help. 乳化完了以后，它就形成一种什么一种什么样的结构呢？连续的这个水线中产生了大量的这种非常小的这个油滴。这个时候，我们就加入了这个这个水泥，我们再进行搅拌。Now those countless oil droplets, which carry hydrophobic particles, are everywhere in the slurry. When it is dried and heated, the oil droplets will evaporate and lift behind those tiny pores, coated with hydrophobic polymer. The end result is a lightweight, water-fearing new concrete. It can repel dust particles and liquids other than water, including milk, beer, soil sauce, coffee. And colored water. From the surface to the inside, the material keeps a super hydrophobic quality, even after it's ground into powder. Our traditional this kind of oil cone shape, its cone is about one and a half meters. But our this is reduced to five times. Its cone is smaller, that means from the heat and the heat of the oil, it should be more powerful. Regular concrete undergoes the curing process for it to harden and gain strength, which involves days of keeping it moist with water. However, in the case of this new concrete, it is impossible to add water into it once the super hydrophobic surface has been generated. So researchers are now working to change this, so the material can go through the same curing process as regular concrete. In turn, making it stronger and more efficient. Scientists are also looking to enhance the material from being self-cleaning. To medical level, where it can not only resist water and dirt, but also bacteria. 水的话，对于细菌来说是一个非常合适的场所。如果不沾水的话，它这个地方就没有生长的可能。这其中真正的要应用，我们其实还有很大量的工作要去做。
heartbreak in India as a second wave of COVID-19 devastates the country. Oxygen supplies are running out and hospitals are overwhelmed with patients. How the international community is stepping in to help. Hello, I'm Arnold Neider and this is The Heat. For the sixth straight day, India is reporting a record number of COVID-19 cases with some 300,000 new infections every 24 hours. Countries across the globe are sending medical help, including critical oxygen supplies. Gao Yi Ming begins our coverage and a warning, some of these images may be difficult to watch. India is facing an out-of-control public health crisis. Hundreds of thousands of patients are pouring into hospitals to seek treatment for COVID-19. But due to shortages of oxygen in beds, many are being turned away. This condition is a bit serious. We're standing here without oxygen and a patient in the middle of the road without any hope. It's been two hours. I've been waiting here since 8 in the morning. As far as I can see, I won't be able to get in for another hour or maybe more. I have a car and I'm sitting in it. But where will a poor person sit if he is sick? Crematoriums are working day and night to cope with the soaring deaths. The World Health Organization says this unprecedented crisis in India is beyond heartbreaking. WHO is doing everything we can providing critical equipment and supplies, including thousands of oxygen concentrators, prefabricated mobile field hospitals, and laboratory supplies. A number of nations are sending aid to help India battle this new wave of infections. China says 800 oxygen concentrators have been sent from Hong Kong to Delhi, and 10,000 more are scheduled to arrive in a week. A foreign ministry spokesperson says Beijing is willing to support Delhi with all the help it needs. We are making it clear that we stand ready to help India fight its recent outbreak. Both sides have been communicating on the matter. If India puts forward specific needs, China is willing to provide support and assistance to the best of its ability. The U.S. has promised to provide medical equipment and protective gear to India, as well as raw materials for vaccines to India's manufacturers. The State Department says it's working nonstop to deliver these supplies, and President Joe Biden has vowed to help India overcome the difficulties in its time of need. Both France and Germany have also promised to provide medical aid, including oxygen, as soon as possible. And Russia says India will receive the first batch of its Sputnik V vaccines on May the 1st. Gao Yiming, CGTN. Earlier, I had a chance to speak with Dr. Anant Ban, a global health researcher based in the Indian city of Bhopal. I started by asking him about what's driving the high infection rates. So, yes, there's a bunch of reasons probably which can be ascribed, uh, you know, one of the things which uh, was a problem was that uh, there were things uh, loosened up too early. When I say loosened up, I mean that uh, the usual public health precautions were not followed in many parts of India. Mask usage went down. There were a lot of uh, mass gatherings happening, political or religious. Uh, there were elections held, which also led to uh, a lot of mixing of individuals. Uh, the health system was also caught a little bit underprepared, even though there was experience from last year and uh, there was not enough uh, preparation to make the health system ready for any kind of surge like this. We should have learned from uh, the, uh, the rise in infections last year as well as the experience of many other countries where th there have been more than one waves, uh, and we should have known that India could also probably be facing this situation. Red, I want to talk about variants. Uh, there are variants of the virus that uh, have made their way to India, the UK variant, the South African variant, the Brazilian variant, all in India. To what extent do you think these variants have been responsible for these surging numbers? Yeah, so what we know about pandemics and also viruses is that they evolve, right? Uh, there are mutations, there are variants, and certainly uh, those are a cause for worry. Um, in India, there have been some attempts at tracking them uh, through genomic surveillance, and they've been able to pick up. Now, there is also talk of an Indian variant, uh, for example. So 
again, these are certainly uh, you know variants which can cause a rapid rise in the spread. Uh, in India now, we believe that uh, some of these variants are certainly responsible uh, for uh, contributing to the spread because they're more infectious in nature. The number of people who uh, an index case could infect is much higher than last year, and that could be contributing um, to uh, why we are seeing this kind of a situation unfold. There is something uh, being called the double mutant uh, a kind of variant that may be in India. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, so there's been a lot of tracking on trying to understand that what is uh, the kind of spread of infection and what might that be caused by. And when this, as I was saying earlier, when these uh, the surveillance efforts are done and uh, genomic workup is done, you realize that there might be some virus uh, uh, mutations which have happened. In this case, there are uh, viruses with double mutation, sometimes more than one, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, causes for worry uh, on that count. And uh, what typically scientists will look out for is when you have these mutations happening in the virus, does that mean that the virus is becomes more infectious? Is it able to escape being uh, picked up on a test, even a gold standard like RT-PCR? And uh, are vaccines still able to protect against these kinds of variants? So I think those are the kind of things why we need good quality lab surveillance. They tell us uh, answers to those questions. Dr. Banan, as we, of course, see these numbers escalate, we're seeing a human tragedy unfold in India right now. We see these really heartbreaking pictures of people waiting outside hospitals, trying to get their loved ones beds in hospitals. We see people standing in lines to buy oxygen. Uh, we see this in many parts of the country. What do you know about the situation as far as hospitals and the healthcare infrastructure is concerned? Yeah, Anand, unfortunately, uh, you know, in India is certainly facing an acute crisis in many parts of the country. It's not just spread, uh, you know, localized to one region. It's actually now in many states that there is a shortage of beds, there is a shortage of ventilators, there is a shortage of even basic equipment uh, and supplies like oxygen. And uh, that is really leading to very distressing scenes uh, of the kind that you've described, where people are waiting to just access care and be able to, um, you know, just receive oxygen um, or, or be, uh, you know, be given a bed in the hospital. Um, unfortunately, uh, this also means that a lot of people are not able to get it as they're waiting in line, and there have been deaths which have happened. So this just tells us that uh, the health system is really stressed out because of the rapid uh, increase in the number of cases. And uh, it's leading to really uh, sad scenes in many parts of the country. You know, as you pointed out a moment ago, there is a feeling that India reopened too quickly. I mean, only a year ago, the country implemented one of the toughest lockdowns in the world. At that time, uh, the number of cases numbered in the hundreds. Uh, but now we've had other factors as well, as you've pointed out. Uh, there's politics which has been involved in this. There's an election that was allowed to take place. There was a very big religious festival that the government allowed to... Uh, take place. Massive election rallies have been held as well. Um, has the government recognized that these have contributed to the high numbers and what are they doing about it? Yeah, I think in post facto there's been some recognition that they, these might have been certainly events which would have led to uh, a spread of infection. And now um, the regulatory bodies such as the Election Commission have stepped forward and said that we need to decrease the number of crowds uh, which are assembling. Um, and similarly, the, the, for the religious events as well, there's been an outreach done to uh, religious authorities to try to decrease the scale of events and, um, you know, also um, ask them to uh, not have too many people turn up for some of these events, largely hold them symbolically. But perhaps we are already a bit late in uh, doing some of this and, you know, the, the downstream impact of a lot of these impacts could be, be uh, of, of these events could be that there is a diffuse spread of infection as people return from these events um, into other parts of India. So, uh, you know, the next few weeks are going to be really crucial. Uh, hopefully, some of the steps which are being taken now around mitigation strategies like localized lockdowns will mean that the stress on the health system decreases. And after that, I think we really need to make sure that we keep adhering to the precautions as we all know which work to ensure that we don't uh, face such situ uh, situations again. Right, and India has also appealed for outside help. Uh, China is stepping in. Uh, the United States has pledged assistance as well. Uh, what's been the response so far? Yeah, so I, I think the response has been fairly encouraging. Uh, many countries have stepped forward. You know, India also um, earlier in the pandemic has been uh, fairly giving. Uh, you know, they've uh, sent out vaccines to many countries. 
they also sent out supplies they helped uh, export uh, you know uh, ppe kits etc uh, as you know india is also among the world's largest uh, producers of vaccines and and has played a very very important role in global health in that uh, aspect but now india needs help india needs uh, resources india needs anything from oxygen um, to ventilators and it's great to see that the global community has began to step up there are many countries which are already flying in supplies and hopefully this will help uh, address uh, the acute shortage that we are seeing in many parts of india as you say india is one of the biggest uh, manufacturers and suppliers of vaccines clearly something went wrong because demand is now outstripping supply uh, why was the country so ill prepared yeah i think the challenge with countries like india uh, is also the size uh, both both uh, geographic but also of the population and even though india has had uh, a fairly large vaccination program for covid-19 probably the second highest number of individuals uh, globally who have been vaccinated uh, but the challenge has been uh, the coverage because uh, with such a large population you will need a lot of doses um, and a lot of resources to be able to vaccinate enough people um, so attempts were made but clearly we could have done perhaps better in terms of being enhancing the supply domestically uh, enhancing our efforts to cover more population now from the 1st of may the government has opened up vaccination for any man above 18 uh, hopefully in the next few weeks we will see a ramp up in the vaccination efforts so that we are able to protect more people uh, within the population Uh, there's also some concern about the numbers that we are hearing from authorities in India that there's been serious undercounting that the situation could actually be far worse than we know. Well there was data earlier uh, as well uh, from seroprevalence studies which seemed to indicate that the uh, actual number of people who had been exposed to infection was much higher uh, than the official numbers because official numbers might depend on factors such as how many people have been tested and if there are areas where not adequate tests have been done or not enough people have turned up for testing even though they had symptoms then you might miss a lot of cases and even now there is a concern that uh, we might not be um, you know able to test enough and uh, there might be a shortage of uh, test uh, appointments there might be a, a long turnaround time for test results to come up and also the fact that many tests uh, which might be especially happening for example at home are not being cataloged as covid tests uh, even though uh, the data coming in from say crematoria or graveyards seems to indicate that the number of deaths is much much higher than the numbers we are hearing from uh, official sources i have one final question and i know this is a difficult one but uh, would you venture to predict how long it could be before india starts turning the corner yeah well all of us are hoping this would be soon but you know unfortunately um, the the cases are continuing to rise so as i said earlier it looks like the peak is not yet here um you know hopefully with the kind of measures which have been put in especially around containment um and mitigation we might start to see uh, a reduction in the number of cases over the next few weeks but uh, may uh, at least the early part looks it looks like it will be a difficult period for india and uh, one is hopeful that uh, you know this doesn't put further stress on the health system and uh, cause the kind of uh, grief and devastation that we have already seen in many parts of the country dr anand bhan thanks for joining us sir thank you sir for more now on the international outreach and the situation in the united states let's bring in our panel joining us now from arizona is will humble He's the executive director of the Arizona Public Health Association. Here in Washington DC, Joseph Williams is the senior news editor with US News and World Report, and Dr. Kate Tilenko is the founder and CEO of Corvus Health. Thanks everyone for being with us. Uh, Kate, as we just saw and heard a great deal of suffering and agony in India, is there a lesson for the rest of the world from the Indian experience, the risk of reopening economies too early of people rushing to get their lives back to normal too quickly I think there are three lessons that India can teach the world now the first is what you mentioned that they reopened too quickly they had mass religious events very large weddings large political rallies i think as governments reopen they have to give more guidance to people about their risk budget and how to slowly enter their normal lives uh, uh, you know at a slower pace than that they did before so that's the first lesson i think the second lesson which the physician you interviewed mentioned was that of surge capacity we're now over a year into this 
this crisis. And countries need to build better surge capacity, and that's through the entire health system. So surge capacity in health workers and beds, oxygen, medical supply, really every, every part of the health system. We see that some uh, parts of India, some states such as Kerala, which did invest more in surge capacity, uh, you know, like the state of Kerala in India, um, haven't had as much of a crisis. In fact, southern India, which tends to invest more in healthcare, has been sending oxygen up to northern India. So that surge capacity is essential. And then the third lesson long term is India and other developing countries must invest more in health care. The WHO recommends that developing countries invest 15 percent of their gross domestic product into health care. India just invests 1.2 percent. So it really grossly underspends in the area of health care. And I guess, Kate, uh, one of the other complications is that uh, in India, as we've seen in other countries as well, including the United States, this pandemic has become very politicized. Yes, it has. And, you know, people are, are asking about, you know, the, the politics and the ethics of this. And I think that ethically we're really in a, a gray zone. We're in uncharted territory. You know, it was interesting to note that India previously had given away or, or sold vaccines you know, perhaps they had better, you know, <laughs> kept those vaccines in the country and vaccinated their own people. They would be in a much better condition if that happened. So it, it shows how, how easily this gets politicized. And leaders are elected by their citizens, not by the citizens of other countries. And, you know, we're seeing, you know, leaders trying to figure out what's best, you know, for them, uh, what's best for their own citizens, what's best politically. And I, I think that's why you, you see some of the, the balancing acts that you have. Joseph Williams here in the United States, U.S. President Joseph Biden, he held a news conference Tuesday afternoon at the White House on the pandemic. Uh, let's listen to what he had to say about the United States pledge to India and the pledge from Biden to the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Let's listen. We are sending immediately a whole series of help that he needs, including providing for those remdesivir and other drugs that are able to deal with this and prevent, in some cases, but recover, help recovery. Uh, secondly, we are sending the actual mechanical parts that are needed for the machinery they have to build a vaccine. And that's being done as well. We're also discussing, I've discussed with him, when we'll be able to send actual vaccines to India, which will be my intention to do. Joseph, this was a bit of a turnaround by the White House. Initially, they were not prepared to send the raw materials for these vaccines to India. What changed? Uh, everything changed. I mean, uh, a surge in India changed. The fact that the AstraZeneca vaccine became approved or is on the verge of being approved by the FDA, that's another change. But I think the largest change is that Biden's policy people and the people at the CDC uh, and the uh, uh, other go uh, government organizations realized that if India is a problem, it's going to be a problem everywhere. If you don't eliminate the virus or at least get it under control everywhere, or at least in developing countries, that is going to be a problem for the United States. The virus doesn't stay put in one country, not to mention the fact you have very uh, similar variants showing up uh, in India as well as the United States, uh, another indicator that the virus doesn't respect national lines or borders. So I think those two things were the most important uh, aspects of, of, of the about face, plus the fact that the United States has been vaccinating its own citizens at a pretty good clip. Uh, and. Uh, if it continues apace, then the United States will have a significant number of people vaccinated uh, that they can do without uh, and ship some overseas. Will Humble, if we look at the uh, numbers here in the United States, 29% of the U.S. population has now been uh, fully vaccinated and 43% have had at least one dose. Now, there has been some concern over people who will not take the vaccine at all for a number of reasons. But there is another concern now is about people who've had the first dose but they won't take the second dose. Um, I mean, is one dose enough to protect people? I'll just be honest with you, from a public health perspective, that first dose is my primary concern because it does provide uh, very good protection. Now, ideally, we want to see people get that second dose. A bigger problem that I, I think that I'm more concerned about here in the U.S. is that while we are doing fairly well overall, at least in our state in Arizona, we are doing actually quite poorly in lower income neighborhoods, 
among certain subpopulations that are difficult to reach, certain types of employment groups, farm workers, uh, persons experiencing homelessness, et cetera. So um, I'm less concerned about people not taking that second dose than I am other aspects of our response, at least here in Arizona, where lower income communities have just not had the access to the vaccine that wealthy Arizonans have had. And that's something that really needs to change immediately. And it's not just access, it's the fact that the appointment system that, at least in Arizona, that's built is favors wealthy people because they have a good computer, they have internet access, they have the ability to get in their car and go to the vaccination site. And so we see many states in the U.S., Maine, and many others that are actually doing quite well getting into underserved populations. Arizona, not so much. Right. Well, as you point out, notwithstanding the fact that people in low-income areas have not uh, had access to uh, vaccines as people in other areas. You point out that Arizona has done rel relatively well. I mean, some of the figures here, they've only had 750 new cases, no deaths. Um, what has Arizona done to get those numbers down? <laughs> well, quite honestly, part of it's pretty shameful. I mean, there's two ways that you build immunity in a population. Vaccine is the ideal way, because that builds the antibodies in a safe way. What we did in Arizona is had two just terrible waves of infection, one in July of, of 2020 into early August, and a horrible surge in cases in December and January and into early February. So more than 35% of Arizonans were infected with this virus and recovered. And so one reason Arizona is doing well today is in part because we did so poorly early on in the pandemic, and that was a direct result of the decisions that were made by the Arizona governor uh, to uh, to basically stop local jurisdictions from putting in face covering ordinances and other public health measures, and then keeping bars, restaurants, and nightclubs where this virus spread so readily open with abandoned and really no limitations at all. Kate, uh, there's been a huge debate that's been going on over countries that have the vaccine and countries that don't have the vaccine. Who should uh, get the vaccine from those countries that have it. The United States has about 60 million doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine, and we know there's been some questions about that vaccine. Uh, but the 60, 60 million doses, rather, could be released relatively quickly. Could the U.S. be doing more for developed, uh, developing countries? Well, I think um, all countries probably could be doing more. The U.S. is the world's largest donor, but the U.N. recommends that wealthy countries give 0.7 percent of their GDP to overseas develop assistance, and the U.S. only gives 0.16, so about one-fourth of what it should give. Uh, you know, so hopefully the U.S. can step up and, and give more to overseas development assistance. I am encouraged by the fact that the U.S. is giving both short-term assistance and long-term assistance to build capacity. So the short-term assistance, you know, would be the, the vaccines, the oxygen, the medical supplies. The long-term assistance is that the um, a development finance corporation in the U.S. is giving Indian uh, vaccine manufacturers very concessional loans so that they can expand their production for the long term. So that will help India now, but also far into the future. Charles Williams, you know, we know people are desperate to get back to normal, get back to their lives pre-COVID. Uh, there was something of some hope uh, over the weekend. The European Union announced that vaccinated Americans may soon be able to travel to Europe. They would probably like to take vacations in European countries. That still has to be confirmed. Uh, but in the end, the, there's also been lots of talk about vaccine passports. Um, I mean, are there risks in this? Where do you see this going? Well, I mean, certainly there are economic benefits. I mean, the carrot certainly is having uh, five or six million Americans visit a country overseas, uh, and people are yearning to get back to normal. But what has to happen is uh, a, another kind of buckle down and, and wear the masks at home, get the vaccine if you can, and, pop, and vaccinate underserved populations so that we have security, so that people are able to get back to normal. One of the things that Biden said this afternoon uh, was he was pressing to get young people vaccinated because apparently they're falling off uh, in getting their second shot or getting their first shot at all. 
So I think a lot of the risks are, are, are pretty much present. I mean, we really don't know how well the vaccine does against some of these uh, different strains that have shown up in other countries. We don't know whether or not there's a strain that the United States may be exporting to other countries, and we still haven't completed the job here at home. So there are very many incentives to get things going, to get things back to normal, but we still haven't crossed the finish line, and the virus is going to have the last word. So I think one of the things that we have to be careful about in, in talking about the vaccine passport as well is that we are, are separating the haves from the have-nots, people who can get vaccines from those who can't. So there is still a fairly long way to go before we're through this thing, a fairly long way to go before we get back to normal and some real hurdles that we have to get over uh, before we even come close to being able to travel to Europe freely or be able to travel, you know, really across the United States without wearing a mask. And the one other point, uh, Joseph, is that, I mean, if we look at Europe, we look at travel to Europe and those are 27 countries, uh, the response to vaccinations and how they've been carried out in these countries is very uneven. There's no kind of benchmark that tells us, look, this country's met the threshold for uh, travel, this country has not. I mean, it's just a blanket thing. Uh, could that, in turn, lead to another wave? It could absolutely lead to another wave, because if you're going into essentially what is a black box in terms of vaccinations, you don't know who's vaccinated, who's not, and that could bring back another vaccination surge or another uh, virus surge to the United mm -hmm. States. Uh, and maybe we're ready for it, maybe we aren't, especially as people become fatigued with the vaccine or with yeah. the uh, COVID restrictions and kind of decelerate and not push all the way through and do what we need to do to get things under control. Will Humble, uh, the United States Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, they've issued new outdoor mask guidelines um, that was issued today uh, for Americans. In essence, it's okay now to go without a mask in small gatherings. It's okay to be outside without a mask. How significant is this, especially for that very long road to, back what, to, to what we've been talking about, getting back to normal? Yeah, well, I think at least in the U.S., I think it makes sense given where we are with the pandemic and what we know in terms of evidence of how this virus spreads in outdoor environments. Um, and I, I do think it's important that when you have evidence that you can release one of these mitigation measures, it's important to do that because it builds more confidence in the population that you're actually using evidence to drive your public policy decision making. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I think it's important that when you can responsibly lift restrictions, that you do that and explain why you can do that, because we need to build confidence with people that our decision makers are actually using evidence, um, right. because you get better compliance when people believe that you're being straight with them. Kate, very quickly, I've only got 30 seconds. Uh, the pause on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine has now been lifted. Uh, how important is that? It's critical because it will allow the U.S. to give the one-shot vaccination, which is J&J. &J. And we have to remember only one in a million people who are vaccinated uh, got this uh, blood clot, and they were almost all women. Mm -hmm. So we can restrict the vaccine uh, not you know, just to men and not to women of childbearing age. Okay, thank you everyone for being with us. That is it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Anand Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.
A new civil rights investigation into police violence in the United States. Troubling new details in the death of Andrew Brown shot while being served a warrant. We're live from his hometown where rallies continue. We've made stunning progress. As long as you are vaccinated and outdoors, you can do it without a mask. Vaccinated Americans can now relax just a little as mask mandates are lifted for certain activities. Live from Washington, this is The World Today. Welcome to CGTN. I'm Mike Walter in Washington, D.C. The FBI is launching an investigation into the death of a black man at the hands of sheriff's deputies in the U.S. state of North Carolina. Andrew Brown Jr. was shot five times, including once in the back of his head as deputies were serving a search and arrest warrant. Nick Harper is in Elizabeth City where the incident happened. He joins us now live. Nick. Yeah, good evening, Mike. Uh, this building just behind me is where the attorneys for the family of Andrew Brown were here uh, earlier this afternoon, and they were giving news of that independent autopsy that they've been carrying out, really to try and find out uh, what happened in the final moments of Andrew Brown's life. They say that he was shot five times in total by police, four times in his right arm, but importantly, one time in the back of his head, and they say that was the fatal shot. Wayne Kendall, one of the attorneys, was speaking about it earlier. Let's listen to what he had to say. This, in fact, was a fatal wound to the back of Mr. Brown's head as he was leaving the site trying to evade being shot at by these particular law enforcement officers who we believe did nothing but a straight-out execution. Straight out execution, very strong words from the attorneys of the family of Andrew Brown. They say that he was assassinated, that he posed no threat, that he was scared for his life, and that's why he was trying to drive away when police officers were trying to serve that warrant for his arrest. But as you mentioned, an FBI investigation now underway. That's looking at the civil rights side of things to try and find out if federal laws were violated. Because quite simply, the family wants answers as to why the amount uh, of force that was used was was used in this situation because they say quite simply it was not necessary it was not warranted and nick the family also uh, very much annoyed about this uh, body cam footage they've been shown just a short uh, snippet uh, they want it released in full can you update us on that yeah, that's right, Mike. 20 seconds in total. That's all they've been shown so far. And it hasn't been made public. There is a law here in North Carolina, which means that a judge has to rule before the whole of the body cam footage can be made public, not just to the family, but to the general public and to the media as well. A judge will be meeting later on Wednesday in one of the buildings behind me to rule on the matter. But it's not clear that even if the judge rules in the favor of releasing the body cam footage, how quickly that might happen. But the uh, family say, quite simply, for accountability's sake, the whole of the body cam footage needs to be shown. Uh, in the meantime, though, protests have been continuing. I was with a protest just before we came on air. They've been marching uh, through the city here this evening. We are about 25 minutes away from a curfew, which will be in place. It's the first time the city has put in a curfew since the shooting of Andrew Brown last Wednesday. And some of the protesters that I spoke to said that they intended to stay out beyond the curfew time. So certainly tensions have been running high. Uh, people here saying that there needs to be accountability and there are many, many questions that are still to be answered. They say that the release of that body cam footage uh, will allow some of those questions to be answered, but they're hopeful that the judge rules in their favour and more information is found out over the next day or so. Mike? Nick Harper, Live Force. Thanks so much. Joining us now is trial lawyer and legal analyst Debbie Hines. Debbie, you just heard what Nick was saying there and is reporting the attorneys for the family calling this an execution. The family still pushing for this body cam footage. It still hasn't been released in its totality uh, to the family and to the public for that matter. What do you make of all of this? Well, evidently, North Carolina uh, has a little quirky law that basically says that in terms of body cams, it's not readily available to the public and that you have to request it from a judge. Um, so that's what's being done right now. But, you know, as a former prosecutor, if everybody is agreeing that they want to see, they want to have the body camera um, re, um, released, there wouldn't be any problem with it. So it does lead the family and other people to suspect that, well, why wouldn't you just do it? Why wouldn't you just go to a judge? Because anytime you go to a 
judge and something is uncontested, the judge is granted as a matter of as a matter of formality, and no one is contesting not releasing the body cam. So I don't really get why that wasn't done in a more sped, um, in a more expeditious fashion. And the other thing is, there's always an exception to every rule, and so even though there may be some waiting period that they have under their law down there, there's always exceptions, and they could have just have gone to the judge and said, look, we have to do it in this case. We have to have it released right now, immediately. The Justice Department, as you know, now looking into police tactics in Minneapolis. They've also just uh, started an inquiry into police practices in Louisville as well. What do you make of the Biden administration's efforts to investigate police tactics, and will it have much of an impact? Well, I definitely think it'll have much of an impact to start, you know, with the last question first, because it's what was done under the Obama era, which, you know, Biden was the vice president, where there were more than, uh, over a course of time, not just under the Obama administration, but over the course of time, there have been more than 20 uh, consent decrees with police departments. So what is being done in Louisville right now is the Department of Justice will go in, they will look at everything, not just the training, but to see if there is any unreasonable searches, any unreasonable reasonable executions of search and seizure warrants, any unreasonable stops, because we already know that in this country, uh, black people are more likely to be stopped by the police, even though they're less likely to have any contraband or anything illegal in their cars. And they're also going to look into see if all of these things add up to being a race problem. Obviously, we know that there's a problem with the execution of search and seizure warrants in Louisville, because that was what happened with Breonna Taylor. Here she was, a 26-year-old woman that was asleep in her bed when the police came in on a no-knock warrant, and she was killed, and there are no charges that were brought as a result of that. So what will happen is if the um, Department of Justice realizes that there is reason to suspect that there has been violations of law, um, violations of policies, the policies are not being... Um, they're not being followed, but basically, if it's based on race in this instance, then what they will do is they will release a public report, which has been done, like I said, in over 20 other cities over time. They will release a public report, and then they will try to see if they can get an agreement with the city uh, to agree to consent to... Um, resolving some of the problems. And all these things take a matter of years. It's not something that's going to be a quick fix. It's not something that the Justice Department goes in and several months later it's resolved. Some of these consent decrees have gone on literally for more than 10 years, but at least it's some progress in the making, and that hopefully will happen in Louisville, Kentucky. Debbie, a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for Thank your you analysis. Right. Thank you. Police departments across the United States are stepping up their use of body cameras. They're revealing the behavior and officers' interactions with the public. But cameras from bystanders' smartphones can show another side of that story, as CGTN's Jim Spellman reports. If it weren't for this video, Derek Chauvin may not have been convicted in the murder of George Floyd. It was shot on a smartphone by Darnella Frazier, a then 17-year-old high school student. She posted the video on her Facebook page. I'm grateful that Ms. Frazier was there. I'm, I'm grateful she had the courage to start filming it because without her, I don't think we would be sitting here today. In the early 1990s, this footage of Rodney King, a black man being beaten by police officers in Los Angeles during a traffic stop, was one of the first such incidents caught on camera. Since then, the technology has grown more prevalent. Security cameras, cell phone video, police body cams, and dashboard cameras. News sources of video like this doorbell camera are capturing even more of our world. And the audio and video quality from smartphones is often quite good. This was shot on an iPhone. It is generally legal to film police in the United States, and the Internet has allowed videos to quickly spread. It's not clear if body cameras have had a widespread impact on police accountability so far, but public pressure now often prompts quicker release of video evidence. In Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, this video of white officer Kim Potter shooting Dante Wright, a 20-year-old black man, was released less than 24 hours after the incident. Video doesn't always reveal clear-cut police misconduct. This video from Columbus, Ohio, shows a 16-year-old black girl wielding a knife as a police officer shoots her. This video from Chicago captures a chaotic foot chase that tragically ends with a 13-year-old Latino boy being shot and killed. Police say the boy had a gun. Some fear such graphic video footage, often shown on a loop on cable news, may be damaging. I think it's also, though, um, 
concerning in the sense that it is a it's like a drip feed of trauma. Some civil rights leaders say it's doubtful that cases of police brutalizing African Americans are actually increasing. It's, it's not that racism has gotten worse. Cameras have gotten better. And we've had uh, more exposure to it. And criminal justice reform advocates, including George Floyd's family, contend that countless other African Americans have suffered at the hands of police without the truth ever being revealed. That's the only thing that changed, the cameras, the technology. Uh, it helped open up doors because without that, my brother just would have been another person on the side of the road left to die. Video also has the power to show the humanity of a man like George Floyd in the final moments of his life, and perhaps the lack of humanity from others in those same moments. Jim Spellman, CGTN. Still to come, China builds consensus with South Asian nations over COVID-19 vaccines, plus an international lifeline for India. Desperately needed medical supplies arriving from abroad as the nation struggles with a surge in cases. Facing the unknown is always difficult. In a world in turmoil, it's easy to lose orientation. But when the storms come, we have to see the possibilities. Reinvent. Find new opportunities. Discover a path forward. CGTN. See the difference. Whether it's about your education, the home you live in, or the items you buy, your money has a story to tell. Because every business story is a human story. Global Business. We are CGTN. China Global Television Network. Help is on the way to India where conditions remain dire. Countries across the globe are sending emergency oxygen, aid, and medical supplies. For a sixth straight day, the country was hit with more than 300,000 new cases. Gao Ming reports, but first, a warning that viewers may find some images in this report disturbing. India is facing an out-of-control public health crisis. Hundreds of thousands of patients are pouring into hospitals to seek treatment for COVID-19. But due to shortages of oxygen in beds, many are being turned away. This condition is a bit serious. We're standing here without oxygen and a patient in the middle of the road without any hope. It's been two hours. I've been waiting here since 8 in the morning. As far as I can see, I won't be able to get in for another hour or maybe more. I have a car and I'm sitting in it. But where will a poor person sit if he is sick? Crematoriums are working day and night to cope with the soaring deaths. The World Health Organization says this unprecedented crisis in India is beyond heartbreaking. WHO is doing everything we can providing critical equipment and supplies, including thousands of oxygen concentrators, prefabricated mobile field hospitals, and laboratory supplies. A number of nations are sending aid to help India battle this new wave of infections. China says 800 oxygen concentrators have been sent from Hong Kong to Delhi, and 10,000 more are scheduled to arrive in a week. A foreign ministry spokesperson says Beijing is willing to support Delhi with all the help it needs. We are making it clear that we stand ready to help India fight its recent outbreak. Both sides have been communicating on the matter. If India puts forward specific needs, China is willing to provide support and assistance to the best of its ability. The U.S. has promised to provide medical equipment and protective gear to India, as well as raw materials for vaccines to India's manufacturers. The State Department says it's working nonstop to deliver these supplies, and President Joe Biden has vowed to help India overcome the difficulties in its time of need. Both France and Germany have also promised to provide medical aid, including oxygen, as soon as possible. And Russia says India will receive the first batch of its Sputnik V vaccines on May the 1st. Gao Yiming, CGTN.
China's foreign minister says agreements have been reached between South Asian counterparts on COVID-19. Foreign ministers from Afghanistan, Pakistan, Nepal, Sri Lanka and Bangladesh attended a virtual meeting to discuss the crisis. We should oppose attempts to label the virus and politicize the pandemic or to prevent international cooperation in fighting COVID-19. Also, we should continue to support the positive role of the World Health Organization in the fight against the pandemic. All countries should work together to build a community of human health. China is implementing President Xi Jinping's pledge to make vaccines a global public good, carrying out vaccine cooperation on a global scale. We are willing to promote vaccine cooperation with other countries via flexible means, such as free aid, commercial procurement and production under the framework of the Six Nation Cooperation Mechanism. The Six Nations agreed to work together on health crises and jointly promote post-pandemic economic recovery. U.S. President uh, in the U.S. new health guidelines were announced for those who are fully vaccinated. They involve mask wearing and might even encourage more people to get the jab. CGTN's Roy Ruttenberg has details. Well, Joe Biden walked out to the White House lawn on Tuesday wearing a mask and then removing it, indicating that as a fully vaccinated adult, he no longer needs to wear a mask outdoors, echoing the change in guidance from the Center for Disease Control on Tuesday that fully vaccinated Americans can now not wear a mask outside in small groups. The restrictions, they say, still apply in large places like concerts and compacted gatherings, but in public spaces, in small groups, the mask is no longer required. Well, this announcement coming on the heels of President Biden's 100th day in office and amid higher numbers in vaccinations, President Biden announcing that at least 215 million Americans have received at least one shot, many of them the most vulnerable of populations. Still, there is growing hesitancy to get a shot among some groups, and more and more people who signed up for two doses are not showing up, it turns out, for the second dose. So there is that concern. The announcement, the easing of restrictions, perhaps a reward for those who are vaccinated, and a carrot for those who aren't. For those who haven't gotten their vaccination yet, especially if you're younger or think you don't need it, this is another great reason to go get vaccinated now, now. Yes, the vaccines are about saving your life, but also the lives of the people around you. Well, President Biden says that the restrictions being eased is in line with the science and the numbers the daily infection numbers, the deaths, and the hospitalizations all dropping. And Biden says that the doctors are also behind it, but they are urging that indoor restrictions remain in place. Masked, fully vaccinated people can safely attend worship services inside, go to an indoor restaurant or bar, and even participate in an indoor exercise class. Although these vaccines are extremely effective, we know that the virus spreads very well indoors. So both the CDC and the White House are urging Americans to keep the course. They say there's a lot more work to be done in May and June. Yes, some restrictions have been eased, but they say this is not over. Rui Ruttenberg, CGTN in Washington. The U.S. will ease travel restrictions on college students from some of the hardest hit countries. That includes China, Brazil, South Africa, Iran, and most of Europe. The State Department says as of August 1st, academics and journalists can qualify for a national interest exception visa. CGTN's Sean Calebs has our story. The move by the Biden administration is seen as incredibly good news for hundreds of thousands of Chinese students. China by far sends more students to study at colleges and universities here in the United States than any other nation. And not only is China going to be allowed to send students here, but also students from Iran, South Africa, Brazil, and a host of other nations. This is something many colleges and universities have been pushing for, urging the Biden administration to make this move. The reason so many of these colleges are simply suffering financially right now, there was a significant drop in enrollment last year during the pandemic. And international students are even more attractive to colleges and universities because they typically pay full tuition, amounting to some $40 billion to the U.S. economy. Most recently, the American Council on Education said it wanted the Biden administration to make this move seen as a welcoming gesture to allow students to come back to the United States and study. 
how, how did we get here? Well, back in March of 2020, then President Donald Trump put a ban on international students coming to the United States during the pandemic, wanting to keep COVID from spreading throughout the United States. Now, even though the door is opening and students are going to be allowed back in, it is not going to be completely a smooth ride. Any first time visa applicants must meet at the U.S. Embassy with embassy officials before coming to the United States. And considering August 1st is the deadline, there is going to be a backlog of students trying to get through the embassy to come here to the United States. The U.S. says it understands that and is working to streamline the effort. Sean Caleb, CGTN in Washington. Starting Thursday, Turkey will be under its strictest pandemic restrictions yet, and the health ministry also announced it's moving on to the next stage of the vaccination plan, saying China's Sinovac vaccine has proven to be effective. Michal Bartavi reports. Turkey was among the first countries to purchase Sinovac Biotech's COVID-19 vaccine, Coronavac. The government rolled out a vaccination program in January and has since administered over 20 million doses. Over 75 percent of the vaccines administered so far are from China's Sinovac Biotech. The health ministry has declared this vaccine as significantly effective. The rate of admissions to hospital for people above the age of 65, and especially those who have been vaccinated, has decreased. And this corresponds with the official figures of the health ministry. In mid-April, Turkey's health minister, Fahrettin Koca, stated that COVID-19 infections among those over the age of 65 and health workers had drastically decreased. Both were included in the first group to receive China's Coronavac vaccine in Turkey. Janet Bardavid is a Hebrew teacher at the Jewish high school in Istanbul. She was vaccinated when people over the age of 65 received their shots. I got the Chinese vaccine, Sinovac, three weeks after I took my second dose in March. My antibody level was measured, and it was very high. Now I feel so much more confident. Turkey's education ministry has extended the school year until July 2nd, and curriculums have been adjusted due to the pandemic. We are currently teaching classes online. However, schools can reopen any day, and we might have to start face-to-face -face education again. As a teacher, of course, I was worried that we could be at risk, both myself and my students. Meanwhile, the health minister announced that most of the new cases were due to COVID-19 variants, which have also infected children. Doctors stress that China's vaccine also provides some protection against variants. We can say that people with an elevated antibody level have less risk of developing a recurrent disease with other variants of the coronavirus, especially mutants. The Turkish government recently began vaccinating those over the age of 55, but has called on citizens to support the process by adhering to social distancing measures. Mikhail Bardavid, CGTN, Istanbul. U.S. President Joe Biden is approaching 100 days in office. Up next, a look at his foreign policy, especially when it comes to China. CGTN. U.S. President Joe Biden is rolling out and modifying his approach to China in his first 100 days. In many ways, it follows the pattern of his predecessor. In other ways, it's a departure. CGTN White House correspondent Nathan King takes a look. It's been a hundred days of confrontation, fiery talks between Washington and Beijing in Anchorage, Alaska, after the Biden administration imposed yet more sanctions on China over Xinjiang and Hong Kong. Washington also held, virtually, the first leaders' summit of the so-called Quad, the ad hoc grouping of the U.S., Japan, India and Australia, widely seen as a grouping aimed at containing China. 
But there's also been cooperation on the biggest threat to the planet, climate change. First, a successful visit to Shanghai by the US Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, John Kerry. Then, Chinese President Xi Jinping, the first foreign leader to address last week's climate summit organized by the White House. We will continue to prioritize ecological conservation and pursue a green and low carbon path to development. China will strive to peak carbon dioxide emissions before 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality before 2060. But much of the second day of the climate summit was dedicated to how the US could catch up with China on the climate-centric industries of tomorrow. Beijing is leading the way from electric vehicles to lithium batteries to the use of wind and solar power. In fact, competition with China on all fronts is now an urgent priority for Washington. While the climate summit was underway, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee backed by an overwhelming majority the Strategic Competition Act of 2021. It's a 280-page call to counter China, militarily, economically, ideologically, and beyond. China today is challenging the United States, destabilizing the international community across every dimension of power, political, diplomatic, economic, innovation, military, even cultural, and with an alternative and deeply disturbing model for global governance. So this is a challenge of unprecedented scope, scale, and urgency, and one that demands a policy and strategy that is genuinely competitive. The act will now go to a full vote in the Senate. There are many more pieces of legislation targeting China in the works from breaking up supply chains when it comes to semiconductors and smartphones to requiring universities to reveal funding from China and restrictions on Chinese students in strategic industries. The first 100 days of the Biden administration has been targeting China in a more organized and strategic way than under Trump. The Biden administration is also keeping in place Trump's tariffs, at least for now. And while it's perhaps too early to call this some sort of new Cold War, the first hundred days of the Biden administration when it comes to policies towards China certainly look like they're heading in that direction. China, of course, is pushing back against what it sees as national sovereignty issues when it comes to Taiwan, Xinjiang or Hong Kong. And other countries, especially in Asia and Europe, even 